Biology is the science of life forms and living processes. The living world comprises an amazing diversity of living organisms. Early man could easily perceive the difference between inanimate matter and living organisms. Early man deified some of the inanimate matter wind, sea, fire etc. and some among the animals and plants. A common feature of all such forms of inanimate and animate objects was the sense of awe or fear that they evoked. The description of living organisms including human beings began much later in human history. Societies which indulged in anthropocentric view of biology could register limited progress in biological knowledge. Systematic and monumental description of life forms brought in, out of necessity, detailed systems of identification, nomenclature and classification. The biggest spin-off of such studies was the recognition of the sharing of similarities among living organisms both horizontally and vertically. That all present-day living organisms are related to each other and also to all organisms that ever lived on this earth was a revelation which humbled man and led to cultural movements for conservation of biodiversity. In the following chapters of this unit, you will get a description, including classification, of animals and plants from a taxonomist perspective. Diversity in the Living World Chapter 1 The Living World Chapter 2 Biological Classification Chapter 3 Plant Kingdom Chapter 4 Animal Kingdom Unit 1 Born on July 5, 1904, in Kempton, Germany, Ernst Mayer, the Harvard University evolutionary biologist who has been called the Darwin of the 20th century, was one of the 100 greatest scientists of all time. Mayer joined Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences in 1953 and retired in 1975, assuming the title Alexander Agassiz Professor of Zoology Emeritus. Throughout his nearly 80-year career, his research spanned ornithology, taxonomy, zoogeography, evolution, systematics, and the history and philosophy of biology. He almost single-handedly made the origin of species diversity the central question of evolutionary biology that it is today. He also pioneered the currently accepted definition of a biological species. Mir was awarded the three prizes widely regarded as the Triple Crown of Biology, the Bowson Prize in 1983, the International Prize for Biology in 1994, and the Crawford Prize in 1999. Mir died at the age of 100 in the year 2004, Ernst Mir 1904-2004-2018-1. How wonderful is the living world, the wide range of living types is amazing, the extraordinary habitats in which we find living organisms, be it cold mountains, deciduous forests, oceans, freshwater lakes, deserts or hot springs, leave us speechless. The beauty of a galloping horse, of the migrating birds, the valley of flowers or the attacking shark evokes awe and a deep sense of wonder. The ecological conflict and cooperation among members of a population and among populations of a community or even the molecular traffic inside a cell make us deeply reflect on, what indeed is life this question has two implicit questions within, it. The first is a technical one and seeks answer to what living is as opposed to the non-living, and the second is a philosophical one, and seeks answer to what the purpose of life is. As scientists, we shall not attempt answering the second question, we will try to reflect on, what is living 1.1 what is living when we try to define living, we conventionally look for distinctive characteristics exhibited by living organisms. Growth, reproduction, ability to sense environment and mount a suitable response come to our mind immediately as unique features of living organisms. One can add a few more features like metabolism, ability to self-replicate, self-organize, interact and emergence to this list. Let us try to understand each of these. All living organisms grow, increase in mass and increase in number of individuals are twin characteristics of growth. A multicellular organism The Living World Chapter 1 1.1 What is living 1.2 Diversity in the Living World 1.3 Taxonomic Categories 1.4 Taxonomical Aids Grows by cell division. In plants, this growth by cell division occurs continuously throughout their lifespan. In animals, this growth is seen only up to a certain age. However, cell division occurs in certain tissues to replace lost cells. Unicellular organisms grow by cell division. One can easily observe this in in vitro cultures by simply counting the number of cells under the microscope. In majority of higher animals and plants, growth and reproduction are mutually exclusive events. One must remember that increase in body mass is considered as growth. Non-living objects also grow if we take increase in body mass as a criterion for growth. Mountains, boulders and sand mounds do grow. However, this kind of growth exhibited by non-living objects is by accumulation of material on the surface. In living organisms, growth is from inside. Growth, therefore, cannot be taken as a defining property of living organisms. Conditions under which it can be observed in all living organisms have to be explained and then we understand that it is a characteristic of living systems. 
a dead organism does not grow. Reproduction, likewise, is a characteristic of living organisms. In multicellular organisms, reproduction refers to the production of progeny possessing features more or less similar to those of parents. Invariably and implicitly we refer to sexual reproduction. Organisms reproduce by asexual means also. Fungi multiply and spread easily due to the millions of asexual spores they produce. In lower organisms like yeast and hydra, we observe budding. In planaria flatworms, we observe true regeneration, that is, a fragmented organism regenerates the lost part of its body and becomes a new organism. The fungi, the filamentous algae, the protonema of mosses, all easily multiply by fragmentation. When it comes to unicellular organisms like bacteria, unicellular algae or amoeba, reproduction is synonymous with growth, that is, increase in number of cells. We have already defined growth as equivalent to increase in cell number or mass. Hence, we notice that in single-celled organisms, we are not very clear about the usage of these two terms, growth and reproduction. Further, there are many organisms which do not reproduce mules, sterile worker bees, infertile human couples, etc. Hence, reproduction also cannot be an all-inclusive defining characteristic of living organisms. Of course, no non-living object is capable of reproducing or replicating by itself. Another characteristic of life is metabolism. All living organisms are made of chemicals. These chemicals, small and big, belonging to various classes, sizes, functions, etc., are constantly being made and changed into some other biomolecules. These conversions are chemical reactions or metabolic reactions. There are thousands of metabolic reactions occurring simultaneously inside all living organisms. Be they Unicellular or multicellular, all plants, animals, fungi and microbes exhibit metabolism. The sum total of all the chemical reactions occurring in our body is metabolism. No non-living object exhibits metabolism. Metabolic reactions can be demonstrated outside the body in cell-free systems. An isolated metabolic reaction as outside the body of an organism, performed in a test tube is neither living nor non-living. Hence, while metabolism is a defining feature of all living organisms without exception, isolated metabolic reactions in vitro are not living things but surely living reactions. Hence, cellular organization of the body is the defining feature of life forms, perhaps. The most obvious and technically complicated feature of all living organisms is this ability to sense their surroundings or environment and respond to these environmental stimuli which could be physical, chemical or biological. We sense our environment through our sense organs. Plants respond to external factors like light, water, temperature, other organisms, pollutants, etc. All organisms, from the prokaryotes to the most complex eukaryotes can sense and respond to environmental cues. Photoperiod affects reproduction in seasonal breeders, both plants and animals. All organisms handle chemicals entering their bodies. All organisms therefore, are aware of their surroundings. Human being is the only organism who is aware of himself, that is, has self-consciousness. Consciousness therefore, becomes the defining property of living organisms. When it comes to human beings, it is all the more difficult to define the living state. We observe patients lying in coma in hospitals virtually supported by machines which replace heart and lungs. The patient is otherwise brain dead, the patient has no self-consciousness, are such patients who never come back to normal life, living or non-living in higher classes, you will come to know that all living phenomena are due to underlying interactions. Properties of tissues are not present in the constituent cells but arise as a result of interactions among the constituent cells. Similarly, properties of cellular organelles are not present in the molecular constituents of the organelle but arise as a result of interactions among the molecular components comprising the organelle. These interactions result in emergent properties at a higher level of organization. This phenomenon is true in the hierarchy of organizational complexity at all levels. Therefore, we can say that living organisms are self-replicating, evolving and self-regulating interactive systems capable of responding to external stimuli. Biology is the story of life on Earth. Biology is the story of evolution of living organisms on Earth. All living organisms present, past and future, are linked to one another by the sharing of the common genetic material, but to varying degrees. One point to diversity in the living world if you look around you will see a large variety of living organisms, be it potted plants, insects, birds, your pets or other animals and plants. There are also several organisms that you cannot see with your naked eye but they are all around you. If you were to increase the area that you make observations in, the range and variety of organisms that you see would increase. Obviously, if you were to visit a dense forest, you would probably see a much greater number and kinds of living organisms in it. Each different kind of plant, animal or organism that you see, represents a species. The number of species that are known and described range between 1.71.8 million.
This refers to biodiversity or the number and types of organisms present on Earth. We should remember here that as we explore new areas, and even old ones, new organisms are continuously being identified. As stated earlier, there are millions of plants and animals in the world. We know the plants and animals in our own area by their local names. These local names would vary from place to place, even within a country. Probably you would recognize the confusion that would be created if we did not find ways and means to talk to each other, to refer to organisms we are talking about. Hence, there is a need to standardize the naming of living organisms such that a particular organism is known by the same name all over the world. This process is called nomenclature. Obviously, nomenclature or naming is only possible when the organism is described correctly and we know to what organism the name is attached to. This is identification. In order to facilitate the study, number of scientists have established procedures to assign a scientific name to each known organism. This is acceptable to biologists all over the world. For plants, scientific names are based on agreed principles and criteria, which are provided in International Code for Botanical Nomenclature ICBN. You may ask, how are animals named animal taxonomists have devolved International Code of Zoological Nomenclature ICCN? The scientific names ensure that each organism has only one name. Description of any organism should enable the people in any part of the world to arrive at the same name. They also ensure that such a name has not been used for any other known organism. Biologists follow universally accepted principles to provide scientific names to known organisms. Each name has two components, the generic name and the specific epithet. This system of providing a name with two components is called binomial nomenclature. This naming system given by Carolus Linnaeus is being practiced by biologists all over the world. This naming system using a two-word format was found convenient. Let us take the example of mango to understand the way of providing scientific names better. The scientific name of mango is written as Mangifera indica. Let us see how it is a binomial name. In this name Mangifera represents the genus while indica is a particular species or a specific epithet. Other universal rules of nomenclature are as follows. 1. Biological names are generally in Latin and written in italics. They are Latinized or derived from Latin irrespective of their origin. 2. The first word in a biological name represents the genus while the second component denotes the specific epithet. 3. Both the words in a biological name, when handwritten, are separately underlined or printed in italics to indicate their Latin origin. 4. The first word denoting the genus starts with a capital letter while the specific epithet starts with a small letter. It can be illustrated with the example of Mangifera indica. Name of the author appears after the specific epithet, that is, at the end of the biological name and is written in an abbreviated form, e.g., Mangifera indica lin. It indicates that this species was first described by Linnaeus. Since it is nearly impossible to study all the living organisms, it is necessary to devise some means to make this possible. This process is classification. Classification is the process by which anything is grouped into convenient categories based on some easily observable characters. For example, we easily recognize groups such as plants or animals or dogs, cats or insects. The moment we use any of these terms, we associate certain characters with the organism in that group. What image do you see when you think of a dog? Obviously, each one of us will see dogs and not cats. Now, if we were to think of Alsatians we know what we are talking about. Similarly, suppose we were to say mammals, you would, of course, think of animals with external ears and body hair. Likewise, in plants, if we try to talk of wheat, the picture in each of our minds will be of wheat plants, not of rice or any other plant. Hence, all these dogs, cats, mammals, wheat, rice, plants, animals, etc., are convenient categories we use to study organisms. The scientific term for these categories is taxa. Here you must recognize that taxa can indicate categories at very different levels. Plants also form a taxa. Weed is also a taxa. Similarly, animals, mammals, dogs are all taxa. But you know that a dog is a mammal and mammals are animals. Therefore, animals, mammals and dogs represent taxa at different levels. Hence, based on characteristics, all living organisms can be classified into different taxa. This process of classification is taxonomy, external and internal structure, along with the structure of cell development. Process and ecological information of organisms are essential and form the basis of modern taxonomic studies. Hence, characterization, identification, classification and nomenclature are the processes that are basic to taxonomy. Taxonomy is not something new. Human beings have always been interested in knowing more and more about the various kinds of organisms, particularly with reference to their own use. In early days, human beings needed to find sources for their basic needs of food, clothing and shelter. 
Hence, the earliest classifications were based on the uses of various organisms. Human beings were, since long, not only interested in knowing more about different kinds of organisms and their diversities, but also the relationships among them. This branch of study was referred to as systematics. The word systematics is derived from the Latin word systema which means systematic arrangement of organisms. Linnaeus used Systema Naturae as the title of his publication. The scope of systematics was later enlarged to include identification, nomenclature and classification. Systematics takes into account evolutionary relationships between organisms 1.3 Taxonomic categories classification is not a single step process but involves hierarchy of steps in which each step represents a rank or category. Since the category is a part of overall taxonomic arrangement, it is called a taxonomic category and all categories together constitute the taxonomic hierarchy. Each category, referred to as a unit of classification, in fact, represents a rank and is commonly termed as tax and PL, taxa. Taxonomic categories and hierarchy can be illustrated by an example. Insects represent a group of organisms sharing common features like three pairs of jointed legs. It means insects are recognizable concrete objects which can be classified and thus were given a rank or category. Can you name other such groups of organisms? Remember, groups represent category. Category further denotes rank. Each rank or taxon, in fact, represents a unit of classification. These taxonomic groups' categories are distinct biological entities and not merely morphological aggregates. Taxonomical studies of all known organisms have led to the development of common categories such as kingdom, phylum or division for plants, class, order, family, genus and species. All organisms, including those in the plant and animal kingdoms have species as the lowest category. Now the question you may ask is, how to place an organism in various categories? The basic requirement is the knowledge of characters of an individual or group of organisms. This helps in identifying similarities and dissimilarities among the individuals of the same kind of organisms as well as of other kinds of organisms. 1. 3. One species taxonomic studies consider a group of individual organisms with fundamental similarities as a species. One should be able to distinguish one species from the other closely related species based on the distinct morphological differences. Let us consider Mangifera indica, Solanum tuberism potato and Panthera leo lion, all the three names. Indica, tuberism and leo, represent the specific epithets, while the first words Mangifera, Solanum and Panthera are genera and represents another higher level of taxon or category. Each genus may have one or more than one specific epithets representing different organisms, but having morphological similarities. For example, Panthera has another specific epithet called Tigris and Selenium includes species like Nigrum and Melangina. Human beings belong to the species Sapiens which is grouped in the genus Homo. The scientific name thus, for human being, is written as Homo sapiens. 1. 3. Two genus genus comprises a group of related species which has more characters in common in comparison to species of other genera. We can say that genera are aggregates of closely related species. For example, potato and brinjal are two different species but both belong to the genus Selenum. Lion panthera leo, leopard p. paratus and tiger p. tigris with several common features, are all species of the genus Panthera. This genus differs from another genus Felis which includes cats 1, 3, 3 family. The next category, family, has a group of related genera with still less number of similarities as compared to genus and species. Families are characterized on the basis of both vegetative and reproductive features of plant species. Among plants for example, three different genera Selenum, Petunia and Dachira are placed in the family Solanaceae. Among animals for example, genus Panthera, comprising lion, tiger, leopard is put along with genus, Felis cats in the family Felidae. Similarly, if you observe the features of a cat and a dog, you will find some similarities and some differences as well. They are separated into two different families Felidae and Canidae, respectively. 1, 3, 4 order you have seen earlier the categories like species, genus and families are based on a number of similar characters. Generally, order and other higher taxonomic categories are identified based on the aggregates of characters. Order being a higher category, is the assemblage of families which exhibit a few similar characters. The similar characters are less in number as compared to different genera included in a family. Plant families like Convolvulaceae, Solanaceae are included in the order Polymoniales mainly based on the floral characters. The animal order, Carnivora, includes families like Felidae and Canidae 1, 3, 5 class. This category includes related orders. For example, order Primata comprising monkey, gorilla and gibbon is placed in class Mammalia along with order Carnivora that includes animals like tiger, cat and dog. 
class Mammalia has other orders also 1, 3, 6 phylum classes comprising animals like fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds along with mammals constitute the next higher category called phylum. All these, based on the common features like presence of notochord and dorsal hollow neural system, are included in phylum chordata. In case of plants, classes with a few similar characters are assigned to a higher category called division. 1, 3, 7 Kingdom All animals belonging to various phyla are assigned to the highest category called Kingdom Animalia in the classification system of animals. The Kingdom Plantae, on the other hand, is distinct, and comprises all plants from various divisions. Henceforth, we will refer to these two groups as animal and plant kingdoms. The taxonomic categories from species to kingdom have been shown in ascending order starting with species in figure 1.1. These are broad categories. However, taxonomists have also developed subcategories in this hierarchy to facilitate more sound and scientific placement of various taxa. Look at the hierarchy in figure 1.1. Can you recall the basis of arrangement say, for example, as we go higher from species to kingdom? The number of common characteristics goes on figure 1.1 taxonomic categories showing hierarchical arrangement in ascending order. 1.4 Taxonomical aids Taxonomic studies of various species of plants, animals and other organisms are useful in agriculture, forestry, industry and in general in knowing our bioresources and their diversity. These studies would require correct classification and identification of organisms. Identification of organisms requires intensive laboratory and field studies. The collection of actual specimens of plant and animal species is essential and is the prime source of taxonomic studies. These are also fundamental to studies and essential for training in systematics. It is used for classification of an organism, and the information gathered is also stored along with the specimens. In some cases the specimen is preserved for future studies. Biologists have established certain procedures and techniques to store and preserve the information as well as the specimens. Some of these are explained to help you understand the usage of these aids. 1. 4. 1. Herbarium Herbarium is a storehouse of collected plant specimens that are dried, pressed and preserved on sheets. Further, these sheets are arranged decreasing, lower the taxa, more are the characteristics that the members within the taxon share. Higher the category, greater is the difficulty of determining the relationship to other taxa at the same level. Hence, the problem of classification becomes more complex. Table 1.1 indicates the taxonomic categories to which some common organisms like housefly, man, mango and wheat belong. Common biological genus family order class phylum name name division man homo sapiens, homo hominidae primitive mammalia cordata housefly musca musca musidae diptera insecta arthropoda domestica mango mangifera mangifera anacardiaceae sapindales decadalatinae angiospermi indica wheat triticum triticum poaceae piles monocadalatinae, angiospermi east of them table 1.1 organisms with their taxonomic categories. 12 Biology According to a universally accepted system of classification, these specimens, along with their descriptions on herbarium sheets, become a storehouse or repository for future use Figure 1.2. The herbarium sheets also carry a label providing information about date and place of collection, English, local and Britannical names, family, collector's name, etc. Herbaria also serve as quick referral systems in taxonomical studies 1, 4. Two botanical gardens These specialized gardens have collections of living plants for reference. Plant species in these gardens are grown for identification purposes and each plant is labeled indicating its botanical scientific name and its family. The famous botanical gardens are at Kew England, Indian Botanical Garden, Howrah India and at National Botanical Research Institute, Lucknow India. 1. 4. 3. Museum Biological museums are generally set up in educational institutes such as schools and colleges. Museums have collections of preserved plant and animal specimens for study and reference. Specimens are preserved in the containers or jars in preservative solutions. Plant and animal specimens may also be preserved as dry specimens. Insects are preserved in insect boxes after collecting, killing and pinning. Larger animals like birds and mammals are usually stuffed and preserved. Museums often have collections of skeletons of animals too. Figure 1.2 Herbarium showing stored specimens. 1. 4. Four zoological parks These are the places where wild animals are kept in protected environments under human care and which enable us to learn about their food habits and behavior. All animals in a zoo are provided, as far as possible, the conditions similar to their natural habitats. Children love visiting these parks, commonly called zoos figure 1.3. 1, 4, 5 Key Key is another taxonomical age used for identification of plants and animals based on the similarities and dissimilarities. The keys are based on the contrasting characters generally in a pair called couplet. It represents the choice made between two opposite options. 
This results in acceptance of only one and rejection of the other. Each statement in the key is called a lead. Separate taxonomic keys are required for each taxonomic category such as family, genus and species for identification purposes. Keys are generally analytical in nature. Summary The living world is rich in variety. Millions of plants and animals have been identified and described but a large number still remains unknown. The very range of organisms in terms of size, color, habitat, physiological and morphological features make us seek the defining characteristics of living organisms. In order to facilitate the study of kinds and diversity of organisms, biologists have evolved certain rules and principles for identification, nomenclature and classification of organisms. The branch of knowledge dealing with these aspects is referred to as taxonomy. The taxonomic studies of various species of plants and animals are useful in agriculture, forestry, industry and in general for knowing our bioresources and their diversity. The basics of taxonomy like identification, naming and classification of organisms are universally evolved under international codes. Based on the resemblances and distinct differences, each organism is identified and assigned a correct scientific biological name comprising two words as per the binomial system of nomenclature. An organism represents occupies a place or position in the system of classification. There are many categories ranks and are generally referred to as taxonomic categories or taxa. All the categories constitute a taxonomic hierarchy. Taxonomists have developed a variety of taxonomic aids to facilitate identification, naming and classification of organisms. These studies are carried out from the actual specimens which are collected from the field and preserved as referrals in the form of herbaria. Museums and in botanical gardens and zoological parks, it requires special techniques for collection and preservation of specimens in herbaria and museums. Live specimens, on the other hand, of plants and animals, are found in botanical gardens or in zoological parks. Taxonomists also prepare and disseminate information through manuals and monographs for further taxonomic studies. Taxonomic keys are tools that help in identification based on characteristics, flora, manuals, monographs and catalogs are some other means of recording descriptions. They also help in correct identification. Flora contains the actual account of habitat and distribution of plants of a given area. These provide the index to the plant species found in a particular area. Manuals are useful in providing information for identification of names of species found in an area. Monographs contain information on any one taxon. Exercises 1. Why are living organisms classified 2. Why are the classification systems changing every now and then 3. What different criteria would you choose to classify people that you meet often for? What do we learn from identification of individuals and populations 5. Given below is the scientific name of mango. Identify the correctly written name, Mangifera indica Mangifera indica 6. Define a taxon. Give some examples of taxa at different hierarchical levels 7. Can you identify the correct sequence of taxonomical categories A species order phylum kingdom B genus species order kingdom C species genus order phylum 8. Try to collect all the currently accepted meanings for the word species. Discuss with your teacher the meaning of species in case of higher plants and animals on one hand, and bacteria on the other hand. 9. Define and understand the following terms. I phylum 2 class 3 family I've order V genus 10. How is a key helpful in the identification and classification of an organism? 11. Illustrate the taxonomical hierarchy with suitable examples of a plant and an animal. 2018 1. 16. Biology Since the dawn of civilization, there have been many attempts to classify living organisms. It was done instinctively not using criteria that were scientific but born out of a need to use organisms for our own use, for food, shelter and clothing. Aristotle was the earliest to attempt a more scientific basis for classification. He used simple morphological characters to classify plants into trees, shrubs and herbs. He also divided animals into two groups, those which had red blood and those that did not. In Linnaeus' time a two-kingdom system of classification with planty and animalia kingdoms was developed that included all plants and animals respectively. This system did not distinguish between the eukaryotes and prokaryotes, unicellular and multicellular organisms and photosynthetic green algae and non-photosynthetic fungi organisms. Classification of organisms into plants and animals was easily done and was easy to understand, but, a large number of organisms did not fall into either category. Hence the two kingdom classification used for a long time was found inadequate. Besides, Gross morphology a need was also felt for including other characteristics like cell structure, nature of wall, mode of nutrition, habitat, methods of reproduction, evolutionary relationships, etc. Classification systems for the living organisms have hence, undergone several changes over the time. Though plant and animal kingdoms have been a constant under all different systems. 
The understanding of what groups organisms be included under these kingdoms have been changing. The number and nature of other kingdoms have also been understood differently by different scientists over the time. Biological Classification Chapter 2 2.1 Kingdom Minera 2.2 Kingdom Protista 2.3 Kingdom Fungi 2.4 Kingdom Planetae 2.5 Kingdom Animalia 2.6 Viruses Viroids and Lichens R.H. Whitaker 1969 proposed a five-kingdom classification. The kingdoms defined by him were named Manera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae and Animalia. The main criteria for classification used by him include cell structure, body organization, mode of nutrition, reproduction and phylogenetic relationships. Table 2.1 gives a comparative account of different characteristics of the five kingdoms. The three-domain system has also been proposed that divides the kingdom Manera into two domains leaving the remaining eukaryotic kingdoms in the third domain and thereby a six-kingdom classification. You will learn about this system in detail at higher classes. Let us look at this five-kingdom classification to understand the issues and considerations that influence the classification system. Earlier classification systems included bacteria, blue-green algae, fungi, mosses, ferns, gymnosperms and the angiosperms under plants. The character that unified this whole kingdom was that all the organisms included had a cell wall in their cells. This placed together groups which widely differed in other characteristics. It brought together the prokaryotic bacteria and the blue-green algae cyanobacteria with other groups which were eukaryotic. It also grouped together the unicellular organisms and the multicellular ones, say, for example, Chlamydomonas and Spirogyra were placed together under algae. The classification did not differentiate between the heterotrophic group, fungi, and the autotrophic green plants. Though they also showed a characteristic difference in their walls composition the fungi had chitin five kingdoms character cell type cell wall nuclear membrane body organization mode of nutrition manure prokaryotic non-cellulosic polysaccharide, amino acid absent cellular autotrophic chemosynthetic and photosynthetic and heterotrophic saprophytic podocytic protista eukaryotic present in some present cellular autotrophic photosynthetic and heterotrophic fungi, eukaryotic present without cellulose with chitin present multicellular loose tissue heterotrophic saprophytic parasitic plantae eukaryotic present cellulose present tissue organ autotrophic photosynthetic animalia eukaryotic absent present tissue organ organ system heterotrophic holozoic saprophytic etc. Table 2.1 Characteristics of the Five Kingdoms In their walls while the green plants had a cellulosic cell wall, when such characteristics were considered, the fungi were placed in a separate kingdom, Kingdom Fungi. All prokaryotic organisms were grouped together under Kingdom Manera and the unicellular eukaryotic organisms were placed in Kingdom Protista. Kingdom Protista has brought together Chlamydomonas, Chlorella earlier placed in algae within plants and both having cell walls with Paramosium and Amoeba which were earlier placed in the animal kingdom which lack cell wall. It has put together organisms which, in earlier classifications, were placed in different kingdoms. This happened because the criteria for classification changed. This kind of changes will take place in future too depending on the improvement in our understanding of characteristics and evolutionary relationships. Over time, an attempt has been made to evolve a classification system which reflects not only the morphological, physiological and reproductive similarities, but is also phylogenetic, that is, is based on evolutionary relationships. In this chapter we will study characteristics of kingdoms Manera, Protista and Fungi of the Whitaker system of classification. The kingdoms Plantae and Animalia, commonly referred to as plant and animal kingdoms, respectively, will be dealt separately in chapters 3 and 4. Sporoflagellum coxi bacilli spirilla vibrio figure 2.1 bacteria of different shapes 2.1 kingdom manure bacteria are the sole members of the kingdom manure. They are the most abundant microorganisms. Bacteria occur almost everywhere. Hundreds of bacteria are present in a handful of soil. They also live in extreme habitats such as hot springs, deserts, snow and deep oceans where very few other life forms can survive. Many of them live in or on other organisms as parasites. Bacteria are grouped under four categories based on their shape, the spherical coccus pl, cocci, the rod-shaped bacillus pl, bacilli, the comma-shaped vibrium pl, vibrio and the spiral spirillum pl, spirilla figure 2.1. Though the bacterial structure is very simple, they are very complex in behavior. Compared to many other organisms, bacteria as a group show the most extensive metabolic diversity. Some of the bacteria are autotrophic, that is, they synthesize their own food from inorganic substrates. They may be photosynthetic autotrophic or chemosynthetic autotrophic. The vast majority of bacteria are heterotrophs, that is, they depend on other organisms or on dead organic matter for food. 
2, 1, 1 Archibacteria These bacteria are special since they live in some of the most harsh habitats such as extreme salty areas halophiles. Hot springs thermoacidophiles and marshy areas methanogens. Archibacteria differ from other bacteria in having a different cell wall structure and this feature is responsible for their survival in extreme conditions. Methanogens are present in the gut of several ruminant animals such as cows and buffaloes and they are responsible for the production of methane biogas from the dung of these animals. Figure 2.2 A filamentous blue-green algae, Nostoc 2, 1, 2 U bacteria There are thousands of different U bacteria or true bacteria. They are characterized by the presence of a rigid cell wall, and if modal, a flagellum. The cyanobacteria also referred to as blue-green algae have chlorophylla similar to green plants and are photosynthetic autotrophs figure 2.2. The cyanobacteria are unicellular, colonial or filamentous, freshwater marine or terrestrial algae. The colonies are generally surrounded by gelatinous sheath. They often form blooms in polluted water bodies. Some of these organisms can fix atmospheric nitrogen in specialized cells called heterocysts, e.g., Nostoc and Anabina. Chemosynthetic autotrophic bacteria oxidize various inorganic substances such as nitrates, nitrites and ammonia and use the released energy for their ADP production. They play a great role in recycling nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, iron and sulfur. Heterotrophic bacteria are most abundant in nature. The majority are important decomposers. Many of them have a significant impact on human affairs. They are helpful in making curd from milk. Production of antibiotics, fixing nitrogen in legume, roots, etc. Some are pathogens causing damage to human beings, crops, farm animals and pets. Cholera, typhoid, tetanus, citrus canker are well-known diseases caused by different bacteria. Bacteria reproduce mainly by fish in figure 2.3. Sometimes, under unfavorable conditions, they produce spores. They also reproduce by a sort of sexual reproduction by adopting a primitive type of DNA transfer from one bacterium to the other. The mycoplasma are organisms that completely lack a cell wall. They are the smallest living cells known and can survive without oxygen. Many mycoplasma are pathogenic in animals and plants 2.2 Kingdom Protista All single-celled eukaryotes are placed under Protista, but the boundaries of this kingdom are not well defined. What may be a photosynthetic protistin to one biologist may be a plant to another. In this book we include chrysophytes, dinoflagellates, euglenoids, slime moles and protozoans under Protista. Members of Protista are primarily aquatic. This kingdom forms a link with the others dealing with plants, animals and fungi. Being eukaryotes, the protistin cell body contains a well-defined nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. Some have flagella or cilia. Protists reproduce asexually and sexually by a process involving cell fusion and zygote formation. 2. 2. 1. Chrysophytes This group includes diadoms and golden algae desmids. They are found in fresh water as well as in marine environments. They are microscopic and float passively in water currents plankton. Most of them are photosynthetic. In diadoms the cell walls form two thin overlapping shells, which fit together as in a soap box. The walls are embedded with silica and thus the walls are indestructible. Thus, diadoms have left behind large amount of cell wall deposits in their habitat. This accumulation over billions of years is referred to as diatomaceous earth. Being gritty this soil is used in polishing, filtration of oils and syrups. Diadoms are the chief producers in the oceans. Figure 2.3 A Dividing Bacterium 2. 2. To dinoflagellates these organisms are mostly marine and photosynthetic. They appear yellow, green, brown, blue or red depending on the main pigments present in their cells. The cell wall has stiff cellulose plates on the outer surface. Most of them have two flagella. One lies longitudinally and the other transversely in a furrow between the wall plates. Very often, red dinoflagellates example, Ganyaldax undergo such rapid multiplication that they make the sea appear red red tides. Toxins released by such large numbers may even kill other marine animals such as fishes too. 2. 3. Euglenoids Majority of them are freshwater organisms found in stagnant water. Instead of a cell wall, they have a protein-rich layer called pellicle which makes their body flexible. They have two flagella, a short and a long one, though they are photosynthetic in the presence of sunlight. When deprived of sunlight they behave like heterotrophs by predating on other smaller organisms. Interestingly, the pigments of euglenoids are identical to those present in higher plants. Example, euglena figure 2.4a. 2, 2, 4 slime moles. Slime moles are saprophytic protists. The body moves along decaying twigs and leaves engulfing organic material. Under suitable conditions, they form an aggregation called plasmodium which may grow and spread over several feet. During unfavorable conditions, the plasmodium differentiates and forms fruiting bodies bearing spores at their tips. 
The spores possess true walls. They are extremely resistant and survive for many years, even under adverse conditions. The spores are dispersed by air currents too. 2. 5 protozoans All protozoans are heterotrophs and live as predators or parasites. They are believed to be primitive relatives of animals. There are four major groups of protozoans. Amoeboid protozoans. These organisms live in fresh water, seawater or moist soil. They move and capture figure 2.4 Adinoflagellates B. Euglena C. Slime all D. Paramosium D. C. B. Their prey by potting out pseudopodia false fetus in amoeba. Marine forms have silica shells on their surface. Some of them such as entamoeba are parasites, flagellated protozoans, the members of this group are either free-living or parasitic. They have flagella, the parasitic forms cause diaseases such as sleeping sickness, example, trypanosoma. Ciliated protozoans, these are aquatic, actively moving organisms because of the presence of thousands of cilia. They have a cavity gullet that opens to the outside of the cell surface, the coordinated movement of rows of cilia causes the water laden with food to be steered into the gullet. Example, Paramosium figure 2.4b, sporozoans, this includes diverse organisms that have an infectious spore-like stage in their life cycle. The most notorious is Plasmodium malarial parasite which causes malaria, a disease which has a staggering effect on human population. 2.3 Kingdom Fungi The fungi constitute a unique kingdom of heterotrophic organisms, they show a great diversity in morphology and habitat. You must have seen fungi on a moist bread and rotten fruits. The common mushroom you eat and toadstools are also fungi. White spots seen on mustard leaves are due to a parasitic fungus. Some unicellular fungi, e.g., yeast are used to make bread and beer. Other fungi cause diseases in plants and animals. Wheat rust causing puccinia is an important example. Some are the source of antibiotics, e.g., penicillium. Fungi are cosmopolitan and occur in air, water, soil and on animals and plants. They prefer to grow in warm and humid places. Have you ever wondered why we keep food in the refrigerator? Yes, it is to prevent food from going bad due to bacterial or fungal infections. With the exception of yeasts which are unicellular, fungi are filamentous. Their bodies consist of long, slender thread-like structures called hyphae. The network of hyphae is known as mycelium. Some hyphae are continuous tubes filled with multinucleated cytoplasm. These are called conocytic hyphae. Others have septae or cross walls in their hyphae. The cell walls of fungi are composed of chitin and polysaccharides. Most fungi are heterotrophic and absorb soluble organic matter from dead substrates and hence are called saprophytes. Those that depend on living plants and animals are called parasites. They can also live as symbionts, in association with algae as lichens and with roots of higher plants as mycorrhiza. Reproduction in fungi can take place by vegetative means fragmentation, fission and budding. Asexual reproduction is by spores called canidia or sporangulospores or zoospores, and sexual reproduction is by oospores, ascospores and basidiospores. The various spores are produced in distinct structures called fruiting bodies. The sexual cycle involves the following three steps. I fusion of protoplasms between two modal or non-modal gametes called plasmogamy. Two fusion of two nuclei called karyogamy. Three meiosis and zygote resulting in haploid spores. When a fungus reproduces sexually, two haploid hyphae of compatible mating types come together and fuse. In some fungi the fusion of two haploid cells immediately results in diploid cells 2N. However, in other fungi ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. An intervening dicaryotic stage NN, that is, two nuclei per cell occurs. Such a condition is called a dicaryon and the phase is called a karyophase of fungus. Later, the parental nuclei fuse and the cells become diploid. The fungi form fruiting bodies in which reduction division occurs, leading to formation of haploid spores. The morphology of the mycelium Mode of spore formation and fruiting bodies form the basis for the division of the kingdom into various classes. 2. 3. 1. Phycomycetes Members of phycomycetes are found in aquatic habitats and on decay in wood and moist and damp places or as obligate parasites on plants. The mycelium is aseptid and coenocytic. Asexual reproduction takes place by zoospores modal or by a planospores non-modal. These spores are endogenously produced in sporangium, as igospore is formed by fusion of two gametes. These gametes are similar in morphology isogamous or dissimilar on isogamous or oogamous. Some common examples are Mucor figure 2.5a, Rhizopus the bread mold mentioned earlier and Albugo the parasitic fungi on mustard. 2, 3, 2 Ascomycetes commonly known as sac fungi. The Ascomycetes are mostly multicellular, e.g., penicillium, or rarely unicellular, e.g., yeast saccharomyces. They are saprophytic, decomposers, parasitic or caprophilus growing on dung, mycelium figure 2.5 fungi, a mucor b aspergillus c agaricus c a b is branched in septate, 
The asexual spores are canidia produced exogenously on the special mycelium called canidia spores. Canidia on germination produce mycelium. Sexual spores are called ascospores which are produced endogenously in sac like ASI singular ascus. These ASI are arranged in different types of fruiting bodies called ascocarps. Some examples are Aspergillus figure 2.5b, Claviceps and Neurospora. Neurospora is used extensively in biochemical and genetic work. Many members like morels and truffles are edible and are considered delicacies. 2, 3, 3 Basidia mycetes Commonly known forms of Basidia mycetes are mushrooms, bracket fungi or puffballs. They grow in soil, on logs and tree stumps and in living plant bodies as parasites, e.g., rusts and smuts. The mycelium is branched and septate. The asexual spores are generally not found, but vegetative reproduction by fragmentation is common. The sex organs are absent, but plasmogamy is brought about by fusion of two vegetative or somatic cells of different strains or genotypes. The resultant structure is dicaryotic which ultimately gives rise to basidium. Karyogamy and meiosis take place in the basidium producing four basidia spores. The basidia spores are exogenously produced on the basidium pl. Basidia. The basidia are arranged in fruiting bodies called basidia carps. Some common members are agaricus mushroom figure 2.5c, ustilago smut and puccinia rust fungus. 2, 3, 4 deuteromycetes commonly known as imperfect fungi because only the asexual or vegetative phases of these fungi are known. When the sexual forms of these fungi were discovered they were moved into classes they rightly belong to. It is also possible that the asexual and vegetative stage have been given one name and placed under Deuteromycetes and the sexual stage another and placed under another class. Later when the linkages were established, the fungi were correctly identified and moved out of Deuteromycetes. Once perfect sexual stages of members of Deuteromycetes were discovered they were often moved to Ascomycetes and Basidiomycetes. The Deuteromycetes reproduce only by asexual spores known as Canidia. The mycelium is septate and branched. Some members are saprophytes or parasites while a large number of them are decomposers of litter and help in mineral cycling. Some examples are Alternaria, Colotopricum and Trichoderma. 2.4 Kingdom Planty Kingdom Planty includes all eukaryotic chlorophyll containing organisms commonly called plants. A few members are partially heterotrophic such as the insectivorous plants or parasites. Bladderwort and Venus flytrap are examples of insectivorous plants and cascuta is a parasite. The plant cells have a eukaryotic structure with prominent chloroplasts and cell wall mainly made of cellulose. You will study the eukaryotic cell structure in detail in Chapter 8. Planty includes algae, bryophytes, pteridophytes, gymnosperms and angiosperms. Life cycle of plants has two distinct phases, the diploid sporophytic and the haploid gametophytic, that alternate with each other. The lengths of the haploid and diploid phases, and whether these phases are free living or dependent on others, vary among different groups in plants. This phenomenon is called alternation of generation. You will study further details of this kingdom in Chapter 3. 2.5 Kingdom and Amelia This kingdom is characterized by heterotrophic eukaryotic organisms that are multicellular and their cells lack cell walls. They directly or indirectly depend on plants for food. They digest their food in an internal cavity and store food reserves as glycogen or fat. Their mode of nutrition is holozoic by ingestion of food. They follow a definite growth pattern and grow into adults that have a definite shape and size. Higher forms show elaborate sensory and neuromotor mechanism. Most of them are capable of locomotion. The sexual reproduction is by copulation of male and female followed by embryological development. Salient features of various phyla are described in Chapter 4, 2.6 Viruses, Viroids, Prions and Lichens in the Five Kingdom classification of Whitaker there is no mention of lichens in some acellular organisms like viruses, viroids and prions. These are briefly introduced here. All of us who have suffered the ill effects of common cold or flu know what effects viruses can have on us, even if we do not associate it with our condition. Viruses did not find a place in classification since they are not considered truly living, if we understand living as those organisms that have a cell structure. The viruses are non-cellular organisms that are characterized by having an inert crystalline structure outside the living cell. 26 Biology Once they infect a cell they take over the machinery of the host cell to replicate themselves, killing the host. Would you call viruses living or non-living the name virus that means venom or poisonous fluid was given by Pasteur? D.J. Ivanowski 1892 recognized certain microbes as causal organism of the mosaic disease of tobacco figure 2.6a. These were found to be smaller than bacteria because they passed through bacteria-proof filters, M.W. B. 
Jarunek 1898 demonstrated that the extracts of the infected plants of tobacco could cause infection in healthy plants and called the fluidus contagium vivum fluidum infectious living fluid. W. M. Stanley 1935 showed that viruses could be crystallized and crystals consist largely of proteins. They are inert outside their specific host cell. Viruses are obligate parasites, in addition to proteins. Viruses also contain genetic material, that could be either RNA or DNA. No virus contains both RNA and DNA. A virus is a nucleoprotein and the genetic material is infectious, in general. Viruses that infect plants have single-stranded RNA and viruses that infect animals have either single or double-stranded RNA or double-stranded DNA. Bacterial viruses or bacteriophages viruses that infect the bacteria are usually double-stranded DNA viruses figure 2.6b. The protein coat called capsid made of small subunits called capsomeres, protects the nucleic acid. These capsomeres are arranged in helical or polyhedral geometric forms. Viruses cause diseases like mumps, smallpox, herpes and influenza. AIDS in humans is also caused by a virus. In plants, the symptoms can be mosaic formation, leaf rolling and curling, yellowing and vein clearing, dwarfing and stunted growth. RNA capsid a sheath head tail fibers collar B figure 2.6 a tobacco mosaic virus TMVB bacteriophage. Summary Biological classification of plants and animals was first proposed by Aristotle on the basis of simple morphological characters. Linnaeus later classified all living organisms into two kingdoms, Plantae and Animalia. Whitaker proposed an elaborate five-kingdom classification Manera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae and Animalia. The main criteria of the five-kingdom classification were cell structure, body organization, mode of nutrition and reproduction, and phylogenetic relationships. In the Five Kingdom classification, bacteria are included in Kingdom Manera, bacteria are cosmopolitan in distribution. These organisms show the most extensive metabolic diversity, bacteria may be autotrophic or heterotrophic in their mode of nutrition. Kingdom Protista includes all single-celled eukaryotes such as chrysophytes, dinoflagellates, euglenoids, slime molds and protozoans. Protists have defined nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles, they reproduce both asexually and sexually. Members of kingdom fungi show a great diversity in structures and habitat. Most fungi are saprophytic in their mode of nutrition. They show asexual and sexual reproduction. Phycomycetes, Ascomycetes, Basidiomycetes and Deuteromycetes are the four classes under this kingdom. The plantae includes all eukaryotic chlorophyll-containing organisms. Algae, bryophytes, pteridophytes, gymnosperms and angiosperms are included in this group. The life cycle of plants exhibit alternation of generations, gametophytic and sporophytic generations. The heterotrophic eukaryotic, multicellular organisms lacking a cell wall are included in the kingdom Animalia. The mode of nutrition of these organisms is holozoic, they reproduce mostly by the sexual mode. Some acellular organisms like viruses and viroids as well as the lichens are not included in the five kingdom system of classification. Viroids. In 1971, T.O. Diener discovered a new infectious agent that was smaller than viruses and caused potato spindle tuber disease. It was found to be a free RNA, it lacked the protein coat that is found in viruses, hence the name viroid. The RNA of the viroid was of low molecular weight, prions. In modern medicine certain infections neurological diseases were found to be transmitted by an agent consisted of abnormally folded protein. The agent was similar in size to viruses. These agents were called prions. The most notable diseases caused by prions are bovine spongiform encephalopathy BSE commonly called mad cow disease in cattle and its analogous variant CR Jacob disease CJD in humans. Lichens. Lichens are symbiotic associations that is mutually useful associations between algae and fungi. The algal component is known as phycobiont and fungal component is mycobiont, which are autotrophic and heterotrophic, respectively. Algae prepare food for fungi and fungi provide shelter and absorb mineral nutrients and water for its partner. So close is their association that if one saw a lichen in nature one would never imagine that they had two different organisms within them. Lichens are very good pollution indicators they do not grow in polluted areas. Exercises 1. Discuss how classification systems have undergone several changes over a period of time too. State two economically important uses of a heterotrophic bacteria the Archaebacteria 3. What is the nature of cell walls and diadoms 4? Find out what do the terms algal bloom and red tide signify 5. How are viroids different from viruses 6? Describe briefly the four major groups of protozoa 7. Plants are autotrophic. Can you think of some plants that are partially heterotrophic 8? 
What do the terms Fecobiant and Mycobiant signify? 9. Give a comparative account of the classes of kingdom fungi under the following. I mode of nutrition 2 mode of reproduction 10. What are the characteristic features of euglenoids 11? Give a brief account of viruses with respect to their structure and nature of genetic material. Also name four common viral diseases 12. Organize a discussion in your class on the topic. Are viruses living or non-living? 2018-1 Plant Kingdom 29 In the previous chapter, we looked at the broad classification of living organisms under the system proposed by Whitaker 1969 wherein he suggested the five kingdom classification viz. Manera, Protista, Fungi, Animalia and Planty. In this chapter, we will deal in detail with further classification within Kingdom Planty popularly known as the Plant Kingdom. We must stress here that our understanding of the Plant Kingdom has changed over time. Fungi, and members of the Manera and Protista having cell walls have now been excluded from Planty though earlier classifications placed them in the same kingdom. So, the cyanobacteria that are also referred to as blue-green algae are not algae anymore. In this chapter, we will describe algae, bryophytes, pteridophytes, gymnosperms and angiosperms under Planty. Let us also look at classification within angiosperms to understand some of the concerns that influence the classification systems. The earliest systems of classification used only gross superficial morphological characters such as habit, color, number and shape of leaves, etc. They were based mainly on vegetative characters or on the Andrician structure system given by Linnaeus. Such systems were artificial, they separated the closely related species since they were based on a few characteristics. Also, the artificial systems gave equal weightage to vegetative and sexual characteristics. This is not acceptable since we know that often the vegetative characters are more easily affected by environment. As against this, natural classification systems developed, which were based on natural affinities among the organisms and consider. Plant Kingdom Chapter 3 3.1 Algae 3.2 Bryophytes 3.3 Teridophytes 3.4 Gymnosperms 3.5 Angiosperms 3.6 Plant Life Cycles and Alternation of Generations not only the external features, but also internal features, like ultrastructure, anatomy, embryology and phytochemistry. Such a classification for flower and plants was given by George Bentham and Joseph Dalton Hooker. At present phylogenetic classification systems based on evolutionary relationships between the various organisms are acceptable. This assumes that organisms belonging to the same taxa have a common ancestor. We now use information from many other sources too to help resolve difficulties in classification. These become more important when there is no supporting fossil evidence. Numerical taxonomy which is now easily carried out using computers is based on all observable characteristics. Number and codes are assigned to all the characters and the data are then processed. In this way each character is given equal importance and at the same time hundreds of characters can be considered. Cytotaxonomy that is based on cytological information like chromosome number, structure, behavior and chemotaxonomy that uses the chemical constituents of the plant to resolve confusions, are also used by taxonomists these days. 3.1 Algae Algae are chlorophyll-bearing, simple, phalloid, autotrophic and largely aquatic both freshwater and marine organisms. They occur in a variety of other habitats, moist stones, soils and wood. Some of them also occur in association with fungi lichen and animals e.g., onslaught bear. The form and size of algae is highly variable, ranging from colonial forms like Volvox and the filamentous forms like Ulothrix and Spiragyra figure 3.1. A few of the marine forms such as kelps, form massive plant bodies. The algae reproduce by vegetative, asexual and sexual methods. Vegetative reproduction is by fragmentation. Each fragment develops into a thallus. Asexual reproduction is by the production of different types of spores, the most common being the zoospores. They are flagellated modal and on germination gives rise to new plants. Sexual reproduction takes place through fusion of two gametes. These gametes can be flagellated and similar in size as an ulothrix or non-flagellated non-modal but similar in size as in spirogyra. Such reproduction is called isogamous. Fusion of two gametes to similar in size, as in species of Eudorina is termed as an isogamous. Fusion between one large, non-modal static female gamete and a smaller, modal male gamete is termed oogamous, e.g. Volvox, Fucus. Plant Kingdom 31 Figure 3.1 Algae, a green algae I Volvox 2 Ulithrix B Brown Algae I Laminaria 2 Fucus 3 Dictyota C Red Algae I Porphyra 2 Polysiphonia. Algae are useful to man in a variety of ways. At least a half of the total carbon dioxide fixation on Earth is carried out by algae through photosynthesis. Being photosynthetic they increase the level of dissolved oxygen in their immediate environment. They are of paramount importance as primary producers of energy-rich compounds which form the basis of the food cycles of all aquatic animals. 
Many species of Porphyra, Limonaria and Sargassum are among the 70 species of marine algae used as food. Certain marine brown and red algae produce large amounts of hydrocolloids water-holding substances, e.g., algin brown algae and carrageen red algae which are used commercially. Agar, one of the commercial products obtained from Gelidium and Gracilaria are used to grow microbes and in preparations of ice creams and jellies. Chlorella unicellular alga rich in proteins is used as food supplement even by space travelers. The algae are divided into three main classes, chlorophyceae, Theophyceae and Rhodophyceae 3, 1, 1 Chlorophyceae The members of Chlorophyceae are commonly called green algae. The plant body may be unicellular, colonial or filamentous. They are usually grass green due to the dominance of pigments chlorophylla and B. The pigments are localized in definite chloroplasts. The chloroplasts may be discoid, plate-like, reticulate, cup-shaped, spiral or even shaped in different species. Most of the members have one or more storage bodies called pyrenoids located in the chloroplasts. Pyrenoids contain protein besides starch. Some algae may store food in the form of oil droplets. Green algae usually have a rigid cell wall made of an inner layer of cellulose and an outer layer of pectose. Vegetative reproduction usually takes place by fragmentation or by formation of different types of spores. Asexual reproduction is by flagellated zoospores produced in zoosporangia. The sexual reproduction shows considerable variation in the type and formation of sex cells and it may be isogamous, anisogamous or oogamous. Some commonly found green algae are Clematomonas, Volvox, Ulithrix, Spirogyra and Charter Figure 3.1a. 3. 1. 2. Theophyceae The members of Theophyceae or brown algae are found primarily in marine habitats. They show great variation in size and form. They range from simple branched, filamentous forms ectocarpus to profusely branched forms as represented by kelps, which may reach a height of 100 meters. They possess chlorophyll A, C, carotenoids and xanthophylls. They vary in color from olive green to various shades of brown depending upon the amount of the xanthophyll pigment. Fucoxanthin present in them. Food is stored as complex carbohydrates, which may be in the form of laminarin or manadol. The vegetative cells have a cellulosic wall usually covered on the outside by a gelatinous coating of algin. The protoplast contains, in addition to plastids, a centrally located vacuole and nucleus. The plant body is usually attached to the substratum by a holdfast, and has a stalk, the stipend leaf-like photosynthetic organ, the frond. Vegetative reproduction takes place by fragmentation. Asexual reproduction in most brown algae is by biflagellate zoospores that are pear-shaped and have two unequal laterally attached flagella. Sexual reproduction may be isogamous, anisogamous or oogamous. Union of gametes may take place in water or within the oogonium oogamous species. The gametes are piriform pear-shaped and bear two laterally attached flagella. The common forms are ectocarpus, dictyota, limonaria, sargassum and fucus figure 3.1b. 3. 1. 3. Rhodophyceae The members of Rhodophyceae are commonly called red algae because of the predominance of the red pigment, R. phycoerythrin in their body. Majority of the red algae are marine with greater concentrations found in the warmer areas. They occur in both well-lighted regions close to the surface of water and also at great depths in oceans where relatively little light penetrates. The red valley of most of the red algae are multicellular. Some of them have complex body organization. The food is stored as Floridian starch which is very similar to amylopectin and glycogen in structure. The red algae usually reproduce vegetatively by fragmentation. They reproduce asexually by non-modal spores and sexually by non-modal table 3.1 divisions of algae and their main characteristics class is common major stored cell wall flagellar habitat name pigments food number and position of insertions. Chlorophyceae green chlorophyll starch cellulose 28. Equal, freshwater, algae A, B apical brackish water, saltwater theophyceae brown chlorophyll manadol. Cellulose 2, unequal, freshwater algae A, C, laminarin and algin lateral rear brackish fucoxanthin water. Saltwater rhodophyceae red chlorophyll floridian cellulose, absent freshwater algae A, D, starched pectin and some. Phycoerythrin poly brackish sulfate water, salt esters water most. Gametes. Sexual reproduction is oogamous and accompanied by complex post-fertilization developments. The common members are Polysophonia, Porphyra figure 3.1c, Gracilaria and Gelidium 3.2 Bryophytes Bryophytes include the various mosses and liverworts that are found commonly growing in moist shaded areas in the hills figure 3.2. Archegonia 4 or BCD Anthoridia 4 capsule and theridial branch branches Archegonial branch seed sporified gametophyte leaves main axis rhizoids gemacup rhizoids gemacup rhizoids figure 3.2 bryophytes a liverwort Marcantia a female phallus female phallus mosses C funaria 
gametophyte and sporophyte desphagnum gametophyte. Bryophytes are also called amphibians of the plant kingdom because these plants can live in soil but are dependent on water for sexual reproduction. They usually occur in damp, humid and shaded localities. They play an important role in plant succession on bare rock soil. The plant body of bryophytes is more differentiated than that of algae. It is thallus-like and prostrate or erect, and attached to the substratum by unicellular or multicellular rhizoids. They lack true roots, stem or leaves. They may possess root-like, leaf-like or stem-like structures. The main plant body of the bryophyte is haploid. It produces gametes, hence is called a gametophyte. The sex organs in bryophytes are multicellular. The male sex organ is called antheridium. They produce biflagellate antherozoans. The female sex organ called archegonium is flask-shaped and produces a single egg. The antherozoids are released into water where they come in contact with archegonium. An antherozoid fuses with the egg to produce the zygote. Zygotes do not undergo reduction division immediately. They produce a multicellular body called a sporophyte. The sporophyte is not free-living but attached to the photosynthetic gametophyte and derives nourishment from it. Some cells of the sporophyte undergo reduction division meiosis to produce haploid spores. These spores germinate to produce gametophyte. Bryophytes in general are of little economic importance but some mosses provide food for herbaceous mammals, birds and other animals. Species of sphagnum, a moss, provide peat that have long been used as fuel, and as packing material for transshipment of living material because of their capacity to hold water. Mosses along with lichens are the first organisms to colonize rocks and hence, are of great ecological importance. They decompose rocks making the substrate suitable for the growth of higher plants. Since mosses form dense mats on the soil, they reduce the impact of falling rain and prevent soil erosion. The bryophytes are divided into liverworts and mosses 3, 2, 1 liverworts. The liverworts grow usually in moist, shady habitats such as banks of streams, marshy ground, damp soil, bark of trees and deep in the woods. The plant body of a liverwort is thalloid, e.g., marcantia. The thallus is dorsoventral and closely oppressed to the substrate. The leafy members have tiny leaf-like appendages and two rows on the stem-like structures. Asexual reproduction in liverworts takes place by fragmentation of thalli, or by the formation of specialized structures called gemmy sing. Gemma. Gemmy are green, multicellular, asexual buds, which develop in small receptacles called gemma cups located on the thalli. The gemmy become detached from the parent body and germinate to form new individuals, during sexual reproduction. Male and female sex. Organs are produced either on the same or on different thalli. The sporophyte is differentiated into a foot, seta and capsule. After meiosis, spores are produced within the capsule. These spores germinate to form free-living gametophytes. 3. 2. 2 moss is the predominant stage of the life cycle of a moss is the gametophyte which consists of two stages. The first stage is the protonema stage, which develops directly from a spore. It is a creeping, green, branched and frequently filamentous stage. The second stage is the leafy stage, which develops from the secondary protonema as a lateral bud. They consist of upright, slender axes bearing spirally arranged leaves. They are attached to the soil through multicellular and branched rhizoids. This stage bears the sex organs. Vegetative reproduction in mosses is by fragmentation and budding in the secondary protonema. In sexual reproduction, the sex organs antheridia and archegonia are produced at the apex of the leafy shoots. After fertilization, the zygote develops into a sporophyte, consisting of a foot, seta and capsule. The sporophyte in mosses is more elaborate than that in liverworts. The capsule contains spores. Spores are formed after meiosis. The mosses have an elaborate mechanism of spore dispersal. Common examples of mosses are funaria, polytrichum and sphagnum figure 3.2. 3.3 Turidophytes The turidophytes include horsetails and ferns. Turidophytes are used for medicinal purposes and as soil binders. They are also frequently grown as ornamentals. Evolutionarily, they are the first terrestrial plants to possess vascular tissues, xylem and phloem. You shall study more about these tissues in Chapter 6. The turidophytes are found in cool, damp, shady places though some may flourish well in sandy soil conditions. You may recall that in bryophytes the dominant phase in the life cycle is the gametophytic plant body. However, in turidophytes, the main plant body is a sporophyte which is differentiated into true root, stem and leaves figure 3.3. These organs possess well-differentiated vascular tissues. The leaves in pteridophyta are small microphylls as in selaginella or large macrophylls as in ferns. The sporophytes bear sporangia that are subtended by leaf-like appendages called sporophylls. In some cases sporophylls may form distinct compact structures called strobili or cone selaginella, equisetum. 
The sporangia produce spores by meiosis in spore mother cells. The spores germinate to give rise to inconspicuous, small but multicellular. Plant Kingdom 37 Figure 3.3 Geridophytes, a Selaginella B. equicetum C. fern D. salvinius trobilus node internode branch rhizome B. C. D. Free living, mostly photosynthetic thalloid gametophytes called prothallus. These gametophytes require cool, damp, shady places to grow. Because of this specific restricted requirement and the need for water for fertilization, the spread of living geridophytes is limited and restricted to narrow geographical regions. The gametophytes bear male and female sex organs called antheridia and archegonia, respectively. Water is required for transfer of antherozoids, the male gametes released from the antheridia, to the mouth of archegonium. Fusion of male gamete with the egg present in the archegonium result in the formation of zygote. Zygote thereafter produces a multicellular well-differentiated sporophyte which is the dominant phase of the pteridophytes. In majority of the pteridophytes all the spores are of similar kinds. Such plants are called homosporos. General like Selaginella and Salvinia which produce two kinds of spores, macro-large and micro-small spores, are known as heterosporos. The megaspores and microspores germinate and give rise to female and male gametophytes, respectively. The female gametophytes in these plants are retained on the parent sporophytes for variable periods. The development of the zygotes into young embryos take place within the female gametophytes. This event is a precursor to the seed habit considered an important step in evolution. The pteridophytes are further classified into four classes, Solopsidus illidum, Lycopsidus elaginella, Lycopodium, Spinopsida equicetum and Teropsida dryopterus, Teres, Ediantum. 3.4 Gymnosperms The gymnosperms gymnus, naked, sperma, seeds are plants in which the ovules are not enclosed by any ovary wall and remain exposed, both before and after fertilization. The seeds that develop post-fertilization, are not covered, that is, are naked. Gymnosperms include medium-sized trees or tall trees and shrubs figure 3.4. One of the gymnosperms, the giant redwood tree sequoia is one of the tallest tree species, the roots are generally tap roots. Roots in some genera have fungal association in the form of Mycorrhiza pinus, while in some other cycas small specialized roots called corolloi roots are associated with N2-fixing cyanobacteria. The stems are unbranched cycas or branched pinus, cedrus. The leaves may be simple or compound. In cycas the pinnate leaves persist for a few years. The leaves in gymnosperms are well adapted to withstand extremes of temperature, humidity and wind. In conifers, the needle-like leaves reduce the surface area. Their thick cuticle and sunken stomata also help to reduce water loss. The gymnosperms are heterosporous. They produce haploid microspores and megaspores. The two kinds of spores are produced within sporangia that are born on sporophylls which are arranged spirally along an axis to form LAX or compact strobili or cones. The strobili bearing microsporophylls and microsporangia are called microsporangia or male strobili. The microspores develop into a male gametophytic generation which is highly reduced and is confined to only a limited number of cells. This reduced gametophyte is called a pollen grain. The development of pollen grains take place within the microsporangia. The cones bearing megasporophylls with ovules or megasporangia are called macrosporangia or female strobili. The male or female cones or strobili may be born on the same tree pinus. However, in cycas male cones and megasporophylls are born on different trees. The megaspore mother cell is differentiated from one of the cells of the nucellus. The nucellus is protected by envelopes and the composite structure is called an ovule. The ovules are born on megasporophylls which may be clustered to form the female cones. The megaspore mother cell divides meiotically to form four megaspores. One of the megaspores enclosed within the megasporangium develops into a multicellular female gametophyte that bears two or more archegonia or female sex organs. The multicellular female gametophyte is also retained within megasporangium, unlike bryophytes and pteridophytes. In gymnosperms the male and the female gametophytes do not have an independent free-living existence. They remain within the sporangia retained on the sporophytes. The pollen grain is released from the microsporangium. They are carried in air currents and come in contact with the opening of the ovules born on megasporophylls. The pollen tube carrying the male gametes grows towards archegonia in the ovules and discharge their contents near the mouth of the archegonia. Following fertilization, zygote develops into an embryo and the ovules into seeds. These seeds are not covered. See Figure 3.4 Gymnosperms, a cycas B. pinus C. ginkgo dwarf shoot long shoot seeds B. A. 3.5 Angiosperms Unlike the gymnosperms where the ovules are naked, in the angiosperms or flowering plants, the pollen grains and ovules are developed in specialized structures called flowers. 
In angiosperms, the seeds are enclosed in fruits. The angiosperms are an exceptionally large group of plants occurring in wide range of habitats. They range in size from the smallest wafia to tall trees of eucalyptus over 100 meters. They provide us with food, fodder, fuel, medicines and several other commercially important products. They are divided into two classes, the dicotyledons and the monocotyledons figure 3.5. The dicotyledons are characterized by seeds having two cotyledons, reticulate venations and leaves, and tetramerous or pentamerous flowers, that is, having four or five members in each floral whorls. The monocotyledons on the other hand are characterized by single cotyledonous seeds, parallel venation in leaves, and tremorous flowers having three members in each floral whorls. The male sex organ in a flower is the stamen. Each stamen consists of a slender filament with an anther at the tip. Within the anthers, the pollen mother cell divide by meiosis to produce microspores which matures into pollen grains. The female sex organ in a flower is the pistil. Pistil consists of an ovary at its base, a long slender style and stigma. Inside the ovary, ovules are present. Generally each ovule has a megaspore mother cell that undergoes meiosis to form four haploid megaspores. Three of them degenerate and one divide to form the embryo sac. Each embryo sac has a three-cell gag apparatus one egg cell and two synergids, three antipodal cells and two polar nuclei. The polar be a figure 3.5 angiosperms, a a dicotyledon be a monocotyledon. Figure 3.6 Life cycle of an angiosperm nuclei eventually fused to produce a diploid secondary nucleus. Pollen grain, after a dispersal from the anthers, are carried by wind or various other agencies to the stigma of a pistil. This is termed as pollination. The pollen grains germinate on the stigma and the resulting pollen tubes grow through the tissues of stigma and style and reach the ovule. The pollen tubes enter the embryo sac where two male gametes are discharged. One of the male gametes fuses with the XL syngamete to form a zygote. The other male gamete fuses with the diploid secondary nucleus to produce the triploid primary endosperm nucleus PEN. Because of the occurrence of two fusions that is, syngamy and triple fusion, this event is termed as double fertilization, an event unique to angiosperms. The zygote develops into an embryo with one or two cotyledons and the PEN develops into endosperm which provides nourishment to the developing embryo. The synergids and antipodal degenerate after fertilization. During these events the ovules develop into seeds and the ovaries develop into fruit. The life cycle of an angiosperm is shown in figure 3.6. 3.6 Plant life cycles and alternation of generations in plants. Both haploid and diploid cells can divide by mitosis. This ability leads to the formation of different plant bodies haploid and diploid. The haploid plant body produces gametes by mitosis. This plant body represents a gametophyte. Following fertilization the zygote also divides by mitosis to produce a diploid sporophytic plant body. Haploid spores are produced by this plant body by meiosis. These in turn, divide by mitosis to form a haploid plant body once again. Thus, during the life cycle of any sexually reproducing plant, there is an alternation of generations between gamete producing haploid gametophyte and spore producing diploid sporophyte. However, different plant groups, as well as individuals representing them, differ in the following patterns. 1. Sporophytic generation is represented only by the one-cell zygote. There are no free living sporophytes. Meiosis in the zygote results in the formation of haploid spores. The haploid spores divide metodically and form the gametophyte. The dominant, photosynthetic phase in such plants is the free living gametophyte. This kind of life cycle is termed as hoplontic. Many algae such as Volvox, Spirogyra and some species of Chlamydomonas represent this pattern figure 3.7a. 2. On the other extreme, is the type wherein the diploid sporophyte is the dominant, photosynthetic, independent phase of the plant. The gametophytic phase is represented by the single to few-celled haploid gametophyte. This kind of life cycle is termed as diplontic. An alga, Fucus sp, represents this pattern figure 3.7b. In addition, all seed-bearing plants that is, gymnosperms and angiosperms, follow this pattern with some variations, wherein, the gametophytic phase is few to multi-celled. 3. Bryophytes and pteridophytes, interestingly, exhibit an intermediate condition haplodiplontic, both phases are multicellular. However, they differ in their dominant phases. Syngamy zygote 2 and spores and haplontic AB gametogenesis meiosis gametophyte and OBA haplodiplontic spores and meiosis gametophyte and syngamy zygote 2 and gametogenesis sporophyte 2 and C figure 3.7 life cycle patterns, a haplontic B diplontic C haplodiplontic. Summary plant kingdom includes algae, bryophytes, pteridophytes, gymnosperms and angiosperms. Algae are chlorophyll-bearing simple, phalloid, autotrophic and largely aquatic organisms. 
depending on the type of pigment possessed and the type of stored food. Algae are class feed into three classes, namely chlorophyceae, theophyceae and rhodophyceae. Algae usually reproduce vegetatively by fragmentation, asexually by formation of different types of spores and sexually by formation of gametes which may show isogamy, anisogamy or oogamy. Bryophytes are plants which can live in soil but are dependent on water for sexual reproduction. Their plant body is more differentiated than that of algae. It is thallus-like and prostrate or erect and attached to the substratum by rhizoids. They possess root-like, leaf-like and stem-like structures. The bryophytes are divided into liverworts and mosses. The plant body of liverworts is thalloid and dorsoventral whereas mosses have upright, slender axes bearing spirally arranged leaves. The main plant body of a bryophyte is gamete producing and is called a gametophyte. It bears the male sex organs called antheridia and female sex organs called archegonia. The male and female gametes produced fuse to form zygote which produces a multicellular body called a sporophyte. It produces haploid spores. The spores germinate to form gametophytes. In pteridophytes the main plant is a sporophyte which is differentiated into true root, stem and leaves. These organs possess well differentiated vascular tissues. The sporophytes bear sporangia which produce spores. The spores germinate to form gametophytes which require cool, damp places to grow. The gametophytes bear male and female sex organs called antheridia and archegonia, respectively. Water is required for transfer of male gametes to archegonium where zygote is formed after fertilization. The zygote produces a sporophyte, a dominant, independent, photosynthetic. Thalloid or erect phase is represented by a haploid gametophyte and it alternates with a short-lived multicellular sporophyte totally or partially dependent on the gametophyte for its anchorage and nutrition. All bryophytes represent this pattern. The diploid sporophyte is represented by a dominant, independent, photosynthetic, vascular plant body. It alternates with multicellular, saprophytic autotrophic, independent but short-lived haploid gametophyte. Such a pattern is known as haplodiplontic life cycle. All pteridophytes exhibit this pattern figure 3.7c. Interestingly, while most algal genera are haplontic, some of them such as Ectocarpus, Polysophonia, Kelps are haplodiplontic. Fucus, an alga is diplontic. The gymnosperms are the plants in which ovules are not enclosed by any ovary wall. After fertilization the seeds remain exposed and therefore these plants are called naked seeded plants. The gymnosperms produce microspores and megaspores which are produced in microsporangia and megasporangia born on the sporophylls. The sporophylls, microsporophylls and megasporophylls are arranged spirally on axis to form male and female cones, respectively. The pollen grain germinates and pollen tube releases the male gamete into the ovule, where it fuses with the egg cell in archegonia. Following fertilization, the zygote develops into embryo and the ovules into seeds. In angiosperms, the male sex organ stamen and female sex organs pistil are born in a flower. Each stamen consists of a filament and an anther. The anther produces pollen grains male gametophyte after meiosis. The pistil consists of an ovary enclosing one to many ovules. Within the ovule is the female gametophyte or embryo sac which contains the egg cell. The pollen tube enters the embryo sac where two male gametes are discharged. One male gamete fuses with egg cell syngamy and other fuses with diploid secondary nucleus triple fusion. This phenomenon of two fusions is called double fertilization and is unique to angiosperms. The angiosperms are divided into two classes, the dicotyledons and the monocotyledons. During the life cycle of any sexually reproducing plant, there is alternation of generations between gamete producing haploid gametophyte and spore producing diploid sporophyte. However, different plant groups as well as individuals may show different patterns of life cycles, haplontic, diplontic or intermediate. Exercise is 1. What is the basis of classification of algae 2? When and where does reduction division take place in the life cycle of a liverwort, a moss, a fern, a gymnosperm and an angiosperm 3? Name three groups of plants that bear archegonia. Briefly describe the life cycle of any one of them. 4. Mention the ploidy of the following. Protonemal cell of a moss, primary endosperm nucleus and dicot. Leaf cell of a moss, prothallus cell of a firm, gemicell in marcantia, maristem cell of monocot, ovum of a liverwort, and zygote of a fern. 5. Write a note on economic importance of algae and gymnosperm 6. Both gymnosperms and angiosperms bear seeds, then why are they classified separately? 7. What is heterospory? Briefly comment on its significance. Give two examples. 8. Explain briefly the following terms with suitable examples. I protonema 2 and theridium 3 archegonium I diplontic v sporophyll v isogamy 9. Differentiate between the following. I red algae and brown algae 2 liverworts and moss 3 homosporous and heterosporous pteridophyte I syngamy and triple fusion 10. 
How would you distinguish monocots from dicots 11? Match the following column I with column 2 column I column 2 acclimatomonas I must be psychus 2 teridified C selaginella 3 algae D sphagnum I gymnosperm 12. Describe the important characteristics of gymnosperms 2018 1. 46 Biology When you look around, you will observe different animals with different structures and forms. As over a million species of animals have been described till now, the need for classification becomes all the more important. The classification also helps in assigning a systematic position to newly described species 4.1 basis of classification in spite of differences in structure and form of different animals. There are fundamental features common to various individuals in relation to the arrangement of cells, body symmetry, nature of cellum, patterns of digestive, circulatory or reproductive systems. These features are used as the basis of animal classification and some of them are discussed here. 4. 1. 1 levels of organization Though all members of animalia are multicellular, all of them do not exhibit the same pattern of organization of cells. For example, in sponges, the cells are arranged as loose cell aggregates, that is, they exhibit cellular level of organization. Some division of labor activities occur among the cells. In coelenterates, the arrangement of cells is more complex. Here the cells performing the same function are arranged into tissues, hence is called tissue level of organization. A still higher level of organization, that is, organ level is exhibited by members of platyhelminthes and other higher phyla where tissues are grouped together to form organs, each specialized for a particular function. In animals like annelids, arthropods, mollusks, animal kingdom chapter 4 4.1 basis of classification 4.2 classification of animals. Echinoderms and chordates, organs have associated to form functional systems, each system concerned with a specific physiological function. This pattern is called organ system level of organization. Organ systems in different groups of animals exhibit various patterns of complex cities. For example, the digestive system in platyhelminthes has only a single opening to the outside of the body that serves as both mouth and anus, and is hence called incomplete. A complete digestive system has two openings, mouth and anus, similarly. The circulatory system may be of two types, eye-open type in which the blood is pumped out of the heart and the cells and tissues are directly bathed in it and two closed type in which the blood is circulated through a series of vessels of varying diameters arteries, veins and capillaries. 4. 1. Two symmetry animals can be categorized on the basis of their symmetry. Sponges are mostly asymmetrical, that is, any plane that passes through the center does not divide them into equal halves. When any plane passing through the central axis of the body divides the organism into two identical halves, it is called radial symmetry. Coelenterates, tenophores and echinoderms have this kind of body plan figure 4.1 a, animals like annelids, arthropods, etc., where the body can be divided into identical left and right halves in only one plane, exhibit bilateral symmetry figure 4.1 b. 4. 1. 3. Diploblastic and triploblastic organization animals in which the cells are arranged in two embryonic layers. An external ectoderm and an internal endoderm are called diploblastic animals, e.g., coelenterates. An undifferentiated layer, mesoglea, is present in between the ectoderm and the endoderm figure 4.2a. Figure 4.2 showing germinal layers, a diploblastic b triploblastic a b ectoderm mesoglea endoderm mesoderm figure 4.1b bilateral symmetry figure 4.1 a radial symmetry. 4. 1. For cell and presence or absence of a cavity between the body wall and the gut wall is very important in classification. The body cavity, which is lined by mesoderm is called cellum. Animals possessing cellum are called coelomates, e.g., annelids, mollusks, arthropods, echinoderms, hemochordates and chordates figure 4.3a. In some animals, the body cavity is not lined by mesoderm. Instead, the mesoderm is present as scattered pouches in between the ectoderm and endoderm. Such a body cavity is called pseudocolum and the animals possessing them are called pseudocolumates, e.g., Ascalminthes figure 4.3b. The animals in which the body cavity is absent are called acolumates, e.g., Platyhelminthes figure 4.3c. Figure 4.3 Diagrammatic sectional view of Acoelumate b pseudocolumate c acolumate those animals in which the developing embryo has a third germinal layer. Mesoderm, in between the ectoderm and endoderm, are called triploblastic animals platyhelminthes to chordates. Figure 4.2b. 4. 1. 5. Segmentation in some animals. The body is externally and internally divided into segments with a serial repetition of at least some organs. For example, an earthworm, the body shows this pattern called metameric segmentation and the phenomenon is known as metamerism. 4. 1. 6. Notochord Notochord is a mesodermally derived rod-like structure formed on the dorsal side during embryonic development in some animals. 
Animals with no decord are called chordates and those animals which do not form this structure are called non-chordates, e.g., porifera to echinoderms. 4.2 Classification of Animals The broad classification of animalia based on common fundamental features as mentioned in the preceding sections is given in Figure 4.4. Animal Kingdom 4949 Animal Kingdom The important characteristic features of the different phyla are described. 4. 2. 1 Phylum Porifera members of this phylum are commonly known as sponges. They are generally marine and mostly asymmetrical animals. Figure 4.5 These are primitive multicellular animals and have cellular level of organization. Sponges have a water transport or canal system. Water enters through minute pores ostia in the body wall into a central cavity, sponge coal, from where it goes out through the osculum. This pathway of water transport is helpful in food gathering, respiratory exchange and removal of waste. Coanocytes or collar cells line the sponge coal and the canals. Digestion is intracellular. The body is supported by a skeleton made up of spicules or sponge and fibers. Sexes are not separate from aphrodite, that is, eggs and sperms are produced by the same individual. Sponges reproduce asexually by fragmentation and sexually by formation of gametes. Fertilization is internal and development is indirect having a larval stage which is morphologically distinct from the adult. Echinodermata exhibits radial or bilateral symmetry depending on the stage. Figure 4.4 Broad classification of kingdom and amelia based on common fundamental features of BC Figure 4.5 Examples of porifera. A C can be used spongia C spongilla. Nidoblasts or nidocytes which contain the stinging capsules or nematocysts present on the tentacles and the body. Nidoblasts are used for anchorage, defense and for the capture of prey. Figure 4.7 Nidarians exhibit tissue level of organization and are diploblastic. They have a central gastrovascular cavity with a single opening, mouth on hippostome. Digestion is extracellular and intracellular. Some of the nidarians, e.g., corals have a skeleton composed of calcium carbonate. Nidarians exhibit two basic body forms called polyp and medusa figure 4.6. The former is a sessile and cylindrical form like hydra, adamsha, etc. whereas, the latter is umbrella-shaped and free-swimming like aurelia or jellyfish. Those nidarians which exist in both forms exhibit alternation of generation metagenesis, that is, polyps produce medusae asexually and medusae form the polyps sexually e.g., obelia. Examples, Phasalia Portuguese Men of War, Adamsha C. Anemone, Thanatula C. Pan, Gorgonia C. Fan and Meandrina Brain Coral. Figure 4.7 Diagrammatic view of Nidoblast Figure 4.6 Examples of Salentorata indicating outline of their body form, A. Aurelia Medusa B. Adamsha Polypria Examples, Sick and Sifa. Spungilla Freshwater Sponge and Euspungia Bath Sponge 4, 2, 2 Phylum, Salentorata Nidaria They are aquatic, mostly marine. Cecil or free swimming, radially symmetrical animals figure 4.6. The name Nidaria is derived from the 4, 2, 3 phylum tenophora tenophores, commonly known as sea walnuts or comb jellies are exclusively marine, radially symmetrical, diploblastic organisms with tissue level of organization. The body bears eight external rows of ciliated comb plates, which help in locomotion figure 4.8. Digestion is both extracellular and intracellular. Bioluminescence the property of a living organism to emit light is well marked in tenophores. Sexes are not separate. Reproduction takes place only by sexual means. Fertilization is external with indirect development. Examples. Pleural brachia and tenoplana 4, 2, 4 phylum. Planta helminthes af dorso ventrally flattened body, hence are called flapworms figure 4.9. These are mostly endoparasites found in animals including human beings. Flatworms are bilaterally symmetrical, triploblastic and decolomate animals with organ level of organization. Hooks and suckers are present in the parasitic forms. Some of them absorb nutrients from the host directly through their body surface. Specialized cells called flame cells help in osmoregulation and excretion. Sexes are not separate. Fertilization is internal and development is through many larval stages. Some members like planaria possess high regeneration capacity. Examples, Tinea tapeworm, Fasciola liver fluke. Figure 4.8 Example of Tenophora pleurobrachia at B Figure 4.9 Examples of Plata helminthes, a tapeworm B liver fluke. 4, 2, 5 Phylum, Ask helminthes The body of the Ask helminthes is circular in cross-section, hence, the name roundworms Figure 4.10. They may be free-living, aquatic and terrestrial or parasitic in plants and animals. Roundworms have organ system level of body organization. They are bilaterally symmetrical, triploblastic and pseudocolomate animals. Alimentary canal is complete with a well-developed muscular pharynx. An excretory tube removes body wastes from the body cavity through the excretory pore. 
sexes are separate dioecious, that is, males and females are distinct. Often females are longer than males. Fertilization is internal and development may be direct. The young ones resemble the adult or indirect. Examples, Ascaris roundworm, Wisher area filaria worm, and Sulostoma hookworm 4, 2, 6 phylum, and alerta they may be aquatic marine and freshwater or terrestrial, free living, and sometimes parasitic. They exhibit organ system level of body organization and bilateral symmetry. They are triploblastic, metamerically segmented and co-element animals. Their body surface is distinctly marked out into segments or metamers and, hence, the phylum name Anellar de Latin, annulus, little ring figure 4.11. They possess longitudinal and circular muscles which help in locomotion. Aquatic annelids like Nereus possess lateral appendages, parapodia, which help in swimming. A closed circulatory system is present. Nephridius and nephridium help in osmoregulation and excretion. Neural system consists of paired ganglia synganglion connected by lateral nerves to a double ventral nerve cord. Nereus, an aquatic form, is dioecious, but earthworms and leeches are monoecious. Reproduction is sexual. Examples: Nereus, Theretum earthworm, and Herudinaria blood-sucking leech. Figure 4.11 Examples of Anelida, Anereus b. Herudinaria male female. Figure 4.10 Examples of Ascalminthes roundworm. 4, 2, 7 phylum, Arthropoda. This is the largest phylum of Animalia which includes insects. Over two-thirds of all named species on Earth are arthropods. Figure 4.12. They have organ system level of organization. They are bilaterally symmetrical, triploblastic, segmented and co-element animals. The body of arthropods is covered by chitinous exoskeleton. The body consists of head, thorax and abdomen. They have jointed appendages arthros joint, poda appendages, respiratory organs are gills, book gills, book lungs or tracheal system. Circulatory system is of open type. Sensory organs like antennae, eyes compound and simple, statusists or balancing organs are present. Excretion takes place through malpighian tubules. They are mostly dioecious. Fertilization is usually internal. They are mostly oviparous. Development may be direct or indirect. Examples, economically important insects, Apis honeybee, Bombyx silkworm, Laxifer lac insect vectors, Anopheles, Culex and Daetes mosquitoes gregarious pest, Locusta locust living fossil, Limulus king crab. 4, 2, 8 phylum, Mollusca This is the second largest animal phylum figure 4.13. Mollusks are terrestrial or aquatic marine or freshwater having an organ system level of organization. They are bilaterally symmetrical, triploblastic and co-element animals. Body is covered by a calcareous shell and is unsegmented with a distinct head, muscular foot and visceral hump. A soft and spongy layer of skin forms a mantle over the visceral hump. The space between the hump and the mantle is called the mantle cavity in which feather-like gills are present. They have respiratory and excretory functions. The anterior head region has sensory tentacles. The mouth contains a file-like rasping organ for feeding, called radula. Figure 4.12 Examples of Arthropoda, a locust bee butterfly sea scorpion d prana c b d figure 4.13 Examples of Mollusca, a pila bee octopus bea. They are usually dioecious and oviparous with indirect development. Examples, pila apple snail, pink to pearl oyster, sepia cuttlefish, loligo squid, octopus devilfish, a plesia sea hare, dentalium tusk shell and chitopler a chitin. 4, 2, 9 phylum, Echinodermata. These animals have an endoskeleton of calcareous ossicles and, hence, the name Echinodermata spiny bodied. Figure 4.14. All are marine with organ system level of organization. The adult echinoderms are radially symmetrical but larvae are bilaterally symmetrical. They are triploblastic and co-element animals. Digestive system is complete with mouth on the lower ventral side and anus on the upper dorsal side. The most distinctive feature of the kinoderms is the presence of water vascular system which helps in locomotion, capture and transport of food and respiration. An excretory system is absent, sexes are separate, reproduction is sexual, fertilization is usually external. Development is indirect with free-swimming larvae. Examples, Asteria starfish, Echinus sea urchin, Antidon sea lily, Cucumeria sea cucumber and Ephira brittle star. April 2, 2010 Phylum, Hemichordata Hemichordata was earlier considered as a subphylum under phylum chordata. But now it is placed as a separate phylum under non-chordata. Hemichordata have a rudimentary structure in the collar region called stomachord, a structure similar to notochord. This phylum consists of a small group of worm-like marine animals with organ system level of organization. They are bilaterally symmetrical, triploblastic and co-element animals. The body is cylindrical and is composed of an anterior proboscis, a collar and a long trunk figure 4.15.
Circulatory system is of open type. Respiration takes place through gills. Excretory organ is proboscis gland. Sexes are separate. Fertilization is external. Development is indirect. Examples. Balanoglossus and Sacaglossus. April 2, 2011 Phylum. Chordata animals belonging to Phylum Chordata are fundamentally characterized by the presence of a notochord. A dorsal figure 4.14 Examples of Echinodermata. Asterias B. Affinera B. Figure 4.15 Balanoglossus proboscis collar trunk. Hollow nerve cord and paired pharyngeal gill slits figure 4.16. These are bilaterally symmetrical, triploblastic, co-element with organ system level of organization. They possess a postanal tail and a closed circulatory system. Table 4.1 presents a comparison of salient features of chordates and non-chordates. Phylum chordata is divided into three subphyla, urochordata or tunicata, cephalochordata and vertebrata. Subphyla urochordata and cephalochordata are often referred to as protachordates figure 4.17 and are exclusively marine. In urochordata, notochord is present only in larval tail, while in cephalochordata, it extends from head to tail region and is persistent throughout their life. Examples, urochordata, ascidia, salpa, dileolum, cephalochordata branchiostoma and phyoxys or lancelet. The members of subphylum vertebrata possess notochord during the embryonic period. The notochord is replaced by a cartilaginous or bony vertebral column in the adult. Thus all vertebrates are chordates but all chordates are not vertebrates, besides the basic chordate characters. Vertebrates have a ventral muscular heart with two, three or four chambers, kidneys for excretion and osmoregulation and paired appendages which may be fins or limbs. Nerve cord notochord postanal part gill slits figure 4.16 chordata characteristics figure 4.17 acidia table 4.1 comparison of chordates and non-chordates as no. Chordates non-chordates 1, notochord present, notochord absent 2, central nervous system is dorsal, central nervous system is ventral, solid hollow and single. And double 3, pharynx perforated by gill slits, gill slits are absent 4, heart is ventral, heart is dorsal if present. 5, a postanal part tail is present. Post-anal tail is absent. Figure 4.18 A jawless vertebrate the trauma is in figure 4.19 example of cartilaginous fishes, a scoliotin B pristis at B4, 2, 1, 1, 1 class, cyclostomata all living members of the class cyclostomata are to parasites on some fishes. They have an elongated body bearing 615 pairs of gill slits for respiration. Cyclostomes have a sucking and circular mouth without jaws fig. 4.18 their body is devoid of scales and paired fins. Cranium and vertebral column are cartilaginous. Circulation is of closed type. Cyclostomes are marine but migrate for spawning to fresh water. After spawning, within a few days, they die. Their larvae, after metamorphosis, return to the ocean. Examples, Patromas and Lamprey and Mycene hagfish. 4, 2, 1, 1, 2 class. Chondrichthy is their marine animals with streamlined body and have cartilaginous and a skeleton figure 4.19. Mouth is located ventrally. Notochord is persistent throughout life. Gill slits are separate and without operculum gill cover. The skin is tough, containing minute placoid scales. Teeth are modified placoid scales which are backwardly directed. Their jaws are very powerful. These animals are predaceous. Due to the absence of air bladder, they have to swim constantly to avoid sinking. Vertebrata division Agnathalax jaw class 1. Cyclostomata nathostomata bears jaw super class Pisces bear fins tetrapoda bear limbs class 1. Amphibia 2, Reptilia 3, Apes 4, Mammals Class 1, Chondrichthy is 2, Ostich thighs The subphylum vertebrata is further divided as follows. Heart is two chambered one auricle and one ventricle. Some of them have electric organs e.g., torpedo and some possess poison sting e.g., trigon. They are cold blooded poikilothermous animals, that is, they lack the capacity to regulate their body temperature. Sexes are separate. In males pelvic fins bear claspers. They have internal fertilization and many of them are viviparous. Examples. Scoliotin dogfish. Pristis sawfish. Carcaridin great white shark. Trigon stingray. 4, 2, 1, 1, 3 class. Ostich thighs it includes both marine and freshwater fishes with bony endoskeleton. Their body is streamlined. Mouth is mostly terminal figure 4.20. They have four pairs of gills which are covered by an operculum on each side. Skin is covered with cycloid tenoid scales. Air bladder is present which regulates buoyancy. Heart is two-chambered one auricle and one ventricle. They are cold blooded animals. Sexes are separate. Fertilization is usually external. They are mostly oviparous and development is direct. 
Examples. Marine. Exocotus flying fish. Hippocampus seahorse. Freshwater. Labia rohu. Catla catla. Clarius magar. Aquarium beta fighting fish. Terraphyllum angelfish. 4. 2. 1. 1. 4. Class. Amphibia as the name indicates gr. Amphi. Dual. Bios. Life. Amphibians can live in aquatic as well as terrestrial habitats. Figure 4.21. Most of them have two pairs of limbs, body is divisible into head and trunk, tail may be present in some. The amphibian skin is moist without scales, the eyes have eyelids, a tympanum represents the ear. Alimentary canal, urinary and reproductive tracts open into a common chamber called cloaca which opens to the exterior. Respiration is by gills, lungs and through skin, the heart is three chambered two auricles and one ventricle. These are cold-blooded animals, sexes are separate, fertilization is external, they are oviparous and development is indirect. Examples, Bufo toad, Rana frog, Hyla tree frog, Salamandra salamander, Echthyathus limbless amphibia. Figure 4.21 Examples of amphibia, a salamandra b Rana a b Figure 4.20 Examples of bony fishes, a hippocampus b catla bia. 58 Biology 4, 2, 1, 1, 5 Class Reptilia The class name refers to their creeping or crawling mode of locomotion Latin, repeer or retum, to creep or crawl. They are mostly terrestrial animals and their body is covered by dry and cornified skin, epidermal scales or scutes fig. 4.22 They do not have external ear openings, tympanum represents ear, limbs, when present, are two pairs. Heart is usually three-chambered, but four-chambered in crocodiles, reptiles are poikilotherms, snakes and lizards shed their scales as skin cast. Sexes are separate, fertilization is internal, they are oviparous and development is direct. Examples, Chelone turtle, Testudo tortoise, Chameleon tree lizard, Calotes garden lizard, Crocodilus crocodile, Alligator alligator, Hemidactylus wall lizard, Poisonous snakes, Naja cobra, Bangerous crite, Vipera viper 4, 2, 1 1, 6 class, Aves The characteristic features of Aves birds are the presence of feathers and most of them can fly except flightless birds e.g., ostrich. They possess beak figure 4.23, the forelimbs are modified into wings, the hind limbs generally have scales and are modified for walking, swimming or clasping the tree branches. Skin is dry without glands except the oil gland at the base of the tail, endoskeleton is fully ossified bony and the long bones are hollow with air cavities pneumatic. The digestive tract of birds has additional chambers, the crop and gizzard, heart is completely four-chambered. They are warm-blooded homoeothermous animals, that is, they are able to maintain a constant body temperature. Respiration is by figure 4.22 reptiles, a chameleon b crocodilus c chelone d naja b c a d. Animal kingdom 5959 animal kingdom lungs, air sacs connected to lungs supplement respiration, sexes are separate. Fertilization is internal, they are oviparous and development is direct. Examples, Corvus crow, Columba pigeon, Cetacula parrot, Struthio ostrich, Pava peacock, Aptanidites penguin, Neophrin vulture. 4, 2, 1, 1, 7 class, Mammalia they are found in a variety of habitats polar ice caps, deserts, mountains, forests, grasslands and dark caves. Some of them have adapted to fly or live in water. The most unique mammalian characteristic is the presence of milk-producing glands mammary glands by which the young ones are nourished. They have two pairs of limbs, adapted for walking, running, climbing, burrowing, swimming or flying figure 4.24. The skin of a figure 4.23 Some birds, a neophron b strothia c cetacula d pavo b c d figure 4.24 Some mammals, a ornithorhynchus b macropus c teropus d balanoptera a b c d. Mammals is unique in possessing hair, external ears or pinny are present, different types of teeth are present in the jaw. Heart is four-chambered, they are homoeothermous, respiration is by lungs, sexes are separate and fertilization is internal. They are viviparous with few exceptions and development is direct. Examples, oviparous ornithorhynchus platypus, viviparous macropus kangaroo, teropus flying fox, camelus camel, macaca monkey, ratus rat, canis dog, felis cat, elephus elephant. Equus horse, Delphinus common dolphin, Balanoptera blue whale, Panthera tigris tiger, Panthera lea lion. The salient distinguishing features of all phyla under animal kingdom is comprehensively given in the table 4.2.
Level of organization cellular tissue tissue organ organ system 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 sim tri various radio radio bilateral 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 radio bilateral bilateral selim absent 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 pseudo kylomate 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 segmentation absent 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 present present absent 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 present Digestive system absent incomplete 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 complete 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 circulatory system absent 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 present 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 respiratory system absent 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 present 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 distinctive features body with pores and canals and walls Nidoblasts present comb plates for locomotion flat body suckers often worm shaped elongated body segmentation like rings exoskeleton of cuticle Jointed appendages, external skeleton of shell usually present. Water vascular system, radial symmetry, worm-like with proboscis, collar and trunk, notochord, dorsal hollow nerve cord, gill slits with limbs or fins. Phylum poriferous salentorata nidaria tenophora plata helminth ashelman esinellata arthropoda mollusca echinodermata hemicordata cordata table 4.2 salient features of different phyla in the animal kingdom. Summary The basic fundamental features such as level of organization, symmetry, cell organization, cellum, segmentation, notochord, etc., have enabled us to broadly classify the animal kingdom. Besides the fundamental features, there are many other distinctive characters which are specific for each phyla or class. Porifera includes multicellular animals which exhibit cellular level of organization and have characteristic flagellated coanocytes. The coelenterates have tentacles and bear nidoblasts. They are mostly aquatic, sessile or free-floating. The tenophores are marine animals with comb plates. The platyhelminths have flat body and exhibit bilateral symmetry. The parasitic forms show distinct suckers and hooks. As These are pseudocolomates and include parasitic as well as non-parasitic roundworms. Annelids are metamerically segmented animals with a true cellum. The arthropods are the most abundant group of animals characterized by the presence of jointed appendages. The mollusks have a soft body surrounded by an external calcareous shell. The body is covered with external skeleton made of chitin. The echinoderms possess a spiny skin. Their most distinctive feature is the presence of water vascular system. The hemichordates are a small group of worm-like marine animals. They have a cylindrical body with proboscis, collar and trunk. Phylum chordata includes animals which possess a notochord either throughout or during early embryonic life. Other common features observed in the chordates are the dorsal, hollow nerve cord and paired pharyngeal gill slits. Some of the vertebrates do not possess jaws agnatha whereas most of them possess jaws nathostomata. Agnatha is represented by the class, cyclostomata, they are the most primitive chordates and are ectoparasites on fishes. Nathostomata has two superclasses, Pisces and Tetrapoda, classes chondrichthyes and ostichthyes bear fins for locomotion and are grouped under Pisces. The chondrichthyes are fishes with cartilaginous and a skeleton and are marine. Classes, amphibia, reptilia, aves and mammalia have two pairs of limbs and are thus grouped under tetrapoda. The amphibians have adapted to live both on land and water. Reptiles are characterized by the presence of dry and cornified skin. Limbs are absent in snakes, fishes, amphibians and reptiles are poikilothermous cold-blooded. Aves are warm-blooded animals with feathers on their bodies and forelimbs modified into wings for flying. Hind limbs are adapted for walking, swimming, perching or clasping. The unique features of mammals are the presence of mammary glands and hairs on the skin. They commonly exhibit viviparity. Exercises 1. What are the difficulties that you would face in classification of animals, if common fundamental features are not taken into account 2. If you are given a specimen, what are the steps that you would follow to classify 3. How useful is the study of the nature of body cavity and cell in the classification of animals 4. Distinguish between intracellular and extracellular digestion 5. What is the difference between direct and indirect development 6. What are the peculiar features that you find in parasitic platyhelminthes 7. What are the reasons that you can think of for the arthropods to constitute the largest group of the animal kingdom 8. Water vascular system is the characteristic of which group of the following. Aporifera b tenophora c echinodermata d cordata 9. All vertebrates are chordates but all chordates are not vertebrates. Justify the statement 10. How important is the presence of air bladder in Pisces 11? What are the modifications that are observed in birds that help them fly 12? Could the number of eggs or young ones produced by an oviparous and viviparous mother be equal Y13? Segmentation in the body is first observed in which of the following? A plata helminthes b s helminthes c and d arthropoda 14. Match the following. 
O perculamite and afrobi parapogia to mollusca c scales 3 porifera d complates i reptilia e radula v anelida f hairs v cyclostomata and chondrict v is g coanocyte 7 mammalia h gill slits 8 ostich thighs 15. Prepare a list of some animals that are found parasitic on human beings. Unit to the description of the diverse forms of life on Earth was made only by observation, through naked eyes or later through magnifying lenses and microscopes. This description is mainly of gross structural features, both external and internal. In addition, observable and perceivable living phenomena were also recorded as part of this description. Before experimental biology or more specifically, physiology, was established as a part of biology, naturalists described only biology. Hence, biology remained as a natural history for a long time. The description, by itself, was amazing in terms of detail. While the initial reaction of a student could be boredom, one should keep in mind that the detailed description was utilized in the later day reductionist biology where living processes drew more attention from scientists than the description of life forms and their structure. Hence, this description became meaningful and helpful in framing research questions in physiology or evolutionary biology. In the following chapters of this unit, the structural organization of plants and animals, including the structural basis of physiological or behavioral phenomena, is described. For convenience, this description of morphological and anatomical features is presented separately for plants and animals. Structural Organization in Plants and Animals Chapter 5 Morphology of Flower and Plants Chapter 6 Anatomy of Flower and Plants Chapter 7 Structural Organization in Animals Catherine Esau was born in Ukraine in 1898. She studied agriculture in Russia and Germany and received her doctorate in 1931 in the United States. She reported in her early publications that the curly top virus spreads through a plant via the food conducting or phloem tissue. Dr. Esau's plant anatomy published in 1954 took a dynamic, developmental approach designed to enhance one's understanding of plant structure and an enormous impact worldwide, literally bringing about a revival of the discipline. The Anatomy of Seed Plants by Catherine Esau was published in 1960. It was referred to as Webster's of Plant Biology. It is encyclopediac. In 1957 she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, becoming the sixth woman to receive that honor. In addition to this prestigious award, she received the National Medal of Science from President George Bush in 1989. When Catherine Esau died in the year 1997, Peter Raven, Director of Anatomy and Morphology, Missouri Botanical Garden, remembered that she absolutely dominated the field of plant biology even at the age of 99. Catherine Esau 1898-1997-2018-1 The wide range in the structure of higher plants will never fail to fascinate us, even though the angiosperms show such a large diversity in external structure or morphology, they are all characterized by presence of roots, stems, leaves, flowers and fruits. In chapters 2 and 3, we talked about classification of plants based on morphological and other characteristics. For any successful attempt at classification and at understanding any higher plant or for that matter any living organism we need to know standard technical terms and standard definitions. We also need to know about the possible variations in different parts, found as adaptations of the plants to their environment, e.g., adaptions to various habitats, for protection, climbing, storage, etc. If you pull out any weed you will see that all of them have roots, stems and leaves, they may be bearing flowers and fruits. The underground part of the flower and plant is the root system while the portion above the ground forms the shoot system figure 5.1. 5.1 The root and majority of the decotyledonous plants, the direct elongation of the radical leads to the formation of primary root which grows inside the soil. It bears lateral roots of several orders that are referred to as secondary, tertiary, etc. roots. The primary roots and its branches constitute the morphology of flower and plants chapter 5 5.1 the root 5.2 the stem 5.3 the leaf 5.4 the inflorescence 5.5 the flower 5.6 the fruit 5.7 the seed 5.8 semi-technical description of a typical flowering plant 5.9 description of some important families flower shoot system root system fruit bud stem leaf node internode primary root secondary root figure 5.2 different types of roots a tap b fibrous c adventitious c b figure 5.1 parts of a flower and plant fibrous roots adventitious roots laterals a main root tap root system as seen in the mustard plant figure 5.2 up in monocotyledonous plants the primary root is short-lived and is replaced by a large number of roots these roots originate from the base of the stem and constitute the fibrous root system as seen in the wheat plant figure 5.2b in some plants, like grass, monster and the banyan tree, roots arise from parts of the plant other than the radical and are called adventitious roots figure 5.2c. The main functions of the root system are absorption of water and minerals from the soil, 
providing a proper encourage to the plant parts, storing reserve food material and synthesis of plant growth regulators. 5. 1. 1. Regions of the root The root is covered at the apex by a thimble-like structure called the root cap figure 5.3. It protects the tender apex of the root as it makes its way through the soil. A few millimeters above the root cap is the region of meristematic activity. The cells of this region are very small, thin-walled and with dense protoplasm. They divide repeatedly. The cells proximal to this region undergo rapid elongation and enlargement and are responsible for the growth of the root in length. This region is called the region of elongation. The cells of the elongation zone gradually differentiate and mature. Hence, this zone, proximal to region of elongation, is called the region of maturation. From this region some of the epidermal cells form very fine and delicate, thread-like structures called root hairs. These root hairs absorb water and minerals from the soil. 5. 1. 2. Modifications of root roots in some plants change their shape and structure and become modified to perform functions other than absorption and conduction of water and minerals. They are modified for support, storage of food and respiration figure 5.4 and 5.5. Tap roots of carrot, turnip and adventitious roots of sweet potato, get swollen and store food. Can you give some more such examples? Have you ever wondered what those hanging structures that support a banyan tree are? These are called prop roots. Similarly, the stems of maize and sugar cane have supporting roots coming out of the lower nodes of the stem. These are called stilt roots. In some plants such as Rhizophora growing in swampy areas, many roots come out of the ground and grow vertically upwards. Such roots, called pneumatophores, help to get oxygen for respiration figure 5.5b, figure 5.3 the regions of the root tip figure 5.4 modification of root for support, banyan tree. 68 Biology 5.2 The stem What are the features that distinguish a stem from a root? The stem is the ascending part of the axis bearing branches, leaves, flowers and fruits. It develops from the plumule of the embryo of a germinating seed. The stem bears nodes and internodes. The region of the stem where leaves are born are called nodes while internodes are the portions between two nodes. The stem bears buds, which may be terminal or axillary. Stem is generally green when young and later often become woody and dark brown. The main function of the stem is spreading out branches bearing leaves, flowers and fruits. It conducts water, minerals and photosynthesis. Some stems perform the function of storage of food, support, protection and of vegetative propagation. 5. 2. 1. Modifications of stem The stem may not always be typically like what they are expected to be. They are modified to perform different functions. Figure 5.6. Underground stems of potato, ginger, turmeric, zamincand, colocasia are modified to store food in them. They also act as organs of perination to tide over conditions unfavorable for growth. Stem tendrils which develop from axillary buds, are slender and spirally coiled and help plants to climb such as in gourds cucumber, pumpkins, watermelon and grapevines. Axillary buds of stems may also get modified into woody, straight and pointed thorns. Thorns are found in many plants such as citrus, bougainvillea. They protect plants from browsing animals. Some plants of arid regions modify their stems into flattened opuntia, or fleshy cylindrical euphorbia structures. They contain chlorophyll and carry figure 5.5 modification of root 4, a storage B respiration, pneumatophorin rhizophora B a carrot turnip sweet potato asparagus. Morphology of flower and plant 69 figure 5.6 modifications of stem 4, a storage B support C protection D spread and vegetative propagation out photosynthesis. Underground stems of some plants such as grass and strawberry, etc., spread to new niches and when older parts die new plants are formed. In plants like mint and jasmine a slender lateral branch arises from the base of the main axis and after growing areola for some time arch downwards to touch the ground. A lateral branch with short internodes and each node bearing a rosette of leaves and a tuft of roots is found in aquatic plants like piscia and ichornia. In banana, pineapple and chrysanthemum, the lateral branches originate from the basal and underground portion of the main stem, grow horizontally beneath the soil and then come out obliquely upward giving rise to leafy shoots. 5.3 The leaf The leaf is a lateral, generally flattened structure born on the stem. It develops at the node and bears a bud in its axil. The axillary bud later develops into a branch. Leaves originate from shoot apical meristems and are arranged in an acropital order. They are the most important vegetative organs for photosynthesis. A typical leaf consists of three main parts, leaf base, petiole and lamina figure 5.7 a. The leaf is attached to the stem by the leaf base and may a BCD axillary stem modified into tendril roots arising from node stem modified into spine ginger zamincan potato bogan via SP. Oxalis SP. There are two lateral small leaf-like structures called stipules. In monocotyledons, the leaf base expands into a sheath covering the stem partially or wholly. 
In some leguminous plants the leaf base may become swollen, which is called the pulvinus. The petiole help hold the blade to light. Long thin flexible petioles allow leaf blades to flutter in wind, thereby cooling the leaf and bringing fresh air to leaf surface. The lamina or the leaf blade is the green expanded part of the leaf with veins and veinlets. There is, usually, a middle prominent vein, which is known as the midrib. Veins provide rigidity to the leaf blade and act as channels of transport for water, minerals and food materials. The shape, margin, apex, surface and extent of incision of lamina varies in different leaves. 5, 3, 1 venation The arrangement of veins and the veinlets in the lamina of leaf is termed as venation. When the veinlets form a network, the venation is termed as reticulate figure 5.7b. When the veins run parallel to each other within a lamina, the venation is termed as parallel figure 5.7c. Leaves of decotyledonous plants generally possess reticulate venation, while parallel venation is the characteristic of most monocotyledons. 5, 3, 2 types of leaves A leaf is said to be simple, when its lamina is entire or when incised, the incisions do not touch the midrib. When the incisions of the lamina reach up to the midrib breaking it into a number of leaflets, the leaf is called compound. About is present in the axial of petiole in both simple and compound leaves, but not in the axial of leaflets of the compound leaf. The compound leaves may be of two types figure 5.8. In a pinnately compound leaf a number of leaflets are present on a common axis, the rachis, which represents the midrib with the leaf as in neem. Figure 5.7 Structure of a leaf, a parts of a leaf B reticulate V nation C parallel V nation B C B silk cotton lamina petiole stipule leaf base axillary but anem figure 5.8 compound leaves, a pinnately compound leaf B palmately compound leaf rachis. In palmately compound leaves, the leaflets are attached at a common point, that is, at the tip of petiole, as in silk cotton. 5, 3, 3 Philodexy Philodexy is the pattern of arrangement of leaves on the stem or branch. This is usually of three types, alternate, opposite and world figure 5.9. In alternate type of Philodexy, a single leaf arises at each node in alternate manner, as in China rose, mustard and sunflower plants. In opposite type, a pair of leaves arise at each node and lie opposite to each other as in Colotropis and Guava plants. If more than two leaves arise at a node and form a whorl, it is called world, as in Alstonia 5, 3, 4 modifications of leaves. Leaves are often modified to perform functions other than photosynthesis. They are converted into tendrils for climbing as in peas or into spines for defense as in cacti figure 5.10a, b. The fleshy leaves of onion and garlic store food figure 5.10c. In some plants such as Australian acacia, the leaves are small and short-lived. The petioles in these plants expand, become green and synthesize food. Leaves of certain insectivorous plants such as pitcher plant, Venus flytrap are also modified leaves. 5.4 The inflorescence A flower is a modified shoot wherein the shoot apical meristem changes to floral meristem. Internodes do not elongate and the axis gets condensed. The apex produces different kinds of floral appendages laterally at successive nodes instead of leaves. When a shoot tip transforms into a flower, it is always solitary. The arrangement of flowers on the figure 5.10 modifications of leaf 4, a support, tendril B protection, spine C storage, fleshy leaves C onion fleshy leaves leaf tender a PB cactus leaves modified into spines figure 5.9 different types of philodexy, a alternate B opposite C world C Austonia a China rose B guava. Floral axis is termed as inflorescence, depending on whether the apex gets developed into a flower or continues to grow. Two major types of inflorescences are defined, racemos and cymos. In racemos type of inflorescences the main axis continues to grow, the flowers are born laterally in an acropital succession figure 5.11. In cymos type of inflorescence the main axis terminates in a flower, hence is limited in growth the flowers are born in a basipital order figure 5.12. 5.5 The flower The flower is the reproductive unit in the angiosperms. It is meant for sexual reproduction. A typical flower has four different kinds of whorls arranged successively on the swollen end of the stalk or pedicel, called thalamus or receptacle. These are calyx, corolla, andricium and genesium. Calyx and corolla are accessory organs, while andricium and genesium are reproductive organs. In some flowers like lily, the calyx and corolla are not distinct and are termed as perianth. When a flower has both andricium and genesium, it is bisexual. A flower having either only stamens or only carpels is unisexual. In symmetry, the flower may be actinomorphic radial symmetry or zygomorphic bilateral symmetry. When a flower can be divided into two equal radial halves in any radial plane passing through the center, it is said to be actinomorphic, e.g., mustard, datura, chili. When it can be divided into two similar halves only in one particular vertical plane, it is zygomorphic, e.g., p. 
Gulmahar, Bean, Cassia. A flower is asymmetric irregular if it cannot be divided into two similar halves by any vertical plane passing through the center, as in canna. A flower may be trimerous, tetramerous or pentamerous when the floral appendages are in multiple of three, four or five, respectively. Flowers with bracts reduced leaf found at the base of the pedicel are called bracteate and those without bracts, e bracteate. Figure 5.12 Cymos inflorescence Figure 5.11 Racemos inflorescence Morphology of flower and plant 73 Based on the position of calyx, corolla and andrecium in respect of the ovary on thalamus, the flowers are described as hypogenous, perigenous and epigenous Figure 5.13 in the hypogenous flower the genetium occupies the highest position while the other parts are situated below it. The ovary in such flowers is said to be superior, e.g., mustard, china rose and prinjol. If genetium is situated in the center and other parts of the flower are located on the rim of the thalamus almost at the same level, it is called perigenous. The ovary here is said to be half inferior, e.g., plum, rose, peach. In epigenous flowers, the margin of thalamus grows upward enclosing the ovary completely and getting fused with it, the other parts of flower arise above the ovary. Hence, the ovary is said to be inferior as in flowers of guava and cucumber, and the ray florets of sunflower. 5. 5. One parts of a flower each flower normally has four floral whorls, viz, calyx, corolla, andrecium and genetium figure 5.14. 5. 5. 1. One calyx The calyx is the outermost whorl of the flower and the members are called sepals. Generally, sepals are green, leaf-like and protect the flower in the bud stage. The calyx may be gamosepalous sepals united or polysepalous sepals free 5, 5, 1, 2 Corolla Corolla is composed of petals. Petals are usually brightly colored to attract insects for pollination, like calyx. Corolla may also be figure 5.13 position of floral parts on thalamus, a hypogenous B and C perigenous D epigenous a B C D. Gamma petalous petals united or polypetalous petals free, the shape and color of corolla vary greatly in plants. Corolla may be tubular, bell-shaped, funnel-shaped or wheel-shaped. Estivation, the mode of arrangement of sepals or petals in floral bud with respect to the other members of the same whorl is known as estivation. The main types of estivation are valvate, twisted, imbricate and vexillary figure 5.15, when sepals or petals in a whorl just touch one another at the margin, without overlapping, as in colotropis, it is said to be valvate. If one margin of the appendage overlaps that of the next one and so on as in china rose, lady's finger and cotton, it is called twisted. If the margins of sepals or petals overlap one another but not in any particular direction as in cassia and gulmahar, the estivation is called imbricate. In pea and bean flowers, there are five petals, the largest standard overlaps the two lateral petals wings which in turn overlap the two smallest anterior petals keel, this type of estivation is known as vexillary or papillionaceous. Pedicel calyx corolla and ricium genetium figure 5.14 parts of a flower figure 5.15 types of estivation in corolla, a valvate B twisted C and brucut D vexillario B C D. Morphology of flower and plant 75 5, 5, 1, 3 and ricium and ricium is composed of stamens, each stamen which represents the male reproductive organ consists of a stalk or a filament and an anther. Each anther is usually bilobed and each lobe has two chambers, the pollen sacs. The pollen grains are produced in pollen sacs. A sterile stamen is called staminode. Stamens of flower may be united with other members such as petals or among themselves. When stamens are attached to the petals, they are epipetalous as in brinjol, or epiphyllous when attached to the perianth as in the flowers of lily. The stamens in a flower may either remain free polyandrous or may be united in varying degrees. The stamens may be united into one bunch or one bundle monoidalphus as in china rose, or two bundles diadelphus as in pea, or into more than two bundles polyadelphus as in citrus. There may be a variation in the length of filaments within a flower, as in salvia and mustard 5, 5, 1, 4 genetium genetium is the female reproductive part of the flower and is made up of one or more carpels. A carpel consists of three parts namely stigma, style and ovary. Ovary is the enlarged basal part, on which lies the elongated tube, the style. The style connects the ovary to the stigma. The stigma is usually at the tip of the style and is the receptive surface for pollen grains. Each ovary bears one or more ovules attached to a flattened, cushion-like placenta. When more than one carpel is present, they may be free as in lotus and rose and are called apocarpus. They are termed syncarpus when carpels are fused, as in mustard and tomato. After fertilization, the ovules develop into seeds and the ovary matures into a fruit. Placentation. The arrangement of ovules within the ovary is known as placentation. The placentation are of different types namely, marginal, axile, 
parietal, basal, central and free central figure 5.16. In marginal placentation the placenta forms a ridge along the ventral suture of the ovary and the ovules are born on this ridge forming two rows, as in P. When the placenta is axial and the ovules are attached to it in a multilocular ovary, the placentaean is said to be axile, as in China rose, tomato and lemon. In parietal placentation, the ovules develop on the inner wall of the ovary or on peripheral part. Ovary is one chamber but it becomes two chambered due to the formation of the false septum, e.g., mustard and argemone. When the ovules are born on central axis and septa are absent, as in dianthus and primrose the placentation is figure 5.16 types of placentation, a marginal B-axial C parietal D free central E basal EBDC. Called free central, in basal placentation, the placenta develops at the base of ovary and a single ovule is attached to it, as in sunflower, marigold. 5.6 The fruit The fruit is a characteristic feature of the flowering plants, it is a mature or ripened ovary, developed after fertilization. If a fruit is formed without fertilization of the ovary, it is called a parthenocarpic fruit. Generally, the fruit consists of a wall or pericarp and seeds. The pericarp may be dry or fleshy. When pericarp is thick and fleshy, it is differentiated into the outer epicarp, the middle mesocarp and the inner endocarp. In mango and coconut, the fruit is known as a droop figure 5.17. They develop from monocarpillary superior ovaries and are one-seeded. In mango the pericarp is well differentiated into an outer thin epicarp, a middle fleshy edible mesocarp and an inner stony hard endocarp. In coconut which is also a droop, the mesocarp is fibrous 5.7 The seed the ovules after fertilization, develop into seeds. A seed is made up of a seed coat and an embryo. The embryo is made up of a radical, an embryonal axis and one is in wheat, maize or two cotyledons as in gram and pea. 5. 7. One structure of a decotyledonous seed The outermost covering of a seed is the seed coat. The seed coat has two layers, the outer testa and the inner tegmen. The hilum is a scar on the seed coat through which the developing seeds were attached to the fruit. Above the hilum is a small pore called the micropile. Within the seed figure 5.17 parts of a fruit, a mango bee coconut a bee. Coat is the embryo, consisting of an embryonal axis and two cotyledons. The cotyledons are often fleshy and full of reserve food materials. At the two ends of the embryonal axis are present the radical and the plumule figure 5.18. In some seeds such as castor the endosperm formed as a result of double fertilization, is a food storing tissue and called endospermic seeds. In plants such as bean, gram and pea, the endosperm is not present in mature seeds and such seeds are called non-endospermous. Seed coat hilum micropile cotyledon plumule radical figure 5.18 structure of decotyledonous seed figure 5.19 structure of a monocotyledonous seed seed coat fruit wall alluron layer endosperm scutellum coleoptile plumule radical coleoriza endosperm embryo 5, 7, 2 structure of monocotyledonous seed generally, monocotyledonous seeds are endospermic but some as in orchids are non-endospermic. In the seeds of cereals such as maize the seed coat is membranous and generally fused with the fruit wall. The endosperm is bulky and stores food. The outer covering of endosperm separates the embryo by a proteinous layer called alluron layer. The embryo is small and situated in a groove at one end of the endosperm. It consists of one large and shield-shaped cotyledon known as scutellum and a short axis with a plumule and a radical. The plumule and radical are enclosed in sheets which are called coleoptile and coleoriza respectively figure 5.19. 5.8 Semi-technical description of atypical flower and plant Various morphological features are used to describe a flowering plant. The description has to be brief, in a simple and scientific language and presented in a proper sequence. The plant is described beginning with its habit, vegetative characters, roots, stem and leaves and then floral characters in fluorescence and flower parts. After describing various parts of plant, a floral diagram and a floral formula are presented. The floral formula is represented by some symbols. In the floral formula, BR stands for Bractea, K stands for Calyx, C for Corolla, P for Perianth, A for Andrachium and G for Genetium, G for Superior Ovary and G for Inferior Ovary, for Male, for Female, for Bisexual Plants, for Actinomorphic and for Zygomorphic Nature of Flower. Fusion is indicated by enclosing the figure within bracket and adhesion by a line drawn above the symbols of the floral parts. A floral diagram provides information about the number of parts of a flower, their arrangement and the relation they have with one another figure 5.20. The position of the mother axis with respect to the flower is represented by a dot on the top of the floral diagram. Calyx, corolla, andrachium and genetium are drawn in successive whorls, calyx being the outermost and the genetium being in the center. 
Floral formula also shows cohesion and adhesion within parts of whorls and between whorls. The floral diagram and floral formula in figure 5.20 represents the mustard plant family, Brassicaceae. 5.9 Description of some important families 5, 9, 1 Fabaceae This family was earlier called Pupilianoidae, a subfamily of family Leguminosae. It is distributed all over the world figure 5.21, vegetative characters trees, shrubs, herbs, root with root nodules stem, erect or climber leaves, alternate, pinnately compound or simple, leaf base, pulvinate, stipulate, venation reticulate. Figure 5.20 Floral Diagram with Floral Formula K22C4A24 G2 Morphology of Flower and Plant 79 BC A DEF Figure 5.21 Pism Sativum P Plant A Flowering Twig B Flower C Petals D Reproductive Parts E L S Carpal F Floral Diagram Floral Characters Inflorescence Racemose Flower Bisexual Zygomorphic Calyx Sepals 5 Gamosepalus Valvate and Bricut Estivation Corolla Petals 5 Polypetalus Papillionaceous Consisting of a posterior standard, two lateral wings, two anterior ones forming a keel and closing stamens and pistil, vexillary estivation and recium, 10, diadelphus, anthrodithicus genetium, ovary superior, monocarpillary, unilocular with many ovules, style single fruit, legume, seed, one to many, non-endospermic floral formula, K5C122A91G1 Economic importance Many plants belonging to the family are sources of pulses gram, arher, sem, moon, soybean, edible oil soybean, groundnut, diindigophora, fiber sunhemp, fodder sesbania, trifolium, ornamentals lupin, sweet pea, medicine muleothe. 5, 9, 2 Solanaceae It is a large family, commonly called as the potato family. It is widely distributed in tropics, subtropics and even temperate zones figure 5.22. Vegetative characters plants mostly herbs, shrubs and rarely small trees stem, herbaceous rarely woody. Aerial, erect, cylindrical, branched, solid. 80 Biology or hollow, hairy or glabrous, underground stem in potato solanum to berries and leaves, alternate. Simple, rarely pinnately compound, extipulate, venation reticulate floral characters in fluorescence, solitary. Axillary or cymos as in selenium flower, bisexual, actinomorphic calyx, sepals 5, united, persistent. Valvate estivation corolla, petals 5, united, valvate estivation and recium, stamens 5, epic petalus genetium, beaker pallary obligately placed. Syncarpus, ovary superior, bilocular, placenta swollen with many ovules, axile fruits, berry or capsule seeds, many. Endospermous floral formula, economic importance Many plants belonging to this family are a source of food tomato, brinjal, potato, spiced chili, medicine belladonna, ashwagandha, fumigatory tobacco, ornamentals petunia. B -A -C -D -E -F figure 5.22 Selenium nigra macoy plant, a flowering twig B flower CLS. A flower D stamens E carpal F floral diagram. 5, 9, 3 Liliaceae commonly called the lily family is a characteristic representative of monocotyledonous plants. It is distributed worldwide figure 5.23, vegetative characters, perennial herbs with underground bulbs corms rhizomes leaves mostly basal. Alternate, linear, extipulate with parallel venation floral characters in fluorescence, solitary cymos, often umbilic clusters flower, bisexual, actinomorphic perianth tepal 633. Often united into tube. Valvate estivation and recium, stamen 6, 3 3, Epidopilus genetium, tricarpillary. Syncarpus, ovary superior, trilocular with many ovules, axile placentation fruit, capsule, rarely berry seed, endospermous floral formula, BRP33A33G3. Economic importance Many plants belonging to this family are good ornamentals. Tulip. Clarissa, source of medicine aloe, vegetables asparagus, and colchicine colchicum autumn nail. Figure 5.23 Allium sepa onion plant, a plant B in fluorescence C flower D floral diagram DCB. Summary flower in plants exhibit enormous variation in shape, size, structure, mode of nutrition, lifespan, habit, and habitat. They have well developed root and shoot systems. Root system is either tap root or fibrous. Generally, decotyledonous plants have tap roots while monocotyledonous plants have fibrous roots. The roots in some plants get modified for storage of food, mechanical support and respiration. The shoot system is differentiated into stem, leaves, flowers and fruits. The morphological features of stems like the presence of nodes and internodes, multicellular hair and positively phototropic nature help to differentiate the stems from roots. 
Stems also get modified to perform diverse functions such as storage of food, vegetative propagation and protection under different conditions. Leaf is a lateral outgrowth of stem developed exogenously at the node. These are green in color to perform the function of photosynthesis. Leaves exhibit marked variations in their shape, size, margin, apex and extent of incisions of leaf blade lamina. Like other parts of plants, the leaves also get modified into other structures such as tendrils, spines for climbing and protection respectively. The flower is a modified shoot, meant for sexual reproduction. The flowers are arranged in different types of inflorescences. They exhibit enormous variation in structure, symmetry, position of ovary in relation to other parts, arrangement of petals, sepals, ovules etc. After fertilization, the ovary is modified into fruits and ovules into seeds. Seeds either may be monocotyledonous or decotyledonous. They vary in shape, size and period of viability. The floral characteristics form the basis of classification and identification of flowering plants. This can be illustrated through semi-technical descriptions of families. Hence, a flowering plant is described in a definite sequence by using scientific terms. The floral features are represented in the summarized form as floral diagrams and floral formula. Exercise is 1. What is meant by modification of root? What type of modification of root is found in the abanyan tree b turnip c mangrove trees 2? Justify the following statements on the basis of external features. I underground parts of a plant are not always roots. 2. Flower is a modified shoot 3. How is a pinnately compound leaf different from a palmately compound leaf 4? Explain with suitable examples the different types of philodexy. 5. Define the following terms, A estivation B placentation C ectonomorphic D zygomorphic E superior ovary F perogenous flower G epipetalous stamen 6. Differentiate between a racemose and cymose inflorescence B fibrous root and adventitious root C apicarpus and syncarpus ovary 7. Draw the label diagram of the following, Igram C2VS of May seed 8, describe modifications of stem with suitable examples. 9. Take one flower each of the families Fabaceae and Solanaceae and write its semi-technical description. Also draw their floral diagram after studying them. 10. Describe the various types of placentations found in flowering plants. 11. What is a flower? Describe the parts of a typical angiosperm flower. 12. How do the various leaf modifications help plants? 13. Define the term inflorescence. Explain the basis for the different types of inflorescence in flowering plants. 14. Write the floral formula of the ectonomorphic, bisexual, hypogenous flower with five united sepals, five free petals, five free stamens and two united carpels with superior ovary and axial placentation. 15. Describe the arrangement of floral members in relation to their insertion on thalamus 2018-1. 84. Biology You can very easily see the structural similarities and variations in the external morphology of the larger living organism, both plants and animals. Similarly, if we were to study the internal structure, one also finds several similarities as well as differences. This chapter introduces you to the internal structure and functional organization of higher plants. Study of internal structure of plants is called anatomy. Plants have cells as the basic unit. Cells are organized into tissues and in turn the tissues are organized into organs. Different organs in a plant show differences in their internal structure. Within angiosperms, the monocots and dicots are also seen to be anatomically different. Internal structures also show adaptations to diverse environments 6.1 The tissues 8 tissue is a group of cells having a common origin and usually performing a common function. A plant is made up of different kinds of tissues. Tissues are classified into two main groups, namely, meristematic and permanent tissues based on whether the cells being formed are capable of dividing or not. 6. 1. 1. Meristematic tissues growth in plants is largely restricted to specialized regions of active cell division called meristems GK. Meristas, divided, plants have different kinds of meristems. The meristems which occur at the tips of roots and shoots and produce primary tissues are called apical meristems figure 6.1. Anatomy of flower and plants chapter 6 6.1 The tissue 6.2 The tissue system 6.3 Anatomy of decotyledonous and monocotyledonous plants 6.4 Secondary growth Root apical meristem occupies the tip of the root while the shoot apical meristem occupies the distant most region of the stem axis. During the formation of leaves and elongation of stem, some cells left behind from shoot apical meristem, constitute the axillary bud. Such buds are present in the axils of leaves and are capable of forming a branch or a flower. The meristem which occurs between mature tissues is known as intercalary meristem. They occur in grasses and regenerate parts removed by the grazing herbivores. Both apical meristems and intercalary meristems are primary meristems because they appear early in life of a plant and contribute to the formation of the primary plant body. 
the meristem that occurs in the mature regions of roots and shoots of many plants, particularly those that produce woody axis and appear later than primary meristem is called the secondary or lateral meristem. They are cylindrical meristems, fascicular vascular cambium, interfascicular cambium and cork cambium are examples of lateral meristems. These are responsible for producing the secondary tissues, following divisions of cells in both primary and as well as secondary meristems, the newly formed cells become structurally and functionally specialized and lose the ability to divide. Such cells are termed permanent or mature cells and constitute the permanent tissues. During the formation of the primary plant body, specific regions of the apical meristem produce dermal tissues, ground tissues and vascular tissues. Central cylinder cortex protoderm initials of central cylinder and cortex initials of root cap root cap root apical meristem leaf primordium shoot apical meristematic zone axillary bud differentiating vascular tissue figure 6.1 apical meristem, a root B shoot. 6, 1, 2 Permanent tissues The cells of the permanent tissues do not generally divide further. Permanent tissues having all cells similar in structure and function are called simple tissues. Permanent tissues having many different types of cells are called complex tissues. 6, 1, 2, 1 Simple tissues A simple tissue is made of only one type of cells. The various simple tissues in plants are parenchyma, colenchyma and sclerenchyma. Figure 6.2 Parenchyma forms the major component within organs. The cells of the parenchyma are generally isodiametric. They may be spherical, oval, round, polygonal or elongated in shape. Their walls are thin and made up of cellulose. They may either be closely packed or have small intercellular spaces. The parenchyma performs various functions like photosynthesis, storage, secretion. The colenchyma occurs in layers below the epidermis in most of the decotyledonous plants. It is found either as a homogeneous layer or in patches. It consists of cells which are much thickened at the corners due to a deposition of cellulose, hemocellulose and pectin. Colenchymatous cells may be oval, spherical or polygonal and often contain chloroplasts. These cells assimilate food when they contain chloroplasts. Intercellular spaces are absent. They provide mechanical support to the growing parts of the plant such as young stem and petiole of a leaf. Sclerenchyma consists of long, narrow cells with thick and lignified cell walls having a few or numerous pits. They are usually dead and without protoplasts. On the basis of variation in form, structure, origin and development, sclerenchyma may be either fibers or sclerians. The fibers are thick-walled, elongated and pointed cells, generally occurring in groups, in various parts of the plant. The sclerians are spherical, oval or cylindrical. Highly thickened dead cells with very intercellular space figure 6.2 simple tissues, a parenchyma B colenchyma C sclerenchyma A fiber A sclerid C lumen thick cell wall lumen pits thick cell wall B thickened corners protoplasm vacuole cell wall A. Narrow cavities lumen, these are commonly found in the fruit walls of nuts, pulp of fruits like guava, pear and sapota, seed coats of legumes and leaves of tea. Sclerenchyma provides mechanical support to organ 6, 1. 2. 2 Complex Tissues The complex tissues are made of more than one type of cells and these work together as a unit. Xylem and phloem constitute the complex tissues in plants figure 6.3. Xylem functions as a conducting tissue for water and minerals from roots to the stem and leaves. It also provides mechanical strength to the plant parts. It is composed of four different kinds of elements, namely, tracheids, vessels, xylem fibers and xylem parenchyma. Gymnosperms lack vessels in their xylem. Tracheids are elongated or tube-like cells with thick and lignified walls and tapering ends. These are dead and are without protoplasm. The inner layers of the cell walls have thickenings which vary in form. In flowering plants, tracheids and vessels are the main water-transporting elements. Vessel is a long cylindrical tube-like structure made up of many cells called vessel members, each with lignified walls and a large central cavity. The vessel cells are also devoid of protoplasm. Vessel members are interconnected through perforations in their common walls. The presence of vessels is a characteristic feature of angiosperms. Xylem fibers have highly thickened walls and obliterated central lumens. These may either be septate or aseptate. Xylem parenchyma cells are living and thin-walled, and their cell walls are made up of cellulose. They store food materials in the form of starch or fat, and other substances like tannins. The radial conduction of water takes place by the ray parenchymata cells. Primary xylem is of two types, protoxylem and metaxylem. The first formed primary xylem elements are called protoxylem and the later formed primary xylem is called metaxylem. In stems, the protoxylem lies towards the center pith and the metaxylem lies towards the periphery of the organ. This type of primary xylem is called endarch. In roots, the protoxylem lies towards periphery and metaxylem lies towards the center. Such arrangement of primary xylem is called exarch. Phloem transports food materials, usually from leaves to other parts of the plant. 
phloem and angiosperms is composed of sieve tube elements, companion cells, phloem parenchyma phloem parenchyma companion cell B sieve pore sieve tube element figure 6.3 asylum B phloem a tracheid vessels and phloem fibers, gymnosperms have albuminous cells and sieve cells, they lack sieve tubes and companion cells. Sieve tube elements are also long, tube-like structures, arranged longitudinally and are associated with the companion cells. Their end walls are perforated in a sieve-like manner to form the sieve plates. A mature sieve element possesses a peripheral cytoplasm and a large vacuole that lacks a nucleus. The functions of sieve tubes are controlled by the nucleus of companion cells. The companion cells are specialized parenchymatous cells, which are closely associated with sieve tube elements. The sieve tube elements and companion cells are connected by pit fields present between their common longitudinal walls. The companion cells help in maintaining the pressure gradient in the sieve tubes. Phloem parenchyma is made up of elongated, tapering cylindrical cells which have dense cytoplasm and nucleus. The cell wall is composed of cellulose and has pits through which plasma decimal connections exist between the cells. The phloem parenchyma stores food material and other substances like resins, latex and mucilage. Phloem parenchyma is absent in most of the monocotyledons. Phloem fibers Bast fibers are made up of sclerenchymatous cells. These are generally absent in the primary phloem but are found in the secondary phloem. These are much elongated, unbranched and have pointed, needle-like apices. The cell wall of phloem fibers is quite thick. At maturity, these fibers lose their protoplasm and become dead. Phloem fibers of jute, flax and hemp are used commercially. The first formed primary phloem consists of narrow sieve tubes and is referred to as protofloem and the later formed phloem has bigger sieve tubes and is referred to as metafloem. 6.2 The tissue system We were discussing types of tissues based on the types of cells present. Let us now consider how tissues vary depending on their location in the plant body. Their structure and function would also be dependent on location. On the basis of their structure and location, there are three types of tissue systems. These are the epidermal tissue system, the ground or fundamental tissue system and the vascular or conducting tissue system. 6. 2. 1. Epidermal tissue system The epidermal tissue system forms the outermost covering of the whole plant body and comprises epidermal cells. Stomata and the epidermal appendages, the trichomes and hairs, the epidermis is the outermost layer of the primary plant body. It is made up of elongated, compactly. The cells of epidermis bear a number of hairs. The root hairs are unicellular elongations of the epidermal cells and help absorb water and minerals from the soil. On the stem the epidermal hairs are called trichomes. The trichomes in the shoot system are usually multicellular. They may be branched or unbranched and soft or stiff. They may even be secretory. The trichomes help in preventing water loss due to transpiration. 6. 2. To the ground tissue system all tissues except epidermis and vascular bundles constitute the ground tissue. It consists of simple tissue such as parenchyma, calenchyma and sclerenchyma. Parenchymatous cells are usually present in cordex, paracycle, pith and metal airy rays, in the primary stems and roots. In leaves, the ground tissue consists of thin-walled chloroplast containing cells and is called mesophyll. Arranged cells, which form a continuous layer, epidermis is usually single-layered. Epidermal cells are parenchymatous with a small amount of cytoplasm lining the cell wall and a large vacuole. The outside of the epidermis is often covered with a waxy thick layer called the cuticle which prevents the loss of water. Cuticle is absent in roots. Stomata are structures present in the epidermis of leaves. Stomata regulate the process of transpiration and gaseous exchange. Each stoma is composed of two bean-shaped cells known as guard cells which enclose stomatal pore. In grasses, the guard cells are dumbbell-shaped. The outer walls of guard cells away from the stomatal pore are thin and the inner walls towards the stomatal pore are highly thickened. The guard cells possess chloroplasts and regulate the opening and closing of stomata. Sometimes, a few epidermal cells in the vicinity of the guard cells become specialized in their shape and size and are known as subsidiary cells. The stomatal aperture, guard cells and the surrounding subsidiary cells are together called stomatal apparatus figure 6.4. Figure 6.4 Diagrammatic Representation A stomata with bean-shaped guard cells B stomata with dumbbell-shaped guard cell Epidermal cell subsidiary cells guard cell stomatal pore chloroplast 6, 2, 3 The vascular tissue system The vascular system consists of complex tissues. The phloem and the xylem The xylem and phloem together constitute vascular bundles Figure 6.5 In decotyledonous stems, cambium is present between phloem and xylem. Such vascular bundles because of the presence of cambium possess the ability to form secondary xylem and phloem tissues, and hence are called open vascular bundles. In the monocotyledons, the vascular bundles have no cambium present in them, hence, since they do not form secondary tissues they are referred to as closed. 
when xylem and phloem within a vascular bundle are arranged in an alternate manner along the different radii, the arrangement is called radial such as in roots. In conjoint type of vascular bundles, the xylem and phloem are jointly situated along the same radius of vascular bundles. Such vascular bundles are common in stems and leaves. The conjoint vascular bundles usually have the phloem located only on the outer side of xylem. 6.3 Anatomy of decotyledonous and monocotyledonous plants for a better understanding of tissue organization of roots. Stems and leaves. It is convenient to study the transverse sections of the mature zones of these organs. 6. 3. 1 Decotyledonous root. Look at figure 6.6a. It shows the transverse section of the sunflower root. The internal tissue organization is as follows. The outermost layer is epiblema. Many of the cells of epiblema protrude in the form of unicellular root tears. The cortex consists of several layers of thin walled parenchyma cells figure 6.5 various types of vascular bundles, a radial B conjoint closed C conjoint open. With intercellular spaces, the innermost layer of the cortex is called endodermis. It comprises a single layer of barrel-shaped cells without any intercellular spaces. The tangential as well as radial walls of the endodermal cells have a deposition of water impermeable, waxy material superin in the form of casparian strips. Next to endodermis lies the few layers of thick-walled parenchymata cells referred to as paracycle. Initiation of lateral roots and vascular cambium during the secondary growth takes place in these cells. The pith is small or inconspicuous. The parenchymatous cells which lie between the xylem and the phloem are called conjunctive tissue. There are usually two to four xylem and phloem patches. Later, a cambium ring develops between the xylem and phloem. All tissues on the inner side of the endodermis such as paracycle, vascular bundles and pith constitute the steel. 6. 3. 2. Monocotyledonous root The anatomy of the monocot root is similar to the dicot root in many respects figure 6.6b. It has epidermis, cortex, endodermis, paracycle, vascular bundles and pith. As compared to the dicot root which have fewer xylem bundles, there are usually more than six polyarch xylem bundles in the monocot root. Pith is large and well developed. Monocotyledonous roots do not undergo any secondary growth. 6. 3. 3. Decotyledonous stem The transverse section of a typical young decotyledonous stem shows that the epidermis is the outermost protective layer of the stem root hair epidermis cortex endodermis protoxylum metazylum pith phloem a paracycle root hair cortex endodermis phloem protoxylum pith metazylum b epidermis paracycle figure 6.6 ts colon a dicot root primary b monocot root Figure 6.7a, covered with a thin layer of cuticle, it may bear trichomes and a few stomata, the cells arranged in multiple layers between epidermis and paracycle constitute the cortex. It consists of three subzones, the outer hypodermis, consists of a few layers of colonchymata cells just below the epidermis, which provide mechanical strength to the young stem. Cortical layers below hypodermis consist of rounded thin wall parenchymata cells with conspicuous intercellular spaces. The innermost layer of the cortex is called the endodermis. The cells of the endodermis are rich in starch grains and the layer is also referred to as the starch sheath. Paracycle is figure 6.7 TS of stem, a dicot B monocot. Present on the inner side of the endodermis and above the phloem in the form of semilunar patches of sclerenchyma. In between the vascular bundles there are a few layers of radially placed parenchymatous cells, which constitute medullary rays. A large number of vascular bundles are arranged in a ring. The ring arrangement of vascular bundles is a characteristic of dicot stem. Each vascular bundle is conjoined, open, and with endarch protoxylum, a large number of rounded, parenchymatous cells with large intercellular spaces which occupy the central portion of the stem constitute the pith. 6. 3. 4. Monocotyledonous stem The monocot stem has a sclerenchymatous hypodermis, a large number of scattered vascular bundles, each surrounded by a sclerenchymatous bundle sheath, and a large, conspicuous parenchymatous ground tissue figure 6.7b. Vascular bundles are conjoint and closed. Peripheral vascular bundles are generally smaller than the centrally located ones. The phloem parenchyma is absent, and water-containing cavities are present within the vascular bundles. 6. 3. 5 dorsoventral decotyledonous leaf The vertical section of a dorsoventral leaf through the lamina shows three main parts, namely, epidermis, mesophyll and vascular system. The epidermis which covers both the upper surface adaxial epidermis and lower surface abaxial epidermis of the leaf has a conspicuous cuticle. The abaxial epidermis generally bears more stomata than the adaxial epidermis, the latter may even lack stomata. The tissue between the upper and the lower epidermis is called the mesophyll. Mesophyll, which possesses chloroplasts and carry out photosynthesis, is made up of parenchyma. 
It has two types of cells, the palisade parenchyma and the spongy parenchyma. The adaxially placed palisade parenchyma is made up of elongated cells, which are arranged vertically and parallel to each other. The oval around and loosely arranged spongy parenchyma is situated below the palisade cells and extends to the lower epidermis. There are numerous large spaces and air cavities between these cells. Vascular system includes vascular bundles, which can be seen in the veins in the midrib. The size of the vascular bundles are dependent on the size of the veins. The veins vary in thickness in the reticulate venation of the dicot leaves. The vascular bundles are surrounded by a layer of thick walled bundle sheath cells. Look at figure 6.8 and find the position of xylem in the vascular bundle. 6. 3. 6. Isobilateral monocotyledonous leaf The anatomy of isobilateral leaf is similar to that of the dorsoventral leaf in many ways. It shows the following characteristic differences. In an isobilateral leaf, the stomata are present on both the surfaces of the epidermis, and the mesophyll is not differentiated into palisade and spongy parenchyma figure 6.8b. In grasses, certain adaxial epidermal cells along the veins modify themselves into large, empty, colorless cells. These are called bulliform cells. When the bulliform cells in the leaves have absorbed water and are turgid, the leaf surface is exposed. When they are flaccid due to water stress, they make the leaves curl inwards to minimize water loss. The parallel venation in monocot leaves is reflected in the near similar sizes of vascular bundles except in main veins as seen in vertical sections of the leaves. 6.4 Secondary growth The growth of the roots and stems in length with the help of apical marrow stem is called the primary growth. Apart from primary growth most decotyledonous plants exhibit an increase in girth. This increase is called the secondary growth. The tissues involved in secondary growth are the two lateral meristems, vascular cambium and cork cambium. 6. 4. 1. Vascular cambium The meristematic layer that is responsible for cutting off vascular tissues, xylem and phloem, is called vascular cambium. In the young stem it is present in patches as a single layer between the xylem and phloem. Later it forms a complete ring. 6. 4. 1. 1. Formation of cambial ring in dicot stems. The cells of cambium present between primary xylem and primary phloem is the intrafascicular cambium. Figure 6.8 TS of leaf, a dicot B monocot. The cells of medullary rays, adjoining these intrafascicular cambium become meristematic and form the intrafascicular cambium. Thus, a continuous ring of cambium is formed 6, 4, 1, to activity of the cambial ring the cambial ring becomes active and begins to cut off new cells, both towards the inner and the outer sides. The cells cut off towards pith, mature into secondary xylem and the cells cut off towards periphery mature into secondary phloem. The cambium is generally more active on the inner side than on the outer, as a result, the amount of secondary xylem produced is more than secondary phloem and soon forms a compact mess. The primary and secondary phloems get gradually crushed due to the continued formation and accumulation of secondary xylem. The primary xylem however remains more or less intact, in or around the center. At some places, the cambium forms a narrow band of parenchyma, which passes through the secondary xylem and the secondary phloem in the radial directions. These are the secondary medullary rays figure 6.9, figure 6.9 secondary growth in a dicot stem diagrammatic stages and transverse views. 6, 4, 1, 3 spring wood and autumn wood The activity of cambium is under the control of many physiological and environmental factors. In temperate regions, the climatic conditions are not uniform through the year. In the spring season, cambium is very active and produces a large number of xylary elements having vessels with wider cavities. The wood formed during this season is called spring wood or early wood. In winter, the cambium is less active and forms fewer xylary elements that have narrow vessels, and this wood is called autumn wood or late wood. The spring wood is lighter in color and has a lower density whereas the autumn wood is darker and has a higher density. The two kinds of woods that appear as alternate concentric rings, constitute an annual ring. Annual rings seen in a cut stem give an estimate of the age of the tree. 6, 4, 1, 4 heartwood and sapwood in old trees. The greater part of secondary xylem is dark brown due to deposition of organic compounds like tannins, resins, oils, gums, aromatic substances and essential oils in the central or innermost layers of the stem. These substances make it hard, durable and resistant to the attacks of microorganisms and insects. This region comprises dead elements with highly lignified walls and is called heartwood. The heartwood does not conduct water but it gives mechanical support to the stem. The peripheral region of the secondary xylem is lighter in color and is known as the sapwood. It is involved in the conduction of water and minerals from root to leaf. 6, 4, 2 cork cambium as the stem continues to increase in girth due to the activity of vascular cambium. The outer cortical and epidermis layers get broken and need to be replaced to provide new protective cell layers. 
Hence, sooner or later, another meristematic tissue called cork cambium or phelogen develops, usually in the cortex region. Phelogen is a couple of layers thick. It is made of narrow, thin-walled and nearly rectangular cells. Phelogen cuts off cells on both sides. The outer cells differentiate into cork or phelum while the inner cells differentiate into secondary cortex or pheladerm. The cork is impervious to water due to superin deposition in the cell wall. The cells of secondary cortex are parenchymatous. Phelogen, phelum, and pheladerm are collectively known as paraderm, due to activity of the cork cambium. Pressure builds up on the remaining layers peripheral. Figure 6.10 Olenticillin B bark B epidermis complementary cells cork cambium secondary cord exit to phelogen and ultimately these layers die and slough off. Bark is a non-technical term that refers to all tissues exterior to the vascular cambium, therefore including secondary phloem. Bark refers to a number of tissue types, viz. paraderm and secondary phloem. Bark that is formed early in the season is called early or soft bark. Towards the end of the season, late or hard bark is formed. Name the various kinds of cell layers which constitute the bark. At certain regions, the phelogen cuts off closely arranged parenchymatous cells on the outer side instead of cork cells. These parenchymatous cells soon rupture the epidermis, forming a lens-shaped openings called lenticels. Lenticels permit the exchange of gases between the outer atmosphere and the internal tissue of the stem. These occur in the most woody trees figure 6.1064. 3. Secondary growth in roots in the dicot root. The vascular cambium is completely secondary in origin. It originates from the tissue located just below the phloem bundles, a portion of paracycle tissue, above the protozylum forming a complete and continuous wavy ring, which later becomes circular figure 6.11. Further events are similar to those already described above for a dicotyledon stem. Secondary growth also occurs in stems and roots of gymnosperms. However, secondary growth does not occur in monocotyledons. Epidermis cortex primary phloem cambial ring endodermis paracycle protozylum epidermis vascular cambium secondary phloem primary xylem secondary xylem cortex epidermis paraderm cortex primary phloem annual ring secondary xylem secondary phloem rays. Figure 6.11 Different stages of the secondary growth in a typical dicot root cortex summary anatomically. A plant is made of different kinds of tissues. The plant tissues are broadly classified into meristematic apical, lateral and intercalary and permanent simple and complex. Assimilation of food and its storage, transportation of water, minerals and photosynthesis, and mechanical support are the main functions of tissues. There are three types of tissue systems epidermal, ground and vascular. The epidermal tissue systems are made of epidermal cells, stomata and the epidermal appendages. The ground tissue system forms the main bulk of the plant. It is divided into three zones cortex, paracycle and pith. The vascular tissue system is formed by the xylem and phloem. On the basis of presence of cambium, location of xylem and phloem, the vascular bundles are of different types. The vascular bundles form the conducting tissue and translocate water, minerals and food material. Monocotyledonous and decotyledonous plants show marked variation in their internal structures. They differ in type, number and location of vascular bundles. The secondary growth occurs in most of the decotyledonous roots and stems and it increases the girth diameter of the organs by the activity of the vascular cambium and the cork cambium. The wood is actually a secondary xylem. There are different types of wood on the basis of their composition and time of production. Exercises 1. State the location and function of different types of meristems 2. Cork cambium forms tissues that form the cork. Do you agree with this statement? Explain 3. Explain the process of secondary growth in the stems of woody angiosperms with the help of schematic diagrams. What is its significance for? Draw illustrations to bring out the anatomical difference between a monocot root and dicot root B monocot stem and dicot stem 5. Cut a transverse section of young stem of a plant from your school garden and observe it under the microscope. How would you ascertain whether it is a monocot stem or a dicot stem? Give reason 6. The transverse section of a plant material shows the following anatomical features of the vascular bundles are conjoined, scattered and surrounded by a sclerenchymatous bundle sheath. B. Phloem parenchyma is absent. What will you identify it as 7? Why are xylem and phloem called complex tissues 8? What is stomatal apparatus? Explain the structure of stomata with the label diagram 9. Name the three basic tissue systems in the flowering plants. Give the tissue names under each system 10. How is the study of plant anatomy useful to us 11? What is paraderm? How does paraderm formation take place in the dicot stems 12? Describe the internal structure of a dorsoventral leaf with the help of label diagrams. 100 Biology In the preceding chapters you came across a large variety of organisms, both unicellular and multicellular, of the animal kingdom. 
In unicellular organisms, all functions like digestion, respiration and reproduction are performed by a single cell. In the complex body of multicellular animals the same basic functions are carried out by different groups of cells in a well-organized manner. The body of a simple organism like Hydra is made of different types of cells and the number of cells in each type can be in thousands. The human body is composed of billions of cells to perform various functions. How do these cells in the body work together in multicellular animals? A group of similar cells along with intercellular substances perform a specific function. Such an organization is called tissue. You may be surprised to know that all complex animals consist of only four basic types of tissues. These tissues are organized in specific proportion and pattern to form an organ like stomach, lung, heart and kidney. When two or more organs perform a common function by their physical and or chemical interaction, they together form organ system, e.g., digestive system, respiratory system, etc. Cells, tissues, organs and organ systems split up the work in a way that exhibits division of labor and contribute to the survival of the body as a whole. 7.1 Animal tissues The structure of the cells vary according to their function. Therefore, the tissues are different and are broadly classified into four types, iapothelial, two connective, three muscular and iveneral. Structural organization in animals chapter 7 7.1 animal tissue 7.2 organ and organ system 7.3 earthworm 7.4 cockroach 7.5 frogs 7 1 1 epithelial tissue we commonly refer to an epithelial tissue as epithelium pl epithelia this tissue has a free surface which faces either a body fluid or the outside environment and thus provides a covering or a lining for some part of the body the cells are compactly packed with little intercellular matrix. There are two types of epithelial tissues namely simple epithelium and compound epithelium. Simple epithelium is composed of a single layer of cells and functions as a lining for body cavities, ducts, and tubes. The compound epithelium consists of two or more cell layers and has protective function as it does in our skin. On the basis of structural modification of the cells, simple epithelium is further divided into three types. These are isquamous, two cuboidal, three columnar figure 7.1. The squamous epithelium is made of a single thin layer of flattened cells with irregular boundaries. They are found in the walls of blood vessels and air sacs of lungs and are involved in functions like forming a diffusion boundary. The cuboidal epithelium is composed of a single layer of cube-like cells. This is commonly found in ducts of glands and tubular parts of nephrons and kidneys and its main functions are secretion and absorption. The epithelium of proximal convoluted tubule PCT of nephron in the kidney has microvilli. The columnar epithelium is composed of a single layer of tall and slender cells. Their nuclei are located at the base. Free surface may have microvilli. They are found in the lining of stomach and intestine and help in secretion and absorption. If the columnar or cuboidal cells bear cilia on their free surface they are called ciliated epithelium figure 7.1d. Their function is to move particles or mucus in a specific direction over the epithelium. They are mainly present in the inner surface of hollow organs like bronchioles and fallopian tubes. Figure 7.1 Simple epithelium, a squamous B cuboidal C columnar D columnar cells bearing cilia a flattened cell cube like cell tall cell BDC. Some of the columnar or cuboidal cells get specialized for secretion and are called glandular epithelium figure 7.2. They are mainly of two types, unicellular, consisting of isolated glandular cells goblet cells of the alimentary canal, and multicellular, consisting of cluster of cells salivary gland. On the basis of the mode of pouring of their secretions, glands are divided into two categories namely exocrine and endocrine glands. Exocrine glands secrete mucus, saliva, earwax, oil, milk, digestive enzymes and other cell products. These products are released through ducts or tubes, in contrast, endocrine glands do not have ducts. Their products called hormones are secreted directly into the fluid bathing the gland. Compound epithelium is made of more than one layer multilayered of cells and thus has a limited role in secretion and absorption figure 7.3. Their main function is to provide protection against chemical and mechanical stresses. They cover the dry surface of the skin, the moist surface of buccal cavity, pharynx, inner lining of ducts of salivary glands and of pancreatic ducts. All cells in epithelium are held together with little intercellular material. In nearly all animal tissues, specialized junctions provide both structural and functional links between its individual cells. Three types of cell junctions are found in the epithelium and other tissues. These are called as tight, adhering and gap junctions. Tight junctions help to stop substances from leaking across a tissue. Adhering junctions perform cementing to keep neighboring cells together. Gap junctions facilitate the cells to communicate with each other by connecting the cytoplasm of adjoining cells, for rapid transfer of ions, small molecules and sometimes big molecules. 
7. 1. 2. Connective tissue Connective tissues are most abundant and widely distributed in the body of complex animals. They are named connective tissues because of their special function of linking and supporting other tissues organs of the body. They range from soft connective tissues to specialized types, which figure 7.2 glandular epithelium, a unicellular B multicellular unicellular gland multicellular gland a B figure 7.3 compound epithelium multilayered cells. Fat storage area nucleus macrophage mass cell fibroblast collagen fibrous plasma membrane include cartilage, bone, adipose, and blood. In all connective tissues except blood, the cells secrete fibers of structural proteins called collagen or elastin. The fibers provide strength, elasticity and flexibility to the tissue. These cells also secrete modified polysaccharides, which accumulate between cells and fibers and act as matrix ground substance. Connective tissues are classified into three types, I loose connective tissue, two dense connective tissue and three specialized connective tissue. Loose connective tissue has cells and fibers loosely arranged in a semi-fluid ground substance, for example, a real or tissue present beneath the skin figure 7.4. Often it serves as a support framework for epithelium. It contains fibroblast cells that produce and secrete fibers, macrophages and mast cells. Adipose tissue is another type of loose connective tissue located mainly beneath the skin. The cells of this tissue are specialized to store fats. The excess of nutrients which are not used immediately are converted into fats and are stored in this tissue. Fibers and fibroblasts are compactly packed in the dense connective tissues. Orientation of fibers show a regular or irregular pattern and are called dense regular and dense irregular tissues. In the dense regular connective tissues, the collagen fibers are present in rows between many parallel bundles of fibers. Tendons, which attach skeletal muscles to bones and ligaments which attach one bone to another are examples of this tissue. Dense irregular connective tissue has fibroblasts and many fibers mostly collagen that are oriented differently figure 7.5. This tissue is present in the skin, cartilage, figure 7.4 loose connective tissue, a real or tissue B adipose tissue a B fibers collagen fiber a B figure 7.5 dense connective tissue, a dense regular B dense irregular. Bones and blood are various types of specialized connective tissues. The intracellular material of cartilage is solid and pliable and resists compression. Cells of this tissue chondrocytes are enclosed in small cavities within the matrix secreted by them figure 7.6a. Most of the cartilage's invertebrate embryos are replaced by bones in adults. Cartilage is present in the tip of nose, outer ear joints, between adjacent bones of the vertebral column, limbs and hands in adults. Bones have a hard and non-pliable ground substance rich in calcium salts and collagen fibers which give bone its strength figure 7.6b. It is the main tissue that provides structural frame to the body. Bones support and protect softer tissues and organs. The bone cells osteocytes are present in the spaces called lacunae. Limb bones, such as the long bones of the legs, serve weight-bearing functions. They also interact with skeletal muscles attached to them to bring about movements. The bone marrow in some bones is the site of production of blood cells. Blood is a fluid connective tissue containing plasma. Red blood cells are BC, white blood cells WBC and platelets figure 7.6C. It is the main circulating fluid that helps in the transport of various substances. You will learn more about blood in chapters 17 and 18. 7. 1. 3. Muscle tissue Each muscle is made of many long, cylindrical fibers arranged in parallel arrays. These fibers are composed of numerous fine fibrils, called myofibrils. Muscle fibers contract shorten in response to stimulation, then relax lengthen and return to their uncontracted state in a coordinated fashion. Their action moves the body to adjust to the changes in the environment and to maintain the positions of the various parts of the body. In general, muscles play an active role in all the movements of the body. Muscles are of three types, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Skeletal muscle tissue is closely attached to skeletal bones. In a typical muscle such as the biceps, striated striped skeletal muscle fibers are bundled together in a parallel fashion figure 7.7 a. A sheath of tough connective tissue encloses several bundles of muscle fibers. You will learn more about this in Chapter 20. Platelets WBC RBC at BC Figure 7.6 Specialized Connective Tissues, a cartilage B bone C blood. The smooth muscle fibers taper at both ends fusiform and do not show striations. Figure 7.7 B, cell junctions hold them together and they are bundled together in a connective tissue sheath. The wall of internal organs such as the blood vessels, stomach and intestine contains this type of muscle tissue. Smooth muscles are involuntary as their functioning cannot be directly controlled. We usually are not able to make it contract merely by thinking about it as we can do with skeletal muscles. 
Cardiac muscle tissue is a contractile tissue present only in the heart. Cell junctions fuse the plasma membranes of cardiac muscle cells and make them stick together. Figure 7.7c. Communication junctions intercalated discs at some fusion points allow the cells to contract as a unit. That is, when one cell receives a signal to contract, its neighbors are also stimulated to contract. 7. 1. For neural tissue Neural tissue exerts the greatest control over the body's responsiveness to changing conditions. Neurons, the unit of neural system are excitable cells figure 7.8, the neuroglial cell which constitute the rest of the neural system protect and support neurons. Neuroglia make up more than one half the volume of neural tissue in our body, when a neuron is suitably stimulated. An electrical disturbance is generated which swiftly travels along its plasma nucleus striations junction between adjacent cells nucleus striations smooth muscle fibers figure 7.7 .7 muscle tissue, a skeletal striated muscle tissue B smooth muscle tissue C cardiac muscle tissue at BC figure 7.8 neural tissue neuron with neuroglia dendrite cell body with nucleus axon neuroglia. Membrane, arrival of the disturbance at the neuron's endings, or output zone, triggers events that may cause stimulation or inhibition of adjacent neurons and other cells. You will study the details in Chapter 21. 7.2 Organ and Organ System The basic tissues mentioned above organized to form organs which in turn associate to form organ systems in the multicellular organisms. Such an organization is essential for more efficient and better coordinated activities of millions of cells constituting an organism. Each organ in our body is made of one or more type of tissues. For example, our heart consists of all the four types of tissues, that is, epithelial, connective, muscular and neural. We also notice, after some careful study that the complexity in organ and organ systems display certain discernible trend. This discernible trend is called evolutionary trend. You will study the details in class 12. You are being introduced to morphology and anatomy of three organisms at different evolutionary levels to show their organization and functioning. Morphology refers to study of form or externally visible features. In the case of plants or microbes, the term morphology precisely means only this. In case of animals this refers to the external appearance of the organs or parts of the body. The word anatomy conventionally is used for the study of morphology of internal organs in the animals. You will learn the morphology and anatomy of earthworm, cockroach and frog representing invertebrates and vertebrates. 7.3 Earthworm Earthworm is a reddish-brown terrestrial invertebrate that inhabits the upper layer of the moist soil. During daytime, they live in burrows made by boring and swallowing the soil. In the gardens, they can be traced by their fecal deposits known as worm castings. The common Indian earthworms are Theratoma and Lumbricus 7, 3, 1 Morphology Earthworms have long cylindrical body. The body is divided into more than 100 short segments which are similar metamers about 100-120 in number. The dorsal surface of the body is marked by a dark median mid-dorsal line dorsal blood vessel along the longitudinal axis of the body. The ventral surface is distinguished by the presence of genital openings pores. Anterior end consists of the mouth and the prostomium, a lobe which serves as a covering for the mouth and as a wedge to force open cracks in the soil into which the earthworm may crawl. The prostomium is sensory in function. The first body segment is called the peristomium buccal segment which contains the mouth. In a mature worm, segments. Structural organization in animals 107 14 16 are covered by a prominent dark band of glandular tissue called glytellum. Thus the body is divisible into three prominent regions, preclitlar, clitlar and postclitlar segments figure 7.9. Four pairs of spermathical apertures are situated on the ventrolateral sides of the intersegmental grooves, that is, fifth ninth segments. A single female genital pore is present in the mid-ventral line of 14th segment. A pair of male genital pores are present on the ventrolateral sides of the 18th segment. Numerous minute pores called nephrodia pores open on the surface of the body. In each body segment, except the first, last and glytellum, there are rows of S-shaped CD, embedded in the epidermal pits in the middle of each segment. CD can be extended or retracted. Their principal role is in locomotion 7, 3. To anatomy the body wall of the earthworm is covered externally by a thin non-cellular cuticle below which is the epidermis. Two muscle layers circular and longitudinal and an innermost coelomic epithelium. The epidermis is made figure 7.9 body of earthworm. A dorsal view B ventral view C lateral view showing mouth opening. Up of a single layer of columnar epithelial cells which contain secretory gland cells. The alimentary canal is a straight tube and runs between first to last segment of the body. Figure 7.10, a terminal mouth opens into the buccal cavity 1-3 segments which leads into muscular pharynx. A small narrow tube, esophagus 5-7 segments, continues into a muscular gizzard 8-9 segments. 
It helps in grinding the soil particles and decaying leaves, etc. The stomach extends from 914 segments. The food of the earthworm is decaying leaves and organic matter mixed with soil. Calciferous glands, present in the stomach, neutralize the humic acid present in humus. Intestine starts from the 15th segment onwards and continues till the last segment. A pair of short and conical intestinal kiki project from the intestine on the 26th segment. The characteristic feature of the intestine after 26th segment except the last 23rd 25th segments is the presence of internal median fold of dorsal wall called tiflosol. This increases the effective area of absorption in the intestine. The alimentary canal opens to the exterior by a small rounded aperture called anus. The ingested organic rich soil passes through the digestive tract where digestive enzymes break down complex food into smaller absorbable units. These simpler molecules are absorbed through intestinal membranes and are utilized. Theretoma exhibits a closed type of blood vascular system, consisting of blood vessels, capillaries and heart. Figure 7.11, due to closed circulatory system, blood is confined to the heart and blood vessels. Contractions keep blood circulating in one direction. Smaller blood vessels supply the gut, nerve cord, and the body wall. Blood glands are present on the fourth, fifth and sixth segments. They produce blood cells and hemoglobin which is dissolved in blood plasma. Blood cells are phagocytic in nature. Earthworms lack specialized breathing devices. Respiratory exchange occurs through moist body surface into their bloodstream. Mouth pharynx esophagus gizzard stomach pre typhlosillar part of intestine intestinal cecum lymph gland typhlosillar part of intestine intestinal lumen typhlosol 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 figure 7.10 alimentary canal of earthworm Structural organization in animals 109 The excretory organs occur as segmentally arranged coiled tubules called nephridia sing, nephridium. They are of three types, iseptal nephridia, present on both the sides of intersegmental septa of segment 15 to the last that open into intestine. Two integumentary nephridia, attached to lining of the body wall of segment 3 to the last that open on the body surface and three pharyngeal nephridia. Present as three paired tufts in the fourth. Fifth and sixth segments figure 7.12. These different types of nephridia are basically similar in structure. Nephridia regulate the volume and composition of the body fluids, and nephridium starts out as a funnel that collects excess fluid from coelomic chamber. The funnel connects with the tubular part of the nephridium which delivers the waste through a pore to the surface in the body wall into the digestive tube. Nervous system is basically represented by ganglia arranged segmentwise on the ventral paired nerve cord. The nerve cord in the anterior region third and fourth segments bifurcates, laterally encircling the pharynx and joins the cerebral ganglia dorsally to form a nerve ring. The cerebral ganglia along with other nerves in the ring integrate sensory input as well as command muscular responses of the body. Figure 7.11 Closed Circulatory System Figure 7.12 Nephridial System in Earthworm Sensory system does not have eyes but does possess light and touch sensitive organs receptor cells to distinguish the light intensities and to feel the vibrations in the ground. Worms have specialized chemoreceptors taste receptors which react to chemical stimuli. These sense organs are located on the anterior part of the worm. Earthworm is hermaphrodite bisexual, that is, testes and ovaries are present in the same individual figure 7.13. There are two pairs of testes present in the 10th and 11th segments. Their vasodeferentia deferentia run up to the 18th segment where they join the prostatic duct. Two pairs of accessory glands are present one pair each in the 17th and 19th segments. The common prostate and spermatic duct vasodeferentia opens to the exterior by a pair of male genital pores on the ventrolateral side of the 18th segment. Four pairs of spermatheci are located in 6th ninth segments one pair in each segment. They receive and store spermatozoa during copulation. One pair of ovaries is attached at the intersegmental septum of the 12th and 13th segments. Ovarian funnels are present beneath the ovaries which continue into oviduct. Join together and open on the ventral side as a single median female genital pore on the 14th segment. A mutual exchange of sperm occurs between two worms during mating. One worm has to find another worm and they may juxtaposing opposite gonadal openings exchanging packets of sperms called spermatophores. Mature sperm and egg cells and nutritive fluid are deposited in cocoons produced by the gland cells of clitellum. Fertilization and development occur within the cocoons which are deposited in soil. The ova eggs are fertilized by the sperm cells within the cocoon which then slips off the worm and is deposited in or on the soil. The cocoon holds the worm embryos. After about three weeks, each cocoon produces two to twenty baby worms with an average of four. Development of earthworms is direct, that is, there is no larva formed. Figure 7.13 Reproductive System of Earthworm
Earthworms are known as friends of farmers because they make burrows in the soil and make it porous which helps in respiration and penetration of the developing plant roots. The process of increasing fertility of soil by the earthworms is called vermicomposting. They are also used as bait in game fishing. 7.4 Cockroach Cockroaches are brown or black-bodied animals that are included in class Insecta phylum Arthropoda. Bright yellow, red and green colored cockroaches have also been reported in tropical regions. Their size ranges from 1 quarter inches to 3 inches 0.67.6 centimeters and have long antenna, legs and flat extension of the upper body wall that conceals head. They are nocturnal omnivores that live in damp places throughout the world. They have become residents of human homes and thus are serious pests and vectors of several diseases. 7. 4. One morphology The adults of the common species of cockroach, Paraplanida americana are about 34-53 mm long with wings that extend beyond the tip of the abdomen in males. The body of the cockroach is segmented and divisible into three distinct regions, head, thorax and abdomen figure 7.14. The entire body is covered by a hard chitinous exoskeleton brown in color. In each segment, exoskeleton has hardened plates called sclerites tergites dorsally and sternites ventrally that are joined to each other by a thin and flexible articular membrane or throatial membrane. Figure 7.14 External Features of Cockroach Head is triangular in shape and lies anteriorly at right angles to the longitudinal body axis. It is formed by the fusion of six segments and shows great mobility in all directions due to flexible neck figure 7.15. The head capsule bears a pair of compound eyes. A pair of thread-like antennae arise from membranous sockets lying in front of eyes. Antennae have sensory receptors that help in monitoring the environment. Anterior end of the head bears appendages forming biting and chewing type of mouth parts. The mouth parts consisting of a labrum upper lip, a pair of mandibles, a pair of maxillae and a labium lower lip. A median flexible lobe, acting as tongue hypopharynx, lies within the cavity enclosed by the mouth parts figure 7.15b. Thorax consists of three parts, prothorax, mesothorax and metathorax. The head is connected with thorax by a short extension of the prothorax known as the neck. Each thoracic segment bears a pair of walking legs, the first pair of wings arises from mesothorax and the second pair from metathorax. Four wings mesothoracic called tegmina are opaque dark and leathery and cover the hind wings when at rest. The hind wings are transparent, membranous and are used in flight. The abdomen in both males and females consists of ten segments. In females, the seventh sternum is boat-shaped and together with the eighth and ninth sterna forms a brood or genital pouch whose anterior part contains female gonopore spermathical pores and collateral glands. In males, genital pouch or chamber lies at the hind end of abdomen bounded dorsally by ninth and tenth turga and ventrally by the ninth sternum. It contains dorsal anus, ventral male genital pore and gonopothesis. Males bear a pair of short, thread-like anal styles which are absent in females. In both sexes, the tenth segment bears a pair of jointed filamentous structures called anal cherchi. Ocellus compound eye mandible maxilla labrum labium a figure 7.15 head region of cockroach, a parts of head region B mouth parts grinding region and sizing region mandible maxilla labrum hypopharynx labium mandible maxilla B. 7, 4, 2 anatomy the alimentary canal present in the body cavity is divided into three regions, foregut, midgut and hindgut figure 7.16. The mouth opens into a short tubular pharynx, leading to a narrow tubular passage called esophagus. This in turn opens into a sac-like structure called crop used for storing of food. The crop is followed by gizzard or proventriculus. It has an outer layer of thick circular muscles and thick inner cuticle forming six highly chitinous plate called teeth. Gizzard helps in grinding the food particles. The entire foregut is lined by cuticle. A ring of six eight blind tubules called hepatic or gastric ceci is present at the junction of foregut and midgut, which secrete digestive juice. At the junction of midgut and hindgut is present another ring of 100 150 yellow colored thin filamentous malpighian tubules. They help in removal of excretory products from humor lymph. The hindgut is broader than midgut and is differentiated into ileum, colon, and rectum. The rectum opens out through anus. Blood vascular system of cockroach is an open type figure 7.17. Blood vessels are poorly developed and open into space hemocol. Visceral organs located in the hemocol are baked in blood hemolymph. The hemolymph is composed of colorless plasma and hemocytes. Heart of cockroach consists of elongated muscular tube lying along mid-dorsal line of thorax and abdomen. It is differentiated into funnel-shaped chambers with ostea on either side. Blood from sinuses enter heart through ostea and is pumped anteriorly to sinuses again. The respiratory system consists of a network of trachea, that open through ten pairs of small holes called spiracles present on the lateral side of the body. 
Thin branching tubes tracheal tubes subdivided into tracheals carry oxygen from the air to all the parts. The salivary gland pharynx salivary reservoir esophagus crop gizzard hepatic cecum mesenteron or migut nalpigian tubules ilium colon rectum figure 7.16 elementary canal of cockroach anterior aorta alary muscles chambers of heart figure 7.17 open circulatory system of cockroach. Opening of the spiracles is regulated by the sphincters. Exchange of gases take place at the tracheals by diffusion. Excretion is performed by malpighian tubules. Each tubule is lined by glandular and ciliated cells. They absorb nitrogenous waste products and convert them into uric acid which is excreted out through the hindgut. Therefore, this insect is called uricotelic. In addition, the fat body, nephrocytes and uricose glands also help in excretion. The nervous system of cockroach consists of a series of fused, segmentally arranged ganglia joined by paired longitudinal connectives on the ventral side. Three ganglia lie in the thorax, and six in the abdomen. The nervous system of cockroach is spread throughout the body. The head holds a bit of a nervous system while the rest is situated along the ventral belly side part of its body. So, now you understand that if the head of a cockroach is cut off, it will still live for as long as one week. In the head region, the brain is represented by supraesophageal ganglion which supplies nerves to antennae and compound eyes. In cockroach, the sense organs are antennae, eyes, maxillary palps, labial palps, anal cherchi, etc. The compound eyes are situated at the dorsal surface of the head. Each eye consists of about 2,000 hexagonal omatidia sing, omatidium. With the help of several omatidia, a cockroach can receive several images of an object. This kind of vision is known as mosaic vision with more sensitivity but less resolution, being common during night heads called nocturnal vision. Cockroaches are dioecious and both sexes have well-developed reproductive organs figure 7.18. Male reproductive system consists of a pair of testes one lying on each lateral side in the fourth six abdominal segments. From each testis arises a thin vas deferens, which opens into ejaculatory duct through seminal vesicle. The ejaculatory duct opens into male gonopore situated ventral to anus. A characteristic mushroom-shaped gland is present in the sixth seventh abdominal segments which functions as an accessory reproductive gland. The external genitalia are represented by male gonopophysis or phalomere chitinous asymmetrical structures, surrounding the male gonopore. The sperms are stored in the seminal vesicles and are glued together in the form of bundles called spermatophores which are discharged during copulation. The female reproductive syzygium consists of two large ovaries, lying laterally in the second sixth abdominal segments. Each ovary is formed of a group of eight ovarian tubules or ovarioles, containing a chain of developing ova. Oviducts of each ovary unite into a single median oviduct also called vagina which opens into the genital chamber. A pair of spermatheca is present in the sixth segment which opens into the genital chamber. Sperms are transferred through spermatophores. Their fertilized eggs are encased in capsules called oothesi. Oatheca is a dark reddish to blackish brown capsule, about 388 mm long. They are dropped or glued to a suitable surface, usually in a crack or crevice of high relative humidity near a food source. On an average, females produce 9-10 oatheci, each containing 14-16 eggs. The development of P. americana is poromatobilis, meaning there is development through nymphal stage. The nymphs look very much like adults. The nymph grows by molting about 13 times to reach the adult form. The next to last nymphal stage has wing pads but only adult cockroaches have wings. Many species of cockroaches are wild and are of no known economic importance yet. A few species thrive in and around human habitat. They are pests because they spoil food and contaminate it with their smelly excreta. They can transmit a variety of bacterial diseases by contaminating food material. Testis phallic gland small tubules long tubules seminal vesicle vas deferens ejaculatory duct right phalomere ventral phalomere anal circus quadral style pseudopenis titillator left phalomere ovary oviduct common oviduct or vagina collaterial glands genital chamber vestibulum genital pouch spermatheca gonapophysis figure 7.18 reproductive system of cockroach a male b female a b 7.5 frogs frogs can live both on land and in fresh water and belong to class amphibia of phylum chordata the most common species of frog found in India is Rana tigrina. They do not have constant body temperature that is, their body temperature varies with the temperature of the environment. Such animals are called cold-blooded or poikilotherms. You might have also noticed changes in the color of the frogs while they are in grasses and on dry land. They have the ability to change the color to hide them from their enemies' camouflage. This protective coloration is called mimicry. You may also know that the frogs are not seen during peak summer and winter. During this period they take shelter in deep burrows to protect them from extreme heat and cold. This is called as summer sleep estivation and winter sleep hibernation respectively 7, 5, 
One morphology have you ever touched the skin of frog? The skin is smooth and slippery due to the presence of mucus. The skin is always maintained in a moist condition. The color of dorsal side of body is generally olive green with dark irregular spots. On the ventral side the skin is uniformly pale yellow. The frog never drinks water but absorb it through the skin. Body of a frog is divisible into head and trunk figure 7.19. A neck and tail are absent. Above the mouth, a pair of nostrils is present. Eyes are bulged and covered by a nictitating membrane that protects them while in water. On either side of eyes a membranous tympanum ear receives sound signals. The forelimbs and hind limbs help in swimming, walking, leaping and burrowing. The hind limbs end in five digits and they are larger and muscular than forelimbs that end in four digits. Feet have web digits that help in swimming. Frogs exhibit sexual dimorphism. Male frogs can be distinguished by the presence of sound producing vocal sacs and also a copulatory pad on the first digit of the four limbs which are absent in female frogs. 7. 5. 2. Anatomy The body cavity of frogs accommodate different organ systems such as digestive, circulatory, respiratory, nervous, excretory and reproductive systems with well-developed structures and functions figure 7.20. The digestive system consists of alimentary canal and digestive glands. The alimentary canal is short because frogs are carnivores and hence the length of intestine is reduced. The mouth opens into the buccal cavity that figure 7.19 external features of frog eye four limb hind limb head trunk. Leads to the esophagus through pharynx. Esophagus is a short tube that opens into the stomach which in turn continues as the intestine, rectum and finally opens outside by the cloaca. Liver secretes bile that is stored in the gallbladder. Pancreas, a digestive gland produces pancreatic juice containing digestive enzymes. Food is captured by the bilobed tongue. Digestion of food takes place by the action of HCL and gastric juices secreted from the walls of the stomach. Partially digested food called chyme is passed from stomach to the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. The duodenum receives bile from gallbladder and pancreatic juices from the pancreas through a common bile duct. Bile emulsifies fat and pancreatic juices digest carbohydrates and proteins. Final digestion takes place in the intestine. Digested food is absorbed by the numerous finger-like folds in the inner wall of intestine called villi and microvilli. The undigested solid waste moves into the rectum and passes out through cloaca. Frogs respire on land and in the water by two different methods. In water, skin acts as aquatic respiratory organ cutaneous respiration. Dissolved oxygen in the water is exchanged through the skin by diffusion. Figure 7.20 Diagrammatic representation of internal organs of frog showing complete digestive system intestine ureter rectum cloaca urinary bladder esophagus liver stomach kidney gallbladder fat bodies lung heart cloacal aperture. On land, the buccal cavity, skin and lungs act as the respiratory organs. The respiration by lungs is called pulmonary respiration. The lungs are a pair of elongated, pink-colored sac-like structures present in the upper part of the trunk region thorax. Air enters through the nostrils into the buccal cavity and then to lungs. During estivation and hibernation gaseous exchange takes place through skin. The vascular system of frog is well-developed closed type. Frogs have a lymphatic system also. The blood vascular system involves heart, blood vessels and blood. The lymphatic system consists of lymph, lymph channels and lymph nodes. Heart is a muscular structure situated in the upper part of the body cavity. It has three chambers, two atria and one ventricle and is covered by a membrane called pericardium. A triangular structure called sinus venosus joins the right atrium. It receives blood through the major veins called vena cava. The ventricle opens into a sac like conus arteriosus on the ventral side of the heart. The blood from the heart is carried to all parts of the body by the arteries arterial system. The veins collect blood from different parts of body to the heart and form the venous system. Special venous connection between liver and intestine as well as the kidney and lower parts of the body are present in frogs. The former is called hepatic portal system and the latter is called renal portal system. The blood is composed of plasma and cells. The blood cells are RBC red blood cells or erythrocytes. WBC white blood cells are leukocytes and platelets. RBCs are nucleated and contain red colored pigment namely hemoglobin. The lymph is different from blood. It lacks few proteins and RBCs. The blood carries nutrients, gases and water to the respective sites during the circulation. The circulation of blood is achieved by the pumping action of the muscular heart. The elimination of nitrogenous wastes is carried out by a well-developed excretory system. The excretory system consists of a pair of kidneys, ureters, cloaca and urinary bladder. These are compact, dark red and bean-like structures situated a little posteriorly in the body cavity on both sides of vertebral column. Each kidney is composed of several structural and functional units called urinitherous tubules or nephrons. Two ureters emerge from the kidneys in the male frogs. The ureters act as urinogenital duct which opens into the cloaca. 
In females the ureters and oviduct open separately in the cloaca. The thin-walled urinary bladder is present ventral to the rectum which also opens in the cloaca. The frog excretes urea and thus is a ureotelic animal. Excretory wastes are carried by blood into the kidney where it is separated and excreted. The system for control and coordination is highly evolved in the frog. It includes both neural system and endocrine glands. The chemical coordination of various organs of the body is achieved by hormones which are secreted by the endocrine glands. The prominent endocrine glands found in frog are pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, thymus, pineal body, pancreatic islets, adrenals and gonads. The nervous system is organized into a central nervous system brain and spinal cord, a peripheral nervous system cranial and spinal nerves and an autonomic nervous system sympathetic and parasympathetic. There are 10 pairs of cranial nerves arising from the brain. Brain is enclosed in a bony structure called brain box cranium. The brain is divided into forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain. Forebrain includes olfactory lobes, paired cerebral hemispheres and unpaired diencephalon. The midbrain is characterized by a pair of optic lobes. Hindbrain consists of cerebellum and medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata passes out through the foramen magnum and continues into spinal cord, which is enclosed in the vertebral column. Frog has different types of sense organs, namely organs of touch sensory papillae, taste taste buds, smell nasal epithelium, vision eyes and hearing tympanum with internal ears. Out of these, eyes and internal ears are well-organized structures and the rest are cellular aggregations around nerve endings. Eyes in a frog are a pair of spherical structures situated in the orbit and skull. These are simple eyes possessing only one unit. External ear is absent in frogs and only tympanum can be seen externally. The ear is an organ of hearing as well as balancing equilibrium. Frogs have well-organized male and female reproductive systems. Male reproductive organs consist of a pair of yellowish ovoid testes figure 7.21, which are found adhered to the upper part of kidneys by a double fold of peritoneum called mesarchium. Vasa afferentia are 10-12 in number that arise from testes. They enter the kidneys on their site and open into Bitter's canal. Finally it communicates with the urinogenital duct that comes out of the kidneys and opens into the cloaca. The cloaca is a small, median chamber that is used to pass fecal matter, urine and sperms to the exterior. The female reproductive organs include a pair of ovaries figure 7.22. The ovaries are situated near kidneys and there is no functional connection with kidneys. A pair of oviduct arising figure 7.22 female reproductive system oviduct ovary ova ureter cloaca cloacal aperture urinary bladder figure 7.21 male reproductive system fat bodies kidney urinogenital duct cloaca cloacal aperture testis adrenal gland urinary bladder rectum vasa afferentia. From the ovaries opens into the cloaca separately. A mature female can lay 2,500 to 3,000 ova at a time. Fertilization is external and takes place in water. Development involves a larval stage called tadpole. Tadpole undergoes metamorphosis to form the adult. Frogs are beneficial for mankind because they eat insects and protect the crop. Frogs maintain ecological balance because these serve as an important link of food chain and food web in the ecosystem. In some countries the muscular legs of frog are used as food by man. Summary cells, tissues, organs and organ systems split up the work in a way that ensures the survival of the body as a whole and exhibit division of labor. A tissue is defined as group of cells along with intracellular substances performing one or more functions in the body. Epithelia are sheet like tissues lining the body's surface and its cavities, ducts and tubes. Epithelia have one free surface facing a body fluid or the outside environment. Their cells are structurally and functionally connected at junctions. Diverse types of connective tissues bind together, support, strengthen, protect, and insulate other tissue in the body. Soft connective tissues consist of protein fibers as well as a variety of cells arranged in a ground substance. Cartilage, bone, blood, and adipose tissue are specialized connective tissues. Cartilage and bone are both structural materials. Blood is a fluid tissue with transport functions. Adipose tissue is a reservoir of stored energy. Muscle tissue, which can contract shorten in response to stimulation, helps in movement of the body and specific body parts. Skeletal muscle is the muscle tissue attached to bones. Smooth muscle is a component of internal organs. Cardiac muscle makes up the contractile walls of the heart. Connective tissue covers all three types of tissues. Nervous tissue exerts greatest control over the response of body. Neurons are the basic units of nervous tissue. Earthworm, cockroach and frog show characteristic features in body organization. In Theretima posthuma earthworm, the body is covered by cuticle. All segments of its body are alike except the 14th. 15th and 16th segment, which are thick and dark and glandular, forming glytellum. 
A ring of S-shaped chitinous CD is found in each segment. These CD help in all commotion. On the ventral side spermathical openings are present in between the grooves of 5 and 6, 6 and 7, 7 and 8 and 8 and 9 segments. Female genital pores are present on 14th segment and male genital pores on 18th segment. The alimentary canal is a narrow tube made of mouth, buccal cavity, pharynx, gizzard, stomach, intestine and anus. The blood vascular system is of closed type with heart and valves. Nervous system is represented by ventral nerve cord. Earthworm is hermaphrodite. Two pairs of testes occur in the 10th and 11th segment, respectively. A pair of ovaries are present on 12th and 13th intersegmental septum. It is a protendrous animal with cross-fertilization. Fertilization and development take place in cocoon secreted by the glands of clitellum. The body of cockroach parrot Planeta americana is covered by chitinous exoskeleton. It is divided into head, thorax and abdomen. Segments bear jointed appendages. There are three segments of thorax, each bearing a pair of walking legs. Two pairs of wings are present, one pair each on second and third segment. There are ten segments in abdomen. Alimentary canal is well developed with a mouth surrounded by mouth parts, a pharynx, esophagus, crop, gizzard, midgut, hindgut and anus. Hepatokiki are present at the junction of foregut and midgut. Malpighi and tubules are present at the junction of midgut and hindgut and help in excretion. A pair of salivary gland is present near crop. The blood vascular system is of open type. Respiration takes place by network of trachea. Trachea opens outside with spiracles. Nervous system is represented by segmentally arranged ganglia and ventral nerve cord. A pair of testes is present in fourth six segments and ovaries in second six segments. Fertilization is internal. Female produces nine ten oothica bearing developing embryos. After rupturing of single oothica sixteen young ones, called nymphs come out. The Indian bullfrog, Rana tigrina, is the common frog found in India. Body is covered by skin. Mucous glands are present in the skin which is highly vascularized and helps in respiration in water and on land. Body is divisible into head and trunk. A muscular tongue is present, which is bilobed at the tip and is used in capturing the prey. The alimentary canal consists of oesophagus, stomach, intestine and rectum, which open into the cloaca. The main digestive glands are liver and pancreas. It can respire in water through skin and through lungs on land. Circulatory system is closed with single circulation. RBCs are nucleated. Nervous system is organized into central, peripheral and autonomic. The organs of urinogenital system are kidneys and urinogenital ducts, which open into the cloaca. The male reproductive organ is a pair of testes. The female reproductive organ is a pair of ovaries. A female lays 2,500-3,000 ova at a time. The fertilization and development are external. The eggs hatch into tadpoles, which metamorphose into frogs. Exercise is one. Answer in one word or one line. I give the common name of Parrot Planeta Americana to how many spermatheci are found in earthworm. 3. What is the position of ovaries in cockroach? I've how many segments are present in the abdomen of cockroach? B. Where do you find Malpighi and tubules? 2. Answer the following. I. What is the function of nephridia? 2. How many types of nephridia are found in earthworm based on their location? 3. Draw a label diagram of the reproductive organs of an earthworm 4. Draw a label diagram of alimentary canal of a cockroach. 5. Distinguish between the followings of perstomium and peristomium b septal nephridium and pharyngeal nephridium 6. What are the cellular components of blood 7? What are the following and where do you find them in animal body? Achondriocytes b axon c ciliated epithelium 8. Describe various types of epithelial tissues with the help of label diagrams. 9. Distinguish between a simple epithelium and compound epithelium B cardiac muscle and striated muscle C dense regular and dense irregular connective tissues D adipose and blood tissue E simple gland and compound gland 10. Mark the odd one in each series, a irregular tissue, blood, neuron, tendon BRBC, WBC, platelets, cartilage C exocrine, endocrine, salivary gland, ligament D maxilla, mandible, labrum, antennae E proteinema, mesothorax, metathorax, coxa 11. Match the terms in column I with those in column 2. Column I column to a compound epithelium I alimentary canal B compound I2 cockroach C septal nephridia 3 skin D open circulatory system I've mosaic vision E tiflis all the earth were methosteocytes V thalamir G genitalia 7, bone 12. Mention briefly about the circulatory system of earthworm 13. Draw a neat diagram of digestive system of frog. 14. Mention the function of the following a ureters in frog B malpighi and tubules C body wall in earthworm. Unit 3 Biology is the study of living organisms. The detailed description of their form and appearance only brought out their diversity.
It is the cell theory that emphasized the unity underlying this diversity of forms, that is, the cellular organization of all life forms. A description of cell structure and cell growth by division is given in the chapters comprising this unit. Cell theory also created a sense of mystery around living phenomena, that is, physiological and behavioral processes. This mystery was the requirement of integrity of cellular organization for living phenomena to be demonstrated or observed. In studying and understanding the physiological and behavioral processes, one can take a physico-chemical approach and use cell-free systems to investigate. This approach enables us to describe the various processes in molecular terms. The approach is established by analysis of living tissues for elements and compounds. It will tell us what types of organic compounds are present in living organisms. In the next stage, one can ask the question, what are these compounds doing inside a cell and, in what way they carry out gross physiological processes like digestion, excretion, memory, defense, recognition, etc. In other words we answer the question, what is the molecular basis of all physiological processes it can also explain the abnormal processes that occur during any diseased condition. This physico-chemical approach to study and understand living organisms is called reductionist biology. The concepts and techniques of physics and chemistry are applied to understand biology. In Chapter 9 of this unit, a brief description of biomolecules is provided. Cell Structure and Functions Chapter 8 Cell, The Unit of Life Chapter 9 Biomolecules Chapter 10 Cell Cycle and Cell Division G. N. Ramachandran, an outstanding figure in the field of protein structure, was the founder of the Madras School of Conformational Analysis of Biopolymers. His discovery of the triple helical structure of collagen published in Nature in 1954 and his analysis of the allowed conformations of proteins through the use of the Ramachandran plot rank among the most outstanding contributions in structural biology. He was born on October 8, 1922, in a small town, not far from Cochin on the southwestern coast of India. His father was a professor of mathematics at a local college and thus had considerable influence in shaping Ramachandran's interest in mathematics. After completing his school years, Ramachandran graduated in 1942 as the top-ranking student in the BSc. Honors Physics course of the University of Madras, he received a PhD from Cambridge University in 1949, while at Cambridge. Ramachandran met Linus Pauling and was deeply influenced by his publications on models of the Greek letter alpha helix and Greek letter beta sheet structures that directed his attention to solving the structure of collagen. He passed away at the age of 78, on April 7, 2001 G. N. Ramachandran 1922-2001-2018-1 When you look around, you see both living and non-living things, you must have wondered and asked yourself what is it that makes an organism living? Or what is it that an inanimate thing does not have which a living thing has the answer to this is the presence of the basic unit of life, the cell in all living organisms. All organisms are composed of cells, some are composed of a single cell and are called unicellular organisms while others, like us, composed of many cells, are called multicellular organisms. 8.1 What is a cell? Unicellular organisms are capable of I independent existence and two performing the essential functions of life. Anything less than a complete structure of a cell does not ensure independent living. Hence, cell is the fundamental structural and functional unit of all living organisms. Anton von Leeuwenhoek first saw and described a live cell, Robert Brown later discovered the nucleus. The invention of the microscope and its improvement leading to the electron microscope revealed all the structural details of the cell. 8.2 Cell Theory In 1838, Matthias Sclidon, a German botanist, examined a large number of plants and observed that all plants are composed of different kinds of cells which form the tissues of the plant. At about the same time, Theodore Cell, The Unit of Life Chapter 8 8.1 What is a Cell 8.2 Cell Theory 8.3 An Overview of Cell 8.4 Prokaryotic Cells 8.5 Eukaryotic Cells Schwann 1839, a British zoologist, studied different types of animal cells and reported that cells had a thin outer layer which is today known as the plasma membrane. He also concluded, based on his studies on plant tissues, that the presence of cell wall is a unique character of the plant cells. On the basis of this, Schwann proposed the hypothesis that the bodies of animals and plants are composed of cells and products of cells. Skleden and Schwann together formulated the cell theory. This theory, however, did not explain as to how new cells were formed. Rudolf Virchow 1855 first explained that cells divided and new cells are formed from pre-existing cells on this cellula e cellula. He modified the hypothesis of Skleden and Schwann to give the cell theory a final shape. Cell theory is understood today is, I all living organisms are composed of cells and products of cells. 2 All cells arise from pre-existing cells 8.3 An overview of cell You have earlier observed cells in an onion peel and or human cheek cells under the microscope. 
Let us recollect their structure. The onion cell which is a typical plant cell, has a distinct cell wall as its outer boundary and just within it is the cell membrane. The cells of the human cheek have an outer membrane as the delimiting structure of the cell. Inside each cell is a dense membrane-bound structure called nucleus. This nucleus contains the chromosomes which in turn contain the genetic material, DNA. Cells that have membrane-bound nuclei are called eukaryotic whereas cells that lack a membrane-bound nucleus are prokaryotic, in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. A semi-fluid matrix called cytoplasm occupies the volume of the cell. The cytoplasm is the main arena of cellular activities in both the plant and animal cells. Various chemical reactions occur in it to keep the cell in the living state, besides the nucleus. The eukaryotic cells have other membrane-bound distinct structures called organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum ER, the Golgi complex, lysosomes, mitochondria, microbodies and vacuoles. The prokaryotic cells lack such membrane-bound organelles. Ribosomes are non-membrane-bound organelles found in all cells, both eukaryotic as well as prokaryotic. Within the cell, ribosomes are found not only in the cytoplasm but also within the two organelles chloroplasts in plants and mitochondria and on rough ER. Animal cells contain another non-membrane-bound organelle called centrosome which helps in cell division. Cells differ greatly in size, shape and activities figure 8.1. For example, mycoplasmas, the smallest cells, are only 0.3 micromen length while bacteria. Cell, the unit of life 127 red blood cells round and biconcave white blood cells branched and long columnar epithelial cells long and narrow amoeboid nerve cell mesophyll cells round and oval tracheate elongated figure 8.1 diagram showing, different shapes of the cells could be 3 to 5 microm. The largest isolated single cell is the egg of an ostrich. Among multicellular organisms, human red blood cells are about 7.0 microm in diameter. Nerve cells are some of the longest cells. Cells also vary greatly in their shape. They may be disc-like, polygonal, columnar, cuboid, thread-like, or even irregular. The shape of the cell may vary with the function they perform. 8.4 prokaryotic cells The prokaryotic cells are represented by bacteria, blue-green algae, mycoplasma and PPLO pleuronumonia-like organisms. They are generally smaller and multiply more rapidly than the eukaryotic cells figure 8.2. They may vary greatly in shape and size. The four basic shapes of bacteria are bacillus rod-like, coccus spherical, vibrio comma shaped and spirillum spiral. The organization of the prokaryotic cell is fundamentally similar even though prokaryotes exhibit a wide variety of shapes and functions. All prokaryotes have a cell wall surrounding the cell membrane except in mycoplasma, the fluid matrix filling the cell is the cytoplasm. There is no well-defined nucleus, the genetic material is basically naked, not enveloped by a nuclear membrane. In addition to the genomic DNA the single chromosome circular DNA, many bacteria have small circular DNA outside the genomic DNA. These smaller DNA are called plasmids. The plasma DNA confers certain unique phenotypic characters to such bacteria. One such character is resistance to antibiotics. In higher classes you will learn that this plasma DNA is used to monitor bacterial transformation with foreign DNA. Nuclear membrane is found in eukaryotes, no organelles like the ones in eukaryotes, are found in prokaryotic cells except for ribosomes. Prokaryotes have something unique in the form of inclusions. A specialized differentiated form of cell membrane called mesosome is the characteristic of prokaryotes. They are essentially unfoldings of cell membrane 8, 4, 1 cell envelope and its modifications. Most prokaryotic cells, particularly the bacterial cells, have a chemically complex cell envelope. The cell envelope consists of a tightly bound three-layered structure that is, the outermost glycocalyx followed by the cell wall and then the plasma membrane. Although each layer of the envelope performs distinct function, they act together as a single protective unit. Bacteria can be classified into two groups on the basis of the differences in the cell envelopes and the manner in which they respond to the staining procedure developed by Gram-Vis. Those that take up the Gram stain are Gram-positive and the others that do not are called Gram-negative bacteria. Glycocalyx differs in composition and thickness among different bacteria. It could be a loose sheath called the slime layer in some, while in others it may be thick and tough, called a capsule. The cell wall determines the shape of the cell and provides a strong structural support to prevent the bacterium from bursting or collapsing. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable in nature and interacts with the outside world. This membrane is similar structurally to that of the eukaryotes. A special membranous structure is the mesosome which is formed by the extensions of plasma membrane into the cell. These extensions are in the form of vesicles, tubules and lamellae. 
They help in cell wall typical bacteria 1 2 meters PPLO about 0.1 meters viruses 0.02 0.2 meters atypical eukaryotic cell 10 20 meters figure 8.2 diagram showing comparison of eukaryotic cell with other organisms. Formation, DNA replication and distribution to daughter cells. They also help in respiration, secretion processes, to increase the surface area of the plasma membrane and enzymatic content. In some prokaryotes like cyanobacteria, there are other membranous extensions into the cytoplasm called chromatophores which contain pigments. Bacterial cells may be modal or non-modal. If modal, they have thin filamentous extensions from their cell wall called flagella. Bacteria show a range in the number and arrangement of flagella. Bacterial flagellum is composed of three parts filament, hook and basal body. The filament is the longest portion and extends from the cell surface to the outside. Besides flagella, pili and fimbri are also surface structures of the bacteria but do not play a role in motility. The pili are elongated tubular structures made of a special protein. The fimbri are small bristle-like fibers sprouting out of the cell. In some bacteria, they are known to help attach the bacteria to rocks and streams and also to the host tissues. 8. 4. 2. Ribosomes and inclusion bodies in prokaryotes. Ribosomes are associated with the plasma membrane of the cell. They are about 15 nm by 20 nm in size and are made of two subunits 50s and 30s units which when present together form 70s prokaryotic ribosomes. Ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. Several ribosomes may attach to a single mRNA and form a chain called polyribosomes or polysome. The ribosomes of a polysome translate the mRNA into proteins. Inclusion bodies, reserve material in prokaryotic cells are stored in the cytoplasm in the form of inclusion bodies. These are not bound by any membrane system and lie free in the cytoplasm, e.g., phosphate granules, cyanophysian granules and glycogen granules. Gas vacuoles are found in blue-green and purple and green photosynthetic bacteria 8.5 eukaryotic cells The eukaryotes include all the protists, plants, animals and fungi. In eukaryotic cells there is an extensive compartmentalization of cytoplasm through the presence of membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotic cells possess an organized nucleus with a nuclear envelope. In addition, eukaryotic cells have a variety of complex locomotory and cytoskeletal structures. Their genetic material is organized into chromosomes. All eukaryotic cells are not identical. Plant and animal cells are different as the former possess cell walls, plastids and a large central vacuole which are absent in animal cells. On the other hand, animal cells have centrioles which are absent in almost all plant cells figure 8.3. Rough endoplasmic reticulum lysosome smooth endoplasmic reticulum plasma desmata microtubule nucleus nucleolus golgi apparatus nuclear envelope vacuole middle lamella plasma membrane cell wall mitochondrion ribosomes chloroplast cytoplasm peroxisome figure 8.3 diagram showing a plant cell b animal cell golgi apparatus smooth endoplasmic reticulum nuclear envelope nucleolus nucleus microvilli plasma membrane centriole peroxium lysosome ribosomes mitochondrion rough endoplasmic reticulum cytoplasma b Cholesterol sugar peripheral protein phospholipid bilayer Let us now look at individual cell organelles to understand their structure and functions. 8. 5. One cell membrane The detailed structure of the membrane was studied only after the advent of the electron microscope in the 1950s. Meanwhile, chemical studies on the cell membrane, especially in human red blood cells RBCs, enabled the scientists to deduce the possible structure of plasma membrane. These studies showed that the cell membrane is mainly composed of lipids and proteins. The major lipids are phospholipids that are arranged in their bilayer. Also, the lipids are arranged within the membrane with the polar head towards the outer sides and the hydrophobic tails towards the inner part. This ensures that the non-polar tail of saturated hydrocarbons is protected from the aqueous environment figure. 8.4 in addition to phospholipids membrane also contains cholesterol. The lipid component of the membrane mainly consists of phosphoglycerides. Later, biochemical investigation clearly revealed that the cell membranes also possess protein and carbohydrate. The ratio of protein and lipid varies considerably in different cell types. In human beings, the membrane of the erythrocyte has approximately 52% protein and 40% lipids. Depending on the ease of extraction, membrane proteins can be classified as integral and peripheral. Peripheral proteins lie on the surface of membrane while the integral proteins are partially or totally buried in figure 8.4 fluid mosaic model of plasma membrane. The membrane, an improved model of the structure of cell membrane was proposed by Singer and Nicholson 1972 widely accepted as fluid mosaic model figure 8.4. According to this, the quasi-fluid nature of lipid enables lateral movement of proteins within the overall bilayer. 
This ability to move within the membrane is measured as its fluidity. The fluid nature of the membrane is also important from the point of view of functions like cell growth, formation of intercellular junctions, secretion, endocytosis, cell division etc. One of the most important functions of the plasma membrane is the transport of the molecules across it. The membrane is selectively permeable to some molecules present on either side of it. Many molecules can move briefly across the membrane without any requirement of energy and this is called the passive transport. Neutral solutes may move across the membrane by the process of simple diffusion along the concentration gradient, that is, from higher concentration to the lower. Water may also move across this membrane from higher to lower concentration. Movement of water by diffusion is called osmosis. As the polar molecules cannot pass through the nonpolar lipid bilayer, they require a carrier protein of the membrane to facilitate their transport across the membrane. A few ions or molecules are transported across the membrane against their concentration gradient, that is, from lower to the higher concentration. Such a transport is an energy-dependent process, in which ADP is utilized and is called active transport, e.g., NAK pump. 8. 5. Two cell wall as you may recall, a non-living rigid structure called the cell wall forms an outer covering for the plasma membrane of fungi and plants. Cell wall not only gives shape to the cell and protects the cell from mechanical damage and infection, it also helps in cell-to-cell -cell interaction and provides barrier to undesirable macromolecules. Algae have cell wall, made of cellulose, galactans, manans and minerals like calcium carbonate, while in other plants it consists of cellulose, hemocellulose, pectins and proteins. The cell wall of a young plant cell, the primary wall is capable of growth, which gradually diminishes as the cell matures and the secondary wall is formed on the inner towards membrane side of the cell. The middle lamella is a layer mainly of calcium pectate which holds or glues the different neighboring cells together. The cell wall and middle lamella may be traversed by plasma desmata which connect the cytoplasm of neighboring cells. 8, 5, 3 endomembrane system while each of the membranous organelles is distinct in terms of its Nucleus nuclear pora fibrosum endoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum smooth reticulum structure and function. Many of these are considered together as an endomembrane system because their functions are coordinated. The endomembrane system include endoplasmic reticulum ER, Golgi complex, lysosomes and vacuoles. Since the functions of the mitochondria, chloroplast and peroxisomes are not coordinated with the above components, these are not considered as part of the endomembrane system. 8, 5, 3, 1 The endoplasmic reticulum ER electron microscopic studies of eukaryotic cells reveal the presence of a network or reticulum of tiny tubular structures scattered in the cytoplasm that is called the endoplasmic reticulum ER figure 8.5. Hence, ER divides the intracellular space into two distinct compartments, that is, luminal inside ER and extraluminal cytoplasm compartments. The ER often shows ribosomes attached to their outer surface. The endoplasmic reticulum bearing ribosomes on their surface is called rough endoplasmic reticulum rare. In the absence of ribosomes they appear smooth and are called smooth endoplasmic reticulum set. Rare is frequently observed in the cells actively involved in protein synthesis and secretion. They are extensive and continuous with the outer membrane of the nucleus. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the major site for synthesis of lipid. In animal cells lipid-like steroidal hormones are synthesized in said. 8, 5, 3, 2 Golgi apparatus Camillo Golgi 1898 first observed densely stained reticular structures near the nucleus. These were later named Golgi bodies after him. They consist of many flat, disc-shaped sacs or cisternae of 0.5 microm to 1.0 microm diameter figure 8.6. These are stacked parallel to each other. Varied number of cisternae are present in a Golgi complex. The Golgi cisternae are concentrically arranged near the nucleus with distinct convex cis or the forming figure 8.5 endoplasmic reticulum cisternae figure 8.6 Golgi apparatus. Face and concave trans or the maturing face. The cis and the trans faces of the organelle are entirely different, but interconnected. The Golgi apparatus principally performs the function of packaging materials to be delivered either to the intracellular targets or secreted outside the cell. Materials to be packaged in the form of vesicles from the ER fuse with the cis face of the Golgi apparatus and move towards the maturing face. This explains why the Golgi apparatus remains in close association with the endoplasmic reticulum. A number of proteins synthesized by ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum are modified in the cisternae of the Golgi apparatus before they are released from its trans face. 
Golgi apparatus is the important site of formation of glycoproteins and glycolipids. 8, 5, 3, 3 lysosomes. These are membrane bound vesicular structures formed by the process of packaging in the Golgi apparatus. The isolated lysosomal vesicles have been found to be very rich in almost all types of hydrolytic enzymes, hydrolases, lipases, proteases. Carbohydrates is optimally active at the acidic pH. These enzymes are capable of digesting carbohydrates. Proteins, lipids and nucleic acids 8, 5, 3, 4 vacuoles. The vacuole is the membrane-bound space found in the cytoplasm. It contains water, sap, excretory product and other materials not useful for the cell. The vacuole is bound by a single membrane called tonoplast. In plant cells the vacuoles can occupy up to 90% of the volume of the cell. In plants, the tonoplast facilitates the transport of a number of ions and other materials against concentration gradients into the vacuole. Hence their concentration is significantly higher in the vacuole than in the cytoplasm. In amoeba the contractile vacuole is important for excretion. In many cells, as in protists, food vacuoles are formed by engulfing the food particles 8, 5, 4 mitochondria mitochondria sing. Mitochondrion, unless specifically stained, are not easily visible under the microscope. The number of mitochondria per cell is variable depending on the physiological activity of the cells. In terms of shape and size also, considerable degree of variability is observed. Typically it is sausage-shaped or cylindrical having a diameter of 0.21.0 microm average 0.5 microm and length 1.04.1 microm. Each mitochondrion is a double. Membrane-bound structure with the outer membrane and the inner membrane dividing its lumen distinctly into two aqueous compartments, that is, the outer compartment and the inner compartment. The inner compartment is filled with a dense homogeneous substance called the matrix. The outer membrane forms the continuous limiting boundary of the organelle. The inner membrane forms a number of infoldings called the Christi sing, Christa towards the matrix figure 8.7. The Christi increase the surface area. The two membranes have their own specific enzymes associated with the mitochondrial function. Mitochondria are the sites of aerobic respiration. They produce cellular energy in the form of ADP, hence they are called powerhouses of the cell. The matrix also possesses single circular DNA molecule, a few RNA molecules, ribosome 70S and the components required for the synthesis of proteins. The mitochondria divide by fission 8, 5, 5 plastids. Plastids are found in all plant cells and in euglenoids. These are easily observed under the microscope as they are large. They bear some specific pigments, thus imparting specific colors to the plants. Based on the type of pigments plastids can be classified into chloroplasts, chromoplasts and leucoplasts. The chloroplasts contain chlorophyll and carotenoid pigments which are responsible for trapping light energy essential for photosynthesis. In the chromoplast fat-soluble carotenoid pigments like carotene, xanthophylls and others are present. This gives the part of the plant a yellow, orange or red color. The leucoplasts are the colorless plastids of varied shapes and sizes with stored nutrients. Amyloplasts store carbohydrates starch. E.g., potato, elaioplasts store oils and fats whereas outer membrane inner membrane matrix crystal figure 8.7 structure of mitochondrion longitudinal section intermembrane space. The alluroplasts store proteins. Majority of the chloroplasts of the green plants are found in the mesophyll cells of the leaves. These are lens-shaped, oval, spherical, discoid or even ribbon-like organelles having variable length 5-10 microm and width 2-4 microm. Their number varies from 1 per cell of the chlamydomonas, a green alga to 20-40 per cell in the mesophyll. Like mitochondria, the chloroplasts are also double membrane-bound. Of the two, the inner chloroplast membrane is relatively less permeable. The space limited by the inner membrane of the chloroplast is called the stroma. A number of organized flattened membranous sacs called the thylakoids are present in the stroma figure 8.8. .8. Thylakoids are arranged in stacks like the piles of coins called grana singular, granum or the intergranal thylakoids. In addition, there are flat membranous tubules called the stroma lamellae connecting the thylakoids of the different grana. The membrane of the thylakoids enclose a space called a lumen. The stroma of the chloroplast contains enzymes required for the synthesis of carbohydrates and proteins. It also contains small, double-stranded circular DNA molecules and ribosomes. Chlorophyll pigments are present in the thylakoids. The ribosomes of the chloroplasts are smaller 70s than the cytoplasmic ribosomes 80s8, 5, 6 ribosomes. Ribosomes are the granular structures first observed under the electron microscope as dense particles by George Pilotti 1953. They are composed of ribonucleic acid RNA and proteins and are not surrounded by any membrane. The eukaryotic ribosomes are ADS while the prokaryotic ribosomes are 70S. Each ribosome has two subunits. 
larger and smaller subunits figure 8.9. The two subunits of 80S ribosomes are 60S and 40S while that of 70S ribosomes are 50S and 30S. Here S. Svedberg's unit stands for the sedimentation coefficient. It is indirectly a measure of density and size. Both 70S and 80S ribosomes are composed of two subunits. Figure 8.8 .8 Sectional view of chloroplast Figure 8.9 Ribosome 8, 5, 7 Cytoskeleton An elaborate network of filamentous proteinaceous structures present in the cytoplasm is collectively referred to as the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton in a cell are involved in many functions such as mechanical support, motility, maintenance of the shape of the cell. Small subunit Large subunit 8, 5, 8 Cilia and Flagella Cilia Sing Cilium and flagella sing. Flagellum are hair-like outgrowths of the cell membrane. Cilia are small structures which work like oars, causing the movement of either the cell or the surrounding fluid. Flagella are comparatively longer and responsible for cell movement. The prokaryotic bacteria also possess flagella but these are structurally different from that of the eukaryotic flagella. The electron microscopic study of the cilium or the flagellum show that they are covered with plasma membrane. Their core called the axoneme possesses a number of microtubules running parallel to the long axis. The axoneme usually has nine pairs of doublets of radially arranged peripheral microtubules, and a pair of centrally located microtubules. Such an arrangement of axonomal microtubules is referred to as the 9 to array figure 8.10. The central tubules are connected by bridges and is also enclosed by a central sheath, which is connected to one of the tubules of each peripheral doublets by a radial spoke. Thus, there are nine radial spokes. The peripheral doublets are also interconnected by linkers. Both the cilium and flagellum emerge from centriole-like structure called the basal bodies. 8, 5, 9 centrosome and centriole centrosome is an organelle usually containing two cylindrical structures called centrioles. They are surrounded by amorphous paracentriolar materials. Both the centrioles and the centrosome lie perpendicular to each other in which each has an organization like the cartwheel. They are plasma membrane peripheral microtubules doublets interdoublet bridge central microtubule radial spoke central sheath figure 8.10 section of cilia flagella showing different parts. A electron micrograph B diagrammatic representation of internal structure of B. Made up of nine evenly spaced peripheral fibrils of tubulin protein. Each of the peripheral fibril is a triplet. The adjacent triplets are also linked. The central part of the proximal region of the centriole is also proteinaceous and called the hub, which is connected with tubules of the peripheral triplets by radial spokes made of protein. The centrioles form the basal body of cilia or flagella, and spindle fibers that give rise to spindle apparatus during cell division in animal cells. August 5, 2010 Nucleus Nucleus as a cell organelle was first described by Robert Brown as early as 1831. Later the material of the nucleus stained by the basic dyes was given the name chromatin by Fleming. The interface nucleus nucleus of a cell when it is not dividing has highly extended and elaborate nucleoprotein fibers called chromatin. Nuclear matrix and one or more spherical bodies called nucleoli sing, nucleolus figure 8.11. Electron microscopy has revealed that the nuclear envelope, which consists of two parallel membranes with a space between 10 to 50 nm called the paranuclear space, forms a barrier between the materials present inside the nucleus and that of the cytoplasm. The outer membrane usually remains continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum and also bears ribosomes on it. At a number of places the nuclear envelope is interrupted by minute pores, which are formed by the fusion of its two membranes. These nuclear pores are the passages through which movement of RNA and protein molecules takes place in both directions between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Normally, there is only one nucleus per cell. Variations in the number of nuclei are also frequently observed. Can you recollect names of organisms that have more than one nucleus per cell? Some mature cells even lack nucleus, e.g., erythrocytes of many mammals and sieve tube cells of vascular plants. Would you consider these cells as living the nuclear matrix or the nucleoplasm contains nucleolus and chromatin? The nucleoli are spherical structures present in the nucleoplasm. The content of nucleolus is continuous with the rest of the nucleoplasm as it is not a membrane-bound structure. It is a site for active ribosomal RNA synthesis. Larger and more numerous nucleoli are present in cells actively carrying out protein synthesis. Nucleoplasm nucleolus nuclear pore nuclear membrane figure 8.11 structure of nucleus. Kinetochore figure 8.12 chromosome with kinetochore figure 8.13 types of chromosomes based on the position of centromere you may recall that the interface nucleus has a loosened and distinct network of nucleoprotein fibers called chromatin. But during different stages of cell division, cells show structured chromosomes in place of the nucleus. Chromatin contains DNA and some basic proteins called histones, some non-histone proteins and also RNA. 
A single human cell has approximately 2 meter long thread of DNA distributed among its 4623 pairs chromosomes. You will study the details of DNA packaging in the form of a chromosome in class 12. Every chromosome visible only in dividing cells essentially has a primary constriction or the centromere on the sides of which disc-shaped structures called kinetochores are present figure 8.12. Centromere holds two chromatids of a chromosome. Based on the position of the centromere, the chromosomes can be classified into four types figure 8.13. The metacentric chromosome has middle centromere forming two equal arms of the chromosome. The submetacentric chromosome has centromere slightly away from the middle of the chromosome resulting into one shorter arm and one longer arm. In case of acrocentric chromosome the centromere is situated close to its end forming one extremely short and one very long arm, whereas the telecentric chromosome has a terminal centromere. Sometimes a few chromosomes have non-staining secondary constrictions at a constant location. This gives the appearance of a small fragment called the satellite. August 5, 2011 Microbodies Many membrane-bound minute vesicles called microbodies that contain various enzymes are present in both plant and animal cells. Summary All organisms are made of cells or aggregates of cells. Cells vary in their shape, size and activities functions. Based on the presence or absence of a membrane-bound nucleus and other organelles, cells and hence organisms can be named as eukaryotic or prokaryotic. A typical eukaryotic cell consists of a cell membrane, nucleus and cytoplasm. Plant cells have a cell wall outside the cell membrane. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable and facilitates transport of several molecules. The endomembrane system includes ER, Golgi complex, lysosomes and vacuoles. All the cell organelles perform different but specific functions. Centrosome and centriole form the basal body of cilia and flagella that facilitate locomotion. In animal cells, centrioles also form spindle apparatus during cell division. Nucleus contains nucleoli and chromatin network. It not only controls the activities of organelles but also plays a major role in heredity. Endoplasmic reticulum contains tubules or cisterni. They are of two types, rough and smooth. ER helps in the transport of substances, synthesis of proteins, lipoproteins and glycogen. The Golgi body is a membranous organelle composed of flattened sacs. The secretions of cells are packed in them and transported from the cell. Lysosomes are single membrane structures containing enzymes for digestion of all types of macromolecules. Ribosomes are involved in protein synthesis. These occur freely in the cytoplasm or are associated with ER. Mitochondria help in oxidative phosphorylation and generation of adenosine triphosphate. They are bound by double membrane. The outer membrane is smooth and inner one folds into several cristae. Plastids are pigment-containing organelles found in plant cells only. In plant cells, chloroplasts are responsible for trapping light energy essential for photosynthesis. The grana, in the plastid, is the site of light reactions and the stroma of dark reactions. The green-colored plastids are chloroplasts, which contain chlorophyll, whereas the other colored plastids are chromoplasts, which may contain pigments like carotene and xanthophyll. The nucleus is enclosed by nuclear envelope, a double membrane structure with nuclear pores. The inner membrane encloses the nucleoplasm and the chromatin material. Thus, cell is the structural and functional unit of life. Exercises 1. Which of the following is not correct? A Robert Brown discovered the cell B. Skleden and Schwann formulated the cell theory. C. Deer Show explained that cells are formed from pre existing cells. D. A. Unicellular organism carries out its life activities within a single cell. 2. New cells generate from a bacterial fermentation. B. Regeneration of old cells. C. Pre existing cells. D. A. Biotic materials. 3. Match the following column I column to a Christi I flat membranous sacs in stroma B cisterni 2 unfoldings in mitochondria C thylakoids 3 disc shaped sacs in Golgi apparatus 4. Which of the following is correct? A cells of all living organisms have a nucleus B both animal and plant cells have a well defined cell wall. C in prokaryotes, there are no membrane bound organelles D cells are formed de novo from abiotic materials. 5. What is a mesosome in a prokaryotic cell? Mention the functions that it performs. 6. How do neutral solutes move across the plasma membrane? Can the polar molecules also move across it in the same way? If not, then how are these transported across the membrane? 7. Name two cell organelles that are double membrane bound. What are the characteristics of these two organelles? State their functions and draw label diagrams of both. 8. What are the characteristics of prokaryotic cells? 9. Multicellular organisms have division of labor. Explain 10. Cell is the basic unit of life. Discuss in brief 11. What are nuclear pores state their function? 12. Both lysosomes and vacuoles are endomembrane structures, yet they differ in terms of their functions. Comment 13. Describe the structure of the following with the help of label diagrams I nucleus 2 centrosome 14. 
What is a centromere? How does the position of centromere form the basis of classification of chromosomes? Support your answer with a diagram showing the position of centromere on different types of chromosomes. 142 Biology There is a wide diversity in living organisms in our biosphere. Now a question that arises in our minds is, are all living organisms made of the same chemicals, that is, elements and compounds you have learned in chemistry how elemental analysis is performed? If we perform such an analysis on a plant tissue, animal tissue or a microbial paste, we obtain a list of elements like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and several others and their respective content per unit mass of a living tissue. If the same analysis is performed on a piece of Earth's crust as an example of non-living matter, we obtain a similar list. What are the differences between the two lists in absolute terms? No such differences could be made out. All the elements present in a sample of Earth's crust are also present in a sample of living tissue. However, a closer examination reveals that the relative abundance of carbon and hydrogen with respect to other elements is higher in any living organism than in Earth's crust table 9.1. 9.1 HOV to analyze chemical composition we can continue asking in the same way, what type of organic compounds are found in living organisms how does one go about finding the answer to get an answer, one has to perform a chemical analysis. We can take any living tissue a vegetable or a piece of liver, etc. and grind it in trichloroacetic acid Cl3CCOOH using a mortar and a pestle. We obtain a thick slurry, if we were to strain this through a cheesecloth or cotton we would obtain two fractions. One is called the filtrate or more technically, the acid-soluble pool, and the second, the retentate or the acid-insoluble fraction. Scientists have found thousands of organic compounds in the acid-soluble pool, Biomolecules Chapter 9 9.1 How to Analyze Chemical Composition 9.2 Primary and Secondary Metabolites 9.3 Biomicromolecules 9.4 Proteins 9.5 Polysaccharides 9.6 Nucleic Acids 9.7 Structure of Proteins 9.8 Nature of Bond Linking Monomers in a Polymer 9.9 .9 Dynamic State of Body Constituents Concept of Metabolism 9.10 Metabolic Basis for Living 9.11 The Living State 9.12 Enzymes in higher classes you will learn about how to analyze a living tissue sample and identify a particular organic compound. It will suffice to say here that one extracts the compounds, then subjects the extract to various separation techniques till one has separated a compound from all other compounds. In other words, one isolates and purifies a compound. Analytical techniques, when applied to the compound give us an idea of the molecular formula and the probable structure of the compound. All the carbon compounds that we get from living tissues can be called biomolecules. However, living organisms have also got inorganic elements and compounds in them. How do we know this a slightly different but destructive experiment has to be done? One weighs a small amount of a living tissue say a leaf or liver and this is called wet weight and dry it. All the water evaporates, the remaining material gives dry weight. Now if the tissue is fully burned, all the carbon compounds are oxidized to gaseous form CO2, water vapor and are removed. What is remaining is called ash. This ash contains inorganic elements like calcium, magnesium etc. Inorganic compounds like sulfate, phosphate, etc are also seen in the acid-soluble fraction, therefore elemental analysis gives elemental composition of living tissues in the form of hydrogen, oxygen, chlorine, carbon etc. While analysis for compounds gives an idea of element weight of Earth's crust human body hydrogen H0.14 0.5 carbon C0.03 18.5 oxygen O46.665.0 nitrogen and very little 3.3 sulfur S0.030.3 sodium Na2.80.2 calcium Ka3.61.5 Magnesium Mg2.10.1 Silicon C27.7 Negligible Adapted from CNRO, Understanding Chemistry, Universities Press, Hyderabad. Table 9.1 A Comparison of Elements Present in Non-Living and Living Matter Component Formula Sodium Na Potassium K Calcium Ka Magnesium Mg Water H2O Compounds NaCl CACO3, PO SO4342 Table 9.2 A list of representative inorganic constituents of living tissues the kind of organic figure 9.1 and inorganic constituents table 9.2 present in living tissues. From a chemistry point of view, one can identify functional groups like aldehydes, ketones, aromatic compounds, etc. But from a biological point of view, we shall classify them into amino acids, nucleotide bases, fatty acids etc. Amino acids are organic compounds containing an amino group and an acidic group of substituents on the same carbon that is, the Greek letter alpha carbon. Hence, they are called Greek letter alpha amino acids, they are substituted methanes, there are four substituent groups occupying the four valency positions. These are hydrogen, carboxyl group, 
amino group and a variable group designated as R group. Based on the nature of R group there are many amino acids. However, those which occur in proteins are only of 20 types. The R group in these proteinaceous amino acids could be a hydrogen. The amino acid is called glycine, a methyl group alanine, hydroxymethylserine, etc. Three of the 20 are shown in figure 9.1. The chemical and physical properties of amino acids are essentially of the amino, carboxyl and the R functional groups. Based on number of amino and carboxyl groups, there are acidic e.g., glutamic acid, basic glycine and neutral valine amino acids. Similarly, there are aromatic amino acids tyrosine, phenylalanine, tryptophan. A particular property of amino acids is the ionizable nature of NH2 and Ku groups. Hence in solutions of different pHs, the structure of amino acids changes. B is called sweaterionic form. Lipids are generally water-insoluble. They could be simple fatty acids. A fatty acid has a carboxyl group attached to an R group. The R group could be a methyl CH3, or ethyl C2H5 or higher number of CH2 groups 1 carbon to 19 carbons. For example, palmitic acid has 16 carbons including carboxyl carbon. Arachidonic acid has 20 carbon atoms including the carboxyl carbon. Fatty acids could be saturated without double bond or unsaturated with one or more CC double bonds. Another simple lipid is glycerol which is trihydroxypropane. Many lipids have both glycerol and fatty acids. Here the fatty acids are found esterified with glycerol. They can be then monoglycerides, diglycerides and triglycerides. These are also called fats and oils based on melting point. Oils have lower melting point e.g. gingerly oil and hence remain as oil in winters. Can you identify a fat from the market? Some lipids have phosphorus and a phosphorylated organic compound in them. These are phospholipids. They are found in cell membrane. Lecithin is one example. Some tissues especially the neural tissues have lipids with more complex structures. Living organisms have a number of carbon compounds in which heterocyclic rings can be found. Some of these are nitrogen bases adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and thymine. When found attached to a sugar, they are called nucleosides. If a phosphate group is also found esterified to the sugar they are called nucleotides. Adenosine, guanosine, thymidine, uridine and citidine are nucleosides. Adenylic acid, thymidylic acid, guanylic acid, uridylic acid and citidylic acid are nucleotides. Nucleic acids like DNA and RNA consist of nucleotides only. DNA and RNA function as genetic material. HO cholesterol phospholipid lecithin fats and oils lipid CH2 14 CH3 Q fatty acid palmitic acid glycerol triglyceride R1 R2 and R3 are fatty acids nitrogen bases aha adenine oct 2 adenylic acid nucleotide aha h 2 adenine aha h 2 uracil adenosine uridine nucleosides aha h 2 o o o h o o c h o 2 o c 6 h 12 o 6 glucose c 5 h 10 o 5 ribose sugars Carbohydrates serine glycine amino acids alanine figure 9.1 Diagrammatic representation of small molecular weight organic compounds in living tissues OOHNNH adenine purine uracil pyrimidine 9.2 Primary and secondary metabolites The most exciting aspect of chemistry deals with isolating thousands of compounds small and big from living organisms determining their structure and if possible synthesizing them if one were to make a list of biomolecules, such a list would have thousands of organic compounds including amino acids, sugars, etc. For reasons that are given in section 9.10, we can call these biomolecules as metabolites. In animal tissues, one notices the presence of all such categories of compounds shown in figure 9.1. These are called primary metabolites. However, when one analyses plant, fungal and microbial cells, one would see thousands of compounds other than these called primary metabolites, e.g. Alkaloids, flavonoids, rubber, essential oils, antibiotics, colored pigments, scents, gums, spices. These are called secondary metabolites table 9.3. While primary metabolites have identifiable functions and play known roles in normal physiological processes. We do not at the moment understand the role or functions of all the secondary metabolites in host organisms. However, many of them are useful to human welfare e.g. rubber, drugs, spices, scents and pigments. Some secondary metabolites have ecological importance. In the later chapters and years you will learn more about this. 9.3 Biomicromolecules There is one feature common to all those compounds found in the acid-soluble pool. They have molecular weights ranging from 18 to around 800 Daltons to approximately. The acid-insoluble fraction has only four types of organic compounds that is, proteins, nucleic acids, polysaccharides and lipids. These classes of compounds with the exception of lipids, have molecular weights in the range of 10,000 Daltons and above. 
For this very reason, biomolecules, that is, chemical compounds found in living organisms are of two types. 1. Those which have molecular weights less than 1000 Dalton and are usually referred to as micromolecules are simply biomolecules while those which are found in the acid insoluble fraction are called macromolecules or biomicromolecules. The molecules in the insoluble fraction with the exception of lipids are polymeric substances, then why do lipids? whose molecular weights do not exceed 800 da, come under acid insoluble fraction, that is, macromolecular fraction lipids are indeed small molecular weight pigments carotenoids, anthocyanins, etc. Alkaloids morphine, codeine, etc. Terpenides monoterpenes, diterpenes etc. Essential oils lemongrass oil, etc. Toxins abrin, ricin lectins concannabolinid drugs vindlistin, curcumin, etc. Polymeric rubber, gums. Cellulose substances table 9.3 some secondary metabolites component of the total cellular mass water 70 90 proteins 10 15 carbohydrates 3 lipids 2 nucleic acids 5 7 ions 1 table 9.4 average composition of cells compounds and are present not only as such but also arranged into structures like cell membrane and other membranes when we grind a tissue we are disrupting the cell structure cell membrane and other membranes are broken into pieces and form vesicles which are not water soluble Therefore, these membrane fragments in the form of vesicles get separated along with the acid-insoluble pool and hence in the macromolecular fraction. Lipids are not strictly macromolecules. The acid-soluble pool represents roughly the cytoplasmic composition. The macromolecules from cytoplasm and organelles become the acid-insoluble fraction. Together they represent the entire chemical composition of living tissues or organisms. In summary if we represent the chemical composition of living tissue from abundance point of view and arrange them class-wise, we observe that water is the most abundant chemical in living organisms table 9.4 9.4 proteins proteins are polypeptides they are linear chains of amino acids linked by peptide bonds as shown in figure 9.3 each protein is a polymer of amino acids as there are 20 types of amino acids e.g. alanine cysteine proline tryptophan lysine etc a protein is a heteropolymer and not a homopolymer a homopolymer has only one type of monomer repeating n number of times. This information about the amino acid content is important as later in your nutrition lessons. You will learn that certain amino acids are essential for our health and they have to be supplied through our diet. Hence, dietary proteins are the source of essential amino acids. Therefore, amino acids can be essential or non-essential. The latter are those which our body can make, while we get essential amino acids through our diet food. Proteins carry out many functions in living organisms, some transport nutrients across cell membrane. Some fight infectious organisms, some are hormones, some are enzymes. Table 9.5 Some proteins and their functions Protein functions Collagen intercellular ground substance trips in enzyme insulin hormone antibody fights infectious agents receptor sensory reception smell. Taste, hormone, etc. GLUT4 enables glucose transport into cells. CHO2 CHO2 CH2 O figure 9.2 diagrammatic representation of a portion of glycogen etc. Table 9.5 Collagen is the most abundant protein in animal world and ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase rubus CO is the most abundant protein in the whole of the biosphere. 9.5 Polysaccharides The acid insoluble pellet also has polysaccharides carbohydrates as another class of macromolecules. Polysaccharides are long chains of sugars. They are threads literally a cotton thread containing different monosaccharides as building blocks. For example, cellulose is a polymeric polysaccharide consisting of only one type of monosaccharide that is, glucose. Cellulose is a homopolymer. Starch is a variant of this but present as a storehouse of energy in plant tissues. Animals have another variant called glycogen. Inulin is a polymer of fructose. In a polysaccharide chain say glycogen, the right end is called the reducing end and the left end is called the non-reducing end. It has branches as shown in the form of a cartoon figure 9.2. Starch forms helical secondary structures. In fact, starch can hold I2 molecules in the helical portion. The starch I2 is blue in color. Cellulose does not contain complex helices and hence cannot hold I2. Plant cell walls are made of cellulose. Paper made from plant pulp and cotton fiber is cellulosic. There are more complex polysaccharides in nature. They have as building blocks, amino sugars and chemically modified sugars e.g., glucosamine, and acetylgalactosamine, etc. Exoskeletons of arthropods, for example, have a complex polysaccharide called chitin. These complex polysaccharides are mostly homopolymers. 
9.6 nucleic acids The other type of macromolecule that one would find in the acid-insoluble fraction of any living tissue is the nucleic acid. These are polynucleotides. Together with polysaccharides and polypeptides these comprise the true macromolecular fraction of any living tissue or cell. For nucleic acids, the building block is a nucleotide. A nucleotide has three chemically distinct components. One is a heterocyclic compound, the second is a monosaccharide and the third a phosphoric acid or phosphate. As you notice in figure 9.1, the heterocyclic compounds in nucleic acids are the nitrogenous bases named adenine, guanine, uracil, cytosine, and thymine. Adenine and guanine are substituted purines while the rest are substituted pyrimidines. The skeletal heterocyclic ring is called as purine and pyrimidine respectively. The sugar found in polynucleotides is either ribose or monosaccharide pentose or 2 feet deoxyribose. A nucleic acid containing deoxyribose is called deoxyribonucleic acid ENA while that which contains ribose is called ribonucleic acid RNA. 9.7 Structure of proteins Proteins, as mentioned earlier, are heteropolymers containing strings of amino acids. Structure of molecules means different things in different contexts. In an organic chemistry, the structure invariably refers to the molecular formula e.g., NaCl, MgCl2, etc. Organic chemists always write a two-dimensional view of the molecules while representing the structure of the molecules e.g., benzene, naphthalene, etc. Physicists conjure up the three-dimensional views of molecular structures while biologists describe the protein structure at four levels. The sequence of amino acids that is, the positional information in a protein, which is the first amino acid, which is second, and so on, is called the primary structure figure 9.3 of a protein. A protein is imagined as a line, the left end represented by the first amino acid and the right end represented by the last amino acid. The first amino acid is also called as N-terminal amino acid, the last amino acid is called the C-terminal amino acid. A protein thread does not exist throughout as an extended rigid rod, the thread is folded in the form of a helix similar to a revolving staircase. Of course, only some portions of the protein thread are arranged in the form of a helix, in proteins, only right-handed helices are observed. Other regions of the protein thread are folded into other forms in what is called the secondary structure. In addition, the long protein chain is also folded upon itself like a hollow woolen ball, giving rise to the tertiary structure figure 9.4 a, b. This gives us a three-dimensional view of a protein. Tertiary structure is absolutely necessary for the many biological activities of proteins. Some proteins are an assembly of more than one polypeptide or subunits. The manner in which these individual folded polypeptides or subunits are arranged with respect to each other e.g. Linear string of spheres. Spheres arranged one upon each other in the form of a cube or plate etc. is the architecture of a protein otherwise called the quaternary structure of a protein. Adult human hemoglobin consists of four subunits. Two of these are identical to each other. Hence, two subunits of Greek letter alpha type and two subunits of Greek letter beta type together constitute the human hemoglobin Hb. A B and C figure 9.4 cartoon showing a, a secondary structure and B a tertiary structure of proteins figure 9.3 various levels of protein structure a primary B secondary C quaternary hydrogen disulfide bond beta plated sheet polypeptide tertiary alpha helix. 9.8 Nature of bond linking monomers in a polymer in a polypeptide or a protein. Amino acids are linked by a peptide bond which is formed when the carboxyl Q group of one amino acid reacts with the amino NH2 group of the next amino acid with the elimination of a water moiety the process is called dehydration. In a polysaccharide the individual monosaccharides are linked by a glycosidic bond. This bond is also formed by dehydration. This bond is formed between two carbon atoms of two adjacent monosaccharides. In a nucleic acid a phosphate moiety links the three feet carbon of one sugar of one nucleotide to the five feet carbon of the sugar of the succeeding nucleotide. The bond between the phosphate and hydroxyl group of sugar is an ester bond. As there is one such ester bond on either side, it is called phosphodiester bond figure 9.5. Nucleic acids exhibit a wide variety of secondary structures. For example, one of the secondary structures exhibited by DNA is the famous Watson-Crick model. This model says that DNA exists as a double helix. The two strands of polynucleotides are anti-parallel that is, run in the opposite direction. The backbone is formed by the sugar phosphate sugar chain. The nitrogen bases are projected more or less perpendicular to this backbone but face inside. A and G of one strand compulsorily base pairs with T and C, respectively, on the other strand. Figure 9.5 diagram indicating secondary structure of DNA 5335. There are two hydrogen bonds between A and T and three hydrogen bonds between G and C. Each strand appears like a helical staircase. 
Each step of ascent is represented by a pair of bases. At each step of ascent, the strand turns 36 degrees. One full turn of the helical strand would involve 10 steps or 10 base pairs. Attempt drawing a line diagram. The pitch would be 34A ring, the rise per base pair would be 3.4A ring. This form of DNA with the above mentioned salient features is called BDNA. In higher classes, you will be told that there are more than a dozen forms of DNA named after English alphabets with unique structural features. 9.9 .9 Dynamic State of Body Constituents Concept of Metabolism What we have learned till now is that living organisms, be it a simple bacterial cell, a protozoan, a plant or an animal, contain thousands of organic compounds. These compounds or biomolecules are present in certain concentrations expressed as moles cell or moles liter etc. One of the greatest discoveries ever made was the observation that all these biomolecules have a turnover. This means that they are constantly being changed into some other biomolecules and also made from some other biomolecules. This breaking and making is through chemical reactions constantly occurring in living organisms. Together all these chemical reactions are called metabolism. Each of the metabolic reactions results in the transformation of biomolecules. A few examples for such metabolic transformations are, removal of CO2 from amino acids making an amino acid into an amine. Removal of amino group in a nucleotide base, hydrolysis of a glycosidic bond in a disaccharide, etc. We can list tens and thousands of such examples. Majority of these metabolic reactions do not occur in isolation but are always linked to some other reactions. In other words, metabolites are converted into each other in a series of linked reactions called metabolic pathways. These metabolic pathways are similar to the automobile traffic in a city. These pathways are either linear or circular. These pathways crisscross each other, that is, there are traffic junctions. Flow of metabolites through metabolic pathway has a definite rate and direction like automobile traffic. This metabolite flow is called the dynamic state of body constituents. What is most important is that this interlinked metabolic traffic is very smooth and without a single reported mishap for healthy conditions. Another feature of these metabolic reactions is that every chemical reaction is a catalyzed reaction. There is no uncatalyzed metabolic conversion in living systems. Even CO2 dissolving in water, a physical process, is a catalyzed reaction in living systems. The catalysts which hasten the rate of a given metabolic conversation are also proteins. These proteins with catalytic power are named enzymes. 9.10 Metabolic basis for living metabolic pathways can lead to a more complex structure from a simpler structure for example. Acetic acid becomes cholesterol or led to a simpler structure from a complex structure for example. Glucose becomes lactic acid in our skeletal muscle. The former cases are called biosynthetic pathways or anabolic pathways. The latter constitute degradation and hence are called catabolic pathways. Anabolic pathways, as expected, consume energy. Assembly of a protein from amino acids requires energy input. On the other hand, catabolic pathways lead to the release of energy. For example, when glucose is degraded to lactic acid in our skeletal muscle, energy is liberated. This metabolic pathway from glucose to lactic acid which occurs in 10 metabolic steps is called glycolysis. Living organisms have learned to trap this energy liberated during degradation and store it in the form of chemical bonds. As and when needed, this bond energy is utilized for biosynthetic, osmotic and mechanical work that we perform. The most important form of energy currency in living systems is the bond energy in a chemical called adenosine triphosphate ADP. How do living organisms derive their energy? What strategies have they evolved? How do they store this energy and in what form? How do they convert this energy into work? You will study and understand all this under a subdiscipline called bioenergetics later in your higher classes. 9.11 The living state at this level, you must understand that the tens and thousands of chemical compounds in a living organism, otherwise called metabolites, or biomolecules, are present at concentrations characteristic of each of them. For example, the blood concentration of glucose in a normal healthy individual is 4.55.0 mm, while that of hormones would be nanograms ml. The most important fact of biological systems is that all living organisms exist in a steady state characterized by concentrations of each of these biomolecules. These biomolecules are in a metabolic flux, any chemical or physical process moves spontaneously to equilibrium. The steady state is a non-equilibrium state. One should remember from physics that systems at equilibrium cannot perform work. As living organisms work continuously, they cannot afford to reach equilibrium. Hence the living state is a non-equilibrium steady state to be able to perform work. Living process is a constant effort to prevent falling into equilibrium. This is achieved by energy input. Metabolism provides a mechanism for the production of energy. Hence the living state and metabolism are synonymous. 
Without metabolism there cannot be a living state. 9.12 Enzymes Almost all enzymes are proteins. There are some nucleic acids that behave like enzymes. These are called ribozymes. One can depict an enzyme by a line diagram. An enzyme like any protein has a primary structure, that is, amino acid sequence of the protein. An enzyme like any protein has the secondary and the tertiary structure. When you look at a tertiary structure figure 9.4b you will notice that the backbone of the protein chain folds upon itself. The chain crisscrosses itself and hence, many crevices or pockets are made. One such pocket is the active site. An active site of an enzyme is a crevice or pocket into which the substrate fits. Thus enzymes, through their active site, catalyze reactions at a high rate. Enzyme catalysts differ from an organic catalyst in many ways, but one major difference needs mention. Inorganic catalysts work efficiently at high temperatures and high pressures, while enzymes get damaged at high temperatures say above 40 degrees Celsius. However, enzymes isolated from organisms who normally live under extremely high temperatures e.g. Hot vents and sulfur springs are stable and retain their catalytic power even at high temperatures up to 80 degrees 90 degrees Celsius. Thermal stability is thus an important quality of such enzymes isolated from thermophilic organisms. 9. 1 2. 1 Chemical Reactions How do we understand these enzymes? Let us first understand a chemical reaction. Chemical compounds undergo two types of changes. A physical change simply refers to a change in shape without breaking of bonds. This is a physical process. Another physical process is a change in state of matter, when ice melts into water, or when water becomes a vapor. These are also physical processes. However, when bonds are broken and new bonds are formed during transformation, this will be called a chemical reaction. For example, BAO2H2SO4BASO42H2O is an inorganic chemical reaction. Similarly, hydrolysis of starch into glucose is an organic chemical reaction. Rate of a physical or chemical process refers to the amount of product formed per unit time. It can be expressed as rate Greek letter delta Greek letter delta PT rate can also be called velocity if the direction is specified. Rates of physical and chemical processes are influenced by temperature among other factors. A general rule of thumb is that rate doubles or decreases by half. For every 10 degrees Celsius change in either direction, catalyzed reactions proceed at rates vastly higher than that of uncatalyzed ones. When enzyme catalyzed reactions are observed, the rate would be vastly higher than the same but uncatalyzed reaction. For example, CO2H2O carbonic anhydrase H2CO3 carbon dioxide water carbonic acid in the absence of any enzyme, this reaction is very slow. With about 200 molecules of H2CO3 being formed in an hour, however, by using the enzyme present within the cytoplasm called carbonic anhydrase, the reaction speeds dramatically with about 600, 000 molecules being formed every second. The enzyme has accelerated the reaction rate by about 10 million times. The power of enzymes is incredible indeed. There are thousands of types of enzymes each catalyzing a unique chemical or metabolic reaction. A multi-step chemical reaction, when each of the steps is catalyzed by the same enzyme complex or different enzymes, is called a metabolic pathway. For example, glucose 2 pyruvic acid C6H12060222C3H4032H2O is actually a metabolic pathway in which glucose becomes pyruvic acid through 10 different enzyme catalyzed metabolic reactions. When you study respiration in chapter 14 you will study these reactions. At this stage you should know that this very metabolic pathway with one or two additional reactions gives rise to a variety of metabolic end products. In our skeletal muscle, under anaerobic conditions, lactic acid is formed, under normal aerobic conditions, pyruvic acid is formed. In yeast, during fermentation, the same pathway leads to the production of ethanol alcohol. Hence, in different conditions different products are possible. 9. 1, 2, 2 How do enzymes bring about such high rates of chemical conversions? To understand this we should study enzymes a little more. We have already understood the idea of an active site. The chemical or metabolic conversion refers to a reaction. The chemical which is converted into a product is called a substrate, hence enzymes, that is proteins with three-dimensional structures including an active site, convert a substrate S into a product P. Symbolically, this can be depicted as SP. It is now understood that the substrate S has to bind the enzyme at its active site within a given cleft or pocket. The substrate has to diffuse towards the active site. There is thus an obligatory formation of an ES complex. E stands for enzyme. This complex formation is a transient phenomenon. During the state where substrate is bound to the enzyme active site, a new structure of the substrate called transition state structure is formed. Very soon, after the expected bond breaking making is completed, the product is released from the active site. 
In other words, the structure of substrate gets transformed into the structure of product S. The pathway of this transformation must go through the so-called transition state structure. There could be many more altered structural states between the stable substrate and the product. Implicit in this statement is the fact that all other intermediate structural states are unstable. Stability is something related to energy status of the molecule or the structure. Hence, when we look at this pictorially through a graph it looks like something as in figure 9.6. The y-axis represents the potential energy content. The x-axis represents the progression of the structural transformation or states through the transition state. You would notice two things. The energy level difference between S and P if P is at a lower level than S. The reaction is an exothermic reaction. One need not supply energy by heating in order to form the product. However, whether it is an exothermic or spontaneous reaction or an endothermic or energy requiring reaction, the S has to go through a much higher energy state or transition state. The difference in average energy content of S from that of this transition state is called activation energy. Enzymes eventually bring down this energy barrier making the transition of S to P more easy. 9, 1, 2, 3 Nature of enzyme action Each enzyme has a substrate S binding site in its molecule so that a highly reactive enzyme substrate complex ES is produced. This complex is short-lived and dissociates into its product SP and the unchanged enzyme with an intermediate formation of the enzyme product complex EP. The formation of the ES complex is essential for catalysis. ES ES EP EP activation energy without enzyme potential energy activation energy with enzyme substrate S product P progress of reaction transition state figure 9.6 concept of activation energy. The catalytic cycle of an enzyme action can be described in the following steps. 1. First, the substrate binds to the active site of the enzyme, fitting into the active site. 2. The binding of the substrate induces the enzyme to alter its shape, fitting more tightly around the substrate. 3. The active site of the enzyme, now in close proximity of the substrate breaks the chemical bonds of the substrate and the new enzyme product complex is formed. 4. The enzyme releases the products of the reaction and the free enzyme is ready to bind to another molecule of the substrate and run through the catalytic cycle once again. 9. 1, 2. Four factors affecting enzyme activity The activity of an enzyme can be affected by a change in the conditions which can alter the tertiary structure of the protein. These include temperature, pH, change in substrate concentration or binding of specific chemicals that regulate its activity. Temperature and pH enzymes generally function in a narrow range of temperature and pH figure 9.7. Each enzyme shows its highest activity at a particular temperature and pH called the optimum temperature and optimum pH. Activity declines both below and above the optimum value. Low temperature preserves the enzyme in a temporarily inactive state whereas high temperature destroys enzymatic activity because proteins are denatured by heat. Figure 9.7 Effect of change in a pH B temperature and C concentration of substrate on enzyme activity V max velocity of R action V S V2 max K M a B C pH temperature enzyme activity. Concentration of substrate with the increase in substrate concentration, the velocity of the enzymatic reaction rises at first. The reaction ultimately reaches a maximum velocity Vmax which is not exceeded by any further rise in concentration of the substrate. This is because the enzyme molecules are fewer than the substrate molecules and after saturation of these molecules. There are no free enzyme molecules to bind with the additional substrate molecules figure 9.7. The activity of an enzyme is also sensitive to the presence of specific chemicals that bind to the enzyme. When the binding of the chemical shuts off enzyme activity, the process is called inhibition and the chemical is called an inhibitor. When the inhibitor closely resembles the substrate in its molecular structure and inhibits the activity of the enzyme, it is known as competitive inhibitor. Due to its close structural similarity with the substrate, the inhibitor competes with the substrate for the substrate binding side of the enzyme. Consequently, the substrate cannot bind and as a result, the enzyme action declines, e.g., inhibition of succinic dehydrogenase by malinate which closely resembles the substrate succinate in structure. Such competitive inhibitors are often used in the control of bacterial pathogens 9, 1, 2, 5 classification and nomenclature of enzymes Thousands of enzymes have been discovered, isolated and studied. Most of these enzymes have been classified into different groups based on the type of reactions they catalyze. Enzymes are divided into six classes each with four 13 subclasses and named accordingly by a four-digit number. Oxidoreductases dehydrogenases, enzymes which catalyze oxidoreduction between two substrates S and SEG, S reduced S oxidized S oxidized S reduced. Transferases, enzymes catalyzing a transfer of a group, G other than hydrogen between a pair of substrate S and SEG. SGSS SG hydrolases, enzymes catalyzing hydrolysis of ester, ether, peptide, glycosidic 
CC, C halide or PN bonds. Lyases, enzymes that catalyze removal of groups from substrates by mechanisms other than hydrolysis leaving double bonds. Isomerases, includes all enzymes catalyzing interconversion of optical, geometric or positional isomers. Ligases, enzymes catalyzing the linking together of two compounds, e.g., enzymes which catalyze joining of CO, CS, CN, PO etc. Bonds 9, 1, 2, 6 cofactors enzymes are composed of one or several polypeptide chains. However, there are a number of cases in which non-protein constituents called cofactors are bound to the, the enzyme to make the enzyme catalytically active. In these instances, the protein portion of the enzymes is called the apoenzyme. Three kinds of cofactors may be identified, prosthetic groups, coenzymes and metal ions. Prosthetic groups are organic compounds and are distinguished from other cofactors in that they are tightly bound to the apoenzyme. For example, in peroxidase and catalase, which catalyze the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen, heme is the prosthetic group and it is a part of the active side of the enzyme. Coenzymes are also organic compounds but their association with the apoenzyme is only transient, usually occurring during the course of catalysis. Furthermore, coenzymes serve as cofactors in a number of different enzyme-catalyzed reactions. The essential chemical components of many coenzymes are vitamins, e.g., coenzyme nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide NAD and NADP contain the vitamin niacin. A number of enzymes require metal ions for their activity which form coordination bonds with side chains at the active site and at the same time form one or more coordination bonds with the substrate, e.g., zinc is a cofactor for the proteolytic enzyme carboxypeptidase. Catalytic activity is lost when the cofactor is removed from the enzyme which testifies that they play a crucial role in the catalytic activity of the enzyme. Summary Although there is a bewildering diversity of living organisms, their chemical composition and metabolic reactions appear to be remarkably similar. The elemental composition of living tissues and non-living matter appear also to be similar when analyzed qualitatively. However, a closer examination reveals that the relative abundance of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen is higher in living systems when compared to inanimate matter. The most abundant chemical in living organisms is water. There are thousands of small molecular weight, 1,000 of biomolecules, amino acids, monosaccharide and disaccharide sugars, fatty acids, glycerol, nucleotides, nucleosides and nitrogen bases are some of the organic compounds seen in living organisms. There are 20 types of amino acids and 5 types of nucleotides. Fats and oils are glycerides in which fatty acids are esterified to glycerol. Phospholipids contain, in addition, a phosphorylated nitrogenous compound, only 3 types of macromolecules, that is, proteins, nucleic acids and polysaccharides are found in living systems. Lipids, because of their association with membranes separate in the macromolecular fraction, biomacromolecules are polymers. They are made of building blocks which are different. Proteins are heteropolymers made of amino acids. Nucleic acids are NA and DNA are composed of nucleotides. Biomacromolecules have a hierarchy of structures, primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. Nucleic acids serve as genetic material. Polysaccharides are components of cell wall implants, fungi and also of the exoskeleton of arthropods. They also are storage forms of energy e.g., starch and glycogen. Proteins serve a variety of cellular functions. Many of them are enzymes, some are antibodies, some are receptors, some are hormones and some others are structural proteins. Collagen is the most abundant protein in animal world and ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase rubus CO is the most abundant protein in the whole of the biosphere. Enzymes are proteins which catalyze biochemical reactions in the cells, ribozymes are nucleic acids with catalytic power. Proteinaceous enzymes exhibit substrate specificity, require optimum temperature and pH for maximal activity. They are denatured at high temperatures, enzymes lower activation energy of reactions and enhance greatly the rate of the reactions. Nucleic acids carry hereditary information and are passed on from parental generation to progeny. Exercise is 1. What are macromolecules give examples to illustrate a glycosidic, peptide and a phosphodiester bond. 3. What is meant by tertiary structure of proteins? 4. Find and write down structures of 10 interesting small molecular weight biomolecules. Find if there is any industry which manufactures the compounds by isolation. Find out who are the buyers. 5. Proteins have primary structure. If you are given a method to know which amino acid is at either of the two termin ions of a protein, can you connect this information to purity or homogeneity of a protein? 6. Find out and make a list of proteins used as therapeutic agents. Find other applications of proteins e.g., cosmetics etc. 7. Explain the composition of triglyceride. 8. 
Can you describe what happens when milk is converted into curd or yogurt, from your understanding of proteins? 9. Can you attempt building models of biomolecules using commercially available atomic models ball and stick models? 10. Attempt titrating an amino acid against a weak base and discover the number of dissociating ionizable functional groups in the amino acid. 11. Draw the structure of the amino acid. Alanine 12. What are gums made of aesthetical different 13? Find out a qualitative test for proteins, fats and oils, amino acids and test any fruit juice, saliva, sweat and urine for them. 14. Find out how much cellulose is made by all the plants in the biosphere and compare it with how much of paper is manufactured by man and hence what is the consumption of plant material by man annually. What a loss of vegetation 15. Describe the important properties of enzymes 2018-1. 162 Biology Are you aware that all organisms, even the largest, start their life from a single cell? You may wonder how a single cell then goes on to form such large organisms. Growth and reproduction are characteristics of cells, indeed of all living organisms. All cells reproduce by dividing into two, with each parental cell giving rise to two daughter cells each time they divide. These newly formed daughter cells can themselves grow and divide, giving rise to a new cell population that is formed by the growth and division of a single parental cell and its progeny. In other words, such cycles of growth and division allow a single cell to form a structure consisting of millions of cells. 10.1 Cell Cycle Cell division is a very important process in all living organisms. During the division of a cell, DNA replication and cell growth also take place. All these processes, that is, cell division, DNA replication, and cell growth, hence, have to take place in a coordinated way to ensure correct division and formation of progeny cells containing intact genomes. The sequence of events by which a cell duplicates its genome, synthesizes the other constituents of the cell and eventually divides into two daughter cells is termed cell cycle. Although cell growth in terms of cytoplasmic increase is a continuous process, DNA synthesis occurs only during one specific stage in the cell cycle. The replicated chromosomes' DNA are then distributed to daughter nuclei by a complex series of events during cell division. These events are themselves under genetic control. Cell cycle and cell division chapter 10 10.1 cell cycle 10.2 M phase 10.3 significance of mitosis 10.4 meiosis 10.5 significance of meiosis. 1 0 1 1 phases of cell cycle A typical eukaryotic cell cycle is illustrated by human cells in culture. These cells divide once in approximately every 24 hours figure 10.1. However, this duration of cell cycle can vary from organism to organism and also from cell type to cell type. Yeast for example, can progress through the cell cycle in only about 90 minutes. The cell cycle is divided into two basic phases, LLLLL interphase LLLM phase mitosis phase The M phase represents the phase when the actual cell division or mitosis occurs and the interphase represents the phase between two successive M phases. It is significant to note that in the 24-hour average duration of cell cycle of a human cell, cell division proper lasts for only about an hour. The interphase lasts more than 95 of the duration of cell cycle. The M phase starts with the nuclear division, corresponding to the separation of daughter chromosomes karyokinesis and usually ends with division of cytoplasm cytokinesis. The interphase, though called the resting phase, is the time during which the cell is preparing for division by undergoing both cell growth and DNA replication in an orderly manner. The interphase is divided into three further phases, LLLLLG1 phase gap 1 liter LLLLS phase synthesis LLLLLG2 phase gap 2 G1 phase corresponds to the interval between mitosis and initiation of DNA replication. During G1 phase the cell is metabolically active and continuously grows but does not replicate its DNA. S or synthesis phase marks the period during which DNA synthesis or replication takes place. During this time the amount of DNA per cell doubles. If the initial amount of DNA is denoted as 2C then it increases to 4C. However, there is no increase in the chromosome number. If the cell had deployed or 2N number of chromosomes at G1, even after S phase the number of chromosomes remains the same, that is, 2N. In animal cells, during the S phase, DNA replication begins in the nucleus, and the centriole duplicates in the cytoplasm. During the G2 phase, proteins are synthesized in preparation for mitosis while cell growth continues. How do plants and animals continue to grow all their lives? Do all cells in a plant divide all the time? Do you think all cells continue to divide in all plants and animals? Can you tell the name and the location of tissues having cells that divide all their life in higher plants? Do animals have similar merostomatic tissues? Figure 10.1 A diagrammatic view of cell cycle indicating formation of two cells from one cell M phase.
Some cells in the adult animals do not appear to exhibit division e.g., heart cells and many other cells divide only occasionally, as needed to replace cells that have been lost because of injury or cell death. These cells that do not divide further exit G1 phase to enter an inactive stage called quiescent stage G0 of the cell cycle. Cells in the stage remain metabolically active but no longer proliferate unless called on to do so depending on the requirement of the organism. In animals, mitotic cell division is only seen in the diploid somatic cells. Against this, the plants can show mitotic divisions in both haploid and diploid cells. From your recollection of examples of alternation of generations in plants chapter 3 identify plant species and stages at which mitosis is seen in haploid cells. 10.2 M phase This is the most dramatic period of the cell cycle, involving a major reorganization of virtually all components of the cell. Since the number of chromosomes in the parent and progeny cells is the same, it is also called as equational division. Though for convenience mitosis has been divided into four stages of nuclear division karyokinesis. It is very essential to understand that cell division is a progressive process and very clear cut lines cannot be drawn between various stages. Karyokinesis involves following four stages, LL prophase LLL metaphase LLLLL anaphase LLLLL telophase 1 0 2 1 prophase prophase which is the first stage of karyokinesis of mitosis follows the S and G2 phases of interphase. In the S and G2 phases the new DNA molecules formed are not distinct but intertwined. Prophase is marked by the initiation of condensation of chromosomal material. The chromosomal material becomes untangled during the process of chromatin condensation figure 10.2 up. The centrosome, which had undergone duplication during S phase of interphase, now begins to move towards opposite poles of the cell. The completion of prophase can thus be marked by the following characteristic events. LLLLL chromosomal material condenses to form compact mitotic chromosomes. Chromosomes are seen to be composed of two chat etched together at the centromere LLL centrosome which had undergone duplication during interphase, begins to move towards opposite poles of the cell. Each centrosome radiates out microtubules called esters. The two esters together with spindle fibers forms mitotic apparatus. You have studied mitosis in onion root tip cells. It has 16 chromosomes in each cell. Can you tell how many chromosomes will the cell have at G1 phase? After S phase, and after M phase also, what will be the DNA content of the cells at G1, after S and at G2? If the content after M phase is 2C, 2C. Cells at the end of prophase, when viewed under the microscope, do not show Golgi complexes, endoplasmic reticulum, nucleolus in the nuclear envelope. 1 0, 2 2 metaphase The complete disintegration of the nuclear envelope marks the start of the second phase of mitosis, hence the chromosomes are spread through the cytoplasm of the cell. By this stage, condensation of chromosomes is completed and they can be observed clearly under the microscope. This then, is the stage at which morphology of chromosomes is most easily studied. At this stage, metaphase chromosome is made up of two sister chromatids, which are held together by the centromere figure 10.2b. Small disc-shaped structures at the surface of the centromeres are called conatochores. These structures serve as the sites of attachment of spindle fibers formed by the spindle fibers to the chromosomes that are moved into position at the center of the cell. Hence, the metaphase is characterized by all the chromosomes coming to lie at the equator with one chromatid of each chromosome connected by its conatochore to spindle fibers from one pole and its sister chromatid connected by its conatochore to spindle. Fibers from the opposite pole figure 10.2b. The plane of alignment of the chromosomes at metaphase is referred to as the metaphase plate. The key features of metaphase are LLLLL spindle fibers attached to connectors of chromosomes. LLL chromosomes are moved to spindle equator and get aligned along metaphase plate through spindle fibers to both poles. 1 0 2 3 anaphase at the onset of anaphase, each chromosome arranged at the metaphase plate is split simultaneously and the two daughter chromatids, now referred to as daughter chromosomes of the future daughter nuclei, begin their migration towards the two opposite poles. As each chromosome moves away from the equatorial plate, the centromere of each chromosome remains directed towards the pole and hence at the leading edge, with the arms of the chromosome trailing behind figure 10.2c. Thus, anaphase stage is characterized by figure 10.2 and b, a diagrammatic view of stages in mitosis.
the following key events. LLLLL centromeres split and chromatids separate LL chromatids move to opposite poles. 1 0 2 4 telophase at the beginning of the final stage of karyokinesis, that is, telophase, the chromosomes that have reached their respective post decadence and lose their individuality. The individual chromosomes can no longer be seen and each set of chromatin material tends to collect at each of the two poles figure 10.2d. This is the stage which shows the following key events. LLLLL chromosomes cluster at opposite spindle poles and their identity is lost as discrete elements. LLL nuclear envelope develops around the chromosome clusters at each pole forming two daughter nuclei. LLLLL nucleolus. Golgi complex and DR reform 1 0, 2, 5 cytokinesis mitosis accomplishes not only the segregation of duplicated chromosomes into daughter nuclei karyokinesis, but the cell itself is divided into two daughter cells by the separation of cytoplasm called cytokinesis at the end of which cell division gets completed figure 10.2e. In an animal cell, this is achieved by the appearance of a furrow in the plasma membrane. The furrow gradually deepens and ultimately joins in the center dividing the cell cytoplasm into two. Plant cells however, are enclosed by a relatively inextensible cell wall, therefore they undergo cytokinesis by a different mechanism. In plant cells, wall formation starts in the center of the cell and grows outward to meet the existing lateral walls. The formation of the new cell wall begins with the formation of a simple precursor, called the cell plate that represents the middle lamella between the walls of two adjacent cells. At the time of cytoplasmic division, organelles like mitochondria and plastids get distributed between the two daughter cells. In some organisms karyokinesis is not followed by cytokinesis as a result of which multinucleate condition arises leading to the formation of syncytium e.g., liquid endosperm and coconut. Figure 10.2 C to E, a diagrammatic view of stages in mitosis. 10.3 Significance of mitosis Mitosis or the equational division is usually restricted to the diploid cells only. However, in some lower plants and in some social insects haploid cells also divide by mitosis. It is very essential to understand the significance of this division in the life of an organism. Are you aware of some examples where you have studied about haploid and diploid insects? Mitosis usually results in the production of diploid daughter cells with identical genetic complement. The growth of multicellular organisms is due to mitosis. Cell growth results in disturbing the ratio between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. It therefore becomes essential for the cell to divide to restore the nucleocytoplasmic ratio. A very significant contribution of mitosis is cell repair. The cells of the upper layer of the epidermis, cells of the lining of the gut, and blood cells are being constantly replaced. Mitotic divisions in the merostomatic tissues, the apical and the lateral cambium, result in a continuous growth of plants throughout their life. 10.4 Meiosis The production of offspring by sexual reproduction includes the fusion of two gametes, each with a complete haploid set of chromosomes. Gametes are formed from specialized diploid cells. This specialized kind of cell division that reduces the chromosome number by half results in the production of haploid daughter cells. This kind of division is called meiosis. Meiosis ensures the production of haploid phase in the life cycle of sexually reproducing organisms whereas fertilization restores the diploid phase. We come across meiosis during gametogenesis in plants and animals. This leads to the formation of haploid gametes. The key features of meiosis are as follows. LL meiosis involves two sequential cycles of nuclear and cell division called meiosis I and meiosis II but only a single cycle of DNA replication. LLL meiosis I is initiated after the parental chromosomes have replicated to produce identical sister chromatids at the S phase. LLLL meiosis involves pairing of homologous chromosomes and recombination between non-sister chromatids of homologous chromosomes. LLLLL4 haploid cells are formed at the end of meiosis II. Meiotic events can be grouped under the following phases. Meiosis I meiosis II prophase I prophase II metaphase I metaphase II anaphase I anaphase II telophase I telophase II. 1 0 4 1 meiosis I prophase I prophase of the first meiotic division is typically longer and more complex when compared to prophase of mitosis. It has been further subdivided into the following five phases based on chromosomal behavior, that is, leptidine, zygotine, pachidine, diplodine and diakinesis. During leptidine stage the chromosomes become gradually visible under the light microscope. The compaction of chromosomes continues throughout leptidine. 
This is followed by the second stage of prophagy called zygotine. During this stage chromosomes start pairing together and this process of association is called synapsis. Such paired chromosomes are called homologous chromosomes. Electron micrographs of this stage indicate that chromosome synapsis is accompanied by the formation of complex structure called synaptonymal complex. The complex formed by a pair of synapsed homologous chromosomes is called a bivalent or a tetrad. However, these are more clearly visible at the next stage. The first two stages of prophagia are relatively short-lived compared to the next stage that is pachydine. During this stage, the four chromatids of each bivalent chromosomes becomes distinct and clearly appears as tetrads. This stage is characterized by the appearance of recombination nodules, the sites at which crossing over occurs between non-sister chromatids of the homologous chromosomes. Crossing over is the exchange of genetic material between two homologous chromosomes. Crossing over is also an enzyme-mediated process and the enzyme involved is called recombinase. Crossing over leads to recombination of genetic material on the two chromosomes. Recombination between homologous chromosomes is completed by the end of pachydine, leaving the chromosomes linked at the sites of crossing over. The beginning of diplodine is recognized by the dissolution of the synaptonymal complex and the tendency of the recombined homologous chromosomes of the bivalents to separate from each other except at the sites of crossovers. These X-shaped structures are called chiasmata. In oocytes of some vertebrates, diplodine can last for months or years. The final stage of meiotic prophagy is diakinesis. This is marked by terminalization of chiasmata. During this phase the chromosomes are fully condensed and the meiotic spindle is assembled to prepare the homologous chromosomes for separation. By the end of diakinesis, the nucleolus disappears and the nuclear envelope also breaks down. Diakinesis represents transition to metaphase. Metaphase I, the bivalent chromosomes align on the equatorial plate figure 10.3, the microtubules from the opposite poles of the spindle attach to the kinetic or of homologous chromosomes. Cell cycle and cell division 169 Anaphase I, the homologous chromosomes separate, while sister chromatids remain associated at their centromeres figure 10.3. Telophage I, the nuclear membrane and nucleolus reappear, cytokinesis follows and this is called as diet of cells figure 10.3. Although in many cases the chromosomes do undergo some dispersion, they do not reach the extremely extended state of the interphase nucleus. The stage between the two meiotic divisions is called interkinesis and is generally short-lived. There is no replication of DNA during interkinesis. Interkinesis is followed by prophase 2, a much simpler prophase than prophase I1-0, 4, 2 meiosis 2 prophase 2, meiosis 2 is initiated immediately after cytokinesis. Usually before the chromosomes have fully elongated, in contrast to meiosis I, meiosis 2 resembles a normal mitosis. The nuclear membrane disappears by the end of prophase 2 figure 10.4, the chromosomes again become compact. Metaphase 2. At this stage the chromosomes align at the equator and the microtubules from opposite poles of the spindle get attached to the kinetochores figure 10.4 of sister chromatids. Anaphase 2. It begins with the simultaneous splitting of the centromere of each chromosome which was holding the sister chromatids together. Allowing them to move toward opposite poles of the cell figure 10.4 by shortening of microtubules attached to kinetochores. Figure 10.3 Stages of Meiosis I One hundred seventy Biology Telophase II Meiosis ends with Telophase II, in which the two groups of chromosomes once again get enclosed by a nuclear envelope. Cytokinesis follows resulting in the formation of tetrad of cells that is. For haploid daughter cells figure 10.4 10.5 Significance of meiosis Meiosis is the mechanism by which conservation of specific chromosome number of each species is achieved across generations in sexually reproducing organisms. Even though the process, per se, paradoxically, results in reduction of chromosome number by half. It also increases the genetic variability in the population of organisms from one generation to the next. Variations are very important for the process of evolution. Figure 10.4 Stages of Meiosis 2 Summary According to the Cell Theory, Cells Arise from Pre-Existing Cells The process by which this occurs is called cell division. Any sexually reproducing organism starts its life cycle from a single cell zygote. 
Cell division does not stop with the formation of the mature organism but continue throughout its life cycle. The stages through which a cell passes from one division to the next is called the cell cycle. Cell cycle is divided into two phases called I interphase, a period of preparation for cell division, and two mitosis M phase the actual period of cell division. Interphase is further subdivided into G1, S and G2. G1 phase is the period when the cell grows and carries out normal metabolism. Most of the organelle duplication also occurs during this phase. S phase marks the phase of DNA replication and chromosome duplication. G2 phase is the period of cytoplasmic growth. Mitosis is also divided into four stages namely prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase. Chromosome condensation occurs during prophase. Simultaneously, the centrioles move to the opposite poles. The nuclear envelope and the nucleolus disappear and the spindle fibers start appearing. Metaphase is marked by the alignment of chromosomes at the equatorial plate. During anaphase the centromeres divide and the chromatids start moving towards the two opposite poles. Once the chromatids reach the two poles, the chromosomal elongation starts, nucleolus and the nuclear membrane reappear. This stage is called the telophase. Nuclear division is then followed by the cytoplasmic division and is called cytokinesis. Mitosis thus, is the equational division in which the chromosome number of the parent is conserved in the daughter cell. In contrast to mitosis, meiosis occurs in the diploid cells, which are destined to form gametes. It is called the reduction division since it reduces the chromosome number by half while making the gametes. In sexual reproduction when the two gametes fuse the chromosome number is restored to the value in the parent. Meiosis is divided into two phases, meiosis I and meiosis II. In the first meiotic division the homologous chromosomes pair to form bivalence and undergo crossing over. Meiosis I has a long prophase, which is divided further into five phases. These are leptidine, zygotine, pachidine, diplodine and diakinesis. During metaphase I and the bivalence arrange on the equatorial plate. This is followed by anaphase I in which homologous chromosomes move to the opposite poles with both their chromatids. Each pole receives half the chromosome number of the parent cell. In telophase I, the nuclear membrane and nucleolus reappear. Meiosis II is similar to mitosis. During anaphase to the sister chromatids separate, thus at the end of meiosis four haploid cells are formed. Exercises 1. What is the average cell cycle span for a mammalian cell? 2. Distinguish cytokinesis from karyokinesis. 3. Describe the event taking place during interphase 4. What is goquiescent phase of cell cycle? 5. Why is mitosis called equational division 6? Name the stage of cell cycle at which one of the following events occur. I chromosomes are moved to spindle equator. 2. Centromere splits and chromatid separate repairing between homologous chromosomes takes place. I've crossing over between homologous chromosomes takes place 7. Describe the following. A synapsis B bivalent C chiasma to draw a diagram to illustrate your answer. 8. How does cytokinesis in plant cells differ from that in animal cells? 9. Find examples where the four daughter cells from meiosis are equal in size and where they are found unequal in size. 10. Distinguish anaphase of mitosis from anaphase I of meiosis 11. List the main differences between mitosis and meiosis. 12. What is the significance of meiosis 13? Discuss with your teacher about I haploid insects in lower plants where cell division occurs, and to some haploid cells in higher plants where cell division does not occur. 14. Can there be mitosis without DNA replication in S phase 15? Can there be DNA replication without cell division 16? Analyze the event during every stage of cell cycle and notice how the following two parameters change I number of chromosomes N per cell 2 amount of DNA content C per cell 2018 1. Unit for the description of structure and variation of living organisms over a period of time, ended up as two, apparently irreconcilable perspectives on biology. The two perspectives essentially rested on two levels of organization of life forms and phenomena. One described at organismic and above level of organization while the second described at cellular and molecular level of organization. The first resulted in ecology and related disciplines. The second resulted in physiology and biochemistry. Description of physiological processes, in flower and plants as an example, is what is given in the chapters in this unit. The processes of mineral nutrition of plants, photosynthesis, transport, respiration and ultimately plant growth and development are described in molecular terms but in the context of cellular activities and even at organism level. Wherever appropriate, the relation of the physiological processes to environment is also discussed. Plant Physiology Chapter 11 Transport in Plants Chapter 12 Mineral Nutrition Chapter 13 Photosynthesis in Higher Plants Chapter 14 Respiration in Plants Chapter 15 Plant Growth and Development
Melvin Calvin born in Minnesota in April, 1911, received his Ph.D. in chemistry from the University of Minnesota. He served as professor of chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley, just after World War II, when the world was under shock after the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombings, and seeing the ill effects of radioactivity, Calvin and company workers put radioactivity to beneficial use. He along with J.A. Basham studied reactions in green plants forming sugar and other substances from raw materials like carbon dioxide. Water and minerals by labeling the carbon dioxide with C14, Calvin proposed that plants change light energy to chemical energy by transferring an electron in an organized array of pigment molecules and other substances. The mapping of the pathway of carbon assimilation in photosynthesis earned him Nobel Prize in 1961. The principles of photosynthesis as established by Calvin are, at present, being used in studies on renewable resource for energy and materials and basic studies in solar energy research Melvin Calvin 2018-1. Have you ever wondered how water reaches the top of tall trees, or for that matter how and why substances move from one cell to the other? Whether all substances move in a similar way, in the same direction and whether metabolic energy is required for moving substances. Plants need to move molecules over very long distances, much more than animals do. They also do not have a circulatory system in place. Water taken up by the roots has to reach all parts of the plant, up to the very tip of the growing stem. The photosynthets or food synthesized by the leaves have also to be moved to all parts including the root tips embedded deep inside the soil. Movement across short distances, say within the cell, across the membranes and from cell to cell within the tissue has also to take place. To understand some of the transport processes that take place in plants, one would have to recollect one's basic knowledge about the structure of the cell and the anatomy of the plant body. We also need to revisit our understanding of diffusion, besides gaining some knowledge about chemical potential and ions. When we talk of the movement of substances we need first to define what kind of movement we are talking about, and also what substances we are looking at. In a flower and plant the substances that would need to be transported are water, mineral nutrients, organic nutrients and plant growth regulators. Over small distances substances move by diffusion and by cytoplasmic streaming supplemented by active transport. Transport over longer distances proceeds through the vascular system the xylem and the phloem and is called translocation. An important aspect that needs to be considered is the direction of transport. In rooted plants, transport in xylem of water and minerals is essentially unidirectional, from roots to the stems. Organic and mineral nutrients however, undergo multidirectional transport. Organic transport in plants Chapter 11 11.1 Means of Transport 11.2 Plant Water Relations 11.3 Long Distance Transport of Water 11.4 Transpiration 11.5 Uptake and Transport of Mineral Nutrients 11.6 Flow and Transport Flow from source to sink. Compounds synthesized in the photosynthetic leaves are exported to all other parts of the plant including storage organs. From the storage organs they are later re-exported. The mineral nutrients are taken up by the roots and transported upwards into the stem, leaves and the growing regions. When any plant part undergoes senescence, nutrients may be withdrawn from such regions and moved to the growing parts. Hormones or plant growth regulators and other chemical signals are also transported, though in very small amounts, sometimes in a strictly polarized or unidirectional manner from where they are synthesized to other parts. Hence, in a flowering plant there is a complex traffic of compounds but probably very orderly moving in different directions, each organ receiving some substances and giving out some others. 11.1 Means of Transport 1 1 1 1 Diffusion movement by diffusion is passive, and may be from one part of the cell to the other, or from cell to cell or over short distances, say, from the intercellular spaces of the leaf to the outside. No energy expenditure takes place. In diffusion, molecules move in a random fashion, the net result being substances moving from regions of higher concentration to regions of lower concentration. Diffusion is a slow process and is not dependent on a living system. Diffusion is obvious in gases and liquids, but diffusion in solids rather than of solids is more likely. Diffusion is very important to plants since it is the only means for gaseous movement within the plant body. Diffusion rates are affected by the gradient of concentration, the permeability of the membrane separating them, temperature and pressure. 1 1 1 2 Facilitative diffusion as pointed out earlier, a gradient must already be present for diffusion to occur. The diffusion rate depends on the size of the substances, obviously smaller substances diffuse faster. The diffusion of any substance across a membrane also depends on its solubility in lipids, the major constituent of the membrane. Substances soluble in lipids diffuse through the membrane faster. Substances that have a hydrophilic moiety find it difficult to pass through the membrane. Their movement has to be facilitated. 
Membrane proteins provide sites at which such molecules cross the membrane. They do not set up a concentration gradient. A concentration gradient must already be present for molecules to diffuse even if facilitated by the proteins. This process is called facilitated diffusion. In facilitated diffusion special proteins help move substances across membranes without expenditure of ADP energy. Facilitated diffusion cannot cause net transport of molecules from a low to a high concentration. This would require input of energy. Transport rate reaches a maximum when all of the protein transporters are being used saturation. Facilitated. Transport in plants 177 diffusion is very specific. It allows cell to select substances for uptake. It is sensitive to inhibitors which react with protein side chains. The proteins form channels in the membrane for molecules to pass through. Some channels are always open, others can be controlled. Some are large, allowing a variety of molecules to cross. The porins are proteins that form large pores in the outer membranes of the plastids, mitochondria and some bacteria allowing molecules up to the size of small proteins to pass through. Figure 11.1 shows an extracellular molecule bound to the transport protein. The transport protein then rotates and releases the molecule inside the cell. E.g., water channels made up of eight different types of aquaparins 1 1 1 2 1 passive symports and antiports some carrier or transport proteins allow diffusion only if two types of molecules move together. In a symport, both molecules cross the membrane in the same direction. In an antiport, they move in opposite directions figure 11.2. When a figure 11.1 facilitative diffusion uniport carrier protein membrane antiport symport AAABB figure 11.2 facilitated diffusion. Molecule moves across a membrane independent of other molecules. The process is called uniport 1 1 1 3 active transport active transport uses energy to transport and pump molecules against a concentration gradient. Active transport is carried out by specific membrane proteins, hence different proteins in the membrane play a major role in both active as well as passive transport. Pumps are proteins that use energy to carry substances across the cell membrane. These pumps can transport substances from a low concentration to a high concentration uphill transport. Transport rate reaches a maximum when all the protein transporters are being used or are saturated. Like enzymes the carrier protein is very specific in what it carries across the membrane. These proteins are sensitive to inhibitors that react with protein side chains. 1 1 1 4 Comparison of different transport processes Table 11.1 gives a comparison of the different transport mechanisms. Proteins in the membrane are responsible for facilitated diffusion and active transport and hence show common characteristics of being highly selective. They are liable to saturate respond to inhibitors and are under hormonal regulation, but diffusion whether facilitated or not, take place only along a gradient and do not use energy. Table 11.1 Comparison of different transport mechanisms Property simple facilitated active diffusion transport Transport requires special membrane proteins No yes yes highly selective No yes yes transport saturates No yes yes uphill transport No no yes requires ADP energy No no yes 11.2 Plant water relations Water is essential for all physiological activities of the plant and plays a very important role in all living organisms. It provides the medium in which most substances are dissolved. The protoplasm of the cells is nothing but water in which different molecules are dissolved and several particles suspended. A watermelon has over 92% water. Most herbaceous plants have only about 10 to 15% of its fresh weight as dry matter. Of course, distribution of water within a plant varies. Woody parts have relatively very little water, while soft parts mostly contain water. A seed may appear dry but it still has water, otherwise it would not be alive and respiring. Terrestrial plants take up huge amount of water daily but most of it is lost to the air through evaporation from the leaves, that is, transpiration. A mature corn plant absorbs almost 3 liters of water in a day, while a mustard plant absorbs water equal to its own weight in about 5 hours. Because of this high demand for water, it is not surprising that water is often a limiting factor for plant growth and productivity in both agricultural and natural environments. 1 1 2 1 Water potential to comprehend plant water relations, an understanding of certain standard terms is necessary. Water potential Greek letter Psi Greek letter Psi Greek letter Psi was a concept fundamental to understanding water movement. Solute potentials and pressure potential are the two main components that determine water potential. Water molecules possess kinetic energy. In liquid and gaseous form they are in random motion that is both rapid and constant. The greater the concentration of water in a system, the greater is its kinetic energy or water potential. Hence, it is obvious that pure water will have the greatest water potential. If two systems containing water are in contact, 
Random movement of water molecules will result in net movement of water molecules from the system with higher energy to the one with lower energy. Thus water will move from the system containing water at higher water potential to the one having low water potential. This process of movement of substances down a gradient of free energy is called diffusion. Water potential is denoted by the Greek symbol psi or Greek letter psi 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 and is expressed in pressure units such as Pascal's Pa. By convention, the water potential of pure water at standard temperatures, which is not under any pressure, is taken to be zero. If some solute is dissolved in pure water, the solution has fewer free water molecules and the concentration free energy of water decreases, reducing its water potential. Hence, all solutions have a lower water potential than pure water. The magnitude of this lowering due to dissolution of a solute is called solute potential or s. is always negative. The more the solute molecules, the lower more negative is the s. For a solution at atmospheric pressure water potential with solute potentials, if a pressure greater than atmospheric pressure is applied to pure water or a solution, its water potential increases. It is equivalent to pumping water from one place to another. Can you think of any system in our body where pressure is built up? Pressure can build up in a plant system when water enters a plant cell due to diffusion causing a pressure build up against the cell wall. It makes the cell turgid C section 1 1, 2, 2. This increases the pressure potential. Pressure potential is usually positive, though in plants negative potential or tension in the water column in the xylem plays a major role in water transport up a stem. Pressure potential is denoted as Greek letter psi. Water potential of a cell is affected by both solute and pressure potential. The relationship between them is as follows. Wasp 1 1, 2, 2 osmosis the plant cell is surrounded by a cell membrane and a cell wall. The cell wall is freely permeable to water and substances in solution hence is not a barrier to movement. In plants the cells usually contain a large central vacuole, whose contents, the vacuole or sap, contribute to the solute potential of the cell. In plant cells, the cell membrane and the membrane of the vacuole, the tonoplast together are important determinants of movement of molecules in or out of the cell. Osmosis is the term used to refer specifically to the diffusion of water across a differentially or selectively permeable membrane. Osmosis occurs spontaneously in response to a driving force. The net direction and rate of osmosis depends on both the pressure gradient and concentration gradient. Water will move from its region of higher chemical potential or concentration to its region of lower chemical potential until equilibrium is reached. At equilibrium the two chambers should have nearly the same water potential. You may have made a potato osmometer in your earlier classes stage in school. If the tuber is placed in water, the water enters the cavity in the potato tuber containing a concentrated solution of sugar due to osmosis. Study figure 11.3 in which the two chambers, A and B, containing solutions are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. A solution of which chamber has a lower water potential B solution of which chamber has a lower solute potential. C in which direction will osmosis occur D which solution has a higher solute potential E at equilibrium which chamber will have lower water potential F if one chamber has a Greek letter psi 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 of 2000 kilopascal and the other 1000 kilopascal which is the chamber that has the higher Greek letter psi 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 G what will be the direction of the movement of water when two solutions with 0.2 MPa and 0.1 MPa are separated by a selectively permeable membrane Figure 11.3 AB Solute Molecule Water Semi-Permeable Selectively Permeable Membrane Let us discuss another experiment where a solution of sucrose in water taken in a funnel is separated from pure water in a beaker by a selectively permeable membrane Figure 11.4 You can get this kind of a membrane in an egg, remove the yolk and albumin through a small hole at one end of the egg, and place the shell in dilute solution of hydrochloric acid for a few hours. The eggshell dissolves leaving the membrane intact. Water will move into the funnel, resulting in rise in the level of the solution in the funnel. This will continue till the equilibrium is reached, in case sucrose does diffuse out through the membrane. Will this equilibrium be ever reached? External pressure can be applied from the upper part of the funnel such that no water diffuses into the funnel through the membrane. This pressure required to prevent water from diffusing is in fact, the osmotic pressure and this is the function of the solute concentration. More the solute concentration, greater will be the pressure required to prevent water from diffusing in. Numerically osmotic pressure is equivalent to the osmotic potential, but the sign is opposite osmotic pressure is the positive pressure applied, while osmotic potential is negative. 1 1, 2, 3 Plasmolysis The behavior of the plant cells or tissues with regard to water movement depends on the surrounding solution. If the external solution balances the osmotic pressure of the cytoplasm, it is said to be isotonic. 
If the external solution is more dilute than the cytoplasm, it is hypotonic and if the external solution is more concentrated, it is hypertonic. Cells swell in hypotonic solutions and shrink in hypertonic ones. Plasmolysis occurs when water moves out of the cell and the cell membrane of a plant cell shrinks away from its cell wall. This occurs when figure 11.4A demonstration of osmosis. A thistle funnel is filled with sucrose solution and kept inverted in a beaker containing water. The water will diffuse across the membrane as shown by arrows to raise the level of the solution in the funnel. B pressure can be applied as shown to stop the water movement into the funnel sucrose solution membrane water A B pressure. 182 Biology The cell or tissue is placed in a solution that is hypertonic has more solutes to the protoplasm. Water moves out. It is first lost from the cytoplasm and then from the vacuole. The water when drawn out of the cell through diffusion into the extracellular outside cell fluid causes the protoplast to shrink away from the walls. The cell is said to be plasmalized. The movement of water occurred across the membrane moving from an area of high water potential that is, the cell to an area of lower water potential outside the cell figure 11.5. What occupies the space between the cell wall and the shrunken protoplast in the plasmalized cell when the cell or tissue is placed in an isotonic solution? There is no net flow of water towards the inside or outside. If the external solution balances the osmotic pressure of the cytoplasm it is said to be isotonic. When water flows into the cell and out of the cell and are in equilibrium, the cells are said to be flaccid. The process of plasmolysis is usually reversible. When the cells are placed in a hypotonic solution higher water potential or dilute solution is compared to the cytoplasm. Water diffuses into the cell causing the cytoplasm to build up a pressure against the wall. That is called turgor pressure. The pressure exerted by the protoplast due to entry of water against the rigid walls is called pressure potential. Because of the rigidity of the cell wall, the cell does not rupture. This turgor pressure is ultimately responsible for enlargement and extension growth of cells. What would be the of the flaccid cell? Which organisms other than plants possess cell wall 1 1 2 4 imbibition imbibition is a special type of diffusion when water is absorbed by solids colloids causing them to increase in volume. The classical figure 11.5 plant cell plasmolysis. Examples of imbibition are absorption of water by seeds and dry wood. The pressure that is produced by the swelling of wood had been used by prehistoric man to split rocks and boulders. If it were not for the pressure due to imbibition, seedlings would not have been able to emerge out of the soil into the open, they probably would not have been able to establish. Imbibition is also diffusion since water movement is along a concentration gradient, the seeds and other such materials have almost no water hence they absorb water easily. Water potential gradient between the absorbent and the liquid imbibed is essential for imbibition. In addition, for any substance to imbibe any liquid, affinity between the adsorbent and the liquid is also a prerequisite. 11.3 Long distance transport of water At some earlier stage you might have carried out an experiment where you had placed a twig bearing white flowers in colored water and had watched it turn color. On examining the cut end of the twig after a few hours you had noted the region through which the colored water moved. That experiment very easily demonstrates that the path of water movement is through the vascular bundles, more specifically, the xylem. Now we have to go further and try and understand the mechanism of movement of water and other substances up a plant. Long distance transport of substances within a plant cannot be by diffusion alone. Diffusion is a slow process. It can account for only short distance movement of molecules. For example, the movement of a molecule across a typical plant cell about 50 micron takes approximately 2.5 s. At this rate, can you calculate how many years it would take for the movement of molecules over a distance of 1 meters within a plant by diffusion alone in large and complex organisms? Often substances have to be moved to long distances. Sometimes the sites of production or absorption and sites of storage are too far from each other. Diffusion or active transport would not suffice. Special long-distance transport systems become necessary so as to move substances across long distances and at a much faster rate. Water and minerals and food are generally moved by a mass or bulk flow system. Mass flow is the movement of substances in bulk or en masse from one point to another as a result of pressure differences between the two points. It is a characteristic of mass flow that substances, whether in solution or in suspension, are swept along at the same pace, as in a flowing river. This is unlike diffusion where different substances move independently depending on their concentration gradients. Bulk flow can be achieved either through a positive hydrostatic pressure gradient e.g., a garden hose or a negative hydrostatic pressure gradient e.g., suction through a straw. The bulk movement of substances through the conducting or vascular tissues of plants is called translocation. Do you remember studying cross-sections of roots, stems and leaves of higher plants and studying the vascular system the higher plants have highly specialized vascular tissues, xylem and phloem. 
Xylem is associated with translocation of mainly water, mineral salts, some organic nitrogen and hormones, from roots to the aerial parts of the plants. The phloem translocates a variety of organic and inorganic solutes, mainly from the leaves to other parts of the plants. 1 1 3 1 How do plants absorb water? We know that the roots absorb most of the water that goes into plants. Obviously that is why we apply water to the soil and not on the leaves. The responsibility of absorption of water and minerals is more specifically the function of the root hairs that are present in millions at the tips of the roots. Root hairs are thin walled slender extensions of root epidermal cells that greatly increase the surface area for absorption. Water is absorbed along with mineral solutes, by the root hairs, purely by diffusion, once water is absorbed by the root hairs. It can move deeper into root layers by two distinct pathways, apoplist pathway, simplest pathway. The apoplist is the system of adjacent cell walls that is continuous throughout the plant. Except at the Casparian strips of the endodermis in the roots figure 11.6, the apoplastic movement of water occurs exclusively through the intercellular spaces and the walls of the cells. Movement through the apoplist does not involve crossing the cell figure 11.6 pathway of water movement in the root. Membrane. This movement is dependent on the gradient. The apoplist does not provide any barrier to water movement and water movement is through mass flow. As water evaporates into the intercellular spaces or the atmosphere, tension develop in the continuous stream of water in the apoplist. Hence mass flow of water occurs due to the adhesive and cohesive properties of water. The symplastic system is the system of interconnected protoplasts. Neighboring cells are connected through cytoplasmic strands that extend through plasma desmata. During symplastic movement, the water travels through the cells, their cytoplasm, intercellular movement is through the plasma desmata. Water has to enter the cells through the cell membrane, hence the movement is relatively slower, movement is again down a potential gradient. Symplastic movement may be aided by cytoplasmic streaming, you may have observed cytoplasmic streaming in cells of a hydrilla leaf, the movement of chloroplast due to streaming is easily visible. Most of the water flow in the roots occurs via the apoplast since the cortical cells are loosely packed, and hence offer no resistance to water movement. However, the inner boundary of the cortex, the endodermis, is impervious to water because of a band of subraised matrix called the Casparian strip. Water molecules are unable to penetrate the layer, so they are directed to wall regions that are not subraised, into the cells proper through the membranes. The water then moves through the simplest and again crosses a membrane to reach the cells of the xylem. The movement of water through the root layers is ultimately symplastic in the endodermis. This is the only way water and other solutes can enter the vascular cylinder. Once inside the xylem, water is again free to move between cells as well as through them. In young roots, water enters directly into the xylem vessels and or tracheids. These are non-living conduits and so are parts of the apoplast. The path of water and mineral ions into the root vascular system is summarized in figure 11.7. Some plants have additional structures associated with them that help in water and mineral absorption. A mycorrhiza is a symbiotic association of a fungus with a root system. The fungal paracycle flow M. Casparian strip apoplastic path symplastic path endodermis xylem cortex figure 11.7 symplastic and apoplastic pathways of water and ion absorption and movement in roots. Filaments form a network around the young root or they penetrate the root cells. The hyphae have a very large surface area that absorb mineral ions and water from the soil from a much larger volume of soil that perhaps a root cannot do. The fungus provides minerals and water to the roots. In turn the roots provide sugars and end containing compounds to the mycorrhizae. Some plants have an obligate association with the mycorrhizae. For example, pinus seeds cannot germinate and establish without the presence of mycorrhizae. 1 1 3 2 Water movement up a plant We looked at how plants absorb water from the soil, and move it into the vascular tissues. We now have to try and understand how this water is transported to various parts of the plant. Is the water movement active? Or is it still passive since the water has to be moved up a stem against gravity? What provides the energy for this 1 1 3 2 1 Root pressure as various ions from the soil are actively transported into the vascular tissues of the roots. Water follows its potential gradient and increases the pressure inside the xylem. This positive pressure is called root pressure, and can be responsible for pushing up water to small heights in the stem. How can we see that root pressure exists? Choose a small soft-stemmed plant and on a day, when there is plenty of atmospheric moisture, cut the stem horizontally near the base with a sharp blade, early in the morning. You will soon see drops of solution ooze out of the cut stem. This comes out due to the positive root pressure. If you fix a rubber tube to the cut stem as a sleeve you can actually collect and measure the rate of exudation, and also determine the composition of the exudates. 
Effects of root pressure is also observable at night and early morning when evaporation is low, and excess water collects in the form of droplets around special openings of veins near the tip of grass blades, and leaves of many herbaceous parts. Such water loss in its liquid phase is known as gutation. Root pressure can, at best, only provide a modest push in the overall process of water transport. They obviously do not play a major role in water movement up tall trees. The greatest contribution of root pressure may be to re-establish the continuous chains of water molecules in the xylem which often break under the enormous tensions created by transpiration. Root pressure does not account for the majority of water transport. Most plants meet their need by transpiratory pull. 1 1 3 2 2 Transpiration pull Despite the absence of a heart or a circulatory system in plants, the upward flow of water through the xylem in plants can achieve fairly high rates, up to 15 meters per hour. How is this movement accomplished? A long-standing question is, whether water is pushed or pulled through the plant. Most researchers agree that water is mainly pulled through the plant, and that the driving force for this process is transpiration from the leaves. This is referred to as the cohesion tension transpiration pull model of water transport, but, what generates this transpirational pull water is transient in plants. Less than 1% of the water reaching the leaves is used in photosynthesis and plant growth. Most of it is lost through the stomata in the leaves. This water loss is known as transpiration. You have studied transpiration in an earlier class by enclosing a healthy plant in polythene bag and observing the droplets of water formed inside the bag. You could also study water loss from a leaf using cobalt chloride paper, which turns color on absorbing water. 11.4 Transpiration Transpiration is the evaporative loss of water by plants. It occurs mainly through stomata sing. Colon stoma. Besides the loss of water vapor and transpiration, exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the leaf also occurs through these stomata. Normally stomata are open in the daytime and closed during the night. The immediate cause of the opening or closing of stomata is a change in the turgidity of the guard cells. The inner wall of each guard cell, towards the pore or stomatal aperture, is thick and elastic. When turgidity increases within the two guard cells flanking each stomatal aperture or pore, the thin outer walls bulge out and force the inner walls into a crescent shape. The opening of the stoma is also aided due to the orientation of the microfibrils in the cell walls of the guard cells. Cellulose microfibrils are oriented radially rather than longitudinally making it easier for the stoma to open. When the guard cells lose turgor, due to water loss or water stress the elastic inner walls regain their original shape, the guard cells become flaccid and the stoma closes. Usually the lower surface of a dorsiventral often decotyledonous leaf has a greater number of stomata while in an isobilateral often monocotyledonous leaf they are about equal on both surfaces. Transpiration is affected by several external factors, temperature, light, humidity, wind speed. Plant factors that affect transpiration include number and distribution of stomata, percent of open stomata, water status of the plant, canopy structure etc. Figure 11.8 A stomatal aperture with guard cells. The transpiration-driven ascent of xylem sap depends mainly on the following physical properties of water, cohesion, mutual attraction between water molecules, comma adhesion attraction of water molecules to polar surfaces such as the surface of tracheary elements, comma surface tension, water molecules are attracted to each other in the liquid phase more than to water in the gas phase. These properties give water high tensile strength, that is, an ability to resist a pulling force, and high capillarity, that is, the ability to rise in thin tubes. In plants capillarity is aided by the small diameter of the tracheary elements, the tracheids and vessel elements. The process of photosynthesis requires water, the system of xylem vessels from the root to the leaf vein can supply the needed water. But what force does a plant use to move water molecules into the leaf parenchyma cells where they are needed as water evaporates through the stomata? Since the thin film of water over the cells is continuous, it results in pulling of water, molecule by molecule, into the leaf from the xylem. Also, because of lower concentration of water vapor in the atmosphere as compared to the substomital cavity and intercellular spaces, water diffuses into the surrounding air. This creates a pull of figure 11.9. Measurements reveal that the forces generated by transpiration can create pressure sufficient to lift a xylem-sized column of water over 130 meters high. Xylem flow M diffusion into surrounding air stomach guard cell palisade figure 11.9 water movement in the leaf. Evaporation from the leaf sets up a pressure gradient between the outside air and the air spaces of the leaf. The gradient is transmitted into the photosynthetic cells and on the water-filled xylem in the leaf vein. Stomatal pore. 1 1, 4, 
One transpiration and photosynthesis a compromised transpiration has more than one purpose. It creates transpiration full for absorption and transport of plants, supplies water for photosynthesis, transports minerals from the soil to all parts of the plant, cools leaf surfaces, sometimes 10 to 15 degrees, by evaporative cooling, maintains the shape and structure of the plants by keeping cells turgid and actively photosynthesizing plant has an insatiable need for water. Photosynthesis is limited by available water which can be swiftly depleted by transpiration. The humidity of rainforests is largely due to this vast cycling of water from root to leaf to atmosphere and back to the soil. The evolution of the C4 photosynthetic system is probably one of the strategies for maximizing the availability of CO2 while minimizing water loss. C4 plants are twice as efficient as C3 plants in terms of fixing carbon dioxide making sugar. However, a C4 plant loses only half as much water as a C3 plant for the same amount of CO2 fixed. 11.5 Uptake and transport of mineral nutrients plants obtain their carbon and most of their oxygen from CO2 in the atmosphere. However, their remaining nutritional requirements are obtained from water and minerals in the soil. 1 1 5 1 Uptake of mineral ions Unlike water, all minerals cannot be passively absorbed by the roots. Two factors account for this. I minerals are present in the soil as charged particles ions which cannot move across cell membranes and to the concentration of minerals in the soil is usually lower than the concentration of minerals in the root. Therefore, most minerals must enter the root by active absorption into the cytoplasm of epidermal cells. This needs energy in the form of ADP. The active uptake of ions is partly responsible for the water potential gradient in roots and therefore for the uptake of water by osmosis. Some ions also move into the epidermal cells passively. Ions are absorbed from the soil by both passive and active transport. Specific proteins in the membranes of root hair cells actively pump ions from the soil into the cytoplasms of the epidermal cells. Like all cells, the endodermal cells have many transport proteins embedded in their plasma membrane. They let some solutes cross the membrane, but not others. Transport proteins of endodermal cells are control points, where a plant adjusts the quantity and types of solutes that reach the xylem. Note that the root endodermis because of the layer of suberin has the ability to actively transport ions in one direction only. 1 1 5 2 Translocation of mineral ions after the ions have reached xylem through active or passive uptake. Or a combination of the two, their further transport up the stem to all parts of the plant is through the transpiration stream. The chief sinks for the mineral elements are the growing regions of the plant, such as the apical and lateral meristems, young leaves, developing flowers, fruits and seeds, and the storage organs. Unloading of mineral ions occurs at the fine vein endings through diffusion and active uptake by these cells. Mineral ions are frequently remobilized, particularly from older, senescing parts. Older dying leaves export much of their mineral content to younger leaves. Similarly, before leaf fall in deciduous plants, minerals are removed to other parts. Elements most readily mobilized are phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen and potassium. Some elements that are structural components like calcium are not remobilized. An analysis of the xylem exudates shows that though some of the nitrogen travels as inorganic ions, much of it is carried in the organic form as amino acids and related compounds. Similarly, small amounts of P and S are carried as organic compounds. In addition, small amount of exchange of materials does take place between xylem and phloem. Hence, it is not that we can clearly make a distinction and say categorically that xylem transports only inorganic nutrients while phloem transports only organic materials, as was traditionally believed. 11.6 Phloem transport, flow from source to sink food, primarily sucrose, is transported by the vascular tissue phloem from a source to a sink. Usually the source is understood to be that part of the plant which synthesizes the food, that is, the leaf, and sink, the part that needs or stores the food. But, the source and sink may be reversed depending on the season, or the plant's needs. Sugar stored in roots may be mobilized to become a source of food in the early spring when the buds of trees act as sink. They need energy for growth and development of the photosynthetic apparatus. Since the source-sink relationship is variable, the direction of movement in the phloem can be upwards or downwards, that is, b-directional. This contrasts with that of the xylem where the movement is always unidirectional, that is, upwards. Hence, unlike one-way flow of water in transpiration, food and flow MSEP can be transported in any required direction so long as there is a source of sugar and a sink able to use, store or remove the sugar. Flow MSEP is mainly water and sucrose, but other sugars, hormones and amino acids are also transported or translocated through flow M. 1 1 6 1 The pressure flow or mass flow hypothesis The accepted mechanism used for the translocation of sugars from source to sink is called the pressure flow hypothesis. 
See figure 11.10. As glucose is prepared at the source by photosynthesis it is converted to sucrose a desaturide. The sugar is then moved in the form of sucrose into the companion cells and then into the living flow M sieve tube cells by active transport. This process of loading at the source produces a hypertonic condition in the flow M. Water in the adjacent xylem moves into the flow M by osmosis. As osmotic pressure builds up the flow M sap will move to areas of lower pressure. At the sink osmotic pressure must be reduced. Again active transport is necessary to move the sucrose out of the flow M sap and into the cells which will use the sugar, converting it into energy, starch, or cellulose. As sugars are removed, the osmotic pressure decreases and water moves out of the flow M. To summarize, the movement of sugars in the flow M begins at the source, where sugars are loaded actively transported into a sieve tube. Loading of the flow M sets up a water potential gradient that facilitates the mass movement in the flow M. Flow M tissue is composed of sieve tube cells, which form long columns with holes in their end walls called sieve plates. Cytoplasmic strands pass through the holes in the sieve plates, so forming continuous filaments. As hydrostatic pressure in the sieve tube of flow M increases, pressure flow begins, and the sap moves through the flow M. Meanwhile, at the sink, incoming sugars are actively transported out of the flow M and removed sugars leave sieve tube for metabolism and storage. Water follows by osmosis high flow and turgor pressure root sugars enter sieve tubes. Water follows by osmosis sugar solution flows to regions of low turgor pressure tip of stem sugars leave sieve tubes. Water follows by osmosis figure 11.10 diagrammatic presentation of mechanism of translocation. As complex carbohydrates, the loss of solute produces a high water potential in the flow M, and water passes out, returning eventually to xylem. A simple experiment, called girdling, was used to identify the tissue through which food is transported. On the trunk of a tree a ring of bark up to a depth of the flow M layer, can be carefully removed. In the absence of downward movement of food the portion of the bark above the ring on the stem becomes swollen after a few weeks. This simple experiment shows that flow M is the tissue responsible for translocation of food, and the transport takes place in one direction, that is, towards the roots. This experiment can be performed by you easily. Summary plants obtain a variety of inorganic elements ions and salts from their surroundings especially from water and soil. The movement of these nutrients from environment into the plant as well as from one plant cell to another plant cell essentially involves movement across a cell membrane. Transport across cell membrane can be through diffusion, facilitated transport or active transport. Water and minerals absorbed by roots are transported by xylem and the organic material synthesized in the leaves is transported to other parts of plant through flow M. Passive transport diffusion, osmosis and active transport are the two modes of nutrient transport across cell membranes in living organisms. In passive transport, nutrients move across the membrane by diffusion, without any use of energy as it is always down the concentration gradient and hence entropy driven. This diffusion of substances depends on their size, solubility in water or organic solvents. Osmosis is the special type of diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane which depends on pressure gradient and concentration gradient. In active transport, energy in the form of ADP is utilized to pump molecules against a concentration gradient across membranes. Water potential is the potential energy of water molecules which helps in the movement of water. It is determined by solute potential and pressure potential. The osmotic behavior of cells depends on the surrounding solution. If the surrounding solution of the cell is hypertonic, it gets plasmalized. The absorption of water by seeds and dry wood takes place by a special type of diffusion called imbibition. In higher plants, there is a vascular system comprising of xylem and flow M, responsible for translocation. Water minerals and food cannot be moved within the body of a plant by diffusion alone. They are therefore, transported by a mass flow system. Movement of substance in bulk from one point to another as a result of pressure differences between the two points. Water absorbed by root hairs moves into the root tissue by two distinct pathways, that is, apoplist and simplest. Various ions, and water from soil can be transported up to a small height in stems by root pressure. Transpiration pull model is the most acceptable to explain the transport of water. Transpiration is the loss of water in the form of vapors from the plant parts through stomata, temperature, light, humidity, wind speed and number of stomata affect the rate of transpiration. Excess water is also removed through tips of leaves of plants by gotation. Flow M is responsible for transport of food primarily sucrose from the source to the sink. The translocation in flow M is bidirectional. The source sink relationship is variable. The translocation in flow M is explained by the pressure flow hypothesis. Exercises 1. What are the factors affecting the rate of diffusion? 2. What are porins? What role do they play in diffusion? 3. 
Describe the role played by protein pumps during active transport in plants. 4. Explain why pure water has the maximum water potential. 5. Differentiate between the following, a diffusion and osmosis B transpiration and evaporation C osmotic pressure and osmotic potential D imbibition and diffusion E apoplist and simplest pathways of movement of water in plants. F cortation and transpiration 6. Briefly describe water potential. What are the factors affecting it? 7. What happens when a pressure greater than the atmospheric pressure is applied to pure water or a solution? 8. A with the help of well-labeled diagrams, describe the process of plasmolysis in plants, giving appropriate examples. B. Explain what will happen to a plant cell if it is kept in a solution having higher water potential. 9. How is the mycorrhizal association helpful in absorption of water and minerals in plants? 10. What role does root pressure play in water movement in plants? 11. Describe transpiration pull model of water transport in plants. What are the factors influencing transpiration? How is it useful to plants? 12. Discuss the factors responsible for ascent of xylem sap in plants. 13. What essential role does the root endodermis play during mineral absorption in plants? 14. Explain why xylem transport is unidirectional and phloem transport be directional. 15. Explain pressure flow hypothesis of translocation of sugars in plants. 16. What causes the opening and closing of guard cells of stomata during transpiration? 194 Biology The basic needs of all living organisms are essentially the same. They require macromolecules, such as carbohydrates, proteins and fats, and water and minerals for their growth and development. This chapter focuses mainly on inorganic plant nutrition, wherein you will study the methods to identify elements essential to growth and development of plants and the criteria for establishing the essentiality. You will also study the role of the essential elements, their major deficiency symptoms and the mechanism of absorption of these essential elements. The chapter also introduces you briefly to the significance of the mechanism of biological nitrogen fixation. 12.1 Methods to Study the Mineral Requirements of Plants In 1860, Julius von Sachs, a prominent German botanist, demonstrated, for the first time, that plants could be grown to maturity in a defined nutrient solution in complete absence of soil. This technique of growing plants in a nutrient solution is known as hydroponics. Since then, a number of improvised methods have been employed to try and determine the mineral nutrients essential for plants. The essence of all these methods involves the culture of plants in a soil-free, defined mineral solution. These methods require purified water and mineral nutrient salts. Can you explain why is this so essential? After a series of experiments in which the roots of the plants were immersed in nutrient solutions and wherein an element was added substituted removed are given in varied concentration. A Mineral Solution Mineral Nutrition Chapter 12 12.1 Methods to Study the Mineral Requirements of Plants 12.2 Essential Mineral Elements 12.3 Mechanism of Absorption of Elements 12.4 Translocation of Solutes 12.5 Soil as Reservoir of Essential Elements 12.6 Metabolism of Nitrogen Suitable for the plant growth was obtained. By this method, essential elements were identified and their deficiency symptoms discovered. Hydroponics has been successfully employed as a technique for the commercial production of vegetables such as tomato, seedless cucumber and lettuce. It must be emphasized that the nutrient solutions must be adequately aerated to obtain the optimum growth. What would happen if solutions were poorly aerated? Diagrammatic views of the hydroponic technique is given in figures 12.1 and 12.2. 12.2 Essential Mineral Elements Most of the minerals present in soil can enter plants through roots. In fact, more than 60 elements of the 105 discovered so far are found in different plants. Some plant species accumulate selenium, some others gold, while some plants growing near nuclear test sites take up radioactive strontium. There are techniques that are able to detect the minerals even at a very low concentration 10 8 grams ml. The question is, whether all the diverse mineral elements present in a plant, for example, Gold and selenium as mentioned above. Are really necessary for plants? How do we decide what is essential for plants and what is not? 1, 2, 2, 1 criteria for essentiality. The criteria for essentiality of an element are given below. A the element must be absolutely necessary for supporting normal growth and reproduction. In the absence of the element, the plants do not complete their life cycle or set the seeds. B the requirement of the element must be specific and not replaceable by another element. In other words, deficiency of any one element cannot be met by supplying some other element. See the element must be directly involved in the metabolism of the plant. Figure 12.1 Diagram of a typical setup for nutrient solution culture Figure 12.2 Hydroponic plant production Plants are grown in a tube or trough placed on a slight incline. A pump circulates a nutrient solution from a reservoir to the elevated end of the tube. 
the solution flows down the tube and returns to the reservoir due to gravity. Inset shows a plant whose roots are continuously bathed in aerated nutrient solution. The arrows indicates the direction of the flow. Nutrient solution pump. Based upon the above criteria only a few elements have been found to be absolutely essential for plant growth and metabolism. These elements are further divided into two broad categories based on their quantitative requirements. I macronutrients and two micronutrients macronutrients are generally present in plant tissues in large amounts in excess of 10 mol kg minus 1 of dry matter. The macronutrients include carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, potassium, calcium and magnesium. Of these, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen are mainly obtained from CO2 and H2O, while the others are absorbed from the soil as mineral nutrition. Micronutrients or trace elements are needed in very small amounts less than 10 mol kg minus 1 of dry matter. These include iron, manganese, copper, molybdenum, zinc, boron, chlorine and nickel. In addition to the 17 essential elements named above, there are some beneficial elements such as sodium, silicon, cobalt and selenium. They are required by higher plants. Essential elements can also be grouped into four broad categories on the basis of their diverse functions. These categories are I essential elements as components of biomolecules and hence structural elements of cells e.g. carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen. Two essential elements that are components of energy-related chemical compounds in plants e.g. magnesium and chlorophyll and phosphorus in ADP. Three essential elements that activate or inhibit enzymes, for example Mg2 is an activator for both ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase and phosphonylpyruvate carboxylase, both of which are critical enzymes in photosynthetic carbon fixation. Zn2 is an activator of alcohol dehydrogenase and MO of nitrogenase during nitrogen metabolism. Can you name a few more elements that fall in this category for this? You will need to recollect some of the biochemical pathways you have studied earlier. If some essential elements can alter the osmotic potential of a cell, potassium plays an important role in the opening and closing of stomata. You may recall the role of minerals as solutes in determining the water potential of a cell. 1, 2, 2, 2 role of macro and micronutrients essential elements perform several functions. They participate in various metabolic processes in the plant cell such as permeability of cell. Membrane, maintenance of osmotic concentration of cell sap, electron transport systems, buffering action, enzymatic activity and act as major constituents of macromolecules and company enzymes. Various forms and functions of essential nutrient elements are given below. Nitrogen, this is the essential nutrient element required by plants in the greatest amount. It is absorbed mainly as number 3 losum or also taken up as number 2 or NH4. Nitrogen is required by all parts of a plant particularly the merostomatic tissues and the metabolically active cells. Nitrogen is one of the major constituents of proteins, nucleic acids, vitamins and hormones. Phosphorus. Phosphorus is absorbed by the plants from soil in the form of phosphate ions either as HPO24 or HPO42. Phosphorus is a constituent of cell membranes, certain proteins, all nucleic acids and nucleotides, and is required for all phosphorylation reactions. Potassium. It is absorbed as potassium ion K in plants. This is required in more abundant quantities in the merostomatic tissues, buds, leaves and root tips. Potassium helps to maintain an anion cation balance in cells and is involved in protein synthesis, opening and closing of stomata, activation of enzymes and in the maintenance of the turgidity of cells. Calcium. Plant absorbs calcium from the soil in the form of calcium ions Ka2. Calcium is required by merostomatic and differentiating tissues. During cell division it is used in the synthesis of cell wall, particularly as calcium pectate in the middle lamella. It is also needed during the formation of mitotic spindle. It accumulates in older leaves. It is involved in the normal functioning of the cell membranes. It activates certain enzymes and plays an important role in regulating metabolic activities. Magnesium. It is absorbed by plants in the form of divalent Mg2. It activates the enzymes of respiration, photosynthesis and are involved in the synthesis of DNA and RNA. Magnesium is a constituent of the ring structure of chlorophyll and helps to maintain the ribosome structure. Sulfur. Plants obtain sulfur in the form of sulfate so 4 2. Sulfur is present in two amino acids cysteine and methionine and is the main constituent of several coenzymes, vitamins thiamine, biotin, coenzyme A and ferredoxin. Iron. Plants obtain iron in the form of ferric ions Fe3. It is required in larger amounts in comparison to other micronutrients. It is an important constituent of proteins involved in the transfer of electrons like ferredoxin and cytochromes. It is reversibly oxidized from Fe2 to Fe3 during electron transfer. It activates catalase enzyme and is essential for the formation of chlorophyll.
Manganese. It is absorbed in the form of manganese ions MN2. It activates many enzymes involved in photosynthesis, respiration and nitrogen metabolism. The best defined function of manganese is in the splitting of water to liberate oxygen during photosynthesis. Zinc. Plants obtain zinc as ZN2 ions. It activates various enzymes, especially carboxylases. It is also needed in the synthesis of oxen. Copper. It is absorbed as cupric ions Q2. It is essential for the overall metabolism in plants. Like iron, it is associated with certain enzymes involved in redox reactions and is reversibly oxidized from Q to Q2. Boron. It is absorbed as BO33 or BO472. Boron is required for uptake and utilization of Ka2, membrane functioning, pollen germination, cell elongation, cell differentiation and carbohydrate translocation. Molybdenum. Plants obtain it in the form of molybdate ions Mu22. It is a component of several enzymes, including nitrogenase and nitrate reductase both of which participate in nitrogen metabolism. Chlorine. It is absorbed in the form of chloride anion Cl, along with Na and K. It helps in determining the solute concentration and the anion cation balance in cells. It is essential for the water splitting reaction in photosynthesis, a reaction that leads to oxygen evolution. 1 2 2 3 Deficiency Symptoms of Essential Elements Whenever the supply of an essential element becomes limited, plant growth is retarded. The concentration of the essential element below which plant growth is retarded is termed as critical concentration. The element is said to be deficient when present below the critical concentration, since each element has one or more specific structural or functional role in plants. In the absence of any particular element, plants show certain morphological changes. These morphological changes are indicative of certain element deficiencies and are called deficiency symptoms. The deficiency symptoms vary from element to element and they disappear when the deficient mineral nutrient is provided to the plant. However, if deprivation continues, it may eventually lead to the death of the plant. The parts of the plants that show the deficiency symptoms also depend on the mobility of the element in the plant. For elements that are actively mobilized within the plants and exported to young developing tissues, the deficiency symptoms tend to appear first in the older tissues. For example, the deficiency symptoms of nitrogen, potassium and magnesium are visible first in the senescent leaves. In the older leaves, biomolecules containing these elements are broken down, making these elements available for mobilizing to younger leaves. The deficiency symptoms tend to appear first in the young tissues whenever the elements are relatively immobile and are not transported out of the mature organs. For example, element like sulfur and calcium are a part of the structural component of the cell and hence are not easily released. This aspect of mineral nutrition of plants is of a great significance and importance to agriculture and horticulture. The kind of deficiency symptoms shown in plants include chlorosis, necrosis, stunted plant growth, premature fall of leaves and buds, and inhibition of cell division. Chlorosis is the loss of chlorophyll leading to yellowing in leaves. This symptom is caused by the deficiency of elements N, K, M, G, S, Fe, M, N, Z, N, and Mo. Likewise, necrosis, or death of tissue, particularly leaf tissue, is due to the deficiency of K, M, G, K, K, lack or low level of N, K, S, Mo causes an inhibition of cell division. Some elements like N, S, Mo delay flowering if their concentration in plants is low. You can see from the above that the deficiency of any element can cause multiple symptoms and that the same symptoms may be caused by the deficiency of one of several different elements. Hence, to identify the deficient element, one has to study all the symptoms developed in all the various parts of the plant and compare them with the available standard tables. We must also be aware that different plants also respond differently to the deficiency of the same element. 1 2 2 for toxicity of micronutrients the requirement of micronutrients is always in low amounts while their moderate decrease causes the deficiency symptoms and a moderate increase causes toxicity. In other words, there is a narrow range of concentration at which the elements are optimum. Any mineral ion concentration in tissues that reduces the dry weight of tissues by about 10% is considered toxic. Such critical concentrations vary widely among different micronutrients. The toxicity symptoms are difficult to identify. Toxicity levels for any element also vary for different plants. Many a times, excess of an element may inhibit the uptake of another element. For example, the prominent symptom of manganese toxicity is the appearance of brown spots surrounded by chlorotic veins. It is important to know that manganese competes with iron and magnesium for uptake and with magnesium for binding with enzymes. Manganese also inhibit calcium translocation in shoot apex. Therefore, excess of manganese may, in fact, induce deficiencies of iron, magnesium and calcium. Thus, what appears as symptoms of manganese toxicity may actually be the deficiency symptoms of iron, magnesium and calcium.
Can this knowledge be of some importance to a farmer, a gardener, or even for you in your kitchen garden? 12.3 Mechanism of Absorption of Elements Much of the studies on mechanism of absorption of elements by plants has been carried out in isolated cells. Tissues are organs. These studies revealed that the process of absorption can be demarcated into two main phases. In the first phase, an initial rapid uptake of ions into the free space or outer space of cells, the apoplast, is passive. In the second phase of uptake, the ions are taken in slowly into the inner space the simplest of the cells. The passive movement of ions into the apoplast usually occurs through ion channels, the transmembrane proteins that function as selective pores. On the other hand, the entry or exit of ions to and from the simplest requires the expenditure of metabolic energy, which is an active process. The movement of ions is usually called flux, the inward movement into the cells is influx and the outward movement, efflux. You have read the aspects of mineral nutrient uptake and translocation in plants in Chapter 11, 12.4 Translocation of solutes Mineral salts are translocated through xylem along with the ascending stream of water, which is pulled up through the plant by transpirational pull. Analysis of xylem sap shows the presence of mineral salts in it. Use of radioisotopes of mineral elements also substantiate the view that they are transported through the xylem. You have already discussed the movement of water in xylem in Chapter 11. 12.5 Soil is reservoir of essential elements Majority of the nutrients that are essential for the growth and development of plants become available to the roots due to weathering and breakdown of rocks. These processes enrich the soil with dissolved ions and inorganic salts. Since they are derived from the rock minerals, their role in plant nutrition is referred to as mineral nutrition. Soil consists of a wide variety of substances. Soil not only supplies minerals but also harbors nitrogen-fixing bacteria, other microbes, holds water, supplies air to the roots and acts as a matrix that stabilizes the plant. Since deficiency of essential minerals affect the crop yield, there is often a need for supplying them through fertilizers. Both macronutrients N, P, K, S, etc. and micronutrients Q, Z, N, F, M, N, etc. form components of fertilizers and are applied as per need. 12.6 Metabolism of Nitrogen 1 2, 6, 1 Nitrogen cycle apart from carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen is the most prevalent element in living organisms. Nitrogen is a constituent of amino acids, proteins, hormones, chlorophylls and many of the vitamins. Plants compete with microbes for the limited nitrogen that is available in soil. Thus, nitrogen is a limiting nutrient for both natural and agricultural ecosystems. Nitrogen exists as two nitrogen atoms joined by a very strong triple covalent bond NN. The process of conversion of nitrogen N2 to ammonia is termed as nitrogen fixation. In nature, lightning and ultraviolet radiation provide enough energy to convert nitrogen to nitrogen oxides NO, number 2, N2O. Industrial combustions, forest fires, automobile exhausts and power generating stations are also sources of atmospheric nitrogen oxides. Decomposition of organic nitrogen of dead plants and animals into ammonia is called ammonification. Some of this ammonia volatilizes and re-enters the atmosphere but most of it is converted into nitrate by soil bacteria in the following steps. Figure 12.3 The nitrogen cycle showing relationship between the three main nitrogen pools atmospheric soil, and biomass 232223222NHO no HHO. I22223 no oh no, 2 ammonia is first oxidized to nitrite by the bacteria Nitrosominus and O nitrococcus. The nitrite is further oxidized to nitrate with the help of the bacterium Nitrobacter. These steps are called nitrification figure 12.3. These nitrifying bacteria are chemoautotrophs. The nitrate thus formed is absorbed by plants and is transported to the leaves. In leaves, it is reduced to form ammonia that finally forms the amine A group of amino acids. Nitrate present in the soil is also reduced to nitrogen by the process of denitrification. Denitrification is carried by bacteria Pseudomonas and Thiobacillus 1, 2, 6, 2 Biological nitrogen fixation Very few living organisms can utilize the nitrogen in the form N2, available abundantly in the air. Only certain prokaryotic species are capable of fixing nitrogen. Reduction of nitrogen to ammonia by living organisms is called biological nitrogen fixation. The enzyme, nitrogenase which is capable of nitrogen reduction is present exclusively in prokaryotes. Such microbes are called N2 fixers. NNNH nitrogenase 3 The nitrogen fixing microbes could be free living or symbiotic. Examples of free-living nitrogen-fixing aerobic microbes are Azotobacter and Bigernichia while Rodospirillum is anaerobic and Bacillus free-living. In addition, a number of cyanobacteria such as Anabina and Nostoc are also free-living nitrogen fixers. Symbiotic Biological Nitrogen Fixation Several types of symbiotic biological nitrogen-fixing associations are known. 
The most prominent among them is the legume bacteria relationship. Species of rod shaped rhizobium has such relationship with the roots of several legumes such as alfalfa, sweet clover, sweet pea, lentils, garden pea, broad bean, clover beans, etc. The most common association on roots is its nodules. These nodules are small outgrowths on the roots. The microbe, Frankia, also produces nitrogen fixing nodules on the roots of non leguminous plants, e.g., Alnus. Both rhizobium and Frankia are free living in soil, but as symbionts, can fix atmospheric nitrogen. Uproot any one plant of a common pulse, just before flowering, you will see near spherical outgrowths on the roots. These are nodules, if you cut through them you will notice that the central portion is red or pink. What makes the nodules pink? This is due to the presence of leguminous hemoglobin or leg hemoglobin. Nodule formation Nodule formation involves a sequence of multiple interactions between rhizobium and roots of the host plant. Principal stages in the nodule formation are summarized as follows. Rhizobia multiply and colonize the surroundings of roots and get attached to epidermal and root hair cells. The root hairs curl and the bacteria invade the root hair. An infection thread is produced carrying the bacteria into the cortex of the root, where they initiate the nodule formation in the cortex of the root. Then the bacteria are released from the thread into the cells which leads to the differentiation of specialized nitrogen-fixing cells. The nodule thus formed, establishes a direct vascular connection with the host for exchange of nutrients. These events are depicted in figure 12.4. The nodule contains all the necessary biochemical components, such as the enzyme nitrogenase and leguminoglobin. The enzyme nitrogenase is a MOFA protein and catalyses the conversion of atmospheric nitrogen to ammonia. Figure 12.5 The first stable product of nitrogen fixation. The reaction is as follows, 232NADH16 ADP 2NHH16 ADP 16P The enzyme nitrogenase is highly sensitive to the molecular oxygen, it requires anaerobic conditions. The nodules have adaptations that ensure that the enzyme is protected from oxygen. To protect these enzymes, the nodule contains an oxygen scavenger called leg hemoglobin. It is interesting to note that these microbes live as aerobes under free living conditions where nitrogenase is not operational. But during nitrogen fixing events, they become anaerobic thus protecting the nitrogenase enzyme. You must have noticed in the above reaction that the ammonia synthesis by nitrogenase requires a soil particles root hair bacteria inner cortex and paracycle cells under division infection thread containing bacteria mature nodule hook bacteria. Figure 12.4 Development of root nodules in soybean. A rhizobium bacteria contact a susceptible root hair. Divide near it. B. Successful infection of the root hair causes it to curl. C. Infected thread carries the bacteria to the inner cortex. The bacteria get modified into rod-shaped bacteroids and cause inner cortical and paracycle cells to divide. Division and growth of cortical and paracycle cells led to nodule formation. D. A. Mature nodule is complete with vascular tissues continuous with those of the root and 2 h h h h h h h h h h h h h h h h h n n n n n n enzyme substrate nitrogen gas N2 reduction 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 binding of substrate nitrogenase product. Ammonia NH3 release of products free nitrogenase combined another molecule of N22H2HNNHHNHNN figure 12.5 steps of conversion of atmospheric nitrogen to ammonia by nitrogenase enzyme complex found in nitrogen fixing bacteria. Very high input of energy 8 ADP for each NH3 produced, the energy required, thus, is obtained from the respiration of the host cells. Fate of ammonia, at physiological pH, the ammonia is protonated to form NH4 ammonium ion, while most of the plants can assimilate nitrate as well as ammonium ions, the latter is quite toxic to plants and hence cannot accumulate in them. Let us now see how the NH4 is used to synthesize amino acids in plants. There are two main ways in which this can take place, I reductive amination, in these processes. Ammonia reacts with Greek letter alpha catagloteric acid and forms glutamic acid as indicated in the equation given below. 2. Transamination. It involves the transfer of amino group from one amino acid to the keto group of a keto acid. Glutamic acid is the main amino acid from which the transfer of NH2, the amino group takes place and other amino acids are formed through transamination. The enzyme transaminase catalyses all such reactions, for example, Greek letter alpha catagloteric acid NHNADPH glutamate dehydrogenase 4 glutamate HONADP2 The two most important amides, asparagin and glutamine found in plants are a structural part of proteins. They are formed from two amino acids, namely aspartic acid and glutamic acid, respectively, by addition of another amino group to each. The hydroxyl part of the acid is replaced by another NH2 radical. Since amides contain more nitrogen than the amino acids, they are transported to other parts of the plant via xylem vessels. 
In addition, along with the transpiration stream the nodules of some plants e.g. soybean export the fixed nitrogen as ureides. These compounds also have a particularly high nitrogen to carbon ratio. Summary plants obtain their inorganic nutrients from air, water and soil. Plants absorb a wide variety of mineral elements. Not all of the mineral elements that they absorb are required by plants. Out of the more than 105 elements discovered so far, less than 21 are essential and beneficial for normal plant growth and development. The elements required in large quantities are called macronutrients while those required in less quantities or in trace are termed as micronutrients. These elements are either essential constituents of proteins, carbohydrates, fats, nucleic acid etc. and or take part in various metabolic processes. Deficiency of each of these essential elements may lead to symptoms called deficiency symptoms. Chlorosis, necrosis, stunted growth, impaired cell division, etc. are some prominent deficiency symptoms. Plants absorb minerals through roots by either passive or active processes. They are carried to all parts of the organism through xylem along with water transport. Nitrogen is very essential for the sustenance of life. Plants cannot use atmospheric nitrogen directly. But some of the plants in association with N2 fixing bacteria, especially roots of legumes, can fix this atmospheric nitrogen into biologically usable forms. Nitrogen fixation requires a strong reducing agent and energy in the form of ADP. N2 fixation is accomplished with the help of nitrogen fixing microbes. Mainly rhizobium, the enzyme nitrogenase which plays an important role in biological N2 fixation is very sensitive to oxygen. Most of the processes take place in anaerobic environment. The energy, ADP, required is provided by the respiration of the host cells. Ammonia produced following N2 fixation is incorporated into amino acids as the amino group. Exercise is one. All elements that are present in a plant need not be essential to its survival. Comment 2. Why is purification of water and nutrient salt so important in studies involving mineral nutrition using hydroponics? 3. Explain with examples, macronutrients, micronutrients, beneficial nutrients, toxic elements and essential elements. 4. Name at least 5 different deficiency symptoms in plants. Describe them and correlate them with the concerned mineral deficiency. 5. If a plant shows a symptom which could develop due to deficiency of more than one nutrient, how would you find out experimentally, the real deficient mineral element 6? Why is that in certain plants deficiency symptoms appear first in younger parts of the plant while in others they do so in mature organs 7? How are the minerals absorbed by the plants 8? What are the conditions necessary for fixation of atmospheric nitrogen by rhizobium? What is their role in N2 fixation 9? What are the steps involved in formation of a root nodule 10? Which of the following statements are true if false? Correct them. A boron deficiency leads to stout axis. B. Every mineral element that is present in a cell is needed by the cell. C. Nitrogen as a nutrient element is highly immobile in the plants. D. It is very easy to establish the essentiality of micronutrients because they are required only in trace quantities. 206 Biology All animals including human beings depend on plants for their food. Have you ever wondered from where plants get their food green plants? In fact, have to make or rather synthesize the food they need and all other organisms depend on them for their needs. The green plants make or rather synthesize the food they need through photosynthesis and are therefore called autotrophs. You have already learned that the autotrophic nutrition is found only in plants and all other organisms that depend on the green plants for food are heterotrophs. Green plants carry out photosynthesis, a physical chemical process by which they use light energy to drive the synthesis of organic compounds. Ultimately, all living forms on Earth depend on sunlight for energy. The use of energy from sunlight by plants doing photosynthesis is the basis of life on Earth. Photosynthesis is important due to two reasons. It is the primary source of all food on Earth. It is also responsible for the release of oxygen into the atmosphere by green plants. Have you ever thought what would happen if there were no oxygen to breath? This chapter focuses on the structure of the photosynthetic machinery and the various reactions that transform light energy into chemical energy. 13.1 What do we know? Let us try to find out what we already know about photosynthesis. Some simple experiments you may have done in the earlier classes have shown that chlorophyll green pigment of the leaf, light and CO2 are required for photosynthesis to occur. You may have carried out the experiment to look for starch formation in two leaves, a variegated leaf or a leaf that was partially covered with black paper, and exposed to light. On testing these leaves for the presence of starch it was clear that photosynthesis occurred only in the green parts of the leaves in the presence of light. Photosynthesis in Higher Plants Chapter 13 13.1 What do we know? 13.2 Early Experiments 13.3 Where does photosynthesis take place? 
13.4 How many pigments are involved in photosynthesis? 13.5 What is light reaction? 13.6 The electron transport? 13.7 Where are the ADP and NADPH used? 13.8 The C4 pathway? 13.9 Photorespiration? 13.10 Factors affecting photosynthesis? Another experiment you may have carried out where a part of a leaf is enclosed in a test tube containing some co-soaked cotton which absorbs CO2, while the other half is exposed to air. The setup is then placed in light for some time, on testing for the presence of starch later in the two plants of the leaf. You must have found that the exposed part of the leaf tested positive for starch while the portion that was in the tube, tested negative. This showed that CO2 was required for photosynthesis. Can you explain how this conclusion could be drawn? 13. Point to early experiments It is interesting to learn about those simple experiments that led to a gradual development in our understanding of photosynthesis. Joseph Priestley 1733 1804 and 1770 performed a series of experiments that revealed the essential role of air in the growth of green plants. Priestley, you may recall, discovered oxygen in 1774. Priestley observed that a candle burning in a closed space, a bell jar, soon gets extinguished figure 13.1 A, B, C, D. Similarly, a mouse would soon suffocate in a closed space. He concluded that a burning candle or an animal that breathed the air, both somehow, damaged the air. But when he placed a mint plant in the same bell jar, he found that the mouse stayed alive and the candle continued to burn. Priestley hypothesized as follows, plants restore to the air whatever breathing animals and burning candles remove. Can you imagine how Priestley would have conducted the experiment using a candle under plant? Remember, he would need to rekindle the candle to test whether it burns after a few days. How many different ways can you think of to light the candle without disturbing the setup using a similar setup as the one used by Priestley? But by placing it once in the dark and once in the sunlight, Jan Ingenhouse 1730 1799 showed that sunlight is essential to the plant process that somehow purifies the air fouled by burning candles or breathing animals. Ingenhouse in an elegant experiment with an aquatic plant showed that in bright sunlight, small bubbles were formed around the green parts while in the dark they did not. Later he identified these bubbles to be of oxygen, hence he showed that it is only the green part of the plants that could release oxygen. A CBD figure 13.1 Priestley's experiment. It was not until about 1854 that Julius von Sachs provided evidence for production of glucose when plants grow. Glucose is usually stored as starch. His later study showed that the green substance in plants chlorophyll as we know it now is located in special bodies later called chloroplasts within plant cells. He found that the green parts in plants is where glucose is made, and that the glucose is usually stored as starch. Now consider the interesting experiments done by T.W. Engelmann 1843-1909. Using a prism he split light into its spectral components and then illuminated a green alga, Cladophora, placed in a suspension of aerobic bacteria. The bacteria were used to detect the sites of O2 evolution. He observed that the bacteria accumulated mainly in the region of blue and red light of the split spectrum. A first action spectrum of photosynthesis was thus described. It resembles roughly the absorption spectra of chlorophyll and be discussed in section 13.4. By the middle of the 19th century the key features of plant photosynthesis were known, namely, that plants could use light energy to make carbohydrates from CO2 and water. The empirical equation representing the total process of photosynthesis for oxygen evolving organisms was then understood as COHOCHOLI2222 where CH2O represented a carbohydrate e.g. glucose, a 6-carbon sugar. A milestone contribution to the understanding of photosynthesis was that made by a microbiologist. Cornelius Van Neel 1897-1985, who, based on his studies of purple and green bacteria, demonstrated that photosynthesis is essentially a light-dependent reaction in which hydrogen from a suitable oxidizable compound reduces carbon dioxide to carbohydrates. This can be expressed by 222-222-HACOACHOHO light in green plants H2O is the hydrogen donor and is oxidized to O2. Some organisms do not release O2 during photosynthesis, when H2S, instead is the hydrogen donor for purple and green sulfur bacteria, the oxidation product is sulfur or sulfate depending on the organism and not O2. Hence, he inferred that the O2 evolved by the green plant comes from H2O, not from carbon dioxide. This was later proved by using radioisotopic techniques. The correct equation, that would represent the overall process of photosynthesis is therefore, 612662. 2, 6, 1, 2, 6, 2, 2, COHOCHOHOL light where C6H12O6 represents glucose. The O2 released is from water. This was proved using radioisotope techniques. Note that this is not a single 
reaction but description of a multi-step process called photosynthesis. Can you explain why 12 molecules of water as substrate are used in the equation given above? 13.3 Where does photosynthesis take place? You would of course answer, in the green leaf or in the chloroplasts, based on what you earlier read in Chapter 8. You are definitely right. Photosynthesis does take place in the green leaves of plants but it does so also in other green parts of the plants. Can you name some other parts where you think photosynthesis may occur? You would recollect from previous unit that the mesophyll cells in the leaves have a large number of chloroplasts. Usually the chloroplasts align themselves along the walls of the mesophyll cells, such that they get the optimum quantity of the incident light. When do you think the chloroplasts will be aligned with their flat surfaces parallel to the walls? When would they be perpendicular to the incident light? You have studied the structure of chloroplast in Chapter 8. Within the chloroplast there is membranous system consisting of grana, the stroma lamellae, and the matrix stroma figure 13.2. There is a clear division of labor within the chloroplast. The membrane system is responsible for trapping the light energy and also for the synthesis of ADP and NADPH in stroma. Enzymatic reactions synthesize sugar, which in turn forms starch. The former set of reactions, since they are directly light-driven are called light reactions photochemical reactions. The latter are not directly light-driven but are dependent on the products of light reactions ADP and NADPH. Hence, to distinguish the latter they are called, by convention, as dark reactions carbon reactions. However, this should not be construed to mean that they occur in darkness or that they are not light-dependent. Figure 13.2 Diagrammatic representation of an electron micrograph of a section of chloroplast outer membrane inner membrane stroma lamella grain a stroma ribosome starch granule lipid droplet. 13.4 HOV Many types of pigments are involved in photosynthesis looking at plants have you ever wondered why and how there are so many shades of green in their leaves, even in the same plant? We can look for an answer to this question by trying to separate the leaf pigments of any green plant through paper chromatography. A chromatographic separation of the leaf pigments shows that the color that we see in leaves is not due to a single pigment but due to four pigments, chlorophyll a bright or blue-green in the chromatogram, chlorophyll B yellow-green, xanthophylls yellow and carotenoids yellow to yellow-orange. Let us now see what roles various pigments play in photosynthesis. Pigments are substances that have an ability to absorb light, at specific wavelengths. Can you guess which is the most abundant plant pigment in the world? Let us study the graph showing the ability of chlorophylla pigment to absorb lights of different wavelengths figure 13.3 up. Of course, you are familiar with the wavelength of the visible spectrum of light as well as the vibgyre. From figure 13.3 up can you determine the wavelength color of light at which chlorophylla shows the maximum absorption? Does it show another absorption peak at any other wavelengths too? If yes, which one now look at figure 13.3 b showing the wavelengths at which maximum photosynthesis occurs in a plant? Can you see that the wavelengths at which there is maximum absorption by chlorophyll A, that is, in the blue and the red regions, also shows higher rate of photosynthesis. Hence, we can conclude that chlorophyll A is the chief pigment associated with photosynthesis, but by looking at figure 13.3c can you say that there is a complete one-to-one -one overlap between the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll A and the action spectrum of photosynthesis? Figure 13.3 a graph showing the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll A. B and the carotenoids figure 13.3 B graph showing action spectrum of photosynthesis figure 13.3 C graph showing action spectrum of photosynthesis superimposed on absorption spectrum of chlorophylla. These graphs, together, show that most of the photosynthesis takes place in the blue and red regions of the spectrum, some photosynthesis does take place at the other wavelengths of the visible spectrum. Let us see how this happens, though chlorophyll is the major pigment responsible for trapping light. Other thylakoid pigments like chlorophyll B, xanthophylls and carotenoids, which are called accessory pigments, also absorb light and transfer the energy to chlorophyll A. Indeed, they not only enable a wider range of wavelength of incoming light to be utilized for photosynthesis but also protect chlorophyll A from photooxidation. 13.5 What is light reaction? Light reactions or the photochemical phase include light absorption, water splitting, oxygen release, and the formation of high-energy chemical intermediates, ADP and NADPH. Several protein complexes are involved in the process. The pigments are organized into two discrete photochemical light harvesting complexes LHC within the photosystem IPSI and photosystem 2PS2. These are named in the sequence of their discovery, and not in the sequence in which they function during the light reaction. The LHC are made up of hundreds of pigment molecules bound to proteins. Each photosystem has all the pigments except one molecule of chlorophylla forming a light harvesting system also called antennae figure 13.4. These pigments help to make photosynthesis more efficient by absorbing different wavelengths of light. 
The single chlorophylla molecule forms the reaction center. The reaction center is different in both the photosystems. In PSI the reaction center chlorophylla has an absorption peak at 700 nm, hence is called P700, while in PS2 it has absorption maxima at 680 nm, and is called P680. 13.6 The electron transport in photosystem to the reaction center chlorophylla absorbs 680 nm wavelength of red light causing electrons to become excited and jump into an orbit farther from the atomic nucleus. These electrons are picked up by an electron acceptor which passes them to an electron's transport photon reaction center pigment molecules primary acceptor figure 13.4 the light harvesting complex. System consisting of cytochromes figure 13.5. This movement of electrons is downhill, in terms of an oxidation reduction or redox potential scale. The electrons are not used up as they pass through the electron transport chain, but are passed on to the pigments of photosystem PSI simultaneously. Electrons in the reaction center of PSI are also excited when they receive red light of wavelength 700 nm and are transferred to another acceptor molecule that has a greater redox potential. These electrons then are moved downhill again, this time to a molecule of energy rich NADP. The addition of these electrons reduces NADP to NADPHH. This whole scheme of transfer of electrons, starting from the PS2, uphill to the acceptor, down the electron transport chain to PSI. Excitation of electrons, transfer to another acceptor, and finally downhill to NADP reducing it to NADPHH is called the Z scheme, due to its characteristic shape figure 13.5. This shape is formed when all the carriers are placed in a sequence on a redox potential scale 1 3, 6, 1 splitting of water you would then ask, how does PS2 supply electrons continuously the electrons that were moved from photosystem 2 must be replaced. This is achieved by electrons available due to splitting of water, the splitting of water is associated with the PS2, water is split into 2 H, O and electrons. This creates oxygen, one of the net products of photosynthesis. The electrons needed to replace those removed from photosystem I are provided by photosystem 2. 2442-2HOHOE We need to emphasize here that the water splitting complex is associated with the PS2, which itself is physically located on the inner side of the membrane of the thylakoid. Then, where are the protons and O2 formed likely to be released? In the lumen. Or on the outer side of the membrane 1, 3, 6. Two cyclic and non-cyclic photophosphorylation living organisms have the capability of extracting energy from oxidizable substances and store this in the form of bond energy. Special substances like ADP carry this energy in their chemical bonds. The process through which electron transport system E acceptor E acceptor light photosystem 2 photosystem I NADPH NADP LHC LHC HO2 E2 HO2 ADP IP ADP figure 13.5 Z scheme of light reaction. ADP is synthesized by cells in mitochondria and chloroplasts is named phosphorylation. Photophosphorylation is the synthesis of ADP from ADP and inorganic phosphate in the presence of light. When the two photosystems work in a series, first PS2 and then the PSI, a process called non-cyclic photophosphorylation occurs. The two photosystems are connected through an electron transport chain, as seen earlier in the Z scheme. Both ADP and NADPHH are synthesized by this kind of electron flow figure 13.5. When only PSI is functional, the electron is circulated within the photosystem and the phosphorylation occurs due to cyclic flow of electrons figure 13.6. A possible location where this could be happening is in the stroma lamellae. While the membrane or lamellae of the grain have both PSI and PS2 the stroma lamellae membranes lack PS2 as well as NADP reductase enzyme. The excited electron does not pass on to NADP but is cycled back to the PSI complex through the electron transport chain figure 13.6. The cyclic flow hence, results only in the synthesis of ADP, but not of NADPHH. Cyclic photophosphorylation also occurs when only light of wavelengths beyond 680 nm are available for excitation. 1 3, 6, 3 chemiasmotic hypothesis Let us now try and understand how actually ADP is synthesized in the chloroplast. The chemiasmotic hypothesis has been put forward to explain the mechanism, like in respiration, in photosynthesis too, ADP synthesis is linked to development of a proton gradient across a membrane. This time these are the membranes of thylakoid, there is one difference though, here the proton accumulation is towards the inside of the membrane, that is, in the lumen. In respiration, protons accumulate in the intermembrane space of the mitochondria when electrons move through the EDS chapter 14. Let us understand what causes the proton gradient across the membrane. We need to consider again the processes that take place during the activation of electrons and their transport to determine the steps that cause a proton gradient to develop figure 13.7.
A since splitting of the water molecule takes place on the inner side of the membrane. The protons or hydrogen ions that are produced by the splitting of water accumulate within the lumen of the thylakoids. Figure 13.6 Cyclic Photophosphorylation Photosystem ILID Acceptor Electron Transport System Chlorophyll P780 P IP80 P 214 Biology BIOS Electrons move through the photosystems. Protons are transported across the membrane. This happens because the primary acceptor of electron which is located towards the outer side of the membrane transfers its electron not to an electron carrier but to an H carrier. Hence, this molecule removes a proton from the stroma while transporting an electron. When this molecule passes on its electron to the electron carrier on the inner side of the membrane, the proton is released into the inner side or the lumen side of the membrane. See the NADP reductase enzyme is located on the stroma side of the membrane, along with electrons that come from the acceptor of electrons of PSI. Protons are necessary for the reduction of NADP to NADPHH. These protons are also removed from the stroma, hence, within the chloroplast. Protons in the stroma decrease in number, while in the lumen there is accumulation of protons. This creates a proton gradient across the thylakoid membrane as well as a measurable decrease in pH in the lumen. Why are we so interested in the proton gradient? This gradient is important because it is the breakdown of this gradient that leads to the synthesis of ADP. The gradient is broken down due to the movement of protons across the membrane to the stroma through the transmembrane figure 13.7 ADP synthesis through chemiosmosis. Channel of the CF0 of the ADP synthase The ADP synthase enzyme consists of two parts, one called the CF0 is embedded in the thylakoid membrane and forms a transmembrane channel that carries out facilitated diffusion of protons across the membrane. The other portion is called CF1 and protrudes on the outer surface of the thylakoid membrane on the side that faces the stroma. The breakdown of the gradient provides enough energy to cause a conformational change in the CF1 particle of the ADP synthase which makes the enzyme synthesize several molecules of energy-packed ADP. Chemiosmosis requires a membrane, a proton pump, a proton gradient and ADP synthase. Energy is used to pump protons across a membrane to create a gradient or a high concentration of protons within the thylakoid lumen. ADP synthase has a channel that allows diffusion of protons back across the membrane. This releases enough energy to activate ADP synthase enzyme that catalyses the formation of ADP. Along with the NADPH produced by the movement of electrons, the ADP will be used immediately in the biosynthetic reaction taking place in the stroma, responsible for fixing CO2 and synthesis of sugars. 13.7 Where are the ADP and NADPH used? We learned that the products of light reaction are ADP, NADPH and O2. Of these O2 diffuses out of the chloroplast while ADP and NADPH are used to drive the processes leading to the synthesis of food, more accurately, sugars. This is the biosynthetic phase of photosynthesis. This process does not directly depend on the presence of light but is dependent on the products of the light reaction. That is, ADP and NADPH, besides CO2 and H2O, you may wonder how this could be verified. It is simple, immediately after light becomes unavailable. The biosynthetic process continues for some time, and then stops. If then, light is made available, the synthesis starts again. Can we? Hence, say that calling the biosynthetic phase as the dark reaction is a misnomer. Discuss this amongst yourselves. Let us now see how the ADP and NADPH are used in the biosynthetic phase. We saw earlier that CO2 is combined with H2O to produce CH2ON or sugars. It was of interest to scientists to find out how this reaction proceeded, or rather what was the first product formed when CO2 is taken into a reaction or fixed. Just after World War II, among the several efforts to put radioisotopes to beneficial use, the work of Melvin Calvin is exemplary. The use of radioactive 14C by him in algal photosynthesis studies led to the discovery that the first CO2 fixation product was a 3-carbon organic acid. He also contributed to working out the complete biosynthetic pathway, hence it was called Calvin cycle after him. The first product identified was 3-phosphoglyceric acid or in short PGA. How many carbon atoms does it have? Scientists also tried to know whether all plants have PGA as the first product of CO2 fixation, or whether any other product was formed in other plants. Experiments conducted over a wide range of plants led to the discovery of another group of plants, where the first stable product of CO2 fixation was again an organic acid, but one which had four carbon atoms in it. This acid was identified to be oxaloacetic acid or OAA. Since then CO2 assimilation during photosynthesis was said to be of two main types, those plants in which the first product of CO2 fixation is a C3 acid PGA, that is, the C3 pathway, and those in which the first product was a C4 acid OAA, that is, the C4 pathway. 
these two groups of plants showed other associated characteristics that we will discuss later. 1 3 7 1 The primary acceptor of CO2 Let us now ask ourselves a question that was asked by the scientists who are struggling to understand the dark reaction. How many carbon atoms would a molecule have which after accepting fixing CO2, would have three carbons of PGA? The studies very unexpectedly showed that the acceptor molecule was a 5-carbon ketose sugar, ribulose bisphosphate rub. Did any of you think of this possibility? Do not worry. The scientists also took a long time and conducted many experiments to reach this conclusion. They also believed that since the first product was a C3 acid, the primary acceptor would be a 2-carbon compound. They spent many years trying to identify a 2-carbon compound before they discovered the 5-carbon rub. 1 3 7 2 The Calvin cycle Calvin and his co-workers then worked out the whole pathway and showed that the pathway operated in a cyclic manner, the rub was regenerated. Let us now see how the Calvin pathway operates and where the sugar is synthesized. Let us at the outset understand very clearly that the Calvin pathway occurs in all photosynthetic plants. It does not matter whether they have C3 or C4 or any other pathways. Figure 13.8 For ease of understanding, the Calvin cycle can be described under three stages, carboxylation, reduction and regeneration. 1. Carboxylation Carboxylation is the fixation of CO2 into a stable organic intermediate. Carboxylation is the most crucial step of the Calvin cycle where CO2 is utilized for the carboxylation of rub. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme rub carboxylase which results in the formation of two molecules of 3PGA. Since this enzyme also has an oxygenation activity it would be more correct to call it rub carboxylase oxygenase or ubis CO. 2. Reduction these are a series of reactions that led to the formation of glucose. The steps involve utilization of two molecules of ADP for phosphorylation and two of NADPH for reduction per CO2 molecule fixed. The fixation of six molecules of CO2 and six turns of the cycle are required for the formation of one molecule of glucose from the pathway. 3. Regeneration Regeneration of the CO2 acceptor molecule rub is crucial if the cycle is to continue uninterrupted. The regeneration steps require 1 ADP for phosphorylation to form rub, ribulose 1, 5 bisphosphate atmosphere C02H2O carboxylation ADP regeneration 3 phosphoglycerate triosphosphate reduction ADP NADPH ADP pi NADP sucrose. Starch ADP figure 13.8 The Calvin cycle proceeds in three stages, 1 carboxylation, during which CO2 combines with ribulose 1, 5 bisphosphate. 2 Reduction, during which carbohydrate is formed at the expense of the photochemically made ADP and NADPH, and 3 Regeneration during which the CO2 accepts ribulose 1. 5 Bisphosphate is formed again so that the cycle continues. Hence for every CO2 molecule entering the Calvin cycle, 3 molecules of ADP and 2 of NADPH are required. It is probably to meet this difference in number of ADP and NADPH used in the dark reaction that the cyclic phosphorylation takes place. To make one molecule of glucose six turns of the cycle are required. Work out how many ADP and NADPH molecules will be required to make one molecule of glucose through the Calvin pathway. It might help you to understand all of this if we look at what goes in and what comes out of the Calvin cycle. In out 6 CO2 1 glucose 18 ADP 18 ADP 12 NADPH 12 NADP 13.8 The C4 pathway plants that are adapted to dry tropical regions have the C4 pathway mentioned earlier. Though these plants have the C4 oxaloacetic acid as the first CO2 fixation product they use the C3 pathway or the Calvin cycle as the main biosynthetic pathway. Then, in what way are they different from C3 plants? This is a question that you may reasonably ask. C4 plants are special, they have a special type of leaf anatomy, they tolerate higher temperatures, they show a response to high light intensities, they lack a process called photorespiration and have greater productivity of biomass. Let us understand these one by one. Study vertical sections of leaves, one of a C3 plant and the other of a C4 plant. Do you notice the differences? Do both have the same types of mesophylls? Do they have similar cells around the vascular bundle sheath? The particularly large cells around the vascular bundles of the C4 plants are called bundle sheath cells. And the leaves which have such anatomy are said to have Krantz anatomy. Krantz means wreath and is a reflection of the arrangement of cells. The bundle sheath cells may form several layers around the vascular bundles. They are characterized by having a large number of chloroplasts. Thick walls impervious to gaseous exchange and no intercellular spaces. You may like to cut a section of the leaves of C4 plants, Mejler sorghum, to observe the Krantz anatomy and the distribution of mesophyll cells. It would be interesting for you to collect leaves of diverse species of plants around you and cut vertical sections of the leaves. Observe under the microscope. Look for the bundle sheath around the vascular bundles. The presence of the bundle sheath would help you identify the C4 plants. 
Now study the pathway shown in figure 13.9. This pathway that has been named the Hatch and Slack pathway is again a cyclic process. Let us study the pathway by listing the steps. The primary CO2 acceptor is a 3 carbon molecule phosphonylpyruvate PEP and is present in the mesophyll cells. The enzyme responsible for this fixation is PEP carboxylase or PEC case. It is important to register that the mesophyll cells lack rubus CO enzyme. The C4 acid OAA is formed in the mesophyll cells. It then forms other four carbon compounds like malic acid or aspartic acid in the mesophyll cells itself, which are transported to the bundle sheath cells. In the bundle sheath cells these C4 acids are broken down to release CO2 and a 3 carbon molecule. The 3 carbon molecule is transported back to the mesophyll where it is converted to PEP again, thus, completing the cycle. The CO2 released in the bundle sheath cells enters the C3 or the Calvin pathway, a pathway common to all plants. The bundle sheath cells are figure 13.9 diagrammatic representation of the Hatch and Slack pathway. Rich in an enzyme ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase rubus CO, but lack PEC case. Thus, the basic pathway that results in the formation of the sugars, the Calvin pathway, is common to the C3 and C4 plants. Did you know that the Calvin pathway occurs in all the mesophyll cells of the C3 plants and the C4 plants it does not take place in the mesophyll cells but does so only in the bundle sheath cells? 13.9 Photorespiration Let us try and understand one more process that creates an important difference between C3 and C4 plants. Photorespiration. To understand photorespiration we have to know a little bit more about the first step of the Calvin pathway, the first CO2 fixation step. This is the reaction where rub combines with CO2 to form two molecules of 3PGA, that is catalyzed by rubus CO, rub CO PGA rubus coex 223 rubus CO that is the most abundant enzyme in the world do you wonder why? Is characterized by the fact that its active site can bind to both CO2 and O2 hence the name. Can you think how this could be possible? Rubis CO has a much greater affinity for CO2 when the CO2, O2 is nearly equal than for O2. Imagine what would happen if this were not so. This binding is competitive. It is the relative concentration of O2 and CO2 that determines which of the two will bind to the enzyme. In C3 plants some O2 does bind to Rubis CO, and hence CO2 fixation is decreased. Here the rub instead of being converted to two molecules of PGA binds with O2 to form one molecule of phosphoglyceride and phosphoglycolate 2 carbon in a pathway called photorespiration. In the photorespiratory pathway, there is neither synthesis of sugars, nor of ADP, rather it results in the release of CO2 with the utilization of ADP. In the photorespiratory pathway there is no synthesis of ADP or NADPH, the biological function of photorespiration is not known yet. In C4 plants photorespiration does not occur. This is because they have a mechanism that increases the concentration of CO2 at the enzyme site. This takes place when the C4 acid from the mesophyll is broken down in the bundle sheath cells to release CO2. This results in increasing the intracellular concentration of CO2. In turn, this ensures that the rubis CO functions as a carboxylase minimizing the oxygenase activity. Now that you know that the C4 plants lack photorespiration, you probably can understand why productivity and yields are better in these plants. In addition these plants show tolerance to higher temperatures. Based on the above discussion can you compare plants showing the C3 and the C4 pathway use the table format given and fill in the information. Table 13.1 fill in the columns 2 and 3 in this table to highlight the differences between C3 and C4 plants characteristics C3 plants C4 plants choose from cell type in which the Calvin mesophyll bundle sheath both cycle takes place cell type in which the initial mesophyll bundle sheath both carboxylation reaction occurs how many cell types does the two bundle sheath and leaf have that fix CO2 mesophyll 1 mesophyll 3 bundle sheath palisade Spongy mesophyll which is the primary CO2 acceptor rub PEP PGA number of carbons in the 543 primary CO2 acceptor which is the primary CO2 PGA OAA rub PEP fixation product no. Of carbons in the primary 345 CO2 fixation product does the plant have rubus CO yes no not always does the plant have PEP case. Yes no not always which cells in the plant have mesophyll bundle sheath none rubisco. CO2 fixation rate under high low high medium light conditions whether photorespiration is high negligible sometimes present at low light intensities whether photorespiration is high negligible sometimes present at high light intensities whether photorespiration would be high negligible sometimes present at low CO2 concentrations whether photorespiration would be high negligible sometimes present at high CO2 concentrations temperature optimum 30 40 C 20 25 C above 40 C examples cuts vertical. Sections of leaves of different plants and observe under the microscope for Kranz anatomy and list them in the appropriate columns. 13.10 Factors affecting photosynthesis An understanding of the factors that affect photosynthesis is necessary. 
The rate of photosynthesis is very important in determining the yield of plants including crop plants. Photosynthesis is under the influence of several factors, both internal plant and external. The plant factors include the number, size, age and orientation of leaves, mesophyll cells and chloroplasts, internal CO2 concentration and the amount of chlorophyll. The plant or internal factors are dependent on the genetic predisposition and the growth of the plant. The external factors would include the availability of sunlight, temperature, CO2 concentration and water. As a plant photosynthesizes, all these factors will simultaneously affect its rate. Hence, though several factors interact and simultaneously affect photosynthesis or CO2 fixation, usually one factor is the major cause or is the one that limits the rate. Hence, at any point the rate will be determined by the factor available at suboptimal levels. When several factors affect any biochemical process, Blackman's 1905 law of limiting factors comes into effect. This states the following, if a chemical process is affected by more than one factor, then its rate will be determined by the factor which is nearest to its minimal value, it is the factor which directly affects the process if its quantity is changed. For example, despite the presence of a green leaf and optimal light and CO2 conditions, the plant may not photosynthesize if the temperature is very low. This leaf, if given the optimal temperature, will start photosynthesizing 1-3, 1-0. One light we need to distinguish between light quality, light intensity and the duration of exposure to light, while discussing light as a factor that affects photosynthesis. There is a linear relationship between incident light and CO2 fixation rates at low light intensities. At higher light intensities, gradually the rate does not show further increase as other factors become limiting figure 13.10. What is interesting to note is that light saturation occurs at 10% of the full sunlight. Hence, except for plants in shade or in dense forests, light is rarely a limiting factor in nature. Increase in figure 13.10 graph of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis rate of photosynthesis light intensity A, B, C, D, E. Incident light beyond a point causes the breakdown of chlorophyll under decrease in photosynthesis. 1, 3, 1, 0. 2. Carbon dioxide concentration Carbon dioxide is the major limiting factor for photosynthesis. The concentration of CO2 is very low in the atmosphere between 0.03 and 0.04%. Increase in concentration up to 0.05% can cause an increase in CO2 fixation rates. Beyond this the levels can become damaging over longer periods. The C3 and C4 plants respond differently to CO2 concentrations. At low light conditions neither group responds to high CO2 conditions. At high light intensities, both C3 and C4 plants show increase in the rates of photosynthesis. What is important to note is that the C4 plants show saturation at about 360 microwatt while C3 responds to increased CO2 concentration and saturation is seen only beyond 450 microwatt. Thus, current availability of CO2 levels is limiting to the C3 plants. The fact that C3 plants respond to higher CO2 concentration by showing increased rates of photosynthesis leading to higher productivity has been used for some greenhouse crops such as tomatoes and bell pepper. They are allowed to grow in carbon dioxide enriched atmosphere that leads to higher yields 1 3, 1 0, 3 temperature the dark reactions being enzymatic are temperature controlled. Though the light reactions are also temperature sensitive they are affected to a much lesser extent. The C4 plants respond to higher temperatures and show a higher rate of photosynthesis while C3 plants have a much lower temperature optimum. The temperature optimum for photosynthesis of different plants also depends on the habitat that they are adapted to. Tropical plants have a higher temperature optimum than the plants adapted to temperate climates. 1 3, 1 0, 4 water Even though water is one of the reactants in the light reaction, the effect of water as a factor is more through its effect on the plant, rather than directly on photosynthesis. Water stress causes the stomata to close hence reducing the CO2 availability. Besides, water stress also makes leaves wilt, thus, reducing the surface area of the leaves and their metabolic activity as well. Summary Green plants make their own food by photosynthesis. During this process carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is taken in by leaves through stomata and used for making carbohydrates, principally glucose and starch. Photosynthesis takes place only in the green parts of the plants, mainly the leaves. Within the leaves, the mesophyll cells have a large number of chloroplasts that are responsible for CO2 fixation. Within the chloroplasts, the membranes are sites for the light reaction, while the chemosynthetic pathway occurs in the stroma. Photosynthesis has two stages, the light reaction and the carbon-fixing reactions. In the light reaction the light energy is absorbed by the pigments present in the antenna, and funneled to special chlorophyll molecules called reaction center chlorophylls. There are two photosystems, PSI and PS2. PSI has a 700 nm absorbing chlorophyll a P700 molecule at its reaction center. 
while PS2 has a P680 reaction center that absorbs red light at 680 nm after absorbing light. Electrons are excited and transferred through PS2 and PSI and finally to NAD forming NADH. During this process a proton gradient is created across the membrane of the thylakoid. The breakdown of the proton's gradient due to movement through the F0 part of the Atpase enzyme releases enough energy for synthesis of ADP. Splitting of water molecules is associated with PS2 resulting in the release of O2, protons and transfer of electrons to PS2, in the carbon fixation cycle. CO2 is added by the enzyme, Rubis CO, to a 5-carbon compound rub that is converted to two molecules of free carbon PGA. This is then converted to sugar by the Calvin cycle. And the rub is regenerated. During this process ADP and NADPH synthesized in the light reaction are utilized. Rubis CO also catalyses a wasteful oxygenation reaction in C3 plants. Photorespiration. Some tropical plants show a special type of photosynthesis called C4 pathway. In these plants the first product of CO2 fixation that takes place in the mesophyll is a 4-carbon compound. In the bundle sheath cells the Calvin pathway is carried out for the synthesis of carbohydrates. Exercise is 1. By looking at a plant externally can you tell whether a plant is C3 or C4 why and how to? By looking at which internal structure of a plant can you tell whether a plant is C3 or C4 explain? 3. Even though a very few cells in a C4 plant carry out the biosynthetic, Calvin pathway, yet they are highly productive. Can you discuss why? 4. Rubis CO is an enzyme that acts both as a carboxylase and oxygenase. Why do you think Rubis CO carries out more carboxylation in C4 plants? 5. Suppose there were plants that had a high concentration of chlorophyll B, but lacked chlorophyll A. Would it carry out photosynthesis then why do plants have chlorophyll B and other accessory pigments? 6. Why is the color of a leaf kept in the dark frequently yellow, or pale green which pigment do you think is more stable? 7. Look at leaves of the same plant on the shady side and compare it with the leaves on the sunny side. Or, compare the potted plants kept in the sunlight with those in the shade. Which of them has leaves that are darker green? Y8. Figure 13.10 shows the effect of light on the rate of photosynthesis. Based on the graph, answer the following questions. A at which point S A. B or C in the curve is light a limiting factor B which could be the limiting factor S in region A. C what do C and D represent on the curve 9? Give comparison between the following. A C3 and C4 pathways B cyclic and non-cyclic photophosphorylation C anatomy of leaf in C3 and C4 plants 2018-1. 226 Biology All of us breathe to live, but why is breathing so essential to life? What happens when we breathe also? Do all living organisms, including plants and microbes, breathe? If so, how all living organisms need energy for carrying out daily life activities, be it absorption, transport, movement, reproduction or even breathing? Where does all this energy come from? We know we eat food for energy, but how is this energy taken from food? How is this energy utilized? Do all foods give the same amount of energy? Do plants eat? Where do plants get their energy from in microorganisms for their energy requirements? Do they eat food? You may wonder at the several questions raised above. They may seem to be very disconnected. But in reality, the process of breathing is very much connected to the process of release of energy from food. Let us try and understand how this happens. All the energy required for life processes is obtained by oxidation of some macromolecules that we call food. Only green plants and cyanobacteria can prepare their own food. By the process of photosynthesis they trap light energy and convert it into chemical energy that is stored in the bonds of carbohydrates like glucose, sucrose and starch. We must remember that in green plants too, not all cells, tissues and organs photosynthesize, only cells containing chloroplasts that are most often located in the superficial layers, carry out photosynthesis. Hence, even in green plants all other organs, tissues and cells that are non-green, need food for oxidation. Hence, food has to be translocated to all non-green parts. Animals are heterotrophic, that is, they obtain food from plants' respiration in plants chapter 14 14.1 do plants breathe. 14.2 Glycolysis 14.3 Fermentation 14.4 Aerobic Respiration 14.5 The Respiratory Balance Sheet 14.6 Amphibolic Pathway 14.7 Respiratory Quotient Direct herbivores or indirectly carnivores, saprophytes like fungi are dependent on dead and decaying matter. What is important to recognize is that ultimately all the food that is respired for life processes comes from photosynthesis. This chapter deals with cellular respiration or the mechanism of breakdown of food materials within the cell to release energy. And the trapping of this energy for synthesis of ADP, photosynthesis, of course. 
takes place within the chloroplasts and the eukaryotes, whereas the breakdown of complex molecules to yield energy takes place in the cytoplasm and in the mitochondria also only in eukaryotes. The breaking of the CC bonds of complex compounds through oxidation within the cells, leading to release of considerable amount of energy is called respiration. The compounds that are oxidized during this process are known as respiratory substrates. Usually carbohydrates are oxidized to release energy, but proteins, fats and even organic acids can be used as respiratory substances in some plants, under certain conditions. During oxidation within a cell, all the energy contained in respiratory substrates is not released free into the cell, or in a single step. It is released in a series of slow stepwise reactions controlled by enzymes, and it is trapped as chemical energy in the form of ADP, hence. It is important to understand that the energy released by oxidation in respiration is not or rather cannot be used directly but is used to synthesize ADP, which is broken down whenever and wherever energy needs to be utilized, hence, ADP acts as the energy currency of the cell. This energy trapped in ADP is utilized in various energy requiring processes of the organisms, and the carbon skeleton produced during respiration is used as precursors for biosynthesis of other molecules in the cell. 14.1 Do plants breathe well? The answer to this question is not quite so direct. Yes, plants require O2 for respiration to occur and they also give out CO2. Hence, plants have systems in place that ensure the availability of O2. Plants, unlike animals, have no specialized organs for gaseous exchange but they have stomata and lenticels for this purpose. There are several reasons why plants can get along without respiratory organs. First, each plant part takes care of its own gas exchange needs. There is very little transport of gases from one plant part to another. Second, plants do not present great demands for gas exchange. Roots, stems and leaves respire at rates far lower than animals do. Only during photosynthesis are large volumes of gases exchanged then. Each leaf is well adapted to take care of its own needs during these periods. When cells photosynthesize, availability of O2 is not a problem in these cells since O2 is released within the cell. Third, the Distance that gases must diffuse even in large, bulky plants is not great. Each living cell in a plant is located quite close to the surface of the plant. This is true for leaves, you may ask, but what about thick, woody stems and roots and stems? The living cells are organized in thin layers inside and beneath the bark. They also have openings called lenticels. The cells in the interior are dead and provide only mechanical support. Thus, most cells of a plant have at least a part of their surface in contact with air. This is also facilitated by the loose packing of parenchyma cells and leaves, stems and roots, which provide an interconnected network of air spaces. The complete combustion of glucose, which produces CO2 and H2O as end products, yields energy most of which is given out as heat. CHOOCOHO energy 61262206666 If this energy is to be useful to the cell, it should be able to utilize it to synthesize other molecules that the cell requires. The strategy that the plant cell uses is to catabolize the glucose molecule in such a way that not all the liberated energy goes out as heat. The key is to oxidize glucose not in one step but in several small steps enabling some steps to be just large enough such that the energy released can be coupled to ADP synthesis. How this is done is, essentially, the story of respiration. During the process of respiration, oxygen is utilized, and carbon dioxide, water and energy are released as products. The combustion reaction requires oxygen, but some cells live where oxygen may or may not be available. Can you think of such situations and organisms where O2 is not available? There are sufficient reasons to believe that the first cells on this planet lived in an atmosphere that lacked oxygen. Even among present-day living organisms, we know of several that are adapted to anaerobic conditions. Some of these organisms are facultative anaerobes, while in others the requirement for anaerobic condition is obligate. In any case, all living organisms retain the enzymatic machinery to partially oxidize glucose without the help of oxygen. This breakdown of glucose to pyruvic acid is called glycolysis 14.2 glycolysis The term glycolysis has originated from the Greek words, glycos for sugar, and lysis for splitting. The scheme of glycolysis was given by Gustav Emden, Otto Meyerhoff, and J. Parnas, and is often referred to as the ENT pathway. In anaerobic organisms, it is the only process in respiration. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell and is present in all living organisms. In this process, glucose undergoes partial oxidation to form two molecules of pyruvic acid, in plants. This glucose is derived from sucrose, which is the end product of photosynthesis, or from storage. Carbohydrates, sucrose is converted into glucose and fructose by the enzyme, invertase, and these two monosaccharides readily enter the glycolytic pathway. 
Glucose and fructose are phosphorylated to give rise to glucose 6-phosphate by the activity of the enzyme hexokinase. This phosphorylated form of glucose then isomerizes to produce fructose 6-phosphate. Subsequent steps of metabolism of glucose and fructose are same. The various steps of glycolysis are depicted in Figure 14.1. In glycolysis, a chain of 10 reactions, under the control of different enzymes, takes place to produce pyruvate from glucose. While studying the steps of glycolysis, please note the steps at which utilization or synthesis of ADP or in this case NADHH take place. ADP is utilized at two steps, first in the conversion of glucose into glucose 6-phosphate and second in the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. The fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is split into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde PGAL. We find that there is one step where NADHH is formed from NAD. This is when 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde PGAL is converted to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate BPGA. Two redox equivalents are removed in the form of two hydrogen atoms from PGAL and transferred to a molecule of NAD. PGAL is oxidized and within organic phosphate to get converted into BPGA. The conversion of BPGA to 3-phosphoglyceric acid PGA is also an energy-yielding process. This energy is trapped by the formation of ADP. Another ADP is synthesized during the conversion of PEP to pyruvic acid. Can you then calculate how many ADP molecules are directly synthesized in this pathway from one glucose molecule? Pyruvic acid is then the key product of glycolysis. What is the metabolic fate of pyruvate? This depends on the cellular need. Glucose 6C glucose 6-phosphate 6 6C fructose 6-phosphate 6 6C 6 fructose 1. 6-bisphosphate 6 6C triosphosphate glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate 3 3C 3 triosphosphate dehydroxyacetone phosphate 3C 3 2X triosbisphosphate 1. 3 bisphosphoglyceric acid 3 C 2 X triosphosphate 3 phosphoglyceric acid 3 C 2 X 2 phosphoglycerate 2 X phosphonyl pyruvate 2 X pyruvic acid 3 C ADP 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 NADHH NAD H2O ADP figure 14.1 steps of glycolysis. There are three major ways in which different cells handle pyruvic acid produced by glycolysis. These are lactic acid fermentation, alcoholic fermentation and aerobic respiration. Fermentation takes place under anaerobic conditions in many prokaryotes and unicellular eukaryotes. For the complete oxidation of glucose to CO2 and H2O, however, organisms adopt Krebs cycle which is also called as aerobic respiration. This requires O2 supply. 14.3 Fermentation and Fermentation, say by yeast, the incomplete oxidation of glucose is achieved under anaerobic conditions by sets of reactions where pyruvic acid is converted to CO2 and ethanol. The enzymes, pyruvic acid carboxylase and alcohol dehydrogenase catalyze these reactions. Other organisms like some bacteria produce lactic acid from pyruvic acid. The steps involved are shown in figure 14.2. In animal cells also, like muscles during exercise, when oxygen is inadequate for cellular respiration pyruvic acid is reduced to lactic acid by lactate dehydrogenase. The reducing agent is NADHH which is reoxidized to NAD in both the processes. In both lactic acid and alcohol fermentation not much energy is released. Less than 7% of the energy in glucose is released and not all of it is trapped as high energy bonds of ADP. Also, the processes are hazardous. Either acid or alcohol is produced. What is the net ADPs that is synthesized? Calculate how many ADP are synthesized and deduct the number of ADP utilized during glycolysis when one molecule of glucose is fermented to alcohol or lactic acid yeasts poison themselves to death when the concentration of alcohol reaches about 13%. What then would be the maximum concentration of alcohol in beverages that are naturally fermented? How do you think alcoholic beverages of alcohol content greater than this concentration are obtained? What then is the process by which organisms can carry out complete oxidation of glucose and extract the energy stored to figure 14.2 major pathways of anaerobic respiration? Synthesize a larger number of ADP molecules needed for cellular metabolism in eukaryotes. These steps take place within the mitochondria and this requires O2. Aerobic respiration is the process that leads to a complete oxidation of organic substances in the presence of oxygen and releases CO2, water and a large amount of energy present in the substrate. This type of respiration is most common in higher organisms. We will look at these processes in the next section. 14.4 Aerobic Respiration For aerobic respiration to take place within the mitochondria, the final product of glycolysis, pyruvate is transported from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria. The crucial events in aerobic respiration are, the complete oxidation of pyruvate by the stepwise removal of all the hydrogen atoms, leaving three molecules of CO2. 
comma the passing on of the electrons removed as part of the hydrogen atoms to molecular O2 with simultaneous synthesis of ADP. What is interesting to note is that the first process takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria while the second process is located on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Pyruvate, which is formed by the glycolytic catabolism of carbohydrates in the cytosol, after it enters mitochondrial matrix undergoes oxidative decarboxylation by a complex set of reactions catalyzed by pyruvic dehydrogenase. The reactions catalyzed by pyruvic dehydrogenase require the participation of several coenzymes, including NAD and coenzyme A pyruvic acid coenad Mg pyruvate dehydrogenase 2 acetyl coaceo NADHH2 during this process. Two molecules of NADH are produced from the metabolism of two molecules of pyruvic acid produced from one glucose molecule during glycolysis. The acetyl coa then enters the cyclic pathway, tricarboxylic acid cycle, more commonly called as Krebs cycle after the scientist Hans Krebs who first elucidated it. 1 4 4 1 tricarboxylic acid cycle The TCA cycle starts with the condensation of acetyl group with oxaloacetic acid OAA in water to yield citric acid figure 14.3. The reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme citrate synthase and a molecule of coa is released. Citrate is then isomerized to isocitrate. It is followed by two successive steps of decarboxylation, leading to the formation of Greek letter alpha catagloteric acid. Figure 14.3 The citric acid cycle pyruvate 3 c acetyl coenzyme A2C citric acid 6 c oxaloacetic acid 4 c CO2 NAD NADHH NADHH NAD NAD CO2 citric acid cycle Greek letter alpha catagloteric acid 5 c NADHH GDP GTP succinic acid 4 c malic acid 4 c FADH2 Fad pyruvic acid NAD fat HO ADP pi mitochondrial matrix 4 2 2 34 42 CO NADHH and then succinyl coa. In the remaining steps of citric acid cycle, succinyl coa is oxidized to OAA, allowing this cycle to continue. During the conversion of succinyl coa to succinic acid, a molecule of GTP is synthesized. This is a substrate level phosphorylation. In a coupled reaction, GTP is converted to GDP with the simultaneous synthesis of ADP from ADP. Also, there are three points in the cycle where NAD is reduced to NADHH and one point where FAD is reduced to FADH2. The continued oxidation of acetyl CoA via the TCA cycle requires the continued replenishment of oxaloacetic acid, the first member of the cycle. In addition, it also requires regeneration of NAD and FAD from NADH and FADH2 respectively. The summary equation for this phase of respiration may be written as follows. 2 FADH ADP CoA NAD NADHH CO2 We have till now seen that glucose has been broken down to release CO2 and 8 molecules of NADHH. 2 of FADH2 have been synthesized besides just 2 molecules of ADP and TCA cycle. You may be wondering why we have been discussing respiration at all. Neither O2 has come into the picture nor the promised large number of ADP has yet been synthesized. Also what is the role of the NADHH and FADH2 that is synthesized? Let us now understand the role of O2 in respiration and how ADP is synthesized. 1 4 4 2 Electron Transport System EDS and Oxidative Phosphorylation The following steps in the respiratory process are to release and utilize the energy stored in NADHH and FADH2. This is accomplished when they are oxidized through the electron transport system and the electrons are passed on to O2 resulting in the formation of H2O. The metabolic pathway through which the electron passes from one carrier to another is called the electron transport system EDS figure 14.4 and it is present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Electrons from NADH Produced in the mitochondrial matrix during citric acid cycle are oxidized by an NADH dehydrogenase complex I. And electrons are then transferred to ubiquinone located within the inner membrane. Ubiquinone also receives reducing equivalents via FADH2 complex 2 that is generated during oxidation of succinate in the citric acid cycle. The reduced ubiquinone ubiquinol is then oxidized with the transfer of electrons to cytochrome C via cytochrome BC1 complex complex 3. Cytochrome C is a small protein attached to the outer surface of the inner membrane and acts as a mobile carrier for transfer of electrons between complex 3 and IV. Complex IV refers to cytochrome C oxidase complex containing cytochrome C and a 3 and 2 copper centers. When the electrons pass from one carrier to another via complex I to IV in the electron transport chain, they are coupled to ADP synthase complex V for the production of ADP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. The number of ADP molecules synthesized depends on the nature of the electron donor. Oxidation of one molecule of NADH gives rise to three molecules of ADP. While that of one molecule of FADH2 produces two molecules of ADP, although the aerobic process of respiration takes place only in the presence of oxygen. 
the role of oxygen is limited to the terminal stage of the process, yet, the presence of oxygen is vital, since it drives the whole process by removing hydrogen from the system. Oxygen acts as the final hydrogen acceptor, unlike photophosphorylation where it is the light energy that is utilized for the production of proton gradient required for phosphorylation. In respiration it is the energy of oxidation reduction utilized for the same process, it is for this reason that the process is called oxidative phosphorylation. You have already studied about the mechanism of membrane-linked ADP synthesis as explained by chemiosmotic hypothesis in the earlier chapter. As mentioned earlier, the energy released during the electron figure 14.4 electron transport system EDS. Transport system is utilized in synthesizing ADP with the help of ADP synthase complex V. This complex consists of two major components, F1 and F0 figure 14.5. The F1 headpiece is a peripheral membrane protein complex and contains the site for synthesis of ADP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. F0 is an integral membrane protein complex that forms the channel through which protons cross the inner membrane. The passage of protons through the channel is coupled to the catalytic side of the F1 component for the production of ADP, for each ADP produced. 2H passes through F0 from the intermembrane space to the matrix down the electrochemical proton gradient. 14.5 The respiratory balance sheet It is possible to make calculations of the net gain of ADP for every glucose molecule oxidized, but in reality this can remain only a theoretical exercise. These calculations can be made only on certain assumptions that, there is a sequential, orderly pathway functioning, with one substrate forming the next in with glycolysis, TCA cycle and EDS pathway following one after another. Comma the NADH synthesized in glycolysis is transferred into the mitochondria and undergoes oxidative phosphorylation. Comma none of the intermediates in the pathway are utilized to synthesize any other compound, only glucose is being respired, no other alternative substrates are entering in the pathway at any of the intermediary stages. But this kind of assumptions are not really valid in a living system, all pathways work simultaneously and do not take place one after another, substrates enter the pathways and are withdrawn from it as and when necessary, ADP is utilized as and when needed, enzymatic rates are controlled by multiple means. Yet, it is useful to do this exercise to appreciate the beauty and efficiency of the living system in extraction and storing energy. Hence, there can be a net gain of 38 ADP molecules during aerobic respiration of one molecule of glucose. Figure 14.5 Diagrammatic Presentation of ADP Synthesis in Mitochondria Now let us compare fermentation and aerobic respiration. Fermentation accounts for only a partial breakdown of glucose whereas in aerobic respiration it is completely degraded to CO2 and H2O. Comma in fermentation there is a net gain of only two molecules of ADP for each molecule of glucose degraded to pyruvic acid whereas many more molecules of ADP are generated under aerobic conditions. Comma NADH is oxidized to NAD rather slowly in fermentation, however the reaction is very vigorous in case of aerobic respiration. 14.6 Amphibolic pathway glucose is the favored substrate for respiration. All carbohydrates are usually first converted into glucose before they are used for respiration. Other substrates can also be respired, as has been mentioned earlier, but then they do not enter the respiratory pathway at the first step. See figure 14.6 to see the points of entry of different substrates in the respiratory pathway. Fats would need to be broken down into glycerol and fatty acids first. If fatty acids were to be respired they would first be degraded to acetyl-CoA and enter the pathway. Glycerol would enter the pathway after being converted to PGAL. The proteins would be degraded by proteases and the individual amino acids after deamination depending on their structure would enter the pathway at some stage within the Krebs cycle or even as pyruvate or acetyl-CoA. Since respiration involves breakdown of substrates, the respiratory process has traditionally been considered a catabolic process and the respiratory pathway as a catabolic pathway. But is this understanding correct we have discussed above, at which points in the respiratory pathway different substrates would enter if they were to be respired and used to derive energy? What is important to recognize is that it is these very compounds that would be withdrawn from the respiratory pathway for the synthesis of the said substrates. Hence, fatty acids would be broken down to acetyl-CoA before entering the respiratory pathway when it is used as a substrate. But when the organism needs to synthesize fatty acids, acetyl-CoA would be withdrawn from the respiratory pathway for it. Hence, the respiratory pathway comes into the picture both during breakdown and synthesis of fatty acids. Similarly, during breakdown and synthesis of protein 2, respiratory intermediates form the link. 
breaking down processes within the living organism is catabolism, and synthesis is anabolism. Because the respiratory pathway is involved in both anabolism and catabolism, it would hence be better to consider the respiratory pathway as an amphibolic pathway rather than as a catabolic one. 236 Biology 14.7 Respiratory Quotient Let us now look at another aspect of respiration. As you know, during aerobic respiration, O2 is consumed and CO2 is released. The ratio of the volume of CO2 evolved to the volume of O2 consumed in respiration is called the respiratory quotient RQ or respiratory ratio. RQ volume of CO evolved volume of O consumed 2 to the respiratory quotient depends upon the type of respiratory substrate used during respiration. When carbohydrates are used as substrate and are completely oxidized, the RQ will be 1, because equal amounts of CO2 and O2 are evolved and consumed. Respectively, as shown in the equation below, figure 14.6 interrelationship among metabolic pathways showing respiration-mediated breakdown of different organic molecules to CO2 and H20. CHOOCOHO energy 61262226666 RQCOO661022 When fats are used in respiration, the RQ is less than 1. Calculations for a fatty acid, tripomidin, if used as a substrate is shown, 2, 1, 4, 5, 1, 0, 2, 9, 8, 5, 1, 9, 8, 6, 2, 2, 2. CHOOCOHO energy tripomidin RQCOO1021450722 when proteins are respiratory substrates the ratio would be about 0.9. What is important to recognize is that in living organisms respiratory substrates are often more than one. Pure proteins or fats are never used as respiratory substrates. Summary plants unlike animals have no special systems for breathing or gaseous exchange. Stomata and lenticels allow gaseous exchange by diffusion. Almost all living cells in a plant have their surfaces exposed to air, the breaking of CC bonds of complex organic molecules by oxidation cells leading to the release of a lot of energy is called cellular respiration. Glucose is the favored substrate for respiration. Fats and proteins can also be broken down to yield energy. The initial stage of cellular respiration takes place in the cytoplasm. Each glucose molecule is broken through a series of enzyme-catalyzed reactions into two molecules of pyruvic acid. This process is called glycolysis. The fate of the pyruvate depends on the availability of oxygen in the organism. Under anaerobic conditions either lactic acid fermentation or alcohol fermentation occurs. Fermentation takes place under anaerobic conditions in many prokaryotes, unicellular eukaryotes and in germinating seeds. In eukaryotic organisms aerobic respiration occurs in the presence of oxygen. Pyruvic acid is transported into the mitochondria where it is converted into acetyl-CoA with the release of CO2. Acetyl-CoA then enters the tricarboxylic acid pathway or Krebs cycle operating in the matrix of the mitochondria. NADHH and FADH2 are generated in the Krebs cycle. The energy in these molecules as well as that in the NADHH synthesized during glycolysis are used to synthesize ADP. This is accomplished through a system of electron carriers called electron transport system EDS located on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. The electrons, as they move through the system, release enough energy that are trapped to synthesize ADP. This is called oxidative phosphorylation. In this process O2 is the ultimate acceptor of electrons and it gets reduced to water. The respiratory pathway is an amphibolic pathway as it involves both anabolism and catabolism. The respiratory quotient depends upon the type of respiratory substance used during respiration. Exercise is 1. Differentiate between a respiration and combustion B. Glycolysis and Krebs cycle C. Aerobic respiration and fermentation 2. What are respiratory substrates? Name the most common respiratory substrate 3. Give the schematic representation of glycolysis 4. What are the main steps in aerobic respiration? Where does it take place? 5. Give the schematic representation of an overall view of Krebs cycle. 6. Explain EDS 7. Distinguish between the following, aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration B. Glycolysis and fermentation C. Glycolysis and citric acid cycle 8. What are the assumptions made during the calculation of net gain of ADP 9? Discuss the respiratory pathway as an amphibolic pathway. 10. Define RQ. What is its value for fats 11? What is oxidative phosphorylation 12? What is the significance of stepwise release of energy in respiration? 2018-1. Plant Growth and Development 239 You have already studied the organization of a flower and plant in Chapter 5. Have you ever thought about where and how the structures like roots, stems, leaves, flowers, fruits and seeds arise and that too in an orderly sequence you are, by now, aware of the term seed, seedling, plantlet, mature plant? You have also seen that trees continue to increase in height or girth over a period of time, 
However, the leaves, flowers and fruits of the same tree not only have limited dimensions but also appear and fall periodically and some time repeatedly. Why does vegetative phase precede flowering in a plant? All plant organs are made up of a variety of tissues. Is there any relationship between the structure of a cell? A tissue, an organ and the function they perform can the structure and the function of these be altered? All cells of a plant are descendants of the zygote. The question is, then, why and how do they have different structural and functional attributes? Development is the sum of two processes, growth and differentiation. To begin with, it is essential and sufficient to know that the development of a mature plant from a zygote fertilized egg follow a precise and highly ordered succession of events. During this process a complex body organization is formed that produces roots, leaves, branches, flowers, fruits, and seeds, and eventually they die. Figure 15.1 The first step in the process of plant growth is seed germination. The seed germinates when favorable conditions for growth exist in the environment. In absence of such favorable conditions the seeds do not germinate and goes into a period of suspended growth or ast. Once favorable conditions return, the seeds resume metabolic activities and growth takes place. In this chapter, you shall also study some of the factors which govern and control these developmental processes. These factors are both intrinsic internal and extrinsic external to the plant. Plant Growth and Development Chapter 15 15.1 Growth 15.2 Differentiation Dedifferentiation and redifferentiation 15.3 Development 15.4 Plant Growth Regulators 15.5 Photoperiodism 15.6 Fertilization 240 Biology 15.1 Growth Growth is regarded as one of the most fundamental and conspicuous characteristics of a living being. What is growth? Growth can be defined as an irreversible permanent increase in size of an organ or its parts or even of an individual cell. Generally, growth is accompanied by metabolic processes both anabolic and catabolic, that occur at the expense of energy. Therefore, for example, expansion of a leaf is growth. How would you describe the swelling of piece of wood when placed in water? 1 5 1 1 Plant growth generally is indeterminate. Plant growth is unique because plants retain the capacity for unlimited growth throughout their life. This ability of the plants is due to the presence of meristems at certain locations in their body. The cells of such meristems have the capacity to divide and self-perpetuate. The product, however, soon loses the capacity to divide and such cells make up the plant body. This form of growth wherein new cells are always being added to the plant body by the activity of the meristem is called the open form of growth. What would happen if the meristem ceases to divide? Does this ever happen in Chapter 6? You have studied about the root apical meristem and the shoot apical meristem. You know that they are responsible for the seed coat epicotyl hook cotyledons cotyledon soil line epicotyl hypocotyl hypocotyl figure 15.1 germination and seedling development in bean. Primary growth of the plants and principally contribute to the elongation of the plants along their axis. You also know that into cotyledonous plants and gymnosperms, the lateral meristems, vascular cambium and cork cambium appear later in life. These are the meristems that cause the increase in the girth of the organs in which they are active. This is known as secondary growth of the plant C figure 15.215, 1, 2 growth is measurable growth, at a cellular level, is principally a consequence of increase in the amount of protoplasm. Since increase in protoplasm is difficult to measure directly, one generally measures some quantity which is more or less proportional to it. Growth is, therefore, measured by a variety of parameters some of which are, increase in fresh weight, dry weight, length, area, volume and cell number. You may find that amazing to know that one single maize root apical mercidum can give rise to more than 17. 500 new cells per hour, whereas cells in a watermelon may increase in size by up to 3, 50, 000, 000, 000 times. In the former, growth is expressed as increase in cell number, the latter expresses growth as increase in size of the cell. While the growth of the pollen tube is measured in terms of its length, an increase in surface area denotes the growth in a dorsoventral leaf. 1 5, 1. Three phases of growth. The period of growth is generally divided into three phases, namely, meristematic, elongation, and maturation. Figure 15.3. Let us understand this by looking at the root tips. The constantly dividing cells, both at the root apex and the shoot apex, represent the meristematic phase of growth. The cells in this region are rich in protoplasm, possess large conspicuous nuclei, their cell walls are primary in nature, thin and cellulosic with abundant plasma desmetal connections. The cells proximal just next. Away from the tip to the shoot apical meristem vascular cambium vascular cambium root apical meristem shoot root figure 15.2 Diagrammatic representation of locations of root apical meristem, shoot apical meristem and vascular cambium. 
arrows exhibit the direction of growth of cells and organ GFEDCBA figure 15.3 detection of zones of elongation by the parallel line technique. Zones A, B, C, D immediately behind the apex have elongated most. Meristematic zone represents the phase of elongation, increased faculation, cell enlargement and new cell wall deposition are the characteristics of the cells in this phase. Further away from the apex, that is, more proximal to the phase of elongation, lies the portion of axis which is undergoing the phase of maturation. The cells of this zone, attain their maximal size in terms of wall thickening and protoplasmic modifications. Most of the tissues and cell types you have studied in Chapter 6 represent this phase 1 5, 1, 4 growth rates the increased growth per unit time is termed as growth rate. Thus, rate of growth can be expressed mathematically, an organism, or a part of the organism can produce more cells in a variety of ways. Figure 15.4 Diagrammatic representation of arithmetic B geometric growth and C stages during embryo development showing geometric and arithmetic phases. The growth rate shows an increase that may be arithmetic or geometrical figure 15.4, in arithmetic growth, following mitotic cell division, only one daughter cell continues to divide while the other differentiates and matures. The simplest expression of arithmetic growth is exemplified by a root elongating at a constant rate. Look at figure 15.5, on plotting the length of the organ against time, a linear curve is obtained. Mathematically, it is expressed as LTL0 RTLT length at time TL0 length at time 0 R growth rate elongation per unit time. Let us now see what happens in geometrical growth. In most systems, the initial growth is slow lag phase, and it increases rapidly thereafter at an exponential rate log or exponential phase. Here, both the progeny cells following mitotic cell division retain the ability to divide and continue to do so. However, with limited nutrient supply, the growth slows down leading to a stationary phase. If we plot the parameter of growth against time, we get a typical sigmoid or S-curve figure 15.6. A sigmoid curve is a characteristic of living organism growing in a natural environment. It is typical for all cells, tissues and organs of a plant. Can you think of more similar examples? What kind of a curve can you expect in a tree showing seasonal activities? The exponential growth can be expressed as W1 W0 or W1 final size weight height, number etc. W0 initial size at the beginning of the period R growth rate T time of growth E base of natural logarithms here. R is the relative growth rate and is also the measure of the ability of the plant to produce new plant material, referred to as efficiency index. Hence, the final size of W1 depends on the initial size, W0, figure 15.5 constant linear growth, a plot of length L against time T figure 15.6 an idealized sigmoid growth curve typical of cells in culture and many higher plants and plant organ size weight of the organ exponential phase lag phase time stationary phase. 244 biology quantitative comparisons between the growth of living system can also be made in two ways. I measurement and the comparison of total growth per unit time is called the absolute growth rate. To the growth of the given system per unit time expressed on a common basis, e.g., per unit initial parameter is called the relative growth rate. In figure 15.7 two leaves, A and B, are drawn that are of different sizes but shows absolute increase in area and the given time to give leaves, A1 and B1. However, one of them shows much higher relative growth rate, which one and why 1 5, 1, 5 conditions for growth why do you not try to write down what you think are necessary conditions for growth this list may have water. Oxygen and nutrients as very essential elements for growth, the plant cells grow in size by cell enlargement which in turn requires water. Turgidity of cells helps in extension growth, thus, plant growth and further development is intimately linked to the water status of the plant. Water also provides the medium for enzymatic activities needed for growth. Oxygen helps in releasing metabolic energy essential for growth activities. Nutrients macro and micro essential elements are required by plants for the synthesis of protoplasm and act as source of energy. In addition, every plant organism has an optimum temperature range best suited for its growth. Any deviation from this range could be detrimental to its survival. Environmental signals such as light and gravity also affect certain phases stages of growth. Figure 15.7 Diagrammatic Comparison of Absolute and Relative Growth Rates Both leaves A and B have increased their area by 5 square centimeters in a given time to produce A1, B1 leaves. 15.2 Differentiation Dedifferentiation and redifferentiation The cells derived from root apical and shoot apical meristems and cambrium differentiate and mature to perform specific functions. This act leading to maturation is termed as differentiation. During differentiation, cells undergo few to major structural changes both in their cell walls and protoplasm. 
For example, to form a tracheary element, the cells would lose their protoplasm. They also develop a very strong, elastic, lignocellulosic secondary cell walls to carry water to long distances even under extreme tension. Try to correlate the various anatomical features you encounter in plants to the functions they perform. Plants show another interesting phenomenon, the living differentiated cells, that by now have lost the capacity to divide can regain the capacity of division under certain conditions. This phenomenon is termed as de-differentiation, for example, formation of meristems, interfascicular cambium and cork cambium from fully differentiated parenchyma cells. While doing so, such meristems tissues are able to divide and produce cells that once again lose the capacity to divide but mature to perform specific functions, that is, get redifferentiated. List some of the tissues in a woody decotyledonous plant that are the products of redifferentiation. How would you describe a tumor? What would you call the parenchyma cells that are made to divide under controlled laboratory conditions during plant tissue culture recall? In section 1511, we have mentioned that the growth in plants is open, that is, it can be indeterminate or determinate. Now, we may say that even differentiation in plants is open, because cells tissues arising out of the same marrow stem have different structures at maturity. The final structure at maturity of a cell tissue is also determined by the location of the cell within. For example, cells positioned away from root apical meristems differentiate as root cap cells, while those pushed to the periphery mature as epidermis. Can you add a few more examples of open differentiation correlating the position of a cell to its position in an organ? 15.3 Development Development is a term that includes all changes that an organism goes through during its life cycle from germination of the seed to senescence. Diagrammatic representation of the sequence of processes which constitute the development of a cell of a higher plant is given in figure 15.8. It is also applicable to tissues organs. Plants follow different pathways in response to environment or phases of life to form different kinds of structures. This ability is called plasticity, e.g., heterophily in cotton, coriander and larkspur. In such plants, the leaves of the juvenile plant are different in shape from those in mature plants. On the other hand, difference in shapes of leaves produced in air and those produced in water in buttercup also represent the heterophilous development due to environment figure 15.9. This phenomenon of heterophily is an example of plasticity. Figure 15.8 Sequence of the developmental process in a plant cell Cell division death plasmatic growth differentiation expansion elongation maturation meristematic cell senescence mature cell Figure 15.9 Heterophily in a larkspur and B. Buttercup Thus, growth, differentiation and development are very closely related events in the life of a plant. Broadly, development is considered as the sum of growth and differentiation. Development in plants that is, both growth and differentiation is under the control of intrinsic and extrinsic factors. The former includes both intracellular genetic or intracellular factors chemicals such as plant growth regulators while the latter includes light, temperature, water, oxygen, nutrition, etc. 15.4 Plant Growth Regulators 1 5, 4, 1 Characteristics The plant growth regulators PGRs are small, simple molecules of diverse chemical composition. They could be indole compounds indole 3 acetic acid, IAA, adenine derivatives N6 for furilaminopurine, kinetin, derivatives of carotenoids of cysic acid, ABA, terpenes gibberellic acid, GA3 or gases ethylene, C2H4. Plant growth regulators are variously described as plant growth substances, plant hormones or phytohormones in literature. The PGRs can be broadly divided into two groups based on their functions in a living plant body. One group of PGRs are involved in growth-promoting activities, such as cell division, cell enlargement, pattern formation, tropic growth, flowering, fruiting and seed formation. These are also called plant growth promoters, e.g., auxins, gibberellins and cytokinins. The PGRs of the other group play an important role in plant responses to wounds and stresses of biotic and abiotic origin. They are also involved in various growth inhibiting activities such as dormancy and abscission. The PGR abscisic acid belongs to this group. The gaseous PGR, ethylene, could fit either of the groups, but it is largely an inhibitor of growth activities. 1 5, 4, 2 The discovery of plant growth regulators Interestingly, the discovery of each of the five major groups of PGRs have been accidental. All this started with the observation of Charles Darwin and his son Francis Darwin when they observed that the coleoptiles of canary grass responded to unilateral illumination by growing towards the light source phototropism. After a series of experiments, it was concluded that the tip of coleoptile was the site of transmittable influence that caused the bending of the entire coleoptile figure 15.10. Oxen was isolated by F.W. went from tips of coleoptiles of oat seedlings. Figure 15.10 experiment used to demonstrate that tip of the coleoptile is the source of oxen. 
Arrows indicate direction of light ABCD. The Bacchini foolish seedling disease of rice seedlings was caused by a fungal pathogen Gibberella fugicuroi. E. Kurosawa 1926 reported the appearance of symptoms of the disease in rice seedlings when they were treated with sterile filtrates of the fungus. The active substances were later identified as gibberellic acid. F. Skug and his co-workers observed that from the internodal segments of tobacco stems the callus a mass of undifferentiated cells proliferated only if. In addition to auxins the nutrients medium was supplemented with one of the following, extracts of vascular tissues. Yeast extract, coconut milk or DNA, Skug and Miller, later identified and crystallized the cytokinesis promoting active substance that they termed kinetin. During mid-1960s, three independent researchers reported the purification and chemical characterization of three different kinds of inhibitors, inhibitor B, abscission 2 and dormin. Later all the three were proved to be chemically identical, it was named abscisic acid ABA. Cousins confirmed the release of a volatile substance from ripened oranges that hastened the ripening of stored unripened bananas. Later this volatile substance was identified as ethylene, a gaseous PGR. Let us study some of the physiological effects of these five categories of PGRs in the next section. 1 5 4 3 Physiological effects of plant growth regulators 1 5 4 3 1 Auxins Auxins from Greek auxine, to grow was first isolated from human urine. The term auxin is applied to the indole 3 acetic acid IAA, and to other natural and synthetic compounds having certain growth regulating properties. They are generally produced by the growing apices of the stems and roots, from where they migrate to the regions of their action. Auxins like IAA and indolbutyric acid IBA have been isolated from plants, and AA naphthalene acetic acid and 2,4-D2,4 dichlorophen oxyacetic are synthetic auxins. All these auxins have been used extensively in agricultural and horticultural practices, they help to initiate rooting in stem cuttings, an application widely used for plant propagation. Auxins promote flowering e.g. in pineapples, they help to prevent fruit and leaf drop at early stages but promote the abscission of old mature leaves and fruits. In most higher plants, the growing apical bud inhibits the growth of the lateral axillary buds, a phenomenon called apical dominance. Removal of shoot tips decapitation usually results in the growth of lateral buds figure 15.11. It is widely applied in tea plantations, hedge making, can you explain why? Auxins also induce parthenocarpy, e.g., in tomatoes, they are widely used as herbicides too. 4D, widely used to kill decotyledonous weeds, does not affect mature monocotyledonous plants. It is used to prepare weed-free lawns by gardeners. Auxin also controls xylem differentiation and helps in cell division. 1 5, 4, 3, 2 gibberellins Gibberellins are another kind of promontory PGR. There are more than 100 gibberellins reported from widely different organisms such as fungi and higher plants. They are denoted as GA1, GA2, GA3 and so on. However, gibberellic acid GA3 was one of the first gibberellins to be discovered and remains the most intensively studied form. All GAs are acidic, they produce a wide range of physiological responses in the plants, their ability to cause an increase in length of axis is used to increase the length of grapes stalks. Gibberellins, cause fruits like apple to elongate and improve its shape, they also delay senescence. Thus, the fruits can be left on the tree longer so as to extend the market period. GA3 is used to speed up the malting process in brewing industry. Sugarcane stores carbohydrate as sugar in their stems. Spraying sugarcane crop with gibberellins increases the length of the stem, thus increasing the yield by as much as 20 tons per acre. Spraying juvenile conifers with GAs hastens the maturity period, thus leading to early seed production. Gibberellins also promotes bolting internode elongation just prior to flowering in meat, cabbages and many plants with rosette habit. 1 5, 4, 3, 3 cytokinin Cytokinins have specific effects on cytokinesis, and were discovered as kinetin a modified form of adenine. Appearing from the autoclave herring sperm DNA, kinetin does not occur naturally in plants. Search for natural substances with cytokinin-like activities led to the isolation of sedin from corn kernels and coconut milk. Since the discovery of sedin, several naturally occurring cytokinins, and some synthetic compounds with cell division promoting activity, have been identified. Natural cytokinins are synthesized in regions where rapid cell division occurs, for example, root apices, developing shoot buds, young fruits etc. It helps to produce new figure 15.11 apical dominance in plants. A, a plant with apical bud intact B A plant with apical bud removed note the growth of lateral buds into branches after decapitation. A B Leaves, chloroplasin leaves, lateral shoot growth and adventitious shoot formation. Cytokinins help overcome the apical dominance. 
They promote nutrient mobilization which helps in the delay of leaf senescence. 1, 5, 4, 3, 4 Ethylene Ethylene is a simple gaseous PGR. It is synthesized in large amounts by tissues undergoing senescence and ripening fruits. Influences of ethylene on plants include horizontal growth of seedlings, swelling of the axis and apical hook formation and dicot seedlings. Ethylene promotes senescence and abscission of plant organs especially of leaves and flowers. Ethylene is highly effective in fruit ripening. It enhances the respiration rate during ripening of the fruits. This rise in rate of respiration is called respiratory climactic. Ethylene breaks seed and bud dormancy. Initiates germination in peanut seeds, sprouting of potato tubers. Ethylene promotes rapid internode petiole elongation in deep water rice plants. It helps leaves upper parts of the shoot to remain above water. Ethylene also promotes root growth and root hair formation, thus helping the plants to increase their absorption surface. Ethylene is used to initiate flowering and for synchronizing fruit set in pineapples. It also induces flowering in mango. Since ethylene regulates so many physiological processes, it is one of the most widely used PGR in agriculture. The most widely used compound is source of ethylene is ethophen. Ethophen in an aqueous solution is readily absorbed and transported within the plant and releases ethylene slowly. Ethophen hastens root ripening in tomatoes and apples and accelerates abscission in flowers and fruits thinning of cotton, cherry, walnut. It promotes female flowers and cucumbers thereby increasing the yield 1 5 4 3 5 abscisic acid as mentioned earlier, abscisic acid ABA was discovered for its role in regulating abscission and dormancy. But like other PGRs, it also has other wide-ranging effects on plant growth and development. It acts as a general plant growth inhibitor and an inhibitor of plant metabolism. ABA inhibits seed germination. ABA stimulates the closure of stomata in the epidermis and increases the tolerance of plants to various kinds of stresses. Therefore, it is also called the stress hormone. ABA plays an important role in seed development, maturation and dormancy. By inducing dormancy, ABA helps seeds to withstand desiccation and other factors unfavorable for growth. In most situations, ABA acts as an antagonist to GAs. We may summarize that for any and every phase of growth, differentiation and development of plants, one or the other PGR has some role to play. Such roles could be complementary or antagonistic. These could be individualistic or synergistic. Similarly, there are a number of events in the life of a plant where more than one PGR interact to affect that event, e.g., dormancy in seed buds, abscission, senescence, apical dominance, etc. Remember, the role of PGR is of only one kind of intrinsic control, along with genomic control and extrinsic factors, they play an important role in plant growth and development. Many of the extrinsic factors such as temperature and light, control plant growth and development via PGR, some of such events could be, vernalization, flowering, dormancy, seed germination, plant movements, etc. We shall discuss briefly the role of light and temperature both of them, the extrinsic factors on initiation of flowering. 15.5 Photoperiodism It has been observed that some plants require a periodic exposure to light to induce flowering. It is also seen that such plants are able to measure the duration of exposure to light, for example. Some plants require the exposure to light for a period exceeding a well-defined critical duration while others must be exposed to light for a period less than this critical duration before the flowering is initiated in them. The former group of plants are called long-day plants while the latter ones are termed short-day plants. The critical duration is different for different plants. There are many plants, however, where there is no such correlation between exposure to light duration and induction of flowering response. Such plants are called day-neutral plants figure 15.12. It is now also figure 15.12 photoperiodism, long-day. Short day and day neutral plants long day plant short day plant day neutral plant. Known that not only the duration of light period but that the duration of dark period is also of equal importance. Hence, it can be said that flowering in certain plants depends not only on a combination of light and dark exposures but also their relative durations. This response of plants to periods of day-night is termed photoperiodism. It is also interesting to note that while shoot apices modify themselves into flowering apices prior to flowering, they that is, shoot apices of plants by themselves cannot perceive photoperiods. The side of perception of light-dark duration are the leaves. It has been hypothesized that there is a hormonal substance S that is responsible for flowering. This hormonal substance migrates from leaves to shoot apices for inducing flowering only when the plants are exposed to the necessary inductive photoperiod. 15.6 Fernalization There are plants for which flowering is either quantitatively or qualitatively dependent on exposure to low temperature. This phenomenon is termed fernalization. It prevents precocious reproductive development late in the growing season, and enables the plant to have sufficient time to reach maturity. 
Vernalization refers specially to the promotion of flowering by a period of low temperature. Some important food plants, wheat, barley, rye have two kinds of varieties, winter and spring varieties. The spring variety are normally planted in the spring and come to flower and produce grain before the end of the growing season. Winter varieties, however, if planted in spring would normally fail to flower or produce mature grain within a span of a flowering season. Hence, they are planted in autumn, they germinate, and over winter come out as small seedlings, resume growth in the spring, and are harvested usually around midsummer. Another example of vernalization is seen in biennial plants. Biennials are monocarpic plants that normally flower and die in the second season. Sugar beet, cabbages, carrots are some of the common biennials. Subjecting the growing of a biennial plant to a cold treatment stimulates a subsequent photoperiodic flowering response. 15.7 Seed Dormancy There are certain seeds which fail to germinate even when external conditions are favorable. Such seeds are understood to be undergoing a period of dormancy which is controlled not by external environment but are under endogenous control or conditions within the seed itself. Impermeable and hard seed coat, presence of chemical inhibitors such as abscisic acids, phenolic acids, podiascorpic acid, and immature. Embryos are some of the reasons which causes seed dormancy. This dormancy however can be overcome through natural means and various other man-made measures. For example, the seed coat barrier in some seeds can be broken by mechanical abrasions using knives, sandpaper, etc. Or vigorous shaking. In nature, these abrasions are caused by microbial action and passage through digestive tract of animals. Effective inhibitory substances can be removed by subjecting the seeds to chilling conditions or by application of certain chemicals like gerberellic acid and nitrates. Changing the environmental conditions, such as light and temperature or other methods to overcome seed dormancy. Summary growth is one of the most conspicuous events in any living organism. It is an irreversible increase expressed in parameters such as size, area, length, height, volume, cell number etc. It conspicuously involves increased protoplasmic material. In plants, meristems are the sites of growth. Root and shoot apical meristems sometimes along with intercalary meristem, contribute to the elongation growth of plant axes. Growth is indeterminate in higher plants, following cell division in root and shoot apical meristem cells. The growth could be arithmetic or geometrical. Growth may not be and generally is not sustained at a high rate throughout the life of cell tissue or an organism. One can define three principal phases of growth the lag, the log and the senescent phase. When a cell loses the capacity to divide, it leads to differentiation. Differentiation results in development of structures that is commensurate with the function the cells finally has to perform. General principles for differentiation for cell, tissues and organs are similar. A differentiated cell may differentiate and then redifferentiate. Since differentiation in plants is open, the development could also be flexible, that is, the development is the sum of growth and differentiation. Plant exhibit plasticity and development. Plant growth and development are under the control of both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Intercellular intrinsic factors are the chemical substances, called plant growth regulators PGR. There are diverse groups of PGRs in plants, principally belonging to five groups, auxins, gibberellins, cytokinins, abscisic acid and ethylene. These PGRs are synthesized in various parts of the plant. They control different differentiation and developmental events. Any PGR has diverse physiological effects on plants. Diverse PGRs also manifest similar effects. PGRs may act synergistically or antagonistically. Plant growth and development is also affected by light, temperature, nutrition, oxygen status, gravity and such external factors. Flowering in some plants is induced only when exposed to certain duration of photoperiod. Depending on the nature of photoperiod requirements, the plants are called short-day plants, long-day plants and day-neutral plants. Certain plants also need to be exposed to low temperature so as to hasten flowering later in life. This treatment is known as vernalization. Exercises 1. Define growth, differentiation, development, de-differentiation, redifferentiation, determinate growth, meristem and growth rate. 2. Why is not any one parameter good enough to demonstrate growth throughout the life of a flower and plant 3? Describe briefly, a arithmetic growth B geometric growth C sigmoid growth curve D absolute and relative growth rates 4. List 5 main groups of natural plant growth regulators. Write a note on discovery, physiological functions and agricultural horticultural applications of any one of them. 5. What do you understand by photoperiodism and vernalization? Describe their significance 6. Why is abscisic acid also known as stress hormone 7? Both growth and differentiation in higher plants are open. Comment 8. Both a short-day plant and a long-day plant can produce can flower simultaneously in a given place.
Explain 9. Which one of the plant growth regulators would you use if you are asked to? A. Induce rooting in a twig. B. Quickly ripen a fruit. C. Delay leaf senescence. D. Induce growth in axillary buzzy bolt or rosette plant. F. Induce immediate stomatal closure in leaves. 10. Would a defoliated plant respond to photoperiodic cycle? Y. 11. What would be expected to happen if a GA3 is applied to rice seedlings? B. Dividing cells stop differentiating. C. A rotten fruit gets mixed with unripe fruits. D. You forget to add cytokine into the culture medium. Unit 5 The reductionist approach to study of life forms resulted in increasing use of physical chemical concepts and techniques. Majority of these studies employed either surviving tissue model or straightaway cell free systems. An explosion of knowledge resulted in molecular biology. Molecular physiology became almost synonymous with biochemistry and biophysics. However, it is now being increasingly realized that neither a purely organismic approach nor a purely reductionistic molecular approach would reveal the truth about biological processes or living phenomena. Systems biology makes us believe that all living phenomena are emergent properties due to interaction among components of the system under study. Regulatory network of molecules, supramolecular assemblies, cells, tissues, organisms and indeed, populations and communities, each create emergent properties. In the chapters under this unit, major human physiological processes like digestion, exchange of gases, blood circulation, locomotion and movement are described in cellular and molecular terms. The last two chapters point to the coordination and regulation of body events at the organismic level. Human Physiology Chapter 16 Digestion and Absorption Chapter 17 Breathing and Exchange of Gases Chapter 18 Body Fluids and Circulation Chapter 19 Excretory Products and Their Elimination Chapter 20 Locomotion and Movement Chapter 21 Neural Control and Coordination Chapter 22 Chemical Coordination and Integration Alfonso Corti, Italian anatomist, was born in 1822. Corti began his scientific career studying the cardiovascular systems of reptiles. Later, he turned his attention to the mammalian auditory system. In 1851, he published a paper describing a structure located on the basilar membrane of the cochlea containing hair cells that convert sound vibrations into nerve impulses, the organ of Corti. He died in the year 1888, Alfonso Corti 1822-1888-2018-1. Food is one of the basic requirements of all living organisms. The major components of our food are carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Vitamins and minerals are also required in small quantities. Food provides energy and organic materials for growth and repair of tissues. The water we take in plays an important role in metabolic processes and also prevents dehydration of the body. Biomicro molecules in food cannot be utilized by our body in their original form. They have to be broken down and converted into simple substances in the digestive system. This process of conversion of complex food substances to simple absorbable forms is called digestion and is carried out by our digestive system by mechanical and biochemical methods. General organization of the human digestive system is shown in figure 16.1. 16.1 Digestive System The human digestive system consists of the alimentary canal and the associated glands. 1 6 1 1 Alimentary canal The alimentary canal begins with an anterior opening, the mouth, and it opens out posteriorly through the anus. The mouth leads to the buccal cavity or oral cavity. The oral cavity has a number of teeth and a muscular tongue. Each tooth is embedded in a socket of jawbone figure 16.2. This type of attachment is called the cadont. Majority of mammals including human being forms two sets of teeth during their life. A set of temporary milk or deciduous teeth replaced by a set of permanent or adult teeth. This type of dentition is called diphodont, an adult human digestion and absorption chapter 16 16.1 digestive system 16.2 digestion of food 16.3 absorption of digested products 16.4 disorders of digestive system 258 biology sigmoid colon figure 16.1 the human digestive system has 32 permanent teeth which are of four different types heterodent dentition namely incisors i canine c Premolars PM and molars M. Arrangement of teeth in each half of the upper and lower jaw in the order I, C, PM, M is represented by a dental formula which in human is 2123-2123. The hard chewing surface of the teeth, made up of enamel, helps in the mastication of food. The tongue is a freely movable muscular organ attached to the floor of the oral cavity by the frenulum. The upper surface of the tongue has small projections called papillae, some of which bear taste buds. The oral cavity leads into a short pharynx which serves as a common passage for food and air. The esophagus and the trachea windpipe open into the pharynx. A cartilaginous flap called epiglottis prevents the entry of food into the glottis, opening of the windpipe during swallowing. 
The esophagus is a thin, long tube which extends posteriorly passing through the neck, thorax and diaphragm and leads to a J-shaped bag. Like structure called stomach, a muscular sphincter gastroesophageal regulates the opening of esophagus into the stomach. The stomach, located in the upper left portion of the abdominal cavity, has four major parts, a cardiac portion into which the esophagus opens, a fundic region, body main central region and a pyloric portion which opens into the first part of small intestine figure 16.3. Small intestine is distinguishable into three regions, a C-shaped duodenum, a long coiled middle portion jejunum and a highly coiled ileum. The opening of the stomach into the duodenum is guarded by the pyloric sphincter, ileum opens into the large intestine. It consists of cecum, colon and rectum. Cecum is a small blind sac which hosts some symbiotic microorganisms. A narrow finger-like tubular projection, the vermiform appendix which is a vestigial organ, arises from the cecum. The cecum opens into the colon. The colon is divided into four parts, an ascending, a transverse, descending part and a sigmoid colon. The descending part opens into the rectum which opens out through the anus. The wall of elementary canal from esophagus to rectum possesses four layers figure 16.4 namely serosa, muscularis, submucosa and mucosa. Serosa is the outermost layer and is made up of a thin mesothelium epithelium of visceral organs with some connective tissues. Muscularis is formed by smooth muscles usually arranged into an inner circular and an outer longitudinal layer. An oblique muscle layer may be present in some regions. The submucosal layer is formed of loose connective tissues containing nerves, blood and lymph vessels. In duodenum, glands are also present in submucosa. The innermost layer lining the lumen of the alimentary canal is the mucosa. This layer forms the regular folds rugae in the stomach and small finger-like foldings called villi in the small intestine figure 16.5. The cells lining the villi produce numerous microscopic figure 16.2 arrangement of different types of teeth in the jaws on one side and the sockets on the other side figure 16.3 anatomical regions of human stomach. 260 Biology Figure 16.4 Diagrammatic representation of transverse section of gut projections called microvilli giving a brush border appearance. These modifications increase the surface area enormously. Villi are supplied with a network of capillaries and a large lymph vessel called the lacteal. Mucosal epithelium has goblet cells which secrete mucus that help in lubrication. Mucosa also forms glands in the stomach, gastric glands and crypts in between the bases of villi and the intestine crypts of Lieberkuhn. All the four layers show modifications in different parts of the alimentary canal 1 6, 1, 2 digestive glands The digestive glands associated with the alimentary canal include the salivary glands, the liver and the pancreas. Saliva is mainly produced by three pairs of salivary glands, the parotid cheek, the submaxillary submandibular lower jaw and the sublinguals below the tongue. These glands situated just outside the buccal cavity secrete salivary juice into the buccal cavity. Liver is the largest gland of the body weighing about 1.2 to 1.5 kilograms in an adult human. It is situated in the abdominal cavity, just below the diaphragm and has two lobes. The hepatic lobules are the structural and functional units of liver containing hepatic cells arranged in the form of cords. Each lobule is covered by a thin connective tissue sheath called the glissance capsule. The bile secreted by the hepatic cells passes through the hepatic ducts and is stored and concentrated in a thin muscular sac called the gallbladder. The duct of gallbladder cystic duct along with figure 16.5A section of small intestinal mucosa showing villi villi lacteal capillaries crypts artery vein. The hepatic duct from the liver forms the common bile duct figure 16.6. The bile duct and the pancreatic duct open together into the duodenum as the common hepatopancreatic duct which is guarded by a sphincter called the sphincter of body. The pancreas is a compound both exocrine and endocrine elongated organ situated between the limbs of the C-shaped duodenum. The exocrine portion secretes an alkaline pancreatic juice containing enzymes and the endocrine portion secretes hormones, insulin and glucagon. Figure 16.6 The duct systems of liver, gallbladder and pancreas 16.2 Digestion of food The process of digestion is accomplished by mechanical and chemical processes. The buccal cavity performs two major functions, mastication of food and facilitation of swallowing. The teeth and the tongue with the help of saliva masticate and mix up the food thoroughly. Mucus and saliva helps in lubricating and adhering the masticated food particles into a bolus. The bolus is then conveyed into the pharynx and then into the esophagus by swallowing or deglutition. The bolus further passes down through the esophagus by successive waves of muscular contractions called peristalsis. The gastroesophageal sphincter controls the passage of food into the stomach. The saliva secreted into the oral cavity contains electrolytes and enzymes, salivary amylase and lysozyme. 
The chemical process of digestion is initiated in the oral cavity by the hydrolytic action of the carbohydrate splitting enzyme. The salivary. Analyze. About 30% of starch is hydrolyzed here by this enzyme optimum pH 6.8 into a disaccharide, maltose. Lysozyme present in saliva acts as an antibacterial agent that prevents infections. Starch salivary. Amylase pH maltose 68 The mucosa of stomach has gastric glands. Gastric glands have three major types of cells namely eye mucus neck cells which secrete mucus, two peptic or chief cells which secrete the proenzyme pepsinogen, and three parietal or oxyntic cells which secrete HCL and intrinsic factor factor essential for absorption of vitamin B12. The stomach stores the food for four or five hours. The food mixes thoroughly with the acidic gastric juice of the stomach by the churning movements of its muscular wall and is called the chyme. The proenzyme pepsinogen, on exposure to hydrochloric acid gets converted into the active enzyme pepsin, the proteolytic enzyme of the stomach. Pepsin converts proteins into proteoses and peptones peptides. The mucus and bicarbonates present in the gastric juice play an important role in lubrication and protection of the mucosal epithelium from excoriation by the highly concentrated hydrochloric acid. HCL provides the acidic pH pH 1.8 optimal for pepsins. Lenin is a proteolytic enzyme found in gastric juice of infants which helps in the digestion of milk proteins. Small amounts of lipases are also secreted by gastric glands. Various types of movements are generated by the muscularis layer of the small intestine. These movements help in a thorough mixing up of the food with various secretions in the intestine and thereby facilitate digestion. The bile, pancreatic juice and the intestinal juice are the secretions released into the small intestine. Pancreatic juice and bile are released through the hepatopancreatic duct. The pancreatic juice contains inactive enzymes trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, procarboxypeptidases, amylases, lipases and nucleases. Trypsinogen is activated by an enzyme, enterokinase, secreted by the intestinal mucosa into active trypsin, which in turn activates the other enzymes in the pancreatic juice. The bile released into the duodenum contains biopigments bilirubin and biliverdin, bile salts, cholesterol and phospholipids but no enzymes. Bile helps in emulsification of fats, that is, breaking down of the fats into very small micelles. Bile also activates lipases. The intestinal mucosal epithelium has goblet cells which secrete mucus. The secretions of the brush border cells of the mucosa along with the secretions of the goblet cells constitute the intestinal juice or succus entericus. This juice contains a variety of enzymes like disaccharidases e.g., maltase, dipeptidases, lipases, nucleosidases, etc. The mucus along with the bicarbonates from the pancreas protects the intestinal mucosa from acid as well as provide an alkaline medium pH 7.8 for enzymatic activities. Submucosal glands Bruner's glands also help in this. Proteins Proteoses and peptones partially hydrolyzed proteins in the chyme reaching the intestine are acted upon by the proteolytic enzymes of pancreatic juice as given below. Proteins peptones proteoses trypsin chymotrypsin carboxypeptidase to peptides carbohydrates in the chyme are hydrolyzed by pancreatic amylase into disaccharides. Polysaccharides starch disaccharides amylase fats are broken down by lipases with the help of bile into D and monoglycerides. Fats diglycerides monoglycerides lipases nucleases in the pancreatic juice acts on nucleic acids to form nucleotides and nucleosides nucleic acids nucleotides nucleosides nucleases the enzymes in the succus entericus act on the end products of the above reactions to form the respective simple absorbable forms. These final steps in digestion occur very close to the mucosal epithelial cells of the intestine. Dipeptides dipeptidases amino acids maltose maltase glucose glucose lactose glucose alactose lactase g sucrose fructose sucrase glucose nucleotides nucleosides nucleotidases nucleosidases sugars bases d and monoglycerides fatty acids glycerolipases the breakdown of biomicromolecules mentioned above occurs in the duodenum region of the small intestine. The simple substances thus formed are absorbed in the jejunum and ileum regions of the small intestine. The undigested and unabsorbed substances are passed on to the large intestine. No significant digestive activity occurs in the large intestine. The functions of large intestine are, eye absorption of some water, minerals and certain drugs, two secretion of mucus which helps in adhering the waste undigested particles together and lubricating it for an easy passage. The undigested, unabsorbed substances called feces enters into the cecum of the large intestine through ileocecal valve, which prevents the backflow of the fecal matter. It is temporarily stored in the rectum till defecation. The activities of the gastrointestinal tract are under neural and hormonal control for proper coordination of different parts. The sight, smell and or the presence of food in the oral cavity can stimulate the secretion of saliva.
Gastric and intestinal secretions are also, similarly, stimulated by neural signals. The muscular activities of different parts of the alimentary canal can also be moderated by neural mechanisms. Both local and through CNS, hormonal control of the secretion of digestive juices is carried out by local hormones produced by the gastric and intestinal mucosa. Calorific value of protein. Carbohydrate and fat boxed item, not for evaluation the energy requirements of animals and the energy content of food, are expressed in terms of measure of heat energy because heat is the ultimate form of all energies. This is often measured to as calorie calorie joule J, which is the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of 1 gram of water by x 31 degrees Celsius since this value is tiny amount of energy. Physiologists commonly use kilocalorie kcal or kilojoule kj, 1 kilocalorie is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of 1 kilogram of water by x 31 degrees Celsius nutritionists. Traditionally referred to kcal as the calorie or joule always capitalized, the amount of heat liberated from complete combustion of 1 gram food and a bomb calorimeter a closed metal chamber filled with O2 as its gross calorific or gross energy value. The actual amount of energy combustion of 1 gram of food is the physiologic value of food, gross calorific values of carbohydrates. Proteins and fats are 4.1 kcal g, 5.65 kcal g and 9.45 kcal g, respectively, whereas their physiologic values are 4.0 kcal g. 4.0 kcalg and 9.0 kcalg, respectively. 16.3 Absorption of digested products Absorption is the process by which the end products of digestion pass through the intestinal mucosa into the blood or lymph. It is carried out by passive, active or facilitated transport mechanisms. Small amounts of monosaccharides like glucose, amino acids and some electrolytes like chloride ions are generally absorbed by simple diffusion. The passage of these substances into the blood depends upon the concentration gradients. However, some substances like glucose and amino acids are absorbed with the help of carrier proteins. This mechanism is called the facilitated transport. Transport of water depends upon the osmotic gradient. Active transport occurs against the concentration gradient and hence requires energy. Various nutrients like amino acids, monosaccharides like glucose, electrolytes like NA are absorbed into the blood by this mechanism. Fatty acids and glycerol being insoluble, cannot be absorbed into the blood. They are first incorporated into small droplets called micelles which move into the intestinal mucosa. They are reformed into very small protein-coated fat globules called the chylomicrons which are transported into the lymph vessels lacteals and the villi. These lymph vessels ultimately release the absorbed substances into the bloodstream. Absorption of substances takes place in different parts of the alimentary canal, like mouth, stomach, small intestine and large intestine. However, maximum absorption occurs in the small intestine. A summary of absorption sites of absorption and substances absorbed is given in Table 16.1. The absorbed substances finally reach the tissues which utilize them for their activities. This process is called assimilation. The digestive wastes, solidified into coherent feces in the rectum initiate a neural reflex causing an urge or desire for its removal. The ingestion of feces to the outside through the anal opening defecation is a voluntary process and is carried out by a mass peristaltic movement. 16.4 Disorders of digestive system The inflammation of the intestinal tract is the most common ailment due to bacterial or viral infections. The infections are also caused by the parasites of the intestine like tapeworm, roundworm, threadworm, hookworm, pinworm, etc. Jaundice, the liver is affected, skin and eyes turn yellow due to the deposit of bile pigments, vomiting, it is the ejection of stomach contents through the mouth. This reflex action is controlled by the vomit center in the medulla, a feeling of nausea precedes vomiting. Diarrhea, the abnormal frequency of bowel movement and increased liquidity of the fecal discharge is known as diarrhea. It reduces the absorption of food, constipation, in constipation, the feces are retained within the colon as the bowel movements occur irregularly. Indigestion, in this condition, the food is not properly digested leading to a feeling of fullness. The causes of indigestion are inadequate enzyme secretion, anxiety, food poisoning, overeating, and spicy food. Stomach absorption of water, simple sugars, and alcohol etc. takes place, small intestine principal organ for absorption of nutrients. The digestion is completed here and the final products of digestion such as glucose, fructose, fatty acids, glycerol and amino acids are absorbed through the mucosa into the bloodstream and lymph. Mouth certain drugs coming in contact with the mucosa of mouth and lower side of the tongue are absorbed into the blood capillaries lining them. Large intestine absorption of water, some minerals and drugs takes place. Table 16.1 The summary of absorption in different parts of digestive system.
PEM dietary deficiencies of proteins and total food calories are widespread in many underdeveloped countries of South and Southeast Asia, South America, and West and Central Africa. Protein energy malnutrition PEM may affect large sections of the population during drought, famine and political turmoil. This happened in Bangladesh during the Liberation War and in Ethiopia during the severe drought in mid-80s. PEM affects infants and children to produce marasmus and kwashiorkor. Marasmus is produced by a simultaneous deficiency of proteins and calories. It is found in infants less than a year in age, if mother's milk is replaced too early by other foods which are poor in both proteins and caloric value. This often happens if the mother has second pregnancy or childbirth when the older infant is still too young. In marasmus, protein deficiency impairs growth and replacement of tissue proteins, extreme emaciation of the body and thinning of limbs results, the skin becomes dry, thin and wrinkled. Growth rate and body weight decline considerably, even growth and development of brain and mental faculties are impaired. Kwashiorkor is produced by protein deficiency unaccompanied by calorie deficiency. It results from the replacement of mother's milk by a high-calorie low-protein diet in a child more than one year in age. Like marasmus, kwashiorkor shows wasting of muscles, thinning of limbs, failure of growth and brain development. But unlike marasmus, some fat is still left under the skin. Moreover, extensive edema and swelling of body parts are seen. Summary The digestive system of humans consists of an alimentary canal and associated digestive glands. The alimentary canal consists of the mouth, buccal cavity, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum and the anus. The accessory digestive glands include the salivary glands, the liver with gallbladder and the pancreas. Inside the mouth the teeth masticates the food, the tongue tastes the food and manipulates it for proper mastication by mixing with the saliva. Saliva contains a starch digestive enzyme, salivary amylase that digests the starch and converts it into maltose disaccharide. The food then passes into the pharynx and enters the esophagus in the form of bolus, which is further carried down through the esophagus by peristalsis into the stomach. In stomach mainly protein digestion takes place, absorption of simple sugars, alcohol and medicines also takes place in the stomach. The chyme food enters into the duodenum portion of the small intestine and is acted on by the pancreatic juice, bile and finally by the enzymes in the succus entericus, so that the digestion of carbohydrates, proteins and fats is completed. The food then enters into the jejunum and ileum portions of the small intestine. Carbohydrates are digested and converted into monosaccharides like glucose. Proteins are finally broken down into amino acids. The fats are converted to fatty acids and glycerol. The digested end products are absorbed into the body through the epithelial lining of the intestinal villi. The undigested food feces enters into the cecum of the large intestine through ileocecal valve, which prevents the backflow of the fecal matter. Most of the water is absorbed in the large intestine, the undigested food becomes semi-solid in nature and then enters into the rectum, anal canal and is finally ingested out through the anus. Exercise is 1. Choose the correct answer among the following. A gastric juice contains i-pepsin, lipase and renin 2 trypsin, lipase and renin 3 trypsin, pepsin and lipase i trypsin. Pepsin and renin B succus entericus is the name given to i a junction between ileum and large intestine 2 intestinal juice 3 swelling in the gut i appendix 2. Match column I with column 2 column I column 2 a bilirubin and bilivertin I parotid B hydrolysis of starch 2 bile C digestion of fat 3 lipases D salivary gland I vamylases 3. Answer briefly, a Y are villi present in the intestine and not in the stomach B how does pepsinogen change into its active form C what are the basic layers of the wall of alimentary canal D how does bile help in the digestion of fats 4. State the role of pancreatic juice in digestion of proteins. 5. Describe the process of digestion of protein in stomach. 6. Give the dental formula of human beings. 7. Bile juice contains no digestive enzymes, yet it is important for digestion. Y8. Describe the digestive role of chymotrypsin, which two other digestive enzymes of the same category are secreted by its source gland. 9. How are polysaccharides and disaccharides digested? 10. What would happen if HCL were not secreted in the stomach? 11. How does butter in your food get digested and absorbed in the body? 12. Discuss the main steps in the digestion of proteins as the food passes through different parts of the alimentary canal. 13. Explain the term thecodont and diphyodont. 14. Name different types of teeth and their number in an adult human. 15. What are the functions of liver? 268. Biology as you have read earlier, oxygen O2 is utilized by the organisms to indirectly break down simple molecules like glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, etc., to derive energy to perform various activities. 
Carbon dioxide CO2 which is harmful is also released during the above catabolic reactions. It is, therefore, evident that O2 has to be continuously provided to the cells and CO2 produced by the cells have to be released out. This process of exchange of O2 from the atmosphere with CO2 produced by the cells is called breathing, commonly known as respiration. Place your hands on your chest. You can feel the chest moving up and down. You know that it is due to breathing. How do we breathe? The respiratory organs and the mechanism of breathing are described in the following sections of this chapter. 17.1 Respiratory organs Mechanisms of breathing vary among different groups of animals depending mainly on their habitats and levels of organization. Lower invertebrates like sponges, coenterates, flatworms, etc., exchange O2 with CO2 by simple diffusion over their entire body surface. Earthworms use their moist cuticle and insects have a network of tubes tracheal tubes to transport atmospheric air within the body. Special vascularized structures called gills branchial respiration are used by most of the aquatic arthropods and mollusks whereas vascularized bags called lungs pulmonary respiration are used by the terrestrial forms for the exchange of gases. Among vertebrates, fishes use gills whereas amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals respire through lungs. Amphibians like frogs can respire through their moist skin cutaneous respiration also. Breathing and Exchange of Gases Chapter 17 17.1 Respiratory Organs 17.2 Mechanism of Breathing 17.3 Exchange of Gases 17.4 Transport of Gases 17.5 Regulation of Respiration 17.6 Disorders of Respiratory System 171. One Human Respiratory System We have a pair of external nostrils opening out above the upper lips. It leads to a nasal chamber through the nasal passage. The nasal chamber opens into the pharynx, a portion of which is the common passage for food and air. The pharynx opens through the larynx region into the trachea. Larynx is a cartilaginous box which helps in sound production and hence called the sound box. During swallowing glottis can be covered by a thin elastic cartilaginous flap called epiglottis to prevent the entry of food into the larynx. Trachea is a straight tube extending up to the mid-thoracic cavity, which divides at the level of fifth thoracic vertebra into a right and left primary bronchi. Each bronchi undergoes repeated divisions to form the secondary and tertiary bronchi and bronchioles ending up in very thin terminal bronchioles. The trachea, primary, secondary and tertiary bronchi, and initial bronchioles are supported by incomplete cartilaginous rings. Each terminal bronchiole gives rise to a number of very thin, irregular walled and vascularized bag-like structures called alveoli. The branching network of bronchi, bronchioles and alveoli comprise the lungs figure 17.1. We have two lungs which are covered by a double-layered pleura, with pleural fluid between them. It reduces friction on the lung surface. The outer pleural membrane is in close contact with the thoracic bronchus lung heart diaphragm epiglottis larynx trachea cut end of rib pleural membranes alveoli pleural fluid bronchial figure 17.1 diagrammatic view of human respiratory system sectional view of the left lung is also shown lining whereas the inner pleural membrane is in contact with the lung surface the parts starting with the external nostrils up to the terminal bronchioles constitute the conducting part whereas the alveoli and their ducts form the respiratory or exchange part of the respiratory system the conducting part transports the atmospheric air to the alveoli, clears it from foreign particles, humidifies and also brings the air to body temperature. Exchange part is the site of actual diffusion of O2 and CO2 between blood and atmospheric air. The lungs are situated in the thoracic chamber which is anatomically an airtight chamber. The thoracic chamber is formed dorsally by the vertebral column, ventrally by the sternum, laterally by the ribs and on the lower side by the dome-shaped diaphragm. The anatomical setup of lungs in thorax is such that any change in the volume of the thoracic cavity will be reflected in the lung pulmonary cavity. Such an arrangement is essential for breathing, as we cannot directly alter the pulmonary volume. Respiration involves the following steps, eye breathing or pulmonary ventilation by which atmospheric air is drawn in and CO2-rich alveolar air is released out. 2. Diffusion of gases O2 and CO2 across alveolar membrane 3. Transport of gases by the blood. I diffusion of O2 and CO2 between blood and tissues the utilization of O2 by the cells for catabolic reactions and resultant release of CO2 cellular respiration is dealt in the chapter 14. 17.2 Mechanism of breathing Breathing involves two stages, inspiration during which atmospheric air is drawn in and expiration by which the alveolar air is released out. The movement of air into and out of the lungs is carried out by creating a pressure gradient between the lungs and the atmosphere. Inspiration can occur if the pressure within the lungs intrapulmonary pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure. That is, there is a negative pressure in the lungs with respect to atmospheric pressure. Similarly, expiration takes place when the intrapulmonary pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure. 
the diaphragm and a specialized set of muscles, external and internal intercostals between the ribs, help in generation of such gradients. Inspiration is initiated by the contraction of diaphragm which increases the volume of thoracic chamber in the antero-posterior axis. The contraction of external intercostal muscles lifts up the ribs and the sternum causing an increase in the volume of the thoracic chamber in the dorsoventral axis. The overall increase in the thoracic volume causes a similar increase in pulmonary volume. An increase in pulmonary volume decreases the intrapulmonary pressure to less than the atmospheric pressure which forces the air from outside to move into the lungs. That is, inspiration figure 17.2 up, relaxation of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles returns the diaphragm and sternum to their normal positions and reduce the thoracic volume and thereby the pulmonary volume. This leads to an increase in intrapulmonary pressure to slightly above the atmospheric pressure causing the expulsion of air from the lungs, that is, expiration figure 17.2b. We have the ability to increase the strength of inspiration and expiration with the help of additional muscles in the abdomen. On an average, a healthy human breathes 12-16 times minute. The volume of air involved in breathing movements can be estimated by using a spirometer which helps in clinical assessment of pulmonary functions. 1 7, 2, 1 Respiratory Volumes and Capacities Tidal Volume TV, Volume of Air Inspired or Expired During a Normal Respiration It is approximately 500 milliliters, that is, a healthy man can inspire or expire approximately 6,000 to 8,000 ml of air per minute. Inspiratory Reserve Volume Irv, Additional Volume of Air, a person can inspire by a forcible inspiration. This averages 2,500 milliliters to 3,000 milliliters. Expiratory Reserve Volume Irv, Additional Volume of Air, a person can expire by a forcible expiration. This averages 1,000 milliliters to 1,100 milliliters. Figure 17.2 Mechanism of Breathing Showing, a Inspiration B Expiration. Residual volume RV, volume of air remaining in the lungs even after a forcible expiration. This average is 1,100 milliliters to 1,200 milliliters by adding up a few respiratory volumes described above. One can derive various pulmonary capacities, which can be used in clinical diagnosis. Inspiratory capacity IC, total volume of air a person can inspire after a normal expiration. This includes tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume TV IRV. Expiratory capacity EC, total volume of air a person can expire after a normal inspiration. This includes tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume TV IRV. Functional residual capacity FRC, volume of air that will remain in the lungs after a normal expiration. This includes IRV RV, vital capacity VC, the maximum volume of air a person can breathe in after a forced expiration. This includes IRV. TV and IRV or the maximum volume of air a person can breathe out after a forced inspiration. Total lung capacity, total volume of air accommodated in the lungs at the end of a forced inspiration. This includes RV, IRV, TV and IRV or vital capacity residual volume 17.3 Exchange of gases alveoli are the primary sites of exchange of gases. Exchange of gases also occur between blood and tissues. O2 and CO2 are exchanged in these sites by simple diffusion mainly based on pressure concentration gradient. Solubility of the gases as well as the thickness of the membranes involved in diffusion are also some important factors that can affect the rate of diffusion. Pressure contributed by an individual gas in a mixture of gases is called partial pressure and is represented as PO2 for oxygen and PCO2 for carbon dioxide. Partial pressures of these two gases in the atmospheric air and the two sites of diffusion are given in Table 17.1 and in Figure 17.3. The data given in the table clearly indicates a concentration gradient for oxygen from alveoli to blood and blood to tissues. Similarly, Table 17.1 Partial pressures in MMHG of oxygen and carbon dioxide, at different parts involved in diffusion in comparison to those in atmosphere respiratory atmospheric alveoli blood blood tissues gas air deoxygenated oxygenated O2, 159, 104, 40, 95, 40, CO2 0.340 40 40 40 45. 273 breathing and exchange of gases a gradient is present for CO2 in the opposite direction, that is, from tissues to blood and blood to alveoli. As the solubility of CO2 is 20-25 times higher than that of O2, the amount of CO2 that can diffuse through the diffusion membrane per unit difference in partial pressure is much higher compared to that of O2. The diffusion membrane is made up of three major layers figure 17.4 namely, the thin squamous epithelium of alveoli, the endothelium of alveolar capillaries and the basement substance in between them. However, its total thickness is much less than a millimeter, therefore, all the factors in our body are favorable for diffusion of O2 from alveoli to tissues and that of CO2 from tissues to alveoli. 
air alveolar wall 1 celled thick red blood cell blood capillary basement substance alveolar cavity figure 17.4 a diagram of a section of an alveolus with a pulmonary capillary figure 17.3 diagrammatic representation of exchange of gases at the alveolus in the body tissues with blood and transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide 17.4 Transport of gases Blood is the medium of transport for O2 and CO2. About 97% of O2 is transported by RBCs in the blood. The remaining 3% of O2 is carried in a dissolved state through the plasma. Nearly 20-25% of CO2 is transported by RBCs whereas 70% of it is carried as bicarbonate. About 7% of CO2 is carried in a dissolved state through plasma 1-7-4. One transport of oxygen hemoglobin is a red-colored iron-containing pigment present in the RBCs. O2 can bind with hemoglobin in a reversible manner to form oxyhemoglobin. Each hemoglobin molecule can carry a maximum of four molecules of O2. Binding of oxygen with hemoglobin is primarily related to partial pressure of O2, partial pressure of CO2, hydrogen ion concentration and temperature are the other factors which can interfere with this binding. A sigmoid curve is obtained when percentage saturation of hemoglobin with O2 is plotted against the PO2. This curve is called the oxygen dissociation curve figure 17.5 and is highly useful in studying the effect of factors like PCO2, H concentration, etc., on binding of O2 with hemoglobin. In the alveoli, where there is hypo2, low PCO2, lesser H concentration and lower temperature, the factors are all favorable for the formation of oxyhemoglobin. Whereas in the tissues, where low PO2, high PCO2, High H concentration and higher temperature exist. The conditions are favorable for dissociation of oxygen from the oxyhemoglobin. This clearly indicates that O2 gets bound to hemoglobin in the lung surface and gets dissociated at the tissues. Every 100 milliliters of oxygenated blood can deliver around 5 milliliters of O2 to the tissues under normal physiological conditions. 1 7 4 2 Transport of carbon dioxide CO2 is carried by hemoglobin as carbaminohemoglobin about 20-25%. This binding is related to the partial pressure of CO2. PO2 is a major factor which could affect this binding. When PCO2 is high and PO2 is low as in the tissues, more binding of carbon dioxide occurs whereas when the PCO2 is low and PO2 is high as in the alveoli, dissociation 20 0 20 40 40 60 60 80 80 100 100 partial pressure of oxygen MMHG percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen figure 17.5 oxygen dissociation curve of CO2 from carbaminohemoglobin takes place, that is, CO2 which is bound to hemoglobin from the tissues is delivered at the alveoli. RBCs contain a very high concentration of the enzyme, carbonic anhydrase and minute quantities of the same is present in the plasma too. This enzyme facilitates the following reaction in both directions, COHOHCO carbonic anhydrase carbonic anhydra 2223SOHCOH3 at the tissue site where partial pressure of CO2 is high due to catabolism. CO2 diffuses into blood RBCs and plasma and forms HCO3 and H, at the alveolar site where PCO2 is low. The reaction proceeds in the opposite direction leading to the formation of CO2 and H2O, thus, CO2 trapped as bicarbonate at the tissue level and transported to the alveoli is released out as CO2 figure 17.4. Every 100 milliliters of deoxygenated blood delivers approximately 4 milliliters of CO2 to the alveoli 17.5 regulation of respiration human beings have a significant ability to maintain and moderate the respiratory rhythm to suit the demands of the body tissues. This is done by the neural system, a specialized center present in the medulla region of the brain called respiratory rhythm center is primarily responsible for this regulation. Another center present in the pons region of the brain called pneumotaxic center can moderate the functions of the respiratory rhythm center. Neural signal from this center can reduce the duration of inspiration and thereby alter the respiratory rate. A chemosensitive area is situated adjacent to the rhythm center which is highly sensitive to CO2 and hydrogen ions. Increase in these substances can activate this center, which in turn can signal the rhythm center to make necessary adjustments in the respiratory process by which these substances can be eliminated. Receptors associated with aortic arch and carotid artery also can recognize changes in CO2 and H concentration and send necessary signals to the rhythm center for remedial actions. The role of oxygen in the regulation of respiratory rhythm is quite insignificant. 17.6 Disorders of respiratory system asthma is a difficulty in breathing causing wheezing due to inflammation of bronchi and bronchioles. Emphysema is a chronic disorder in which alveolar walls are damaged due to which respiratory surface is decreased. One of the major causes of this is cigarette smoking. Summary cells utilize oxygen for metabolism and produce energy along with substances like carbon dioxide which is harmful. 
Animals have evolved different mechanisms for the transport of oxygen to the cells and for the removal of carbon dioxide from there. We have a well-developed respiratory system comprising two lungs and associated air passages to perform this function. The first step in respiration is breathing by which atmospheric air is taken in inspiration and the alveolar air is released out expiration. Exchange of O2 and CO2 between deoxygenated blood and alveoli, transport of these gases throughout the body by blood. Exchange of O2 and CO2 between the oxygenated blood and tissues and utilization of O2 by the cell cellular respiration are the other steps involved. Inspiration and expiration are carried out by creating pressure gradients between the atmosphere and the alveoli with the help of specialized muscles, intercostals and diaphragm. Volumes of air involved in these activities can be estimated with the help of spirometer and are of clinical significance. Exchange of O2 and CO2 at the alveoli and tissues occur by diffusion. Rate of diffusion is dependent on the partial pressure gradients of O2 PO2 and CO2 PCO2, their solubility as well as the thickness of the diffusion surface. These factors in our body facilitate diffusion of O2 from the alveoli to the deoxygenated blood as well as from the oxygenated blood to the tissues. The factors are favorable for the diffusion of CO2 in the opposite direction, that is, from tissues to alveoli. Oxygen is transported mainly as oxyhemoglobin. In the alveoli where PO2 is higher, O2 gets bound to hemoglobin which is easily dissociated at the tissues where PO2 is low and PCO2 and H concentration are high. Nearly 70% of carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate HCO3 with the help of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. 20-25% of carbon dioxide is carried by hemoglobin as carbaminohemoglobin. In the tissues where PCO2 is high, it gets bound to blood whereas in the alveoli where PCO2 is low and PO2 is high, it gets removed from the blood. Respiratory rhythm is maintained by the respiratory center in the medulla region of brain, a pneumotaxic center in the pons region of the brain and a chemosensitive area in the medulla can alter respiratory mechanism. Occupational respiratory disorders, in certain industries, especially those involving grinding or stone breaking, so much dust is produced that the defense mechanism of a body cannot fully cope with the situation. Long exposure can give rise to inflammation leading to fibrosis proliferation of fibrous tissues and thus causing serious lung damage. Workers in such industries should wear protective masks. Exercise is 1. Define vital capacity. What is its significance? 2. State the volume of air remaining in the lungs after a normal breathing. 3. Diffusion of gases occurs in the alveolar region only and not in the other parts of respiratory system. Why 4. What are the major transport mechanisms for CO2? Explain 5. What will be the PO2 and PCO2 in the atmospheric air compared to those in the alveolar air? I PO2 lesser. PCO2 higher 2 PO2 higher, PCO2 lesser 3 PO2 higher, PCO2 higher I PO2 lesser, PCO2 lesser 6. Explain the process of inspiration under normal conditions 7. How is respiration regulated 8? What is the effect of PCO2 on oxygen transport 9? What happens to the respiratory process in a man going up a hill 10? What is the side of gaseous exchange in an insect 11? Define oxygen dissociation curve. Can you suggest any reason for its sigmoidal pattern 12? Have you heard about hypoxia? Try to gather information about it, and discuss with your friends. 13. Distinguish between IRV and IRV B inspiratory capacity and expiratory capacity C vital capacity and total lung capacity. 14. What is tidal volume? Find out the tidal volume approximate value for a healthy human in an hour. 2018 1. 278 Biology You have learned that all living cells have to be provided with nutrients, O2 and other essential substances. Also, the waste or harmful substances produced, have to be removed continuously for healthy functioning of tissues. It is therefore, essential to have efficient mechanisms for the movement of these substances to the cells and from the cells. Different groups of animals have evolved different methods for this transport. Simple organisms like sponges and coal enter its circulate water from their surroundings through their body cavities to facilitate the cells to exchange these substances. More complex organisms use special fluids within their bodies to transport such materials. Blood is the most commonly used body fluid by most of the higher organisms including humans for this purpose. Another body fluid, lymph, also helps in the transport of certain substances. In this chapter, you will learn about the composition and properties of blood and lymph tissue fluid and the mechanism of circulation of blood is also explained herein. 18.1 Blood Blood is a special connective tissue consisting of a fluid matrix, plasma, and formed elements. 1 8 1 1 Plasma Plasma is a straw-colored, viscous fluid constituting nearly 55% of the blood. 90-92% of plasma is water and proteins contribute 6-8% of it. Fibrinogen, globulins and albumins are the major proteins. 
Body fluids and circulation chapter 18 18.1 blood 18.2 lymph tissue fluid 18.3 circulatory pathways 18.4 double circulation 18.5 regulation of cardiac activity 18.6 disorders of circulatory system. Fibrinogens are needed for clotting or coagulation of blood. Globulins primarily are involved in defense mechanisms of the body and the albumins help in osmotic balance. Plasma also contains small amounts of minerals like Na, Ka, Mg, HCO3, Cl, etc. Glucose, amino acids, lipids, etc. are also present in the plasma as they are always in transit in the body. Factors for coagulation or clotting of blood are also present in the plasma in an inactive form. Plasma without the clotting factors is called serum. 1 8 1 2 formed elements erythrocytes leukocytes and platelets are collectively called formed elements figure 18.1 and they constitute nearly 45 percent of the blood erythrocytes or red blood cells rbc are the most abundant of all the cells in blood a healthy adult man has on an average 5 millions to 5.5 millions of rbc's mm3 of blood rbc's are formed in the red bone marrow in the adults rbc's are devoid of nucleus in most of the mammals and are biconcave in shape they have a red-colored, iron-containing complex protein called hemoglobin, hence the color and name of these cells. A healthy individual has 12-16 GMS of hemoglobin in every 100 milliliters of blood. These molecules play a significant role in transport of respiratory gases. RBCs have an average lifespan of 120 days after which they are destroyed in the spleen graveyard of RBCs. Leukocytes are also known as white blood cells WBC as they are colorless due to the lack of hemoglobin. They are nucleated and are relatively lesser in number which averages 6,000-8,000 mm3 of blood. Leukocytes are generally short-lived. We have two main categories of WBCs granulocytes and agranulocytes. Neutrophils, eosinophils and basophils are different types of granulocytes, while lymphocytes and monocytes are the agranulocytes. Neutrophils are the most abundant cells 60-65% of the total WBCs and basophils are the least 0.51% among them. Neutrophils and monocytes 6-8% are phagocytic cells which destroy foreign organisms entering the body. Basophils secrete histamine, serotonin, heparin, etc., and are involved in inflammatory reactions. Eosinophils 2-3% resist infections and are also RBC platelets eosinophil basophil neutrophil monocyte T lymphocyte B lymphocyte. Associated with allergic reactions, lymphocytes 20-25% are of two major types B and T forms. Both B and T lymphocytes are responsible for immune responses of the body. Platelets also called thrombocytes, are cell fragments produced from megakaryocytes special cells in the bone marrow. Blood normally contains 1, 500, 003, 500, 00 platelets MM3. Platelets can release a variety of substances most of which are involved in the coagulation or clotting of blood. A reduction in their number can lead to clotting disorders which will lead to excessive loss of blood from the body. 1 8 1 3 blood groups as you know blood of human beings differ in certain aspects though it appears to be similar various types of grouping of blood has been done two such groupings the avo and rh are widely used all over the world 1 8 1 3 1 avo grouping avo grouping is based on the presence or absence of two surface antigens chemicals that can induce immune response on the rbc's namely a and b similarly the plasma of different individuals contain two natural antibodies proteins produced in response to antigens the distribution of antigens and antibodies in the four groups of blood, A, B, AB and O are given in Table 18.1. You probably know that during blood transfusion, any blood cannot be used. The blood of a donor has to be carefully matched with the blood of a recipient before any blood transfusion to avoid severe problems of clumping destruction of RBC. The donor's compatibility is also shown in the Table 18.1. Blood group antigens on antibodies donors group RBCs in plasma AA anti BA. OBB anti AB. O A B A B nil A B A B O O nil anti A B O table 18.1 blood groups and donor compatibility from the above mentioned table it is evident that group O blood can be donated to persons with any other blood group and hence O group individuals are called universal donors. Persons with A B group can accept blood from persons with A B as well as the other groups of blood. Therefore, such persons are called universal recipients. 1 8 1 3 2 RH grouping another antigen, the RH antigen similar to one present in rhesus monkeys hence RH, is also observed on the surface of RBCs of majority nearly 80% of humans. Such individuals are called RH positive RH VEP and those in whom this antigen is absent are called RH negative RH VEP. An RH VEP person, if exposed to RH VEP blood, will form specific antibodies against the RH antigens. 
Therefore, RH groups should also be matched before transfusions. A special case of RH incompatibility mismatching has been observed between the RH febloid of a pregnant mother with RH febloid of the fetus. RH antigens of the fetus do not get exposed to the RH febloid of the mother in the first pregnancy as the two bloods are well separated by the placenta. However, during the delivery of the first child, there is a possibility of exposure of the maternal blood to small amounts of the RH V blood from the fetus. In such cases, the mother starts preparing antibodies against RH antigen in her blood. In case of her subsequent pregnancies, the RH antibodies from the mother RH V can leak into the blood of the fetus RH V and destroy the fetal RBCs. This could be fatal to the fetus or could cause severe anemia and jaundice to the baby. This condition is called erythroblastosis photolysis. This can be avoided by administering anti-RH antibodies to the mother immediately after the delivery of the first child. 1 8 1 For coagulation of blood you know that when you cut your finger or hurt yourself, your wound does not continue to bleed for a long time, usually the blood stops flowing after some time. Do you know why blood exhibits coagulation or clotting in response to an injury or trauma? This is a mechanism to prevent excessive loss of blood from the body. You would have observed a dark reddish-brown scum formed at the site of a cut or an injury over a period of time. It is a clot or coagulum formed mainly of a network of threads called fibrins in which dead and damaged formed elements of blood are trapped. Fibrins are formed by the conversion of inactive fibrinogens in the plasma by the enzyme thrombin. Thrombins, in turn are formed from another inactive substance present in the plasma called prothrombin. An enzyme complex, thrombokinase, is required for the above reaction. This complex is formed by a series of linked enzymic reactions cascade process involving a number of factors present in the plasma in an inactive state. An injury or a trauma stimulates the platelets in the blood to release certain factors which activate the mechanism of coagulation. Certain factors released by the tissues at the site of injury also can initiate coagulation. Calcium ions play a very important role in clotting. 18.2 Lymph tissue fluid as the blood passes through the capillaries in tissues. Some water along with many small water-soluble substances move out into the spaces between the cells of tissues leaving the larger proteins and most of the formed elements in the blood vessels. This fluid released out is called the interstitial fluid or tissue fluid. It has the same mineral distribution as that in plasma. Exchange of nutrients, gases, etc. between the blood and the cells always occur through this fluid. An elaborate network of vessels called the lymphatic system collects this fluid and drains it back to the major veins. The fluid present in the lymphatic system is called the lymph. Lymph is a colorless fluid containing specialized lymphocytes which are responsible for the immune responses of the body. Lymph is also an important carrier for nutrients, hormones, etc. Fats are absorbed through lymph in the lacteals present in the intestinal villi. 18.3 Circulatory Pathways The circulatory patterns are of two types, open or closed. Open circulatory system is present in orthropods and mollusks in which blood pumped by the heart passes through large vessels into open spaces or body cavities called sinuses. Annelids and chordates have a closed circulatory system in which the blood pumped by the heart is always circulated through a closed network of blood vessels. This pattern is considered to be more advantageous as the flow of fluid can be more precisely regulated. All vertebrates possess a muscular chambered heart. Fishes have a two-chambered heart with an atrium and a ventricle. Amphibians and the reptiles except crocodiles have a three-chambered heart with two atria and a single ventricle. Whereas crocodiles, birds and mammals possess a four-chambered heart with two atria and two ventricles. In fishes the heart pumps out deoxygenated blood which is oxygenated by the gills and supplied to the body parts from where deoxygenated blood is returned to the heart single circulation. In amphibians and reptiles, the left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the gills lung skin and the right atrium gets the deoxygenated blood from other body parts. However, they get mixed up in the single ventricle which pumps out mixed blood in complete double circulation. In birds and mammals, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood received by the left and right atria respectively passes on to the ventricles of the same sides. The ventricles pump it out without any mixing up, that is, two separate circulatory pathways are present in these organisms, hence, these animals have double circulation. Let us study the human circulatory system. 1 8 3 1 Human circulatory system Human circulatory system, also called the blood vascular system consists of a muscular chambered heart, a network of closed branching blood vessels and blood, the fluid which is circulated. Heart, the mesodermally derived organ, is situated in the thoracic cavity, in between the two lungs, slightly tilted to the left. It has the size of a clenched fist. It is protected by a double-walled membranous bag, pericardium, enclosing a pericardial fluid. Our heart has four chambers, two relatively small upper chambers called atria and two larger lower chambers called ventricles. 
A thin, muscular wall called the interatrial septum separates the right and the left atria, whereas a thick wall, the interventricular septum, separates the left and the right ventricles figure 18.2. The atrium and the ventricle of the same side are also separated by a thick fibrous tissue called the atrioventricular septum. However, each of these septa are provided with an opening through which the two chambers of the same side are connected. The opening between the right atrium and the right ventricle is guarded by a valve formed of three muscular flaps or cusps. The tricuspid valve, whereas a bicuspid or mitral valve guards the opening between the left atrium and the left ventricle. The openings of the right and the left ventricles into the figure 18.2 section of a human heart. Pulmonary artery and the aorta respectively are provided with the semilunar valves. The valves in the heart allows the flow of blood only in one direction, that is, from the atria to the ventricles and from the ventricles to the pulmonary artery or aorta. These valves prevent any backward flow. The entire heart is made of cardiac muscles. The walls of ventricles are much thicker than that of the atria. A specialized cardiac musculature called the nodal tissue is also distributed in the heart figure 18.2. A patch of this tissue is present in the right upper corner of the right atrium called the sinoatrial node san. Another mass of this tissue is seen in the lower left corner of the right atrium close to the atrioventricular septum called the atrioventricular node AVN. A bundle of nodal fibers. Atrioventricular bundle AV bundle continues from the AVN which passes through the atrioventricular septa to emerge on the top of the interventricular septum and immediately divides into a right and left bundle. These branches give rise to minute fibers throughout the ventricular musculature of the respective sides and are called Purkinje fibers. The nodal musculature has the ability to generate action potentials without any external stimuli, that is, it is auto-excitable. However, the number of action potentials that could be generated in a minute vary at different parts of the nodal system. The SAN can generate the maximum number of action potentials, that is, 70-75 minutes 1, and is responsible for initiating and maintaining the rhythmic contractile activity of the heart. Therefore, it is called a pacemaker. Our heart normally beats 70-75 times in a minute average 72 beats min 1. 1 8, 3, 2 Cardiac Cycle How does the heart function? Let us take a look. To begin with, all the four chambers of heart are in a relaxed state, that is, they are in joint diastole. As the tricuspid and bicuspid valves are open, blood from the pulmonary veins and vena cava flows into the left and the right ventricle respectively through the left and right atria. The semilunar valves are closed at this stage. The SAN now generates an action potential which stimulates both the atria to undergo a simultaneous contraction the atrial systole. This increases the flow of blood into the ventricles by about 30%. The action potential is conducted to the ventricular side by the AVN and AV bundle from where the bundle of is transmits it through the entire ventricular musculature. This causes the ventricular muscles to contract. Ventricular systole, the atria undergoes relaxation diastole, coinciding with the ventricular systole. Ventricular systole increases the ventricular pressure causing the closure of tricuspid and bicuspid valves due to attempted backflow of blood into the atria, as the ventricular pressure increases further. The semilunar valves guarding the pulmonary artery right side and the aorta left side are forced open allowing the blood in the ventricles to flow through these vessels into the circulatory pathways. The ventricles now relax ventricular diastole and the ventricular pressure falls causing the closure of semilunar valves which prevent the backflow of blood into the ventricles. As the ventricular pressure declines further, the tricuspid and bicuspid valves are pushed open by the pressure in the atria exerted by the blood which was being emptied into them by the veins. The blood now once again moves freely to the ventricles. The ventricles and atria are now again in a relaxed joint diastole state, as earlier. Soon the sand generates a new action potential and the events described above are repeated in that sequence and the process continues. This sequential event in the heart which is cyclically repeated is called the cardiac cycle and it consists of systole and diastole of both the atria and ventricles. As mentioned earlier, the heart beats 72 times per minute, that is, that many cardiac cycles are performed per minute. From this it could be deduced that the duration of a cardiac cycle is 0.8 seconds. During a cardiac cycle, each ventricle pumps out approximately 70 milliliters of blood which is called the stroke volume. The stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate no of beats per minimum, gives the cardiac output. Therefore, the cardiac output can be defined as the volume of blood pumped out by each ventricle per minute and averages 5,000 milliliters or 5 liters in a healthy individual. The body has the ability to alter the stroke volume as well as the heart rate and thereby the cardiac output. For example, the cardiac output of an athlete will be much higher than that of an ordinary man. During each cardiac cycle two prominent sounds are produced which can be easily heard through a stethoscope. 
The first heart sound lub is associated with the closure of the tricuspid and bicuspid valves whereas the second heart sound lub is associated with the closure of the semilunar valves. These sounds are of clinical diagnostic significance. 1 8 3 3 Electrocardiography CG You are probably familiar with this scene from a typical hospital television show. A patient is hooked up to a monitoring machine that shows voltage traces on a screen and makes the sound. Pip, 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 P as the patient goes into cardiac arrest. This type of machine electrocardiograph is used to obtain an electrocardiogram ECG. ECG is a graphical representation of the electrical activity of the heart during a cardiac cycle. To obtain a standard ECG as shown in the Figure 18.3, a patient is connected to the machine with three electrical leads one to each wrist and to the left ankle that continuously monitor the heart activity. For a detailed evaluation of the heart's function, multiple leads are attached to the chest region. Here, we will talk only about a standard ECG. Each peak in the ECG is identified with a letter from P to T that corresponds to a specific electrical activity of the heart. The P wave represents the electrical excitation or depolarization of the atria, which leads to the contraction of both the atria. The QRS complex represents the depolarization of the ventricles, which initiates the ventricular contraction. The contraction starts shortly after Q and marks the beginning of the systole. The D wave represents the return of the ventricles from excited to normal state repolarization. The end of the T wave marks the end of systole, obviously, by counting the number of QRS complexes that occur in a given time period. One can determine the heartbeat rate of an individual. Since the ECGs obtained from different individuals have roughly the same shape for a given lead configuration, any deviation from this shape indicates a possible abnormality or disease. Hence, it is of a great clinical significance 18.4 double circulation the blood flows strictly by a fixed route through blood vessels the arteries and veins. Basically, each artery and vein consists of three layers, an inner lining of squamous endothelium, the tunica intima, a middle layer of smooth muscle and elastic fibers, the tunica media, and an external layer of fibrous connective tissue with collagen fibers, the tunica externa. The tunica media is comparatively thin in the veins figure 18.4. As mentioned earlier, the blood pumped by the right ventricle enters the pulmonary artery, whereas the left ventricle pumps blood into the aorta. The deoxygenated blood pumped into the pulmonary artery is passed on to the lungs from where the oxygenated blood is carried by the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. This pathway constitutes the pulmonary circulation. The oxygenated blood entering the aorta is carried by a network of arteries, arterioles and capillaries to the tissues from where the deoxygenated blood is collected by a system of venules, veins and vena cava and emptied into the right atrium. This is the systemic circulation figure 18.4. The systemic circulation provides nutrients, O2 and other essential substances to the tissues and takes CO2 and other harmful substances away for elimination. A unique vascular connection exists between the digestive tract and liver called figure 18.3 diagrammatic presentation of a standard ECG. Hepatic portal system. The hepatic portal vein carries blood from intestine to the liver before it is delivered to the systemic circulation. A special coronary system of blood vessels is present in our body exclusively for the circulation of blood to and from the cardiac musculature. 18.5 Regulation of cardiac activity Normal activities of the heart are regulated intrinsically, that is, auto-regulated by specialized muscles nodal tissue, hence the heart is called myogenic. A special neural center in the medulla oblongata can moderate the cardiac function through autonomic nervous system ANS. Neural signals through the sympathetic nerves part of ANS can increase the rate of heartbeat, the strength of ventricular contraction and thereby the cardiac output. On the other hand, parasympathetic neural signals another component of ANS decrease the rate of heartbeat, speed of conduction of action potential and thereby the cardiac output. Adrenal metal airy hormones can also increase the cardiac output 18.6 Disorders of circulatory system High blood pressure hypertension Hypertension is the term for blood pressure that is higher than normal 120-80. In this measurement 120 mm Hg mm of mercury pressure is the systolic, or pumping, pressure and 80 mm Hg is the diastolic, or resting, pressure. If repeated checks of blood pressure of an individual is 140 90 140 over 90 or figure 18.4 schematic plan of blood circulation in human. Higher, it shows hypertension, high blood pressure leads to heart diseases and also affects vital organs like brain and kidney. Coronary artery disease CAD Coronary artery disease, often referred to as atherosclerosis, affects the vessels that supply blood to the heart muscle. It is caused by deposits of calcium, fat, cholesterol and fibrous tissues, which makes the lumen of arteries narrower. 
angina. It is also called angina pectoris. A symptom of acute chest pain appears when no enough oxygen is reaching the heart muscle. Angina can occur in men and women of any age but it is more common among the middle-aged than the elderly. It occurs due to conditions that affect the blood flow, heart failure. Heart failure means the state of heart when it is not pumping blood effectively enough to meet the needs of the body. It is sometimes called congestive heart failure because congestion of the lungs is one of the main symptoms of this disease. Heart failure is not the same as cardiac arrest when the heart stops beating or a heart attack when the heart muscle is suddenly damaged by an inadequate blood supply. Summary vertebrates circulate blood, a fluid connective tissue, in their body, to transport essential substances to the cells and to carry waste substances from there. Another fluid, lymph tissue fluid is also used for the transport of certain substances. Blood comprises of a fluid matrix, plasma and formed elements. Red blood cells RBCs, erythrocytes, white blood cells WBCs, leukocytes and platelets thrombocytes constitute the formed elements. Blood of humans are grouped into A, B, AB and O systems based on the presence or absence of two surface antigens, A, B on the RBCs. Another blood grouping is also done based on the presence or absence of another antigen called rhesus factor RH on the surface of RBCs. The spaces between cells in the tissues contain a fluid derived from blood called tissue fluid. This fluid called lymph is almost similar to blood except for the protein content and the formed elements. All vertebrates and a few invertebrates have a closed circulatory system. Our circulatory system consists of a muscular pumping organ, heart, a network of vessels and a fluid, blood. Heart has two atria and two ventricles. Cardiac musculature is auto-excitable. Sinoatrial node sand generates the maximum number of action potentials per minute 70-75 minutes and therefore, it sets the pace of the activities of the heart. Hence it is called the pacemaker. The action potential causes the atria and then the ventricles to undergo contraction systole followed by the relaxation diastole. The systole forces the blood to move from the atria to the ventricles and to the pulmonary artery and the aorta. The cardiac cycle is formed by sequential events in the heart which is cyclically repeated and is called the cardiac cycle. A healthy person shows 72 such cycles per minute. About 70 milliliters of blood is pumped out by each ventricle during a cardiac cycle and it is called the stroke or beat volume. Volume of blood pumped out by each ventricle of heart per minute is called the cardiac output and it is equal to the product of stroke volume and heart rate approx 5 liters. The electrical activity of the heart can be recorded from the body surface by using electrocardiograph and the recording is called electrocardiogram ECG which is of clinical importance. We have a complete double circulation, that is, two circulatory pathways, namely, pulmonary and systemic are present. The pulmonary circulation starts by the pumping of deoxygenated blood by the right ventricle which is carried to the lungs where it is oxygenated and returned to the left atrium. The systemic circulation starts with the pumping of oxygenated blood by the left ventricle to the aorta which is carried to all the body tissues and the deoxygenated blood from there is collected by the veins and returned to the right atrium. Though the heart is auto-excitable, its functions can be moderated by neural and hormonal mechanisms. Exercise is one. Name the components of the formed elements in the blood and mention one major function of each of them. 2. What is the importance of plasma proteins? 3. Match column I with column 2. Column I column 2 eosinophils I coagulation BRBC2 universal recipient CAB group 3 resist infections D platelets I contraction of heart E sisterly B gas transport 4. Why do we consider blood as a connective tissue? 5. What is the difference between lymph and blood? 6. What is meant by double circulation? What is its significance? 7. Write the differences between a blood and lymph B open and closed system of circulation C systole and diastole DP wave and T wave 8. Describe the evolutionary change in the pattern of heart among the vertebrates 9. Why do we call our heart myogenic 10? Sinoatrial node is called the pacemaker of our heart. Why 11? What is the significance of atrioventricular node and atrioventricular bundle in the functioning of heart 12? Define a cardiac cycle and the cardiac output 13. Explain heart sounds 14. Draw a standard ECG and explain the different segments in it. 290 biology animals accumulate ammonia, urea, uric acid carbon dioxide, water and ions like Na, K, Cl, phosphate, sulfate, etc., either by metabolic activities or by other means like excess ingestion. These substances have to be removed totally or partially. In this chapter, you will learn the mechanisms of elimination of these substances with special emphasis on common nitrogenous wastes. Ammonia, urea and uric acid are the major forms of nitrogenous wastes excreted by the animals. Ammonia is the most toxic form and requires large amount of water for its elimination, whereas uric acid, being the least toxic, can be removed with a minimum loss of water. 
The process of excreting ammonia is ammonitalism. Many bony fishes, aquatic amphibians and aquatic insects are ammonitelic in nature. Ammonia, as it is readily soluble, is generally excreted by diffusion across body surfaces or through gill surfaces in fish as ammonium ions. Kidneys do not play any significant role in its removal. Terrestrial adaptation necessitated the production of lesser toxic nitrogenous wastes like urea and uric acid for conservation of water. Mammals. Many terrestrial amphibians and marine fishes mainly excrete urea and are called ureotelic animals. Ammonia produced by metabolism is converted into urea in the liver of these animals and released into the blood which is filtered and excreted out by the kidneys. Some amount of urea may be retained in the kidney matrix of some of these animals to maintain a desired osmolarity. Reptiles, birds, land snails and insects excrete nitrogenous wastes as uric acid in the form of pellet or paste with a minimum loss of water and are called uricotelic animals. Excretory products and their elimination chapter 19 19.1 Human excretory system 19.2 Urine formation 19.3 Function of the tubules 19.4 Mechanism of concentration of the filtrate 19.5 Regulation of kidney function 19.6 Maturation 19.7 Role of other organs in excretion 19.8 Disorders of the excretory system a survey of animal kingdom presents a variety of excretory structures. In most of the invertebrates, these structures are simple tubular forms whereas vertebrates have complex tubular organs called kidneys. Some of these structures are mentioned here. Protonephridia or flame cells are the excretory structures in platyhelminthes flatworms, e.g., planaria, rotifers, some annelids and the cephalochordate, amphioxus. Protonephridia are primarily concerned with ionic and fluid volume regulation, that is, osmoregulation. Nephridia are the tubular excretory structures of earthworms and other annelids. Nephridia help to remove nitrogenous wastes and maintain a fluid and ionic balance. Malpigian tubules are the excretory structures of most of the insects including cockroaches. Malpigian tubules help in the removal of nitrogenous wastes and osmoregulation. Antennal glands are green glands perform the excretory function in crustaceans like prawns 19.1 Human excretory system in humans. The excretory system consists of a pair of kidneys, one pair of ureters, a urinary bladder and a urethra figure 19.1. Kidneys are reddish-brown, bean-shaped structures situated between the levels of last thoracic and third lumbar vertebra close to the dorsal inner wall of the abdominal cavity. Each kidney of an adult human measures 10-12 cm in length. 5-7 cm in width, 2-3 cm in thickness with an average weight of 120-170 grams. Towards the center of the inner concave surface of the kidney is a notch called hilum through which ureter, blood vessels and nerve center. Inner to the hilum is a broad funnel-shaped space called the renal pelvis with projections called calyces. The outer layer of kidney is a tough capsule. Inside the kidney, there are two zones, an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The medulla is divided into a few conical masses medullary pyramids projecting into the calyx sing, calyx. The cortex extends in between the figure 19.1 human urinary system. Figure 19.3 A diagrammatic representation of a nephron showing blood vessels, duct and tubule medullary pyramids as renal columns called columns of Bertini figure 19.2. Each kidney has nearly 1 million complex tubular structures called nephrons figure 19.3, which are the functional units. Each nephron has two parts, the glomerulus and the renal tubule. Glomerulus is a tuft of capillaries formed by the afferent arteriola fine branch of renal artery. Blood from the glomerulus is carried away by an afferent arteriole. The renal tubule begins with a double-walled cup-like structure called Bowman's capsule, which encloses the glomerulus. Glomerulus along with Bowman's capsule, is called the Malpighian body or renal corpuscle figure 19.4. The tubule continues further to form a highly coiled network proximal convoluted tubule figure 19.2 longitudinal section diagrammatic of kidney. PCT, a hairpin shaped tennis loop is the next part of the tubule which has a descending and an ascending limb. The ascending limb continues as another highly coiled tubular region called distal convoluted tubule DCT. The DCTs of many nephrons open into a straight tube called collecting duct, many of which converge and open into the renal pelvis through medullary pyramids in the calyces. The Malpighian corpuscle, PCT and DCT of the nephron are situated in the cortical region of the kidney whereas the loop of henal dips into the medulla. In majority of nephrons, the loop of henal is too short and extends only very little into the medulla. Such nephrons are called cortical nephrons. In some of the nephrons, the loop of henal is very long and runs deep into the medulla. These nephrons are called juxtamedullary nephrons. The efferent arteriole emerging from the glomerulus forms a fine capillary network around the renal tubule called the peritubular capillaries. 
a minute vessel of this network runs parallel to the Hennel's loop forming a U-shaped vasa recta. Vasa recta is absent or highly reduced in cortical nephrons 19.2 urine formation Urine formation involves three main processes namely, glomerular filtration, reabsorption and secretion, that takes place in different parts of the nephron. The first step in urine formation is the filtration of blood, which is carried out by the glomerulus and is called glomerular filtration. On an average, 1100-1200 ml of blood is filtered by the kidneys per minute which constitute roughly one-fifth of the blood pumped out by each ventricle of the heart in a minute. The glomerular capillary blood pressure causes filtration of blood through three layers, that is, the endothelium of glomerular blood vessels, the epithelium of Bowman's capsule and a basement membrane between these two layers. The epithelial cells of Bowman's capsule called podocytes are arranged in an intricate manner so as to leave some minute spaces called filtration slits or slit powers. Blood is filtered so finely through these membranes, that almost all the constituents of the plasma except the proteins pass on to the lumen of the Bowman's capsule. Therefore, it is considered as a process of ultrafiltration. Afferent arterial efferent arterial Bowman's capsule proximal convoluted tubule figure 19.4 Malpighian body renal corpuscle. The amount of the filtrate formed by the kidneys per minute is called glomerular filtration rate GFR. GFR in a healthy individual is approximately 125 milliliters minute, that is, 180 liters per day. The kidneys have built-in mechanisms for the regulation of glomerular filtration rate. One such efficient mechanism is carried out by juxtaglomerular apparatus JGA. JGA is a special sensitive region formed by cellular modifications in the distal convoluted tubule and the afferent arteriole at the location of their contact. A fall in GFR can activate the JG cells to release renin which can stimulate the glomerular blood flow and thereby the GFR back to normal. A comparison of the volume of the filtrate formed per day 180 liters per day with that of the urine released 1.5 liters. Suggest that nearly 99% of the filtrate has to be reabsorbed by the renal tubules. This process is called reabsorption. The tubular epithelial cells in different segments of nephron perform this either by active or passive mechanisms. For example, substances like glucose, amino acids, Na, etc., in the filtrate are reabsorbed actively whereas the nitrogenous wastes are absorbed by passive transport. Reabsorption of water also occurs passively in the initial segments of the nephron figure 19.5. During urine formation, the tubular cells secrete substances like H, K and ammonia into the filtrate. Tubular secretion is also an important step in urine formation as it helps in the maintenance of ionic and acid-base balance of body fluids. 19.3 Function of the tubules Proximal convoluted tubule PCT PCT is lined by simple cuboidal brush border epithelium which increases the surface area for reabsorption. Nearly all of the essential nutrients, and 70-80% of electrolytes and water are reabsorbed by this segment. PCT also helps to maintain the pH and ionic balance of the body fluids by selective secretion of hydrogen ions, ammonia and potassium ions into the filtrate and by absorption of HCO3 from it. Henel's loop, reabsorption is minimum in its ascending limb, however, this region plays a significant role in the maintenance of high osmolarity of metal airy interstitial fluid. The descending limb of loop of Henel is permeable to water but almost impermeable to electrolytes. This concentrates the filtrate as it moves down. The ascending limb is impermeable to water but allows transport of electrolytes actively or passively. Therefore, as the concentrated filtrate pass upward, it gets diluted due to the passage of electrolytes to the metallary fluid. Distal convoluted tubule DCT, conditional reabsorption of Na and water takes place in this segment. DCT is also capable of reabsorption of HCO3 and selective secretion of hydrogen and potassium ions and NH3 to maintain the pH and sodium-potassium balance in blood. Excretory products and their elimination 295 collecting duct. This long duct extends from the cortex of the kidney to the inner parts of the medulla. Large amounts of water could be reabsorbed from this region to produce a concentrated urine. This segment allows passage of small amounts of urea into the metal area interstitium to keep up the osmolarity. It also plays a role in the maintenance of pH and ionic balance of blood by the selective secretion of H and K ions figure 19.5. 19.4 Mechanism of concentration of the filtrate mammals have the ability to produce a concentrated urine. The Hennel's loop and vasa recta play a significant role in this. The flow of filtrate in the two limbs of Hennel's loop is in opposite directions and thus forms a counter current. The flow of blood through the two limbs of vasa recta is figure 19.5 reabsorption and secretion of major substances at different parts of the nephron arrows indicate direction of movement of materials. Also in a countercurrent pattern, the proximity between the Hennel's loop and vasa recta, as well as the countercurrent in them help in maintaining an increasing osmolarity towards the inner metallary interstitium. 
that is, from 300 m osmol 1 in the cortex to about 1200 m osmol 1 in the inner medulla. This gradient is mainly caused by NaCl and urea. NaCl is transported by the ascending limb of Hennel's loop which is exchanged with the descending limb of Vasa recta. NaCl is returned to the interstitium by the ascending portion of Vasa recta. Similarly, small amounts of urea enter the thin segment of the ascending limb of Hennel's loop which is transported back to the interstitium by the collecting tubule. The above described transport of substances facilitated by the special arrangement of Hennel's loop and Vasa recta is called the countercurrent mechanism figure. 19.6. This mechanism helps to maintain a concentration gradient figure 19.6 diagrammatic representation of a nephron and vasa recta showing countercurrent mechanisms. In the medullary interstitium, presence of such interstitial gradient helps in an easy passage of water from the collecting tubule thereby concentrating the filtrate urine. Human kidneys can produce urine nearly four times concentrated than the initial filtrate form 19.5 regulation of kidney function The functioning of the kidneys is efficiently monitored and regulated by hormonal feedback mechanisms involving the hypothalamus. JGA and to a certain extent, the heart, osmoreceptors in the body are activated by changes in blood volume, body fluid volume and ionic concentration. An excessive loss of fluid from the body can activate these receptors which stimulate the hypothalamus to release antidiuretic hormone ADH or vasopressin from the neurohypothesis. ADH facilitates water reabsorption from latter parts of the tubule, thereby preventing diuresis. An increase in body fluid volume can switch off the osmoreceptors and suppress the ADH release to complete the feedback. ADH can also affect the kidney function by its constrictory effects on blood vessels. This causes an increase in blood pressure. An increase in blood pressure can increase the glomerular blood flow and thereby the GFR. The JGA plays a complex regulatory role. A fall in glomerular blood flow glomerular blood pressure GFR can activate the JG cells to release renin which converts angiotensinogen in blood to angiotensin I and further to angiotensin II. Angiotensin II, being a powerful vasoconstrictor, increases the glomerular blood pressure and thereby GFR. Angiotensin II also activates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Aldosterone causes reabsorption of Na and water from the distal parts of the tubule. This also leads to an increase in blood pressure and GFR. This complex mechanism is generally known as the renin angiotensin mechanism. An increase in blood flow to the atria of the heart can cause the release of atrial natriuretic factor ANF. ANF can cause vasodilation dilation of blood vessels and thereby decrease the blood pressure. ANF mechanism, therefore, acts as a check on the renin angiotensin mechanism. 19.6 Maturation urine formed by the nephrons is ultimately carried to the urinary bladder where it is stored till a voluntary signal is given by the central nervous system CNS. This signal is initiated by the stretching of the urinary bladder as it gets filled with urine. In response, the stretch receptors on the walls of the bladder send signals to the CNS. The CNS passes on motor messages to initiate the contraction of smooth muscles of the bladder and simultaneous relaxation of the urethral sphincter causing the release of urine. The process of release of urine is called micturition and the neural mechanisms causing it is called the micturition reflex. An adult human excretes, on an average, 1 to 1.5 liters of urine per day. The urine formed is a light yellow colored watery fluid which is slightly acidic pH 6.0 and has a characteristic odor. On an average, 25-30 gm of urea is excreted out per day. Various conditions can affect the characteristics of urine. Analysis of urine helps in clinical diagnosis of many metabolic disorders as well as malfunctioning of the kidney. For example, presence of glucose glycosuria and ketone bodies ketonuria in urine are indicative of diabetes mellitus. 19.7 Role of other organs in excretion other than the kidneys, lungs, liver and skin also help in the elimination of excretory wastes. Our lungs remove large amounts of CO2 approximately 200 milliliters minute and also significant quantities of water every day. Liver, the largest gland in our body, secretes bile containing substances like bilirubin, biliverdin, cholesterol, degraded steroid hormones, vitamins and drugs. Most of these substances ultimately pass out along with digestive wastes. The sweat and sebaceous glands in the skin can eliminate certain substances through their secretions. Sweat produced by the sweat glands is a watery fluid containing NaCl, small amounts of urea, lactic acid, etc. Though the primary function of sweat is to facilitate a cooling effect on the body surface, it also helps in the removal of some of the wastes mentioned above. Sebaceous glands eliminate certain substances like sterols, hydrocarbons and waxes through sebum. This secretion provides a protective oily covering for the skin. 
Do you know that small amounts of nitrogenous wastes could be eliminated through saliva? 219.8 Disorders of the excretory system malfunctioning of kidneys can lead to accumulation of urea in blood, a condition called uremia, which is highly harmful and may lead to kidney failure. In such patients, urea can be removed by a process called hemodialysis. During the process of hemodialysis, the blood drained from a convenient artery is pumped into a dialysing unit called artificial kidney. Blood drained from a convenient artery is pumped into a dialysing unit after adding an anticoagulant like heparin. The unit contains a coiled cellophane tube surrounded by a fluid dialysing fluid having the same. Summary Many nitrogen-containing substances, ions, CO2, water, etc., that accumulate in the body have to be eliminated. Nature of nitrogenous wastes formed in their excretion vary among animals, mainly depending on the habitat availability of water. Ammonia, urea and uric acid are the major nitrogenous wastes excreted, protonephridia, nephridia, malpighian tubules, green glands and the kidneys are the common excretory organs in animals. They not only eliminate nitrogenous wastes but also help in the maintenance of ionic and acid-base balance of body fluids. In humans, the excretory system consists of one pair of kidneys, a pair of ureters, a urinary bladder and a urethra. Each kidney has over a million tubular structures called nephrons. Nephron is the functional unit of kidney and has two portions glomerulus and renal tubule. Glomerulus is a tuft of capillaries formed from afferent arterioles, fine branches of renal artery. The renal tubule starts with the double walled Bowman's capsule and is further differentiated into a proximal convoluted tubule PCT, Henle's loop HL and distal convoluted tubule DCT. The DCTs of many nephrons join to a common collecting duct many of which ultimately open into the renal pelvis through the medullary pyramids. The Bowman's capsule encloses the glomerulus to form malpighian or renal corpuscle. Urine formation involves three main processes, that is, filtration, reabsorption and secretion. Filtration is a non-selective process performed by the glomerulus using the glomerular capillary blood pressure. About 1,200 milliliters of blood is filtered by the glomerulus per minute to form 125 milliliters of filtrate in the Bowman's capsule per composition as that of plasma except the nitrogenous wastes. The porous cellophane membranes of the tube allows the passage of molecules based on concentration gradient. As nitrogenous wastes are absent in the dialysing fluid, these substances freely move out, thereby clearing the blood. The clear blood is pumped back to the body through a vein after adding anti-heparin to it. This method is a boon for thousands of uremic patients all over the world. Kidney transplantation is the ultimate method in the correction of acute renal failures kidney failure. A functioning kidney is used in transplantation from a donor, preferably a close relative, to minimize its chances of rejection by the immune system of the host. Modern clinical procedures have increased the success rate of such a complicated technique. Renal calculi, stone or insoluble mass of crystallized salts oxalates, etc. formed within the kidney. Glomerulonephritis, inflammation of glomeruli of kidney. Mina GFR, JGA, a specialized portion of the nephrons, plays a significant role in the regulation of GFR. Nearly 99% reabsorption of the filtrate takes place through different parts of the nephrons. PCT is the major site of reabsorption and selective secretion. HL primarily helps to maintain osmolar gradient 300 m osmol 1 1200 m osmol 1 within the kidney interstitium. DCT and collecting duct allow extensive reabsorption of water and certain electrolytes, which help in osmoregulation. H, K and NH3 could be secreted into the filtrate by the tubules to maintain the ionic balance and pH of body fluids. A countercurrent mechanism operates between the two limbs of the loop of Henle and those of vasorecta capillary parallel to Henle's loop. The filtrate gets concentrated as it moves down the descending limb but is diluted by the ascending limb. Electrolytes and urea are retained in the interstitium by this arrangement. DCT and collecting duct concentrate the filtrate about four times, that is, from 300 m osmol 1 to 1200 m osmol 1, an excellent mechanism of conservation of water. Urine is stored in the urinary bladder till a voluntary signal from CNS carries out its release through urethra, that is, maturation. Skin, lungs and liver also assist in excretion. Exercise is 1. Define glomerular filtration rate GFR 2. Explain the auto-regulatory mechanism of GFR3. Indicate whether the following statements are true or false. A maturation is carried out by a reflex BADH helps in water elimination. Making the urine hypotonic C protein-free fluid is filtered from blood plasma into the Bowman's capsule. d henels loop plays an important role in concentrating the urine. Glucose is actively reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. 4. Give a brief account of the countercurrent mechanism. 5. Describe the role of liver, lungs and skin in excretion. 6. Explain maturation 7. 
Match the items of column I with those of column 2. Column I, column 2 I, monotelism I, bridge B, Bowman's capsule 2, water reabsorption C, micturition 3, bony fish D, urocotelism I, urinary bladder D, ADHV, renal tubule. 8. What is meant by the term osmoregulation 9? Terrestrial animals are generally either ureotelic or urocotelic, not aminotelic. Y10. What is the significance of juxtaglomerular apparatus JGA in kidney function 11? Name the following. A chordate animal having flame cells as excretory structures. The cortical portions projecting between the medullary pyramids in the human kidney see a loop of capillary running parallel to the Henel's loop. 12. Fill in the gaps. A ascending limb of Henel's loop is to water whereas the descending limb is to it. The reabsorption of water from distal parts of the tubules is facilitated by hormone C. Dialysis fluid contain all the constituents as in plasma except. DA healthy adult human excretes on an average GM of urea day 2018 1. 302 Biology movement is one of the significant features of living beings. Animals and plants exhibit a wide range of movements. Streaming of protoplasm in the unicellular organisms like amoeba is a simple form of movement. Movement of cilia, flagella and tentacles are shown by many organisms. Human beings can move limbs, jaws, eyelids, tongue, etc. Some of the movements result in a change of place or location. Such voluntary movements are called locomotion. Walking, running, climbing, flying, swimming are all some forms of locomotory movements. Locomotory structures need not be different from those affecting other types of movements. For example, in paramosium, cilia helps in the movement of food through cytopharynx and in locomotion as well. Hydra can use its tentacles for capturing its prey and also use them for locomotion. We use limbs for changes in body postures and locomotion as well. The above observations suggest that movements and locomotion cannot be studied separately. The two may be linked by stating that all locomotions are movements but all movements are not locomotions. Methods of locomotion performed by animals vary with their habitats and the demand of the situation. However, locomotion is generally for search of food, shelter, mate, suitable breeding grounds, favorable climatic conditions or to escape from enemies predators. 20.1 Types of movement cells of the human body exhibit three main types of movements, namely, amoeboid, ciliary and muscular. Locomotion and movement chapter 2020.1 Types of movement 20.2 Muscle 20.3 Skeletal system 20.4 Joints 20.5 Disorders of muscular and skeletal system. Some specialized cells in our body like macrophages and leukocytes in blood exhibit amoeboid movement. It is affected by pseudopodia formed by the streaming of protoplasmas in amoeba. Cytoskeletal elements like microfilaments are also involved in amoeboid movement. Ciliary movement occurs in most of our internal tubular organs which are lined by ciliated epithelium. The coordinated movements of cilia in the trachea help us in removing dust particles and some of the foreign substances inhaled along with the atmospheric air. Passage of ova through the female reproductive tract is also facilitated by the ciliary movement. Movement of our limbs, jaws, tongue, etc. require muscular movement. The contractile property of muscles are effectively used for locomotion and other movements by human beings and majority of multicellular organisms. Locomotion requires a perfect coordinated activity of muscular, skeletal and neural systems. In this chapter, you will learn about the types of muscles, their structure, mechanism of their contraction and important aspects of the skeletal system. 20.2 Muscle You have studied in Chapter 8 that the cilia and flagella are the outgrowths of the cell membrane. Flagellar movement helps in the swimming of spermatozoa, maintenance of water current in the canal system of sponges and in locomotion of protozoans like euglena. Muscle is a specialized tissue of mesodermal origin. About 40-50% of the body weight of a human adult is contributed by muscles. They have special properties like excitability, contractility, extensibility and elasticity. Muscles have been classified using different criteria, namely location, appearance and nature of regulation of their activities. Based on their location, three types of muscles are identified, skeletal, two visceral and three cardiac. Skeletal muscles are closely associated with the skeletal components of the body. They have a striped appearance under the microscope and hence are called striated muscles. As their activities are under the voluntary control of the nervous system, they are known as voluntary muscles too. They are primarily involved in locomotory actions and changes of body postures. Visceral muscles are located in the inner walls of hollow visceral organs of the body like the alimentary canal, reproductive tract, etc. They do not exhibit any striation and are smooth in appearance, hence, they are called smooth muscles non-striated muscle. Their activities are not under the voluntary control of the nervous system and are therefore known as involuntary muscles. They assist, for example, in the transportation of food through the digestive tract and gametes through the genital tract. 
304 biology muscle fiber is lined by the plasma membrane called sarcolemma enclosing the sarcoplasm. Muscle fiber is a syncytium as the sarcoplasm contains many nuclei. The endoplasmic reticulum, that is, sarcoplasmic reticulum of the muscle fibers is the storehouse of calcium ions. A characteristic feature of the muscle fiber is the presence of a large number of parallelly arranged filaments in the sarcoplasm called myofilaments or myofibrils. Each myofibril has alternate dark and light bands on it. A detailed study of the myofibril has established that the striated appearance is due to the distribution pattern of two important proteins actin and myosin. The light bands contain actin and is called I-band or isotropic band, whereas the dark band called A or anisotropic band contains as the name suggests, cardiac muscles or the muscles of heart. Many cardiac muscle cells assemble in a branching pattern to form a cardiac muscle. Based on appearance, cardiac muscles are striated. They are involuntary in nature as the nervous system does not control their activities directly. Let us examine a skeletal muscle in detail to understand the structure and mechanism of contraction. Each organized skeletal muscle in our body is made of a number of muscle bundles or fascicles held together by a common collagenous connective tissue layer called fascia. Each muscle bundle contains a number of muscle fibers figure 20.1. Each fascicle muscle bundle muscle fiber muscle cell sarcolemma blood capillary figure 20.1 diagrammatic cross-sectional view of a muscle showing muscle bundles and muscle fibers. Myosin. Both the proteins are arranged as rod-like structures, parallel to each other and also to the longitudinal axis of the myofibrils. Actin filaments are thinner as compared to the myosin filaments, hence are commonly called thin and thick filaments respectively. In the center of each eye band is an elastic fiber called Z-line which bisects it. The thin filaments are firmly attached to the Z-line. The thick filaments in the A-band are also held together in the middle of this band by a thin fibrous membrane called M-line. The A and I bands are arranged alternately throughout the length of the myofibrils. The portion of the myofibril between two successive Z-lines is considered as the functional unit of contraction and is called a sarcomere figure 20.2. In a resting state, the edges of thin filaments on either side of the thick filaments partially overlap the free ends of the thick filaments leaving the central part of the thick filaments. This central part of thick filament, not overlapped by thin filaments is called the H-zone. Figure 20.2 Diagrammatic representation of anatomy of a muscle fiber showing a sarcomere B a sarcomere B. 2 0 2 1 Structure of contractile proteins Each actin thin filament is made of two F filamentous actins helically wound to each other. Each F actin is a polymer of monomeric G globular actins, two filaments of another protein. Tropomyosin also run close to the F actins throughout its length. A complex protein troponin is distributed at regular intervals on the tropomyosin. In the resting state a subunit of troponin masks the active binding sites for myosin on the actin filaments figure 20.3 up. Each myosin thick filament is also a polymerized protein. Many monomeric proteins called aromyosins figure 20.3b constitute one thick filament. Each meromyosin has two important parts, a globular head with a short arm and a tail, the former being called the heavy meromyosin hum and the latter, the light meromyosin LMM. The hum component, that is, the head and short arm projects outwards at regular distance and angle from each other from the surface of the polymerized myosin filament and is known as cross arm. The globular head is inactive at passe enzyme and has binding sites for ADP and active sites for actin. Figure 20.3 An actin thin filament B myosin monomer meromyosin actin binding sites at binding sites head cross arm B202 2, 2 mechanism of muscle contraction Mechanism of muscle contraction is best explained by the sliding filament theory which states that contraction of a muscle fiber takes place by the sliding of the thin filaments over the thick filaments. Muscle contraction is initiated by a signal sent by the central nervous system CNS via motor neuron. A motor neuron along with the muscle fibers connected to it constitute a motor unit. The junction between a motor neuron and the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction or motor end plate. A neural signal reaching this junction releases a neurotransmitter acetylcholine which generates an action potential in the sarcolemma. This spreads through the muscle fiber and causes the release of calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. Increase in call level leads to the binding of calcium with the subunit of troponin on actin filaments and thereby remove the masking of active sites for myosin. Utilizing the energy from ADP hydrolysis, the myosin head now binds to the exposed active sites on actin to form a cross bridge figure 20.4. This pulls the attached actin filaments towards the center of A band. The Z line attached to these actins are also pulled inward thereby causing a shortening of the sarcomere, that is, contraction. It is clear from the above steps, that during shortening of the muscle, that is, contraction, 
the I bands get reduced, whereas the A bands retain the length figure 20.5. The myosin, releasing the ADP and P1 goes back to its relaxed state, a new ADP binds and the cross bridge is broken figure 20.4. The ADP is again hydrolyzed by the myosin head in the cycle of cross-bridge formation figure 20.4 stages in cross-bridge formation. Rotation of head and breaking of cross-bridge. 308 biology and breakage is repeated causing further sliding. The process continues till the ions are pumped back to the sarcoplasmic cisternae resulting in the masking of actin filaments. This causes the return of Z-lines back to their original position, that is, relaxation. The reaction time of the fibers can vary in different muscles. Repeated activation of the muscles can lead to the accumulation of lactic acid due to anaerobic breakdown of glycogen in them, causing fatigue. Muscle contains a red-colored oxygen-storing pigment called myoglobin. Myoglobin content is high in some of the muscles which gives a reddish appearance. Such muscles are called the red fibers. These muscles also contain plenty of mitochondria which can utilize the large amount of oxygen stored in them for ADP production. These muscles, therefore, can also be called aerobic muscles. On the other hand, some of the muscles possess very less quantity of myoglobin and therefore, appear pale or whitish. These are the white fibers. Number of mitochondria are also few in them, but the amount of sarcoplasmic reticulum is high. They depend on anaerobic process for energy. Figure 20.5 Sliding filament theory of muscle contraction movement of the thin filaments and the relative size of the I-band and H-zones. 20.3 Skeletal System Skeletal system consists of a framework of bones and a few cartilages. This system has a significant role in movement shown by the body. Imagine chewing food without jaw bones and walking around without the limb bones. Bone and cartilage are specialized connective tissues. The former has a very hard matrix due to calcium salts in it and the latter has slightly pliable matrix due to chondroitin salts. In human beings, this system is made up of 206 bones and a few cartilages. It is grouped into two principal divisions the axial and the appendicular skeleton. Axial skeleton comprises 80 bones distributed along the main axis of the body. The skull, vertebral column, sternum and ribs constitute axial skeleton. The skull figure 20.6 is composed of two sets of bones, cranial and facial, that totals to 22 bones. Cranial bones are eight in number, they form the hard protective outer covering, cranium for the brain. The facial region is made up of 14 skeletal elements which form the front part of the skull. A single U-shaped bone called hyoid is present at the base of the buccal cavity and it is also included in the skull. Each middle ear contains three tiny bones, malleus, incus and stapes, collectively called ear ossicles. The skull region articulates with the superior region of the parietal bone, frontal bone, temporal bone, occipital bone, occipital condyle, sphenoid bone, ethmoid bone, lacrimal bone, nasal bone, zygomatic bone, maxilla, mandible, hyoid bone. Figure 20.6. Diagrammatic view of human skull. Vertebral column with the help of two occipital condyles to condylic skull. Our vertebral column figure 20.7 is formed by 26 serially arranged units called vertebrae and is dorsally placed. It extends from the base of the skull and constitutes the main framework of the trunk. Each vertebra has a central hollow portion neural canal through which the spinal cord passes. First vertebra is the atlas and it articulates with the occipital condyles. The vertebral column is differentiated into cervical 7, thoracic 12, lumbar 5, sacral 1 fused and coccygeal 1 fused regions starting from the skull. The number of cervical vertebrae are 7 in almost all mammals including human beings. The vertebral column protects the spinal cord, supports the head and serves as the point of attachment for the ribs and musculature of the back. Sternum is a flat bone on the ventral midline of thorax. There are 12 pairs of ribs. Each rib is a thin flat bone connected dorsally to the vertebral column and ventrally to the sternum. It has two articulation surfaces on its dorsal end and is hence called bicephalic. First seven pairs of ribs are called true ribs. Dorsally, they are attached to the thoracic vertebrae and ventrally connected to the sternum with the help of hyaline cartilage. The 8th, 9th and 10th pairs of ribs do not articulate directly with the sternum but join the 7th rib with the help of hyaline cartilage. These are called vertebrae chondral falls ribs. Last two pairs 11th and 12th of ribs are not connected ventrally and are therefore called floating ribs. Thoracic vertebrae, ribs and sternum together form the rib cage figure 20.8. The bones of the limbs along with their girdles constitute the appendicular skeleton. Each limb is made of 30 bones. The bones of the hand forelimb are humerus, radius and cervical vertebra intervertebral disc sacrum coccyx thoracic vertebra lumbar vertebra figure 20.7 vertebral column right lateral view figure 20.8 ribs and rib cage. Figure 20.9 right pectoral girdle and upper arm frontal view ulna, carpals wrist bones 8 in number, metacarpals palm bones 5 in number and phalanges digits 14 in number figure 20.9. 
femur thigh bone, the longest bone, tibia and fibula, tarsals ankle bone 7 in number, metatarsals 5 in number and phalanges digits 14 in number are the bones of the legs hind limb figure 20.10. A cup-shaped bone called patella cover the knee ventrally kneecap. Pectoral and pelvic girdle bones help in the articulation of the upper and the lower limbs respectively with the axial skeleton. Each girdle is formed of two halves, each half of pectoral girdle consists of a clavicle and a scapula figure 20.9. Scapula is a large triangular flat bone situated in the dorsal part of the thorax between the second and the seventh ribs. The dorsal, flat, triangular body of scapula has a slightly elevated ridge called the spine which projects as a flat, expanded process called the acromion. The clavicle articulates with this. Below the acromion is a depression called the glenoid cavity which articulates with the head of the humerus to form the shoulder joint. Each clavicle is a long slender bone with two curvatures. This bone is commonly called the collarbone. Pelvic girdle consists of two coxal bones figure 20.10. Each coxal bone is formed by the fusion of three bones, ilium, ischium and pubis. At the point of fusion of the above bones is a cavity called acetabulum to which the thigh bone articulates. The two halves of the pelvic girdle meet ventrally to form the pubic symphysis containing fibrous cartilage. 20.4 Joints Joints are essential for all types of movements involving the bony parts of the body. Locomotory movements are no exception to figure 20.10 right pelvic girdle and lower limb bones frontal view. This, joints are points of contact between bones, or between bones and cartilages. Force generated by the muscles is used to carry out movement through joints, where the joint acts as a fulcrum. The movability at these joints vary depending on different factors. Joints have been classified into three major structural forms, namely, fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial. Fibrous joints do not allow any movement. This type of joint is shown by the flat skull bones which fuse end to end with the help of dense fibrous connective tissues in the form of sutures, to form the cranium. In cartilaginous joints, the bones involved are joined together with the help of cartilages. The joint between the adjacent vertebrae and the vertebral column is of this pattern and it permits limited movements. Synovial joints are characterized by the presence of a fluid-filled synovial cavity between the articulating surfaces of the two bones. Such an arrangement allows considerable movement. These joints help in locomotion and many other movements. Ball and socket joint between humerus and pectoral girdle, hinge joint knee joint, pivot joint between atlas and axis, gliding joint between the carpals and saddle joint between carpal and metacarpal of thumb are some examples. 20.5 Disorders of muscular and skeletal system Myasthenia gravis, autoimmune disorder affecting neuromuscular junction leading to fatigue, weakening and paralysis of skeletal muscle. Muscular dystrophy, progressive degeneration of skeletal muscle mostly due to genetic disorder, tetany, rapid spasms wild contractions in muscle due to low kind body fluid. Arthritis, inflammation of joints, osteoporosis, age-related disorder characterized by decreased bone mass and increased chances of fractures. Decreased levels of estrogen is a common cause. Gout, inflammation of joints due to accumulation of uric acid crystals. Summary movement is an essential feature of all living beings. Protoplasmic streaming, ciliary movements, movements of fins, limbs, wings, etc., are some forms exhibited by animals. A voluntary movement which causes the animal to change its place is called locomotion. Animals move generally in search of food, shelter, mate, breeding ground better climate or to protect themselves. The cells of the human body exhibit amoeboid, ciliary and muscular movements, locomotion and many other movements require coordinated muscular activities. Three types of muscles are present in our body. Skeletal muscles are attached to skeletal elements. They appear striated and are voluntary in nature. Visceral muscles, present in the inner walls of visceral organs are non-striated and involuntary. Cardiac muscles are the muscles of the heart. They are striated, branched and involuntary. Muscles possess excitability, contractility, extensibility and elasticity. Muscle fiber is the anatomical unit of muscle. Each muscle fiber has many parallelly arranged myofibrils. Each myofibril contains many serially arranged units called sarcomere which are the functional units. Each sarcomere has a central A-band made of thick myosin filaments, and two half I-bands made of thin actin filaments on either side of it marked by C-lines. Actin and myosin are polymerized proteins with contractility. The active sites for myosin on resting actin filament are masked by a protein troponin. Myosin head contains ecpase and has ADP binding sites and active sites for actin. A motor neuron carries signals to the muscle fiber which generates an action potential in it. This causes the release of Ca from sarcoplasmic reticulum. Ca activates actin which binds to the myosin head to form a crossbridge. 
These cross bridges pull the actin filaments causing them to slide over the myosin filaments and thereby causing contraction. Car then returned to sarcoplasmic reticulum which inactivate the actin. Cross bridges are broken and the muscles relax. Repeated stimulation of muscles leads to fatigue. Muscles are classified as red and white fibers based primarily on the amount of red colored myoglobin pigment in them. Bones and cartilages constitute our skeletal system. The skeletal system is divisible into axial and appendicular. Skull, vertebral column, ribs and sternum constitute the axial skeleton. Limb bones and girdles form the appendicular skeleton. Three types of joints are formed between bones or between bone and cartilage fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial. Synovial joints allow considerable movements and therefore, play a significant role in locomotion. Exercise is 1. Draw the diagram of a sarcomere of skeletal muscle showing different regions 2. Define sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. 3. Describe the important steps in muscle contraction. 4. Write true or false. If false change the statement so that it is true actin is present in thin filament pH zone of striated muscle fiber represents both thick and thin filaments. See human skeleton has 206 bones D. There are 11 pairs of ribs and man sternum is present on the ventral side of the body. 5. Write the difference between actin and myosin B. Red and white muscle C. Pectoral and pelvic girdle 6. Match column I with column 2. Column I column 2 a smooth muscle I myoglobin B tropomyosin 2 thin filament C red muscle 3 sutures D skull I involuntary 7. What are the different types of movements exhibited by the cells of human body 8? How do you distinguish between a skeletal muscle and a cardiac muscle 9? Name the type of joint between the following. Atlas axis B carpal metacarpal of thumb C between phalanges D femur acetabulum E between cranial bones F between pubic bones in the pelvic girdle 10. Fill in the blank spaces. Uh, all mammals except a few have cervical vertebrae. B. The number of phalanges in each limb of human is C. Thin filament of myofibril contains two F actins and two other proteins, namely N. D. And a muscle fiber ca is stored in E. And pairs of ribs are called floating ribs. F. The human cranium is made of bones. Neural control and coordination 315. As you know, the functions of the organs, organ systems in our body must be coordinated to maintain homeostasis. Coordination is the process through which two or more organs interact and complement the functions of one another. For example, when we do physical exercises, the energy demand is increased for maintaining an increased muscular activity. The supply of oxygen is also increased. The increased supply of oxygen necessitates an increase in the rate of respiration, heartbeat and increased blood flow via blood vessels. When physical exercise is stopped, the activities of nerves, lungs, heart and kidney gradually return to their normal conditions. Thus, the functions of muscles, lungs, heart, blood vessels, kidney and other organs are coordinated while performing physical exercises. In our body the neural system and the endocrine system jointly coordinate and integrate all the activities of the organs so that they function in a synchronized fashion. The neural system provides an organized network of point-to-point -point connections for a quick coordination. The endocrine system provides chemical integration through hormones. In this chapter, you will learn about the neural system of human. Mechanisms of neural coordination like transmission of nerve impulse, impulse conduction across the synapse and the physiology of reflex action. Neural control and coordination chapter 21 21.1 Neural system 21.2 Human neural system 21.3 Neuron is structural and functional unit of neural system 21.4 Central neural system 21.5 Reflex action and reflex arc 21.6 Sensory reception and processing 21.1 Neural System The neural system of all animals is composed of highly specialized cells called neurons which can detect, receive and transmit different kinds of stimuli. The neural organization is very simple in lower invertebrates. For example, in Hydra it is composed of a network of neurons. The neural system is better organized in insects, where a brain is present along with a number of ganglia and neural tissues. The vertebrates have a more developed neural system. 21.2 Human Neural System The human neural system is divided into two parts, I the central neural system CNS2 the peripheral neural system PNS the CNS includes the brain and the spinal cord and is the site of information processing and control. The PNS comprises of all the nerves of the body associated with the CNS brain and spinal cord. The nerve fibers of the PNS are of two types, afferent fibers B efferent fibers The efferent nerve fibers transmit impulses from tissues organs to the CNS and the efferent fibers transmit regulatory impulses from the CNS to the concerned peripheral tissues organs. The PNS is divided into two divisions called somatic neural system and autonomic neural system. The somatic neural system relays impulses from the CNS to skeletal muscles while the autonomic neural system transmits impulses from the CNS to the involuntary organs and smooth muscles of the body. 
The autonomic neural system is further classified into sympathetic neural system and parasympathetic neural system. Visceral nervous system is the part of the peripheral nervous system that comprises the whole complex of nerves. Fibers, ganglia, and plexuses by which impulses travel from the central nervous system to the viscera and from the viscera to the central nervous system. 21.3 Neuron is structural and functional unit of neural system. A neuron is a microscopic structure composed of three major parts, namely, cell body, dendrites and axon figure 21.1. The cell body contains cytoplasm with typical cell organelles and certain granular bodies called nissels granules. Short fibers which branch repeatedly and project out of the cell body also contain nissels granules and are called dendrites. These fibers transmit impulses towards the cell body. The axon is a long fiber, the distal end of which is branched. Each branch terminates as a bulb-like structure called synaptic knob which possess synaptic vesicles containing chemicals called neurotransmitters. The axons transmit nerve impulses away from the cell body to a synapse or to a neuromuscular junction. Based on the number of axon and dendrites, the neurons are divided into three types, that is, multipolar with one axon and two or more dendrites, found in the cerebral cortex. Bipolar with one axon and one dendrite, found in the retina of eye and unipolar cell body with one axon only, found usually in the embryonic stage. There are two types of axons, namely, myelinated and non-myelinated. The myelinated nerve fibers are enveloped with Schwann cells, which form a myelin sheath around the axon. The gaps between two adjacent myelin sheaths are called nodes of Ranvier. Myelinated nerve fibers are found in spinal and cranial nerves. Unmyelinated nerve fiber is enclosed by a Schwann cell that does not form a myelin sheath around the axon, and is commonly found in autonomous in the somatic neural systems. 2 1, 3, 1 Generation and conduction of nerve impulse neurons are excitable cells because their membranes are in a polarized state. Do you know why the membrane of the neuron is polarized? Different types of ion channels are present on the neural membrane. These ion channels are selectively permeable to different ions. When a neuron is not conducting any impulse, that is, resting, the axonal membrane is comparatively more permeable to potassium ions K and nearly impermeable to sodium ions Na. Similarly, the membrane is impermeable to negatively charged proteins present in the axoplasm. Consequently, the axoplasm inside the axon contains high concentration of K and negatively charged proteins and low concentration of Na. In contrast, the fluid outside the axon contains a low concentration of K, a high concentration of Na and thus form a concentration gradient. These ionic gradients across the resting membrane are maintained by the active transport of ions by the sodium-potassium pump which transports three Na outwards for 2K into the cell. As a result, the outer surface of the axonal membrane possesses a positive charge while its inner surface figure 21.1 structure of a neuron becomes negatively charged and therefore is polarized. The electrical potential difference across the resting plasma membrane is called as the resting potential. You might be curious to know about the mechanisms of generation of nerve impulse and its conduction along an axon. When a stimulus is applied at a site figure 21.2 e.g., point A on the polarized membrane, the membrane at the site A becomes freely permeable to Na. This leads to a rapid influx of Na followed by the reversal of the polarity at that site, that is, the outer surface of the membrane becomes negatively charged and the inner side becomes positively charged. The polarity of the membrane at the site A is thus reversed and hence depolarized. The electrical potential difference across the plasma membrane at the site A is called the action potential, which is in fact termed as a nerve impulse. At sites immediately ahead, the axon e.g., site B membrane has a positive charge on the outer surface and a negative charge on its inner surface. As a result, a current flows on the inner surface from site A to site B on the outer surface current flows from site B to site A figure 21.2 to complete the circuit of current flow, hence. The polarity at the site is reversed, and an action potential is generated at site B thus, the impulse action potential generated at site A arrives at site B. The sequence is repeated along the length of the axon and consequently the impulse is conducted, the rise in the stimulus induced permeability to Na is extremely short-lived. It is quickly followed by a rise in permeability to K. Within a fraction of a second, K diffuses outside the membrane and restores the resting potential of the membrane at the site of excitation and the fiber becomes once more responsive to further stimulation. A Nabi Na figure 21.2 diagrammatic representation of impulse conduction through an axon at points A and B. 2 1, 3, 2 Transmission of impulses A nerve impulses transmitted from one neuron to another through junctions called synapses. 
a synapse is formed by the membranes of a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron, which may or may not be separated by a gap called synaptic cleft. There are two types of synapses, namely, electrical synapses and chemical synapses. At electrical synapses, the membranes of pre- and postsynaptic neurons are in very close proximity. Electrical current can flow directly from one neuron into the other across these synapses. Transmission of an impulse across electrical synapses is very similar to impulse conduction along a single axon. Impulse transmission across an electrical synapse is always faster than that across a chemical synapse. Electrical synapses are rare in our system. At a chemical synapse, the membranes of the pre- and postsynaptic neurons are separated by a fluid-filled space called synaptic cleft figure 21.3. Do you know how the presynaptic neuron transmits an impulse action potential across the synaptic cleft to the postsynaptic neuron? Chemicals called neurotransmitters are involved in the transmission of impulses at these synapses. The axon terminals contain vesicles filled with these neurotransmitters. When an impulse action potential arrives at the axon terminal, it stimulates the movement of the synaptic vesicles towards the membrane where they fuse with the plasma figure 21.3 diagram showing axon terminal and synapse membrane and release their neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. The released neurotransmitters bind to their specific receptors, present on the postsynaptic membrane. This binding opens ion channels allowing the entry of ions which can generate a new potential in the postsynaptic neuron. The new potential developed may be either excitatory or inhibitory. 21.4 Central Neural System The brain is the central information processing organ of our body, and acts as the command and control system. It controls the voluntary movements, balance of the body, functioning of vital involuntary organs e.g. lungs, heart, kidneys, etc., thermoregulation, hunger and thirst, circadian 24-hour rhythms of our body, activities of several endocrine glands and human behavior. It is also the site for processing of vision, hearing, speech, memory, intelligence, emotions and thoughts. The human brain is well protected by the skull. Inside the skull, the brain is covered by cranial meninges consisting of an outer layer called dura mater, a very thin middle layer called arachnoid and an inner layer which is in contact with the brain tissue called pia mater. The brain can be divided into three major parts, I forebrain, two midbrain, and three hindbrain figure 21.4. Figure 21.4 diagram showing sagittal section of the human brain forebrain. 2 1 4 1 forebrain The forebrain consists of cerebrum, thalamus and hypothalamus Figure 21.4 Cerebrum forms the major part of the human brain. A deep cleft divides the cerebrum longitudinally into two halves, which are termed as the left and right cerebral hemispheres. The hemispheres are connected by a tract of nerve fibers called corpus callosum. The layer of cells which covers the cerebral hemisphere is called cerebral cortex and is thrown into prominent folds. The cerebral cortex is referred to as the gray matter due to its grayish appearance. The neuron cell bodies are concentrated here giving the color. The cerebral cortex contains motor areas, sensory areas and large regions that are neither clearly sensory nor motor in function. These regions called as the association areas are responsible for complex functions like intersensory associations, memory and communication. Fibers of the tracts are covered with the myelin sheath, which constitute the inner part of cerebral hemisphere. They give an opaque white appearance to the layer and, hence, is called the white matter. The cerebrum wraps around a structure called thalamus, which is a major coordinating center for sensory and motor signaling. Another very important part of the brain called hypothalamus lies at the base of the thalamus. The hypothalamus contains a number of centers which control body temperature, urge for eating and drinking. It also contains several groups of neurosecretory cells, which secrete hormones called hypothalamic hormones. The inner parts of cerebral hemispheres and a group of associated deep structures like amygdala, hippocampus, etc., form a complex structure called the limbic lobe or limbic system. Along with the hypothalamus, it is involved in the regulation of sexual behavior, expression of emotional reactions e.g., excitement, pleasure, rage and fear, and motivation. 2 1 4 2 Midbrain The midbrain is located between the thalamus hypothalamus of the forebrain and pons of the hindbrain. A canal called the cerebral aqueduct passes through the midbrain. The dorsal portion of the midbrain consists mainly of four round swellings lobes called corpora quadrigemina. Midbrain and hindbrain form the brain stem 2 1, 4, 3 hindbrain. The hindbrain comprises pons, cerebellum, and medulla, also called the medulla oblongata. Pons consists of fiber tracts that interconnect different regions of the brain. Cerebellum has very convoluted surface in order to provide the additional space for many more neurons. The medulla of the brain is connected to the spinal cord. The medulla contains centers which control respiration, cardiovascular reflexes and gastric secretions. Brain stem forms the connections between the brain and spinal cord. 
Three major regions make up the brain stem, midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. 21.5 Reflex action and reflex arc You must have experienced a sudden withdrawal of a body part which comes in contact with objects that are extremely hot. Cold pointed or animals that are scary or poisonous, the entire process of response to a peripheral nervous stimulation. That occurs involuntarily, that is, without conscious effort or thought and requires the involvement of a part of the central nervous system is called a reflex action. The reflex pathway comprises at least one afferent neuron receptor and one afferent effector or excitor neuron appropriately arranged in the series figure 21.5. The afferent neuron receives signal from a sensory organ and transmits the impulse via a dorsal nerve root into the CNS at the level of spinal cord. The afferent neuron then carries signals from CNS to the effector. The stimulus and response thus forms a reflex arc as shown below in the knee-jerk reflex. You should carefully study figure 21.5 to understand the mechanism of a knee-jerk reflex 21.6 sensory reception and processing. Have you ever thought how do you feel the climatic changes in the environment? How do you see an object and its color? How do you hear a sound? The sensory organs detect all types of changes in the environment and send appropriate signals to the CNS. Where all the inputs are processed and analyzed, signals are then sent to different part centers of the brain. This is how you can sense changes in the environment. Figure 21.5 Diagrammatic Presentation of Reflex Action Showing Knee-Jerk Reflex Sense organs We smell things by our nose, taste by tongue, hear by ear and see objects by eyes. The nose contains mucus-coated receptors which are specialized for receiving the sense of smell and called olfactory receptors. These are made up of olfactory epithelium that consists of three kinds of cells. The neurons of the olfactory epithelium extend from the outside environment directly into a pair of broad bean-sized organs. Called olfactory bulb, which are extensions of the brain's limbic system, both nose and tongue detect dissolved chemicals. The chemical senses of gustation taste and olfactory smell are functionally similar and interrelated. The tongue detects tastes through taste buds, containing gustatory receptors. With each taste of food or sip of drink, the brain integrates the differential input from the taste buds and a complex flavor is perceived. In the following sections, you will be introduced to the structure and functioning of the eye sensory organ for vision and the ear sensory organ for hearing. 2 1, 6, 1 eye or paired eyes are located in sockets of the skull called orbits. A brief account of structure and functions of the human eye is given in the following sections. 2 1, 6, 1, 1 parts of an eye The adult human eyeball is nearly a spherical structure. The wall of the eyeball is composed of three layers figure 21.6. The external layer is composed of a dense connective tissue and is called the sclera. The anterior portion of this layer is called the cornea. The middle layer, choroid, contains many blood vessels and looks bluish in color. The choroid layer is thin over the posterior two-thirds of the eyeball, but it becomes thick in the anterior part to form the ciliary body. The ciliary body figure 21.6 diagram showing parts of an eye. Itself continues forward to form a pigmented and opaque structure called the iris which is the visible colored portion of the eye. The eyeball contains a transparent crystal and lens which is held in place by ligaments attached to the ciliary body. In front of the lens, the aperture surrounded by the iris is called the pupil. The diameter of the pupil is regulated by the muscle fibers of iris. The inner layer is the retina and it contains three layers of neural cells, from inside to outside ganglion cells, bipolar cells and photoreceptor cells. There are two types of photoreceptor cells, namely, rods and cones. These cells contain the light-sensitive proteins called the photopigments. The daylight photopic vision and color vision are functions of cones and the twilight scotopic vision is the function of the rods. The rods contain a purplish red protein called the rhodopsin or visual purple, which contains a derivative of vitamin A, in the human eye. There are three types of cones which possess their own characteristic fodder pigments that respond to red, green and blue lights. The sensations of different colors are produced by various combinations of these cones in their photopigments. When these cones are stimulated equally, a sensation of white light is produced. The optic nerves leave the eye and the retinal blood vessels enter it at a point medial to and slightly above the posterior pole of the eyeball. Photoreceptor cells are not present in that region and hence it is called a blind spot. At the posterior pole of the eye lateral to the blind spot, there is a yellowish pigmented spot called macula lutea with a central pit called the fovea. The fovea is a thinned out portion of the retina where only the cones are densely packed. It is the point where the visual acuity resolution is the greatest. The space between the cornea and the lens is called the aqueous chamber and contains a thin watery fluid called aqueous humor. The space between the lens and the retina is called the vitreous chamber and is filled with a transparent gel called vitreous humor. 2 1, 6, 1, 2 Mechanism of vision The light rays invisible wavelength focused on the retina through the cornea and lens generate potential impulses in rods and cones. 
As mentioned earlier, the photosensitive compounds fodder pigments in the human eyes is composed of obstinate protein and retinal and aldehyde of vitamin A. Light induces dissociation of the retinal from opsin resulting in changes in the structure of the opsin. This causes membrane permeability changes. As a result, potential differences are generated in the photoreceptor cells. This produces a signal that generates action potentials in the ganglion cells through the bipolar cells. These action potentials impulses are transmitted by the optic nerves to the visual. Figure 21.7 Diagrammatic view of ear cortex area of the brain, where the neural impulses are analyzed and the image formed on the retina is recognized based on earlier memory and experience. 2 1 6 2 The ear The ears perform two sensory functions, hearing and maintenance of body balance. Anatomically, the ear can be divided into three major sections called the outer ear, the middle ear and the inner ear Figure 21.7. The outer ear consists of the pinna and external auditory meatus canal. The pinna collects the vibrations in the ear which produce sound. The external auditory meatus leads inwards and extends up to the tympanic membrane the eardrum. There are very fine hairs and wax secreting glands in the skin of the pinna and the meatus. The tympanic membrane is composed of connective tissues covered with skin outside and with mucous membrane inside. The middle ear contains three ossicles called malleus, incus and stapes which are attached to one another in a chain-like fashion. The malleus is attached to the tympanic membrane and the stapes is attached to the oval window of the cochlea. The ear ossicles increase the efficiency of transmission of sound waves to the inner ear. A eustachian tube connects the middle ear cavity with the pharynx. The eustachian tube helps in equalizing the pressures on either sides of the eardrum. The fluid-filled inner ear called labyrinth consists of two parts, the bony and the membranous labyrinth. The bony labyrinth is a series of channels. Inside these channels lies the membranous labyrinth, which is surrounded by a fluid called paralymph. The membranous labyrinth is filled with a fluid called endolymph. The coiled portion of the labyrinth is called cochlea. The membranes constituting cochlea, the Reissner's and basilar, divide the surrounding paralymph-filled bony labyrinth into an upper scala vestibuli and a lower scala tympani figure 21.8. The space. The organ of cordy is a structure located on the basilar membrane which contains hair cells that act as auditory receptors. The hair cells are present in rows on the internal side of the organ of cordy. The basal end of the hair cell is in close contact with the afferent nerve fibers. A large number of processes called stereocilia are projected from the apical part of each hair cell. Above the rows of the hair cells is a thin elastic membrane called tectorial membrane. The inner ear also contains a complex system called vestibular apparatus, located above the cochlea. The vestibular apparatus is composed of three semicircular canals and the otolith macula is the sensory part of saccule and utricle. Each semicircular canal lies in a different plane at right angles to each other. The membranous canals are suspended in the parallel for the bony canals. The base of canals is figure 21.8 Diagrammatic representation of the sectional view of cochlea within cochlea called scala media is filled with endolymph. At the base of the cochlea, the scala vestibuli ends at the oval window, while the scala tympani terminates at the round window which opens to the middle ear. Summary The neural system coordinates and integrates functions as well as metabolic and homeostatic activities of all the organs. Neurons, the functional units of neural system are excitable cells due to a differential concentration gradient of ions across the membrane. The electrical potential difference across the resting neural membrane is called the resting potential. The nerve impulse is conducted along the axon membrane in the form of a wave of depolarization and repolarization. A synapse is formed by the membranes of a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron which may or may not be separated by a gap called synaptic cleft. Chemicals involved in the transmission of impulses at chemical synapses are called neurotransmitters. Human neural system consists of two parts, I central neural system CNS and two the peripheral neural system. The CNS consists of the brain and spiral cord. The brain can be divided into three major parts, I forebrain, two midbrain and three hindbrain. The forebrain consists of cerebrum, thalamus and hypothalamus. The cerebrum is longitudinally divided into two halves that are connected by the corpus callosum. A very important part of the forebrain called hypothalamus controls the body temperature, eating and drinking. Inner part swollen and is called ampulla, which contains a projecting ridge called crista ampullaris which has hair cells. The saccule and utricle contain a projecting ridge called macula. The crista and macula are the specific receptors of the vestibular apparatus responsible for maintenance of balance of the body and posture. 2 0 6 2 one mechanism of hearing How does ear convert sound waves into neural impulses, which are sensed and processed by the brain enabling us to recognize a sound The external ear receives sound waves and directs them to the eardrum. 
The eardrum vibrates in response to the sound waves and these vibrations are transmitted through the ear ossicles malleus, incus and stapes to the oval window. The vibrations are passed through the oval window onto the fluid of the cochlea, where they generate waves in the lymphs. The waves in the lymphs induce a ripple in the basilar membrane. These movements of the basilar membrane bend the hair cells, pressing them against the tectorial membrane. As a result, nerve impulses are generated in the associated afferent neurons. These impulses are transmitted by the afferent fibers via auditory nerves to the auditory cortex of the brain, where the impulses are analyzed and the sound is recognized. Of cerebral hemispheres and a group of associated deep structures form a complex structure called limbic system which is concerned with olfaction. Autonomic responses, regulation of sexual behavior, expression of emotional reactions, and motivation. The midbrain receives and integrates visual, tactile and auditory inputs. The hindbrain comprises pons, cerebellum and medulla. The cerebellum integrates information received from the semicircular canals of the ear and the auditory system. The medulla contains centers, which control respiration, cardiovascular reflexes, and gastric secretions. Pons consist of fiber tracts that interconnect different regions of the brain. The entire process of involuntary response to a peripheral nervous stimulation is called reflex action. Information regarding changes in the environment is received by the CNS through the sensory organs which are processed and analyzed. Signals are then sent for necessary adjustments. The wall of the human eyeball is composed of three layers. The external layer is composed of cornea and sclera. Inside sclera is the middle layer, which is called the choroid. Retina, the innermost layer, contains two types of photoreceptor cells, namely rods and cones. The daylight photopic vision and color vision are functions of cones and twilight scotopic vision is the function of the rods. The light enters through cornea, the lens and the images of objects are formed on the retina. The ear can be divided into the outer ear, the middle ear and the inner ear. The middle ear contains three ossicles called malleus, incus and stapes. The fluid-filled inner ear is called the labyrinth, and the coiled portion of the labyrinth is called cochlea. The organ of cordy is a structure which contains hair cells that act as auditory receptors and is located on the basilar membrane. The vibrations produced in the eardrum are transmitted through the ear ossicles and oval window to the fluid-filled inner ear. Nerve impulses are generated and transmitted by the afferent fibers to the auditory cortex of the brain. The inner ear also contains a complex system located above the cochlea called vestibular apparatus. It is influenced by gravity and movements, and helps us in maintaining balance of the body and posture. 2018-1 Exercises 1. Briefly describe the structure of the following. A brain BIC ear 2. Compare the following. A central neural system CNS and peripheral neural system PNSP resting potential and action potential C choroid and retina 3. Explain the following processes. A polarization of the membrane of a nerve fiber B depolarization of the membrane of a nerve fiber C conduction of a nerve impulse along a nerve fiber D transmission of a nerve impulse across a chemical synapse 4. Draw label diagrams of the following, a neuron B brain CID year 5. Write short notes on the following, a neural coordination B forebrain C midbrain D hindbrain E retina F ear ossicles G cochlea H organ of cordy I synapse 6. Give a brief account of, a mechanism of synaptic transmission B mechanism of vision C mechanism of hearing 7. Answer briefly, a how do you perceive the color of an object B which part of our body helps us in maintaining the body balance C how does the eye regulate the amount of light that falls on the retina. 8. Explain the following. A role of NA in the generation of action potential B mechanism of generation of light induced impulse in the retina. C mechanism through which a sound produces a nerve impulse in the inner ear 9. Differentiate between a myelinated and non-myelinated axon B dendrites and axon C rods and cones D thalamus and hypothalamus E cerebrum and cerebellum. 10. Answer the following. A which part of the ear determines the pitch of a sound B which part of the human brain is the most developed C which part of our central neural system acts as a master clock 11. The region of the vertebrate eye, where the optic nerve passes out of the retina, is called the aphovia B iris C blind spot D optic chasma 12. Distinguish between afferent neurons and afferent neurons B impulse conduction in a myelinated nerve fiber and unmyelinated nerve fiber C aqueous humor and vitreous humor D blind spot and yellow spot F cranial nerves and spinal nerves. 2018 1. 331,331 chemical coordination and integration you have already learned that the neural system provides a point-to-point -point rapid coordination among organs. The neural coordination is fast but short-lived, as the nerve fibers do not innervate all cells of the body and the cellular functions need to be continuously regulated, a special kind of coordination and integration has to be provided. This function is carried out by hormones. The neural system and the endocrine system jointly coordinate and regulate the physiological functions in the body. 
22.1 Endocrine glands and hormones Endocrine glands lack ducts and are hence, called ductless glands. Their secretions are called hormones. The classical definition of hormone is a chemical produced by endocrine glands and released into the blood and transported to a distantly located target organ has current scientific definition as follows. Hormones are non-nutrient chemicals which act as intercellular messengers and are produced in trace amounts. The new definition covers a number of new molecules in addition to the hormones secreted by the organized endocrine glands. Invertebrates possess very simple endocrine systems with few hormones whereas a large number of chemicals act as hormones and provide coordination in the vertebrates. The human endocrine system is described here. Chemical Coordination and Integration Chapter 22 22.1 Endocrine Glands and Hormones 22.2 Human Endocrine System 22.3 Hormones of Heart Kidney and Gastrointestinal Tract 22.4 Mechanism of Hormone Action 22.2 Human Endocrine System The endocrine glands and hormone-producing diffuse tissue cells located in different parts of our body constitute the endocrine system. Pituitary, pineal, thyroid, adrenal, pancreas, parathyroid, thymus and gonads testis in males and ovary in females are the organized endocrine bodies in our body figure 22.1. In addition to these, some other organs, e.g., gastrointestinal tract, liver, kidney, heart also produce hormones. A brief account of the structure and functions of all major endocrine glands and hypothalamus of the human body is given in the following sections. 2 2 2 1 The hypothalamus as you know, the hypothalamus is the basal part of diencephalon, forebrain figure 22.1 and it regulates a wide spectrum of body functions. It contains several groups of neurosecretory cells called nuclei which produce hormones. These hormones regulate the synthesis and secretion of pituitary hormones. However, the hormones produced by hypothalamus are of two types, the releasing hormones which stimulate secretion of pituitary hormones and the inhibiting hormones which inhibit secretions of pituitary hormones. For example a hypothalamic hormone called gonadotrophin releasing hormone GnRH stimulates the pituitary synthesis and release of gonadotrophins. On the other hand, somatostatin from the hypothalamus inhibits the release of growth hormone from the pituitary. These hormones originating in the hypothalamic neurons, pass through axons and are released from their nerve endings. These hormones reach the pituitary gland through a portal circulatory system and regulate the functions of the anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary is under the direct neural regulation of the hypothalamus figure 22.2. Figure 22.1 Location of endocrine glands testis in male ovary and female adrenal pancreas thyroid and parathyroid thymus pineal pituitary hypothalamus. 2 2 2 2 The pituitary gland The pituitary gland is located in a bony cavity called cella tersica and is attached to hypothalamus by a stroke figure 22.2. It is divided anatomically into an adenohypothesis and a neurohypothesis. Adenohypothesis consists of two portions, pars distalis and pars intermedia. The pars distalis region of pituitary, commonly called anterior pituitary, produces growth hormone GH, prolactin PRL, thyroid stimulating hormone TSH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone ACTH, luteinizing hormone LH and follicle stimulating hormone FSH. Pars intermedia secretes only one hormone called melanocyte stimulating hormone MSH. However, in humans, the pars intermedia is almost merged with pars distalis. Neurohypophysis pars nervosa also known as posterior pituitary, stores and releases two hormones called oxytocin and vasopressin, which are actually synthesized by the hypothalamus and are transported axonally to neurohypothesis. Oversecretion of GH stimulates abnormal growth of the body leading to gigantism and low secretion of GH results in stunted growth resulting in pituitary dwarfism. Excess secretion of growth hormone in adults especially in middle age can result in severe disfigurement especially of the face called acromegaly which may lead to serious complications, and premature death if unchecked. The disease is hard to diagnose in the early stages and often goes undetected for many years, until changes in external features become noticeable. Prolactin regulates the growth of the mammary glands and formation of milk and M. TSH stimulates the synthesis and secretion of thyroid hormones from the thyroid gland. ACTH stimulates the synthesis and secretion of steroid hormones called glucocorticoids from the adrenal cortex. LH and FSH stimulate gonadal activity and hence are called gonadotrophins. In males, LH stimulates the synthesis and secretion of hormones called androgens from testis. In males, FSH and androgens regulate spermatogenesis. In females, LH induces ovulation of fully mature follicles graphene follicles and maintains the corpus luteum. 
formed from the remnants of the graphene follicles posterior pituitary anterior pituitary hypothalamus hypothalamic neurons portal circulation figure 22.2 diagrammatic representation of pituitary and its relationship with hypothalamus after ovulation, FSH stimulates growth and development of the ovarian follicles in females. MSH acts on the melanocytes melanin-containing cells and regulates pigmentation of the skin. Oxytocin acts on the smooth muscles of our body and stimulates their contraction. In females, it stimulates a vigorous contraction of uterus at the time of childbirth, and milk ejection from the mammary gland. Vasopressin acts mainly at the kidney and stimulates resorption of water and electrolytes by the distal tubules and thereby reduces loss of water through urine diuresis. Hence, it is also called as antidiuretic hormone ADH. An impairment affecting synthesis or release of ADH results in a diminished ability of the kidney to conserve water leading to water loss and dehydration. This condition is known as diabetes insipidus 2 2 2 3 the pineal gland the pineal gland is located on the dorsal side of forebrain. Pineal secretes a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin plays a very important role in the regulation of a 24-hour diurnal rhythm of our body. For example, it helps in maintaining the normal rhythms of sleep-wake cycle, body temperature. In addition, melatonin also influences metabolism, pigmentation, the menstrual cycle as well as our defense capability. 2 2 2 4 thyroid gland The thyroid gland is composed of two lobes which are located on either side of the trachea figure 22.3. Both the lobes are interconnected with a thin flap of connective tissue called isthmus. The thyroid gland is composed of follicles and stromal tissues. Each thyroid follicle is composed of follicular cells, enclosing a cavity. These follicular cells synthesize two hormones, tetriiodothyronine or thyroxine T4 and triiodothyronine T3. Iodine is essential for the normal rate of hormone synthesis in the thyroid. Deficiency of iodine in our diet results in hypothyroidism and enlargement of the thyroid gland, commonly called goiter. Hypothyroidism during pregnancy causes defective development and maturation of the growing figure 22.3 diagrammatic view of the position of thyroid and parathyroid of ventral side b dorsal side. Baby leading to stunted growth cretinism, mental retardation, low intelligence quotient, abnormal skin, deaf mutism, etc. In adult women, hypothyroidism may cause menstrual cycle to become irregular, due to cancer of the thyroid gland or due to development of nodules of the thyroid glands. The rate of synthesis and secretion of the thyroid hormones is increased to abnormal high levels leading to a condition called hyperthyroidism which adversely affects the body physiology. Exothomic goiter is a form of hyperthyroidism, characterized by enlargement of the thyroid gland, protrusion of the eyeballs, increased basal metabolic rate, and weight loss, also called Graves' disease. Thyroid hormones play an important role in the regulation of the basal metabolic rate. These hormones also support the process of red blood cell formation. Thyroid hormones control the metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Maintenance of water and electrolyte balance is also influenced by thyroid hormones. Thyroid gland also secretes a protein hormone called thyrocalcitonin TCT which regulates the blood calcium levels. 2 2 2 5 Parathyroid gland in humans Four parathyroid glands are present on the back side of the thyroid gland, one pair each in the two lobes of the thyroid gland figure 22.3b. The parathyroid glands secrete a peptide hormone called parathyroid hormone PTH. The secretion of PTH is regulated by the circulating levels of calcium ions. Parathyroid hormone PTH increases the CAR2 levels in the blood. PTH acts on bones and stimulates the process of bone resorption to solution demineralization. PTH also stimulates reabsorption of CA2 by the renal tubules and increases CA2 absorption from the digested food. It is, thus, clear that PTH is a hypercalcemic hormone, that is, it increases the blood CA2 levels. Along with TCT, it plays a significant role in calcium balance in the body 2 2 2 6 thymus The thymus gland is a lobular structure located between lungs behind sternum on the ventral side of aorta. The thymus plays a major role in the development of the immune system. This gland secretes the peptide hormones called thymosins. Thymosins play a major role in the differentiation of T-lymphocytes, which provide cell-mediated immunity. In addition, thymosins also promote production of antibodies to provide humoral immunity. Thymus is degenerated in old individuals resulting in a decreased production of thymosins. As a result, the immune responses of old persons become weak. The adrenal medulla secretes two hormones called adrenaline or epinephrine and or adrenaline or norepinephrine. 
These are commonly called as catecholamines. Adrenaline and noradrenaline are rapidly secreted in response to stress of any kind and during emergency situations and are called emergency hormones or hormones of fight or flight. These hormones increase alertness, pupillary dilation, piloerection raising of hairs, sweating etc. Both the hormones increase the heartbeat, the strength of heart contraction and the rate of respiration. Catecholamines also stimulate the breakdown of glycogen resulting in 2 2 2 7 adrenal gland our body has one pair of adrenal glands one at the anterior part of each kidney figure 22.4 a the gland is composed of two types of tissues the centrally located tissue is called the adrenal medulla and outside this lies the adrenal cortex figure 22.4 b under production of hormones by the adrenal cortex alters carbohydrate metabolism causing acute weakness and fatigue leading to a disease called Addison's disease Figure 22.4 Diagrammatic representation of a adrenal gland above kidney B section showing two parts of adrenal gland adrenal gland adrenal cortex kidney adrenal medulla B. An increased concentration of glucose in blood. In addition, they also stimulate the breakdown of lipids and proteins. The adrenal cortex can be divided into three layers, called zona reticularis inner layer, zona fasciculata middle layer and zona glomerulosa outer layer. The adrenal cortex secretes many hormones, commonly called as corticoids. The corticoids, which are involved in carbohydrate metabolism are called glucocorticoids. In our body, cortisol is the main glucocorticoid. Corticoids, which regulate the balance of water and electrolytes in our body are called mineralocorticoids. Aldosterone is the main mineralocorticoid in our body. Glucocorticoids stimulate gluconeogenesis, lipolysis and proteolysis, and inhibit cellular uptake and utilization of amino acids. Cortisol is also involved in maintaining the cardiovascular system as well as the kidney functions. Glucocorticoids, particularly cortisol, produces anti-inflammatory reactions and suppresses the immune response. Cortisol stimulates the RBC production. Aldosterone acts mainly at the renal tubules and stimulates the reabsorption of Na in water and excretion of K in phosphate ions. Thus, aldosterone helps in the maintenance of electrolytes, body fluid volume, osmotic pressure and blood pressure. Small amounts of androgenic steroids are also secreted by the adrenal cortex which play a role in the growth of axial hair, pubic hair and facial hair during puberty. 2 2 2 8 Pancreas Pancreas is a composite gland figure 22.1 which acts as both the exocrine and endocrine gland. The endocrine pancreas consists of islets of longer hans. There are about 1 to 2 million islets of longer hans in a normal human pancreas representing only 1 to 2 percent of the pancreatic tissue. The two main types of cells in the islet of longer hands are called Greek letter alpha, Greek letter alpha, Greek letter alpha, Greek letter alpha, Greek letter alpha cells and Greek letter beta, Greek letter beta, Greek letter beta, Greek letter beta, Greek letter beta cells. The Greek letter alpha cells secrete a hormone called glucagon, while the Greek letter beta, Greek letter beta, Greek letter beta, Greek letter beta, Greek letter beta cells secrete insulin. Glucagon is a peptide hormone and plays an important role in maintaining the normal blood glucose levels. Glucagon acts mainly on the liver cells hepatocytes and stimulates glycogenolysis resulting in an increased blood sugar hyperglycemia. In addition, this hormone stimulates the process of gluconeogenesis which also contributes to hyperglycemia. Glucagon reduces the cellular glucose uptake and utilization, thus, glucagon is a hyperglycemic hormone. Insulin is a peptide hormone, which plays a major role in the regulation of glucose homeostasis. Insulin acts mainly on hepatocytes and adipocytes cells of adipose tissue and enhances cellular glucose uptake and utilization. As a result, there is a rapid movement of glucose from blood to hepatocytes and adipocytes resulting in decreased blood glucose levels hypoglycemia. Insulin also stimulates conversion of glucose to glycogen glycogenesis in the target cells. The glucose homeostasis in blood is thus maintained jointly by the two, insulin and glucagons. Prolonged hyperglycemia leads to a complex disorder called diabetes mellitus which is associated with loss of glucose through urine and formation of harmful compounds known as ketone bodies. Diabetic patients are successfully treated with insulin therapy 2 2 2 9 testis a pair of testis is present in the scrotal sac outside abdomen of male individuals figure 22.1. Testis performs dual functions as a primary sex organ as well as an endocrine gland. Testis is composed of seminiferous tubules and stromal or interstitial tissue. The Leydig cells or interstitial cells, which are present in the intertubular spaces produce a group of hormones called androgens mainly testosterone. Androgens regulate the development, maturation and functions of the male accessory sex organs like epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, prostate gland, urethra etc. These hormones stimulate muscular growth, growth of facial and axillary hair, aggressiveness, low pitch of voice etc. 
Androgens play a major stimulatory role in the process of spermatogenesis formation of spermatozoa. Androgens act on the central neural system and influence the male's sexual behavior libido. These hormones produce anabolic synthetic effects on protein and carbohydrate metabolism. February 22, 2010 Ovary females have a pair of ovaries located in the abdomen figure 22.1. Ovary is the primary female sex organ which produces one ovum during each menstrual cycle. In addition, ovary also produces two groups of steroid hormones called estrogen and progesterone. Ovary is composed of ovarian follicles and stromal tissues. The estrogen is synthesized and secreted mainly by the growing ovarian follicles. After ovulation, the ruptured follicle is converted to a structure called corpus luteum, which secretes mainly progesterone. Estrogens produce wide-ranging actions such as stimulation of growth and activities of female secondary sex organs. Development of growing Ovarian follicles, appearance of female secondary sex characters e.g., high pitch of voice, etc., mammary gland development. Estrogens also regulate female sexual behavior, progesterone supports pregnancy, progesterone also acts on the mammary glands and stimulates the formation of alveoli sac-like structures which store milk and milk secretion. 22.3 Hormones of Heart, Kidney and Gastrointestinal Tract Now you know about the endocrine glands and their hormones. However, as mentioned earlier, hormones are also secreted by some tissues which are not endocrine glands. For example, the atrial wall of our heart secretes a very important peptide hormone called atrial natriuretic factor ANF, which decreases blood pressure. When blood pressure is increased, ANF is secreted which causes dilation of the blood vessels. This reduces the blood pressure. The juxtaglomerular cells of kidney produce a peptide hormone called erythropoietin which stimulates erythropoiesis formation of RBC. Endocrine cells present in different parts of the gastrointestinal tract secrete four major peptide hormones, namely gastrin, secretin, cholecystokinin CCK and gastric inhibitory peptide GIP. Gastrin acts on the gastric glands and stimulates the secretion of hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. Secretin acts on the exocrine pancreas and stimulates secretion of water and bicarbonate ions. CCK acts on both pancreas and gallbladder and stimulates the secretion of pancreatic enzymes and bile juice, respectively. GIP inhibits gastric secretion and motility. Several other non-endocrine tissues secrete hormones called growth factors. These factors are essential for the normal growth of tissues and their repairing regeneration. 22.4 Mechanism of Hormone Action Hormones produce their effects on target tissues by binding to specific proteins called hormone receptors located in the target tissues only. Hormone receptors present on the cell membrane of the target cells are called membrane-bound receptors and the receptors present inside the target cell are called intracellular receptors. Mostly nuclear receptors present in the nucleus. Binding of a hormone to its receptor leads to the formation of a hormone receptor complex figure 22.5 A, B. Each receptor is specific to one hormone only and hence receptors are specific. Hormone receptor complex formation leads to certain biochemical changes in the target tissue. Target tissue metabolism and hence. Physiological functions are regulated by hormones. On the basis of their chemical nature, hormones can be divided into groups. I peptide. Polypeptide, protein hormones e.g., insulin, glucagon, pituitary hormones, hypothalamic hormones, etc. Two steroids e.g., cortisol, testosterone, estradiol and progesterone. Three iodothyronines thyroid hormones i amino acid derivatives e.g., epinephrine. Hormones which interact with membrane-bound receptors normally do not enter the target cell, but generate second messengers e.g., cyclic AMP, IP3, CA etc. which in turn regulate cellular metabolism figure 22.5 A. Hormones which interact with intracellular receptors e.g., steroid hormones, iodothyronines, etc. mostly regulate gene expression or chromosome function by the interaction of hormone receptor complex with the genome. Cumulative biochemical actions result in physiological and developmental effects figure 22.5 BIA. 341,341 Chemical Coordination and Integration Summary There are special chemicals which act as hormones and provide chemical coordination, integration and regulation in the human body. These hormones regulate metabolism, growth and development of our organs, the endocrine glands or certain cells. The endocrine system is composed of hypothalamus, pituitary and pineal, thyroid, adrenal, pancreas, parathyroid, thymus and gonads testis and ovary. In addition to these, some other organs, e.g., gastrointestinal tract, kidney, heart etc., also produce hormones. The pituitary gland is divided into three major parts, which are called as pars distalis, pars intermedia and pars nervosa. 
Pars distalis produces six trophic hormones. Pars intermedius secretes figure 22.5 diagrammatic representation of the mechanism of hormone action, a protein hormone B steroid hormone B. Only one hormone, while pars nervosa neural hypothesis secretes two hormones. The pituitary hormones regulate the growth and development of somatic tissues and activities of peripheral endocrine glands. Pineal gland secretes melatonin, which plays a very important role in the regulation of 24-hour diurnal rhythms of our body e.g., rhythms of sleep and state of being awake, body temperature, etc. The thyroid gland hormones play an important role in the regulation of the basal metabolic rate, development and maturation of the central neural system, erythropoiesis, metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins and fats, menstrual cycle. Another thyroid hormone, that is, thyrocalcitonin regulates calcium levels in our blood by decreasing it. The parathyroid glands secrete parathyroid hormone PTH which increases the blood CA2 levels and plays a major role in calcium homeostasis. The thymus gland secretes thymosins which play a major role in the differentiation of T-lymphocytes, which provide cell-mediated immunity. In addition, thymosins also increase the production of antibodies to provide humoral immunity. The adrenal gland is composed of the centrally located adrenal medulla and the outer adrenal cortex. The adrenal medulla secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine. These hormones increase alertness, pupillary dilation, piloerection, sweating, heartbeat, strength of heart contraction, rate of respiration, glycogenolysis, lipolysis, proteolysis. The adrenal cortex secretes glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. Glucocorticoids stimulate gluconeogenesis, lipolysis, proteolysis, erythropoiesis, cardiovascular system, blood pressure, and glomerular filtration rate and inhibit inflammatory reactions by suppressing the immune response. Mineralocorticoids regulate water and electrolyte contents of the body. The endocrine pancreas secretes glucagon and insulin. Glucagon stimulates glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis resulting in hyperglycemia. Insulin stimulates cellular glucose uptake and utilization, and glycogenesis resulting in hypoglycemia. Insulin deficiency and or insulin resistance result in a disease called diabetes mellitus. The testis secretes androgens, which stimulate the development, maturation and functions of the male accessory sex organs, appearance of the male secondary sex characters, spermatogenesis, male sexual behavior anabolic pathways and erythropoiesis. The ovary secretes estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen stimulates growth and development of female accessory sex organs and secondary sex characters. Progesterone plays a major role in the maintenance of pregnancy as well as in mammary gland development and lactation. The atrial wall of the heart produces atrial natriuretic factor which decreases the blood pressure. Kidney produces erythropoietin which stimulates erythropoiesis. The gastrointestinal tract secretes gastrin, secretin, cholecystokinin and gastric inhibitory peptide. These hormones regulate the secretion of digestive juices and help in digestion. Exercises 1. Define the following. A exocrine gland B endocrine gland C hormone 2. Diagrammatically indicate the location of the various endocrine glands in our body. 3. List the hormones secreted by the following. A hypothalamus B pituitary C thyroid D parathyroid e, adrenal F pancreas G testis H over E I thymus J atrium K kidney L G I tract 4. Fill in the blanks. Hormones target gland A hypothalamic hormones B thyrotrophin T S H C corticotrophin A C T H D gonadotrophins L H F S H E melanotrophin M S H 5. Write short notes on the functions of the following hormones, a parathyroid hormone PTH, B thyroid hormone C thymosins D androgens E estrogens F insulin and glucagon 6. Give example S of, a hyperglycemic hormone and hypoglycemic hormone B hypercalcemic hormone C gonadotrophic hormones D progestational hormone E blood pressure lowering hormone F androgens and estrogens 7. Which hormonal deficiency is responsible for the following, a diabetes mellitus B goiter C cretinism 8. Briefly mention the mechanism of action of FSH9. Match the following. Column I, column 2, a D4I hypothalamus BPTH2 thyroid CGNRH3 pituitary DLHI parathyroid. Note.